The Story of Civilization, Volume 10, Rousseau and Revolution, by Will and Ariel Durant. Part 1, Continued, Cassette 7, Side 2. They wonder how Volmar can be so good without religious belief. saint Preux, who, like Julie, is a pious Protestant, explains the anomaly. Having resided in Roman Catholic countries, he, Volmar, has never been led to a better opinion of Christianity by what he found professed there. Their religion, he saw, tended only to the interest of their priests. It consisted entirely of ridiculous grimaces and a jargon of words without meaning. He perceived that men of sense and probity were unanimously of his opinion, and that they did not scruple to say so, nay, that the clergy themselves, under the rose, ridiculed in private what they inculcated and taught in public. Hence he has often assured us that, after taking much time and pains in the search, he has never met with above three priests who believed in God. Rousseau adds in a footnote, God forbid that I should approve these hard and rash assertions. Despite them, Volmar regularly goes to Protestant services with Julie, out of respect for her and his neighbors. Julie and saint Preux see in him the strangest absurdity, a man thinking like an infidel and acting like a Christian. He did not deserve the final blow. Julie, dying of a fever contracted while saving her son from drowning, entrusts to Volmar an unsealed letter to saint Preux, which declares to saint Preux that he has always been her only love. We can understand the permanence of that first impression, but why reward her husband's long fidelity and trust with so cruel a deathbed rejection? It is hardly consistent with the nobility with which the author has invested Julie's character. Nevertheless, she is one of the great portraits in modern fiction. Though it was probably suggested by Richardson's Clarissa, it was inspired by Rousseau's own recollections, the two girls whose horses he had led across the stream at Annecy, the memories he treasured of Madame de Varon in his first years under her protection, and then Madame Doudteau, who had made him feel the overflow of love by damning his desire. Of course, Julie is none of these women, and perhaps no woman that Rousseau had ever met, but only the composite ideal of his dreams. The picture is spoiled by Rousseau's insistence upon making nearly all his characters talk like Rousseau. Julie, as motherhood deepens her, becomes a sage who discourses lengthily on everything from domestic economy to mystic union with God. We will examine into the validity of this argument, she says. But what lovable woman ever descended to such bathos? saint Preux, of course, is especially Rousseau, sensitive to all the charms of women, longing to kneel at their idealized feet and to pour out the eloquent phrases of devotion and passion that he has rehearsed in his loneliness. Rousseau describes him as always perpetrating some madness and always making a start at being wise. saint Preux is an unbelievable prig compared with the frankly villainous Lovelace of Richardson. He too must mouth Rousseau. He describes Paris as a maelstrom of evils. Great wealth, great poverty, incompetent government, bad air, bad music, trivial conversation, vain philosophy, and the almost total collapse of religion, morality, and marriage. He repeats the first discourse on the natural goodness of man and the corrupting and degrading influences of civilization. And he compliments Julie and Volmar on preferring the quiet and wholesome life of the countryside at Clairon. Volmar is the most original character in Rousseau's gallery. Who was his model? Perhaps Dolbach, the amiable atheist, the philosopher baron, the virtuous materialist, the devoted husband of one wife and then of her sister? And perhaps Saint Lambert, who had shocked Rousseau by preaching atheism, but had forgiven him for making love to his mistress? Rousseau candidly avows his use of living prototypes and personal memories. Full of that which had befallen me, and still affected by so many violent emotions, my heart added the sentiment of its sufferings to the ideas with which meditation had inspired me. Without perceiving it, I described the situation I was then in, gave portraits of Grimm, Madame d'Epinay, Madame Doudteau, saint Lambert, and myself. Through these character portraits, Rousseau expounded nearly all facets of his philosophy— he gave an ideal picture of a happy marriage, of an agricultural estate managed with efficiency, justice, and humanity, and of children brought up to be exemplary mixtures of freedom and obedience, restraint and intelligence. 
He anticipated the arguments of his Emile, that education should be first of the body to health, then of the character to a stoic discipline, and only then of the intellect to reason. The only means of rendering children docile, says Juli, is not to reason with them, but to convince them that reason is above their age. There should be no appeal to reason, no intellectual education at all before puberty. And the story went out of its way to discuss religion. Julie's faith becomes the instrument of her redemption. The religious ceremony that sanctified her marriage brought her a sense of purification and dedication. But it is a strongly Protestant faith that pervades the book. saint Preux ridicules what seems to him the hypocrisy of the Catholic clergy in Paris. Volmar denounces sacerdotal celibacy as a cover for adultery, and Rousseau, in his own person, adds, to impose celibacy upon a group so numerous as the Roman clergy is not so much to forbid them to have women of their own as to order them to satisfy themselves with the women of other men. In passing, Rousseau declares in favor of religious toleration, extending it even to atheists. No true believer will be either intolerant or a persecutor. If I were a magistrate, and if the law pronounced the penalty of death against atheists— I would begin by burning as such whoever should come to inform against another. The novel had an epical influence in arousing Europe to the beauties and sublimities of nature. In Voltaire, Diderot, and d'Alembert, the fever of philosophy and urban life had not encouraged sensitivity to the majesty of mountains and the kaleidoscope of the sky. Rousseau had the advantage of being born amid the most impressive scenery in Europe. He had walked from Geneva into Savoy and across the Alps to Turin, and from Turin into France. He had savoured the sights and sounds and fragrances of the countryside. He had felt every sunrise as the triumph of divinity over evil and doubt. He imagined a mystic accord between his moods and the changing temper of the earth and the air. His ecstasy of love embraced every tree and flower, every blade of grass. He climbed the Alps to midway of their height and found a purity of air that seemed to cleanse and clear his thoughts. He described these experiences with such feeling and vividness that mountain climbing, especially in Switzerland, became one of Europe's major sports. Never before in modern literature had feeling, passion, and romantic love received so detailed and eloquent an exposition and defense. Reacting against the adoration of reason from Boileau to Voltaire, Rousseau proclaimed the primacy of feeling and its right to be heard in the interpretation of life and the evaluation of creeds. With La Nouvelle Héloise, the Romantic movement raised its challenge to the Classic Age. Of course, there had been Romantic movements even in the Classic heyday. Honoré d'Urfey had played with bucolic love in La Stray, 1610 to 27. Mademoiselle de Scudéry had stretched amours to Reims in Artemen ou Le Grand Cyrus. 1649 to 53. Madame de Lafayette had married love and death in La Princesse de Cleves in 1678. Racine had brought the same theme into Phedra in 1677, the very apex of the classic age. We recall how Rousseau had inherited old romances from his mother and had read them with his father. As for the Alps, Albrecht von Haller had already sung Their Majesty in 1729, and James Thompson had celebrated the beauty and terror of the seasons between 1726 and 1730. Jean-Jacques must have read Prévost's Manon Lecaux in 1731, and since he could read English with difficulty, he must have been familiar with Richardson's Clarissa, published between 1747 and 48, in Prévost's translation. From that two thousand page, still in complete seduction, he took the letter form of narrative as congenial to psychological analysis, and he gave Julie a cousin confidant in Claire, as Richardson had given Clarissa Miss Howe. Rousseau noted with resentment that Diderot published an ecstatic Eloge de Richardson in 1761, soon after Julie, dimming Julie's glory. Julie is quite equal to Clarissa in originality and faults, far superior to it in style. Both are rich in improbabilities and heavy with sermons. But France, which excels the world in style, had never known the French language to take on such color, ardor, smoothness, and rhythm. Rousseau did not merely preach feeling. He had it. Everything he touched was infused with sensitivity and sentiment, and though we may smile at his raptures, we find ourselves warmed by his fire. We may resent and hurry over the untimely disquisitions, 
but we read on, and every now and then a scene intensely felt renews the life of the tale. Voltaire thought in ideas and wrote with epigrams. Rousseau saw in pictures and composed with sensations. His phrases and periods were not artless. He confessed that he turned them over in bed while the passion of the artist frightened sleep. I must read Rousseau, said Kant, until his beauty of expression no longer distracts me, and only then can I examine him with reason. Julie succeeded with everyone except the philosophe. Grimm called it a feeble imitation of Clarissa and predicted that it would soon be forgotten. No more about Jean-Jacques' romance, if you please, growled Voltaire on January 21st, 1761. I have read it to my sorrow, and it would be to his if I had time to say what I think of this silly book. A month later he said it in Lettres sur la Nouvelle Héloise, published under a pseudonym. He pointed out grammatical errors and gave no sign of appreciating Rousseau's descriptions of nature though he would later imitate Jean-Jacques by climbing a hill to worship the rising sun. Paris recognized Voltaire's hand and judged the patriarch to be bitten with jealousy. Barring these pricks, Rousseau was delighted with the reception of his first full-length work. In all literary history, thought Michelet, there had never been so great a success. Edition followed edition, but printings fell far behind demand. Lines formed at the stores to buy the book, Eager readers paid twelve sous per hour to borrow it. Those who had it during the day rented it to others for the night. Rousseau told happily how one lady, all dressed up to go to a ball at the opera, ordered her carriage, took up Julie meanwhile, and became so interested that she read on till four in the morning while maid and horses waited. He ascribed his triumph to the pleasure women took in reading of love. But there were also women who were tired of being mistresses and longed to be wives and to have fathers for their children. Hundreds of letters reached Rousseau at Montmorency, thanking him for his book. So many women tendered him their love that his imagination concluded, there was not one woman in high life with whom I might not have succeeded had I undertaken to do it. It was something new that a man should so completely reveal himself as Rousseau had done through saint Preux and Julie. And there is nothing so interesting as a human soul, even partly or unconsciously bared to view. Here, said Madame de Stal, all the veils of the heart have been rent. Now began the reign of subjective literature, a long succession lasting to our own days of self-revelations, of hearts broken in print, of beautiful souls publicly bathing in tragedy. To be emotional, to express emotion and sentiment, became a fashion not only in France but in England and Germany. The classic mode of restraint, order, reason, and form began to fade away. The reign of the philosophe neared its end. After 1760, the eighteenth century belonged to Rousseau. Chapter 7 Rousseau Philosopher 1. The Social Contract Two months before the publication of La Nouvelle Héloise, Rousseau wrote to M. Le Nieps on December 11, 1760, I have quit the profession of author for good. There remains an old sin to be expiated in print, after which the public will never hear from me again. I know of no happier lot than that of being unknown save only to one's friends. Henceforth, copying music will be my only occupation. And again on June 25th, 1761. Until the age of forty I was wise. At forty I took up the pen. And I put it down before I am fifty, cursing every day of my life the day when my foolish pride made me take it up. And when I saw my happiness, my repose, my health, all go up in smoke, without hope of recapturing them again. Was this a pose? Not quite. It is true that in 1762 he published both Du Contrat Social and Emile, but these had been completed by 1761. They were the old sin to be expiated in print. And it is true that he later wrote replies to the Archbishop of Paris, to the Geneva Consistory, and to the requests from Corsica and Poland to propose constitutions for them. But these compositions were pièces d'occasion, induced by unforeseen events. The confessions, the dialogues, and the rêverie d'un promeneur solitaire were published after his death. Essentially, he kept to his novel vow. It is no wonder that in 1761 he felt exhausted and finished, 
for in the space of five years he had composed three major works, each of which was an event in the history of ideas. Far back in 1743, when he was secretary to the French ambassador in Venice, his observation of the Venetian government, in contrast with the Genevan and the French, had led him to plan a substantial treatise on political institutions. The two discourses were sparks from that fire, but they were hasty attempts to get attention by exaggeration, and neither of them did justice to his developing thought. Meanwhile, he studied Plato, Grotius, Locke, and Pufendorf. The magnum opus that he dreamed of was never completed. Rousseau did not have the ordered mind, patient will, and quiet temper needed for such an enterprise. It would have required him to reason as well as feel, to conceal passion rather than reveal it, and such self-denial was beyond his reach. His renunciation of authorship was his admission of defeat, but he gave the world in 1762 a brilliant fragment of his plan in the 125 pages published at Amsterdam as Du Contrat Social ou Principe du Droit Politique. Everyone knows the bold cry that opened the first chapter, Man is born free and he is everywhere in chains. Rousseau began with conscious hyperbole, for he knew that logic has a powerful virtus dormitiva. He judged rightly in striking so shrill a note, for that line became the watchword of a century. As in the discourses, he assumed a primitive state of nature, in which there were no laws. He charged existing states with having destroyed that freedom, and he proposed in their place to find a form of association which will defend and protect, with the whole common force, the person and goods of each associate, and in which each, while uniting himself to all, may still obey himself alone and remain as free as before. This is the fundamental problem of which the social contract provides the solution. There is a social contract, says Rousseau, not as a pledge of the ruled to obey the ruler, as in Hobbes's Leviathan, but as an agreement of individuals to subordinate their judgment, rights, and powers to the needs and judgment of their community as a whole. Each person implicitly enters into such a contract by accepting the protection of the communal laws. The sovereign power in any state lies not in any ruler, individual or corporate, but in the general will of the community, and that sovereignty, though it may be delegated in part and for a time, can never be surrendered. But what is this volonté générale? Is it the will of all the citizens, or only of the majority? And who are to be considered citizens? It is not the will of all, volonté de tout, for it may contradict many an individual will, nor is it always the will of the majority living, or voting, at some particular moment. It is the will of the community as having a life and reality additional to the lives and wills of the individual members. Rousseau, like a medieval realist, ascribes to the collectivity or general idea a reality additional to that of its particular constituents. The general will or public spirit should be the voice not only of the citizens now living, but of those dead or yet to be born. Hence its character is given to it not only by present wills, but by the past history and future aims of the community. It is like some old family that thinks of itself as one through generations, honors its ancestors, and protects its progeny. So a father, out of obligation to grandchildren yet unborn, may overrule the desires of his living children, and a statesman may feel himself bound to think in terms not of one election, but of many generations. Nevertheless, the vote of the majority always binds all the rest. Who may vote? Every citizen. Who is a citizen? Apparently not all male adults. Rousseau is especially obscure on this point, but he praises d'Alembert for distinguishing the four orders of men who dwell in our town, Geneva, of which only two compose the public. No other French writer has understood the real meaning of the word citizen. Ideally, says Rousseau, law should be the expression of the general will. Man is by nature predominantly good, but he has instincts that must be controlled to make society possible. There is no idealization of a state of nature in the social contract. For a moment, Rousseau talks like Locke or Montesquieu, even like Voltaire. The passage from the state of nature to the civil state produces a very remarkable change in man, 
by substituting law for instinct in his conduct and giving his actions the morality they had formerly lacked. Although in this civil state he deprives himself of some advantages which he had from nature, he gains in return others so great, his faculties are so stimulated and developed, his ideas so extended, and his whole soul so uplifted, that did not the abuses of his new condition often degrade him below that which he left, he would be bound to bless continually the happy moment which took him from it forever, and instead of a stupid and unimaginative animal, made him an intelligent being and a man. So Rousseau, who once talked like a not-quite-philosophical anarchist, is now all for the sanctity of law, if the law expresses the general will. If, as often happens, an individual does not agree with that will as expressed in law, the state may justly force him to submit. This is not a violation of freedom, it is a preservation of it, even for the refractory individual, for in a civil state it is only through law that the individual can enjoy freedom from assault, robbery, persecution, calumny, and a hundred other ills. Hence, in compelling the individual to obey the law, society, in effect, forces him to be free. This is especially so in republics, for obedience to a law which we prescribe to ourselves is liberty. Government is an executive organ to which the general will provisionally delegates some of its powers. The state should be thought of not as only the government, but as the government, the citizens, and the general will or communal soul. Any state is a republic if it is governed by laws and not by autocratic decrees. In this sense, even a monarchy can be a republic. But if the monarchy is absolute, if the king makes as well as executes the laws, then there is no res publica, or commonwealth, there is only a tyrant ruling slaves. Hence Rousseau refused to join those philosophes who praised the enlightened despotism of Frederick II or Catherine II as means of advancing civilization and reform. He thought that people living in Arctic or tropical climates might need absolute rule to preserve life and order, but in temperate zones a mixture of aristocracy and democracy is desirable. Hereditary aristocracy is the worst of all governments. Elective aristocracy is the best. That is, the best government is one in which the laws are made and administered by a minority of men, periodically chosen for their intellectual and moral superiority. Democracy, as direct rule by all the people, seemed to Rousseau impossible. If we take the term in the strict sense, there never has been a real democracy, and there never will be. It is against the natural order for the many to govern and the few to be governed. It is unimaginable that the people should remain continually assembled to devote their time to public affairs, and it is clear that they cannot set up commissions for that purpose without changing the form of administration. Besides, how many conditions difficult to unite are presupposed by such a government? First, a very small state where the people can be readily assembled and where each citizen can with ease know all the rest. Secondly, great simplicity of manners to prevent business from multiplying and raising thorny problems. Next, a large measure of equality in rank and fortune, without which equality of rights and authority cannot long subsist. And lastly, little or no luxury, for luxury corrupts at once the rich and the poor, the rich by possession and the poor by covetousness. This is why a famous writer, Montesquieu, has made virtue the fundamental principle of republics, for all these conditions could not exist without virtue. If there were a people of gods, their government would be democratic, but so perfect a government is not for men. These passages invite misinterpretation. Rousseau uses the term democracy in a sense rarely ascribed to it in politics or history as a government in which all laws are made by the whole people meeting in national assemblies. Actually, the elective aristocracy that he preferred is what we should call representative democracy, government by officials popularly chosen for their supposedly superior fitness. However, Rousseau rejects representative democracy on the ground that the representatives will soon legislate for their own interest rather than for the public good. The people of England regards itself as free, but it is grossly mistaken. It is free only during the election of members of Parliament. As soon as they are chosen, slavery overtakes the people and it ceases to count. Representatives should be elected to administrative and judicial offices, but not to legislate. 
All laws should be made by the people in general assembly, and that assembly should have the power to recall elected officials. Hence the ideal state should be small enough to allow all the citizens to assemble frequently. The larger the state, the less the liberty. Was Rousseau a socialist? The second discourse derived almost all the evils of civilization from the establishment of private property. Yet even that essay judged the institution to be too deeply rooted in the social structure to permit its removal without a chaotic and desolating revolution. The social contract allows for private ownership, but subject to communal control. The community should retain all basic rights. It may seize private property for the common good, and it should fix a maximum of property allowable to any one family. It may sanction the bequest of property, but if it sees wealth tending to a disruptive concentration, it may use inheritance taxes to redistribute wealth and diminish social and economic inequality. It is precisely because the force of things tends always to destroy equality that legislation should always tend to maintain it. One purpose of the social contract is that men who may be unequal in strength or intelligence shall all become equal in social and legal rights. Taxes should fall heavily upon luxuries. The social state is advantageous to men only when all have something and no one has too much. Rousseau did not commit himself to collectivism and never thought of a dictatorship of the proletariat. He despised the nascent proletariat of the cities and agreed with Voltaire in calling it canaille, rabble, scum. His ideal was a prosperous, independent peasantry in the virtuous middle class composed of families like Volmar's in La Nouvelle Héloise. Pierre-Joseph Proudhon was to accuse him of enthroning the bourgeoisie. What place should religion have in the state? Some religion, Rousseau felt, was indispensable to morality. No state has ever been established without a religious basis. Wise men, if they try to speak their language to the common herd instead of its own, cannot possibly make themselves understood. For a young people to be able to prefer sound principles of political theory, the effect would have to become the cause. The social spirit, which should be created by these institutions, would have to preside over their very foundation, and men would have to be before law what they should become by means of law. The legislator, therefore, being unable to appeal to either force or reason, must have recourse to an authority of a different order, capable of constraining without violence. This is what in all ages compelled the fathers of nations to have recourse to divine intervention, and credit the gods with their own wisdom, in order that the peoples, submitting to the laws of the state as to those of nature, might obey freely and bear with docility the yoke of the public good. Rousseau would not always hold to this old political view of religion, but in the social contract he made supernatural belief an instrument of the state and considered priests to be at best a kind of celestial police. However, he rejected the Roman Catholic clergy as such agents, for their church claimed to be above the state and was therefore a disruptive force, dividing the citizen's loyalty. Moreover, he argued, the Christian, if he takes his theology seriously, focuses his attention upon the afterlife and puts little value upon this one. To that extent he is a poor citizen. Such a Christian makes an indifferent soldier. He may fight for his country, but only under constant compulsion and supervision. He does not believe in waging war for the state because he has only one fatherland, the church. Christianity preaches servitude and docile dependence, hence its spirit is so favorable to tyranny that tyrants welcome its cooperation. True Christians are made to be slaves. Here Rousseau agreed with Diderot, anticipated Gibbon, and was for the moment more violently anti-Catholic than Voltaire. Nevertheless, he felt some religion is necessary, some civil religion, formulated by the state and made compulsory upon all its population. As to creed, the dogmas of the civil religion ought to be few, simple, and precisely worded, but without explanation or commentary. The existence of a mighty, intelligent, and beneficent divinity, possessed of foresight and providence, the life to come, the happiness of the just, the punishment of the wicked, the sanctity of the social contract and the laws, these are its positive dogmas. So Rousseau, at least for political purposes, professed the basic beliefs of Christianity, while rejecting its ethics as too pacifistic and international just the reverse of the usual philosophic procedure of retaining the ethics of Christianity while discarding its theology. 
He allowed other religions in his imaginary state, but only on condition that they did not contradict the official creed. He would tolerate those religions that tolerate others, but whoever dares to say, outside the church there is no salvation, ought to be driven from the state, unless the state is the church and the prince is the pontiff thereof. No denial of the articles in the religion of the state is to be permitted. While the state can compel no one to believe them, it can banish him, not for impiety, but as an antisocial being, incapable of truly loving the laws and justice, and of sacrificing at need his life to his duty. If any one, after publicly recognizing these dogmas, behaves as if he does not believe them, let him be punished by death. Next to, man is born free and is everywhere in chains, this last is the most famous sentence in the social contract. Taken literally, it would put to death any person acting as if he had no belief in God, heaven, or hell. Applied to the Paris of that time, it would have almost depopulated the capital. Rousseau's love of startling and absolute statements probably misled him into saying more than he meant. Perhaps he recalled the Diet of Augsburg of 1555, at which the signatory princes agreed that each of them should have the right to banish from his territory any person not accepting the prince's faith. Huius regio, eius religio, and the laws of Geneva, taken literally, as in the case of Servetus, provided an antecedent for Rousseau's sudden savagery. Ancient Athens had made Asabea, failure to recognize the official gods, a capital crime, as in exiling Anaxagoras and poisoning Socrates. The persecution of Christians by imperial Rome was similarly excused, and on Rousseau's penology the order for his arrest in this year 1762, could be described as an act of Christian charity. Was the social contract a revolutionary book? No and yes. Here and there, amid Rousseau's demand for a government responsible to the general will, some moments of caution calmed him, as when he wrote, None but the greatest dangers can counterbalance that of changing the public order, and the sacred power of the laws should never be arrested save when the existence of the country is at stake. He blamed private property for nearly all evils, but he called for its maintenance as made necessary by the incorrigible corruption of mankind. He wondered whether the nature of man would, after a revolution, reproduce old institutions and servitudes under new names. People accustomed to masters will not let mastery cease. Mistaking liberty for unchained license, they are delivered by their revolutions into the hands of seducers, who will only aggravate their chains." Nevertheless, his was the most revolutionary voice of the time. Though elsewhere he belittled and distrusted the masses, here his appeal was to the multitude. He knew that inequality is inevitable, but he condemned it with force and eloquence. He announced unequivocally that a government persistently contravening the general will might justly be overthrown. While Voltaire, Diderot, and D'Alembert were curtsying to kings or empresses, Rousseau raised against existing governments a cry of protest that was destined to be heard from one end of Europe to the other. While the philosophe, already embedded in the status quo, called only for piecemeal reform of particular ills, Jean-Jacques attacked the whole economic, social, and political order, and with such thoroughness that no remedy seemed possible but revolution. And he announced its coming. It is impossible that the great kingdoms of Europe should last much longer. Each of them has had its period of splendor, after which it must inevitably decline. The crisis is approaching. We are on the edge of a revolution. And beyond this he predicted far-reaching transformations. The empire of Russia will aspire to conquer Europe and will itself be conquered. The Tatars, its subjects or neighbors, will become its masters and ours by a revolution which I consider inevitable. The social contract, which in hindsight we perceive to have been the most revolutionary of Rousseau's works, made far less stir than La Nouvelle Héloise. France was ready for emotional release and romantic love, but it was not ready to discuss the overthrow of the monarchy. This book was the most sustained argument that Rousseau had yet produced, and it was not as easy to follow as the sparkling vivacities of Voltaire. Impressed by its later vogue, we are surprised to learn that its popularity and influence began after, not before, the Revolution. Even so, we find D'Alembert writing to Voltaire in 1762. It will not do to speak too loudly against Jean-Jacques or his book, 
for he is rather a king in the Al, that is, among the burly workers in the central market of Paris, and by implication among the populace. This was probably an exaggeration, but we may date from 1762 the turn of philosophy from attack upon Christianity to criticism of the state. Few books have ever aroused so much criticism. Voltaire marked his copy of Du Contrat Social with marginal rejoinders. So, on Rousseau's prescription of death for active unbelief, all coercion on dogma is abominable. Scholars have reminded us how old was the claim that sovereignty lies in the people. Marsilius of Padua, William of Ockham, even Catholic theologians like Bellarmine, Mariana, and Suarez had put forth that claim as a blow behind the knees of kings. It had appeared in the writings of George Buchanan, Grotius, Milton, Algernon Sidney, Locke, Pufendorf. The social contract, like nearly all of Rousseau's political and moral philosophy, is an echo and reflex of Geneva by a citizen distant enough to idealize it without feeling its claws. The book was an amalgam of Geneva and Sparta, of Calvin's Institutes and Plato's Laws. A hundred critics have pointed out the inconsistency between the individualism of Rousseau's discourses and the legalism of the social contract. Long before Rousseau's birth, Filmer, in Patriarcha, from 1642, had disposed of the notion that man is born free. He is born subject to paternal authority and to the laws and customs of his group. Rousseau himself, after that initial cry for freedom, moved further and further from liberty toward order towards submission of the individual to the general will. Basically, the contradictions in his works lay between his character and his thought. He was a rebel individualist by temperament, ailment, and lack of formal discipline. He was a communalist, never a communist, not even a collectivist, by his tardy perception that no operative society can be composed of mavericks. We must allow for development. A man's ideas are a function of his experience and his years. It is natural for a thinking person to be an individualist in youth, loving liberty and grasping for ideals, and a moderate in maturity, loving order and reconciled to the possible. Emotionally, Rousseau remained always a child, resenting conventions, prohibitions, laws. But when he reasoned, he came to realize that within the restrictions necessary for social order, many freedoms can remain and he ended by perceiving that in a community liberty is not the victim but the product of law, that it is enlarged rather than lessened by general obedience to restraints collectively self-imposed. Philosophical anarchists and political totalitarians alike can quote Rousseau to their purpose, and alike unjustly, for he recognized that order is freedom's first law, and the order that he spoke for was to be the expression of the general will. Rousseau denied any real contradictions in his philosophy. All my ideas are consistent, but I cannot expound them all at once. He admitted that his book needs rewriting, but I have neither the strength nor the time to do it. When he had the strength, persecution took away his time, and when persecution ceased and time was given, strength had been worn away. In those later years he grew doubtful of his own arguments. Those who pride themselves on thoroughly understanding the social contract are cleverer than I am. In practice, he quite ignored the principles he had there laid down. He never thought of applying them when asked to draw up constitutions for Poland or Corsica. Had he continued in the line of change that he followed after 1762, he would have ended in the arms of the aristocracy and the church, perhaps under the knife of the guillotine. 2. Emile 1. Education We can forgive much to an author who could, within fifteen months, send forth La Nouvelle Héloise, February 1761, The Social Contract, April 1762, and Émile, May 1762. All three were published in Amsterdam, but Émile was published also in Paris, with governmental permission secured at great risk by the kindly Malzerbe. Marc Michel Ray, the Amsterdam publisher, deserves a passing salute. Having made unexpected profits from Eloise, he settled upon Therese a life annuity of three hundred livres, and foreseeing a greater sale for Emile than for Du Contrat Social, which he had bought for a thousand livres, he paid Jean Jacques six thousand livres for the new and longer manuscript. 
The book originated partly from discussions with Madame de Pinay on the education of her son, and took its first form as a minor essay written to please a good mother who was able to think. Madame de Chenonceau, daughter of Madame Dupin, Rousseau thought of it as a sequel to La Nouvelle Héloise. How should Julie's children be brought up? For a moment he doubted whether a man who had sent all his children to a foundling asylum, and who had failed as a tutor in the Mabli family, was fit to talk on parentage and education. But as usual he found it pleasant to give his imagination free reign, unhampered by experience. He studied Montaigne's essays, Fenelon's Télémaque, Rollin's Traité des Études, and Locke's Some Thoughts on Education. His own first discourse was a challenge to him, for it had pictured man as good by nature, but spoiled by civilization, including education. Could that natural goodness be preserved and developed by right education? Helvetius had just given an affirmative answer in De l'Esprit of 1758, but he had presented an argument rather than a plan. Rousseau began by rejecting existing methods as teaching, usually by rote, worn-out and corrupt ideas, as trying to make the child an obedient automaton in a decaying society, as preventing the child from thinking and judging for himself, as deforming him into a mediocrity and brandishing platitudes and classic tags. Such schooling suppressed all natural impulses and made education a torture which every child longed to avoid. But education should be a happy process of natural unfolding, of learning from nature and experience, of freely developing one's capacities into full and zestful living. It should be the art of training men, the conscious guidance of the growing body to health, of the character to morality, of the mind to intelligence, of the feelings to self-control, sociability, and happiness. Rousseau would have wanted a system of public instruction by the state, but as public instruction was then directed by the church, he prescribed a private instruction by an unmarried tutor who would be paid to devote many years of his life to his pupil. The tutor should withdraw the child as much as possible from its parents and relatives, lest it be infected with the accumulated vices of civilization. Rousseau humanized his treatise by imagining himself entrusted with almost full authority over the rearing of a very malleable youth called Emile. It is quite incredible, but Rousseau managed to make these 450 pages the most interesting book ever written on education. When Kant picked up Emile, he became so absorbed that he forgot to take his daily walk. If nature is to be the tutor's guide, he will give the child as much freedom as safety will allow. He will begin by persuading the nurse to free the babe from swaddling clothes, for these impede its growth and the proper development of its limbs. Next, he will have the mother suckle her child instead of turning it over to a wet nurse. For the nurse may injure the child by harshness or neglect, or may earn from it by conscientious care the love that should naturally be directed to the mother as the first source and bond of family unity and moral order. Here Rousseau wrote lines that had an admirable effect upon the young mothers of the rising generation. Would you restore all men to their primal duties? Begin with the mother. The results will surprise you. Every evil follows in the train of this first sin. The mother whose children are out of sight wins scanty esteem. There is no home life. The ties of nature are not strengthened by those of habit. Fathers, mothers, brothers, and sisters cease to exist. They are almost strangers. How should they love one another? Each thinks of himself. But when mothers deign to nurse their own children, there will be a reform in morals. Natural feeling will revive in every heart. There will be no lack of citizens for the state. This first step will by itself restore mutual affection. The charms of home are the best antidote of vice. This book is continued on Cassette 8, Side 1. The Story of Civilization, Volume 10, Rousseau and Revolution, by Will and Ariel Durant. Part 1, Continued, Cassette 8, Side 1. The charms of home are the best antidote of vice. The noisy play of children, which we thought so trying, becomes a delight. Mother and father grow dearer to each other, 
the marriage tie is strengthened. Thus the cure of this one evil would work a widespread reformation. Nature would regain her rights. When women become good mothers, men will become good husbands and fathers. These famous paragraphs made breastfeeding by mothers part of the change in manners that began in the final decade of Louis XV's reign. Buffon had issued a similar appeal a decade before, but it had not reached the women of France. Now the fairest breasts in Paris made their debut as organs of maternity as well as bewitchments of sex. Rousseau divided the educational career of his pupil into three periods, twelve years of childhood, eight of youth, and an indeterminate age of preparation for marriage and parentage for economic and social life. In the first period, education is to be almost entirely physical and moral. Books and book learning, even religion, must await the development of the mind. Till he is twelve, Emile will not know a word of history and will hardly have heard any mention of God. Education of the body must come first, so Emile is brought up in the country as the only place where life can be healthy and natural. Men are not made to be crowded together in anthills, but scattered over the earth to till it. The more they are massed together, the more corrupt they become. Disease and vice are the sure results of overcrowded cities. Man's breath is fatal to his fellows. Man is devoured by our towns. In a few generations the race dies out or becomes degenerate. It needs renewal, and is always renewed from the country. Send your children out to renew themselves. Send them to regain in the open field the strength lost in the foul air of our crowded cities. Encourage the boy to love nature and the outdoors, to develop habits of simplicity, to live on natural foods. Is there any food more delectable than that which has been grown in one's own garden? A vegetarian diet is the most wholesome and leads to the least ailments. The indifference of children toward meat is one proof that the taste for meat is unnatural. Their preferences for vegetable foods, milk, pastry, fruit, etc. Beware of changing this natural taste and making your children flesh-eaters. Do this, if not for their health, then for the sake of their character. How can we explain away the fact that great meat-eaters are usually fiercer and more cruel than other men? After proper food, good habits. Emile is to be taught to rise early. We saw the sun rise in midsummer. We shall see it rise at Christmas. We are no liabeds. We enjoy the cold. Emile washes often, and as he grows stronger, he reduces the warmth of the water, till at last he bathes winter and summer in cold, even in ice water. To avoid risk, this change is slow, gradual, imperceptible. He rarely uses any headgear, and he goes barefoot all the year round except when leaving his house and garden. Children should be accustomed to cold rather than heat. Great cold never does them any harm if they are exposed to it soon enough. Encourage the child's natural liking for activity. Don't make him sit still when he wants to run about, nor run when he wants to be quiet. Let him run, jump, and shout to his heart's content. Keep doctors away from him as long as you can. Let him learn by action rather than by books or even by teaching. Let him do things himself. Just give him materials and tools. The clever teacher will arrange problems and tasks and will let his pupil learn by hitting a thumb and stubbing a toe. He will guard him from serious injury but not from educative pains. Nature is the best guide and should be followed this side of such injury. Let us lay it down as an incontrovertible rule that the first impulses of nature are always right. There is no original sin in the human heart. Never punish your pupil, for he does not know what it means to do wrong. Never make him say, Forgive me. Wholly unmoral in his actions, he can do nothing morally wrong, and he deserves neither punishment nor reproof. First leave the germ of his character free to show itself. Do not constrain him in anything so you will better see him as he really is. However, he will need moral education. Without it, he will be dangerous and miserable. But don't preach. If you want your pupil to learn justice and kindness, be yourself just and kind, and he will imitate you. Example, example. Without it, you will never succeed in teaching children anything. Here, too, you can find a natural basis. 
Both goodness and wickedness, from the viewpoint of society, are innate in man. Education must encourage the good and discourage the bad. Self-love is universal, but it can be modified until it sends a man into mortal peril to preserve his family, his country, or his honor. There are social instincts that preserve the family and the group, as well as egoistic instincts that preserve the individual. Sympathy, pitié, may be derived from self-love, as when we love the parents who nourish and protect us, but it can flower into many forms of social behavior and mutual aid. Hence, some kind of conscience seems universal and innate. Cast your eyes over every nation of the world, peruse every volume of its history. Amid all these strange and cruel forms of worship, in this amazing variety of manners and customs, you will everywhere find the same basic ideas of good and evil. There is, at the bottom of our hearts, an inborn principle of justice and virtue by which, despite our maxims, we judge our own actions or those of others to be good or evil, and it is this principle that we call conscience. Whereupon Rousseau breaks out into an apostrophe which we shall find almost literally echoed in Kant. Conscience! Conscience! Divine instinct! Immortal voice from heaven! Sure guide of a creature ignorant and finite indeed, yet intelligent and free, infallible, judge of good and evil, making man like to God. In thee consists the excellence of man's nature and the morality of his actions. Apart from thee I find nothing in myself to raise me above the beasts, nothing but the sad privilege of wandering from one error to another by the help of an unbridled intellect and reason which knows no principle. So intellectual education must come only after the formation of moral character. Rousseau laughs at Locke's advice to reason with children. Those children who have been constantly reasoned with strike me as exceptionally silly. Of all human faculties, reason is the last and choicest growth. And you would use this for the child's early training? To make a man reasonable is the coping stone of a good education, and yet you profess to train a child through his reason. You begin at the wrong end. No, we must rather retard mental education. Keep the child's mind, meaning intellect, idle as long as you can. If he has opinions before he is twelve, you may be sure they will be absurd. And don't bother him yet with science. This is an endless chase in which everything that we discover merely adds to our ignorance and our foolish pride. Let your pupil learn by experience the life and workings of nature. Let him enjoy the stars without pretending to trace their history. At the age of twelve, intellectual education may begin, and Emile may read a few books. He may make a transition from nature to literature by reading Robinson Crusoe, for that is the story of a man who, on his island, went through the various stages through which men passed from savagery to civilization. But by the age of twenty, Emile will not have read many books. He will quite ignore the salons and the philosophes. He will not bother with the arts, for the only true beauty is in nature. He will never be a musician, an actor, or an author. Rather, he will have acquired sufficient skill in some trade to earn his living with his hands, if that should ever be necessary. Many a tradeless émigré, thirty years later, would regret having laughed, as Voltaire did, at Rousseau's gentilhomme menuisier, gentleman carpenter. In any case, Emile, though he is heir to a modest fortune, must serve society either manually or mentally. The man who eats in idleness what he has not earned is a thief. 2. Religion Finally, when Emile is about eighteen, we may talk to him about God. I am aware that many of my readers will be surprised to find me tracing the course of my scholar through his early years without speaking to him of religion. At fifteen he will not even know that he has a soul. At eighteen he may not yet be ready to learn about it. If I had to depict the most heartbreaking stupidity, I would paint a pedant teaching children the catechism. If I wanted to drive a child crazy, I would set him to explain what he learned in his catechism. No doubt there is not a moment to be lost if we must deserve eternal salvation, 
but if the repetition of certain words suffices to obtain it, I do not see why we should not people heaven with starlings and magpies as well as with children. Despite this proclamation, which infuriated the Archbishop of Paris, Rousseau now aimed his sharpest shafts at the philosophe. Picture Voltaire or Diderot reading this. I consulted the philosophe. I found them all alike proud, assertive, dogmatic, professing, even in their so-called skepticism, to know everything, proving nothing, scoffing at one another. This last trait struck me as the only point in which they were right. Braggarts in attack, they are weaklings in defense. Weigh their arguments, they are all destructive. Count their voices, each speaks for himself alone. There is not one of them who, if he chanced to discover the difference between falsehood and truth, would not prefer his own lie to the truth which another had discovered. Where is the philosophe who would not deceive the whole world for his own glory? While he continued to condemn intolerance, Rousseau, reversing Bale, denounced atheism as more dangerous than fanaticism. He offered to his readers a profession of faith, by which he hoped to turn the tide from the atheism of Dolbach, Helvetius, and Diderot, back to belief in God, free will, and immortality. He remembered the two abbés, Gim and Gatier, whom he had met in his youth. He welded them into an imaginary vicar in Savoy and he put into the mouth of this village curé the feelings and arguments that justified, in Rousseau's view, a return to religion. The vicaire Savoyard is pictured as the priest of a small parish in the Italian Alps. He privately admits to some skepticism. He doubts the divine inspiration of the prophets, the miracles of the apostles and the saints, and the authenticity of the gospels. And like Hume, he asks... Who will venture to tell me how many eyewitnesses are required to make a miracle credible? He rejects petitional prayer. Our prayers should be hymns to the glory of God and expressions of submission to His will. Many items in the Catholic creed seem to him to be superstition or mythology. Nevertheless, he feels that he can best serve his people by saying nothing of his doubts and practicing kindness and charity to all, believers and unbelievers alike, and performing faithfully all the ritual of the Roman Church. Virtue is necessary to happiness. Belief in God, free will, heaven and hell is necessary to virtue. Religions, despite their crimes, have made men and women more virtuous, at least less cruel and villainous, than they might otherwise have been. When these religions preach doctrines that seem unreasonable or weary us with ceremony, we should silence our doubts for the sake of the group. Even from the standpoint of philosophy, religion is essentially right. The vicar begins like Descartes. I exist, and I have senses through which I receive impressions. This is the first work that strikes me, and I am forced to accept it. He makes short work of Barclay. The cause of my sensations is outside of me, for they affect me whether I have any reason for them or not. They are produced and destroyed independently of me. Thus other entities exist besides myself. A third step answers Hume and anticipates Kant. I find that I have the power of comparing my sensations, so I am endowed with an active force for dealing with experience. This mind cannot be interpreted as a form of matter. There is no sign of a material or mechanical process in the act of thought. How an immaterial mind can act upon a material body is beyond our understanding, but it is a fact immediately perceived, and not to be denied for the sake of some abstract reasoning. Philosophers must learn to recognize that something may be true even if they cannot understand it, and especially when it is, of all truths, the one most immediately perceived. The next step, the vicar admits, is mere reasoning. I do not perceive God, but I reason that just as in my voluntary actions there is a mind as the perceived cause of motion, so there is probably a cosmic mind behind the motions of the universe. God is unknowable, but I feel that He is there and everywhere. I see design in a thousand instances, from the structure of my eyes to the movements of the stars. I should no more think of attributing to chance, however often multiplied, 
a la Diderot, the adjustment of means to ends in living organisms and the system of the world, then I would ascribe to chance the delectable assemblage of letters in printing the Aeneid. If there is an intelligent deity behind the marvels of the universe, it is incredible that he will allow justice to be permanently defeated. If only to avoid the desolating belief in the victory of evil, I must believe in a good God assuring the triumph of good. Therefore I must believe in an afterlife, in a heaven of reward for virtue. And though I am revolted by the idea of hell, and would rather believe that the wicked suffer hell in their own hearts, yet I will accept even that awful doctrine if it is necessary for controlling the evil impulses of mankind. In that case I would implore God not to make the pains of hell everlasting. Hence the doctrine of purgatory as a place of abbreviable punishment for all but the most persistent and unrepentant sinners is more humane than the division of all the dead between the forever blessed and the eternally damned. Granted that we cannot prove the existence of heaven, how cruel it is to take from people this hope that solaces them in their grief and sustains them in their defeats. Without belief in God and an afterlife, morality is imperiled and life is meaningless, for in an atheistic philosophy life is a mechanical accident passing through a thousand sufferings to an agonizing and eternal death. Consequently, we must accept religion as, all in all, a vital boon to mankind. Nor need we make much account of the different sects into which Christianity has been torn. They are all good if they improve conduct and nourish hope. It is ridiculous and indecent to suppose that those who have other creeds, gods, and sacred scriptures than our own will be damned. If there were but one religion on earth, and all beyond its pale were condemned to eternal punishment, the god of that religion would be the most unjust and cruel of tyrants. So Emile will not be taught any particular form of Christianity— but we will give him the means to choose for himself according to the right use of his reason. The best way is to continue in the religion that we inherited from our parents or our community. And to Rousseau himself, his imaginary vicar's counsel is, return to your own country, go back to the religion of your fathers, follow it in sincerity of heart and never forsake it. It is very simple and very holy. In no other religion is the morality purer, or the doctrine more satisfying to reason. Rousseau, in 1754, had anticipated this council, had returned to Geneva and its creed. However, he had not kept his promise to come and dwell there after settling his affairs in France. In the letters from the mountain, which he wrote ten years later, he repudiated, as we shall see, most of the faith of his fathers. In his final decade we shall find him advising religion to others, but giving hardly any sign of religious belief or practice in his daily life. Protestants and Catholics, Calvinists and Jesuits, joined in attacking him and his vicarious profession of faith as essentially unchristian. The education he proposed for Emile shocked Christian readers as in effect irreligious, for they suspected that an average youth brought up to no religion would not adopt one later except for social convenience. Despite his formal acceptance of Calvinism, Rousseau rejected the doctrine of original sin and the redemptive role of the death of Christ. He refused to accept the Old Testament as the word of God and thought the New Testament full of incredible things, things repugnant to reason. But he loved the Gospels as the most moving and inspiring of all books. Can a book at once so grand and so simple be the work of men? Is it possible that he whose history is contained therein is no more than a man? What gentleness and purity in his actions! What a touching grace in his teachings! How lofty are his sayings! How profoundly wise are his sermons! How just and discriminating are his replies! What man, what sage, can live, suffer, and die without weakness or ostentation? If the life and death of Socrates are those of a philosopher, the life and death of Christ are those of a god. 3. Love and Marriage When Rousseau ended the fifty pages of the Savoyard Vicar and turned back to Emile, he faced the problems of sex and marriage. Should he tell his pupil about sex? Not till he asks about it, then tell him the truth. 
but do everything consistent with truth and health to retard sexual consciousness. In any case, don't stimulate it. When the critical age approaches, present to young people such spectacles as will restrain rather than excite them sexually. Remove them from great cities where the flaunted attire and boldness of the women hasten and anticipate the promptings of nature, where everything offers to their view pleasures of which they should know nothing till they are of an age to choose for themselves. If their taste for the arts keeps them in town, guard them from a dangerous idleness. Choose carefully their company, their occupations, and their pleasures. Show them nothing but modest and pathetic pictures, and nourish their sensibility without stimulating their senses. Rousseau worried about the dire results of a practice about which he seems to have had first-hand experience. Never leave the young man day or night, and at least share his room. Never let him go to bed till he is sleepy, and let him rise as soon as he wakes. If once he acquires this dangerous habit, he is ruined. From that time forward, body and soul will be enervated. He will carry to the grave the effects of the most fatal habit which a young man can acquire. And he lays down the law to his pupil. If you cannot master your passions, dear Emile, I pity you, but I shall not hesitate for a moment. I will not permit the purposes of nature to be evaded. If you must be a slave, I prefer to surrender you to a tyrant from whom I may deliver you. Whatever happens, I can free you more easily from slavery to women than from yourself. But don't let your associates tease you into a brothel. Why do these young men want to persuade you? Because they wish to seduce you. Their only motive is a secret spite because they see you are better than they are. They want to drag you down to their level. It is better to marry. But whom? The tutor describes his ideal of a girl, a woman, and a wife, and strives to imprint that ideal upon Emile's mind as a guide and a goal in searching for a mate. Rousseau feared masculine, domineering, immodest women. He saw the fall of civilization in the rule of increasingly masculine women over increasingly feminine men. In every land, the men are the sort that the women make them. Restore women to womanhood, and we shall be men again. The women of Paris usurp the rights of one sex without wishing to renounce those of the other. Consequently, they possess none in their fullness. They do these things better in Protestant countries, where modesty is not a jest among sophists, but a promise of faithful motherhood. A woman's place is in the home, as among the ancient Greeks. She should accept her husband as a master, but in the home she should be supreme. In that way, the health of the race will be preserved. The education of girls should aim to produce such women. They should be educated at home by their mothers. They should learn all the arts of the home, from cooking to embroidery. They should get much religion, and as early as possible, for this will help them to modesty, virtue, and obedience. A daughter should accept without question the religion of her mother, but a wife should accept the religion of her husband. In any case, let her avoid philosophy and scorn to be a salonniere. However, a girl should not be suppressed into a dull timidity. She should be lively, merry, and eager. She should sing and dance to her heart's content, and enjoy all the innocent pleasures of youth. Let her go to balls and sports, even to theatres, under proper supervision and in good company. Her mind should be kept active and alert if she is ever to be a fit wife for a thinking man, and she may be allowed a certain amount of coquetry as part of the complex game by which she tests her suitors and chooses her mate. The proper study of womankind is man. When this ideal of girlhood and womanhood has been fixed in Emile's hopes, he may go out and seek a mate. He, not his parents or his tutor, shall make the choice, but he owes it to them and to their loving care of him through many years to consult them respectfully. You wish to go to the big city and look at the girls who are on display there? Very well. We shall go to Paris. You will see for yourself what these exciting demoiselles are. So Emile lives in Paris a while, mingles in society, but he finds there no girl of the kind his sly tutor has described. Then farewell, Paris, far-famed Paris, with all your noise and smoke and dirt, where the women have ceased to believe in honor and the men in virtue. We are in search of love, happiness, and innocence. The farther we go from Paris, the better. 
and so tutor and pupil are back in the country, and lo, in a quiet hamlet far from the madding crowd, they come upon Sophie. Here, in Book Five, Rousseau's treatise becomes a love story, idealized but delightful, and told with the skill of an accomplished writer. After those long discourses on education, politics, and religion, he returns to romance, and while Thérèse is busy with housework, he resumes his dreams of that gentle woman whom he has found only in scattered moments of his wanderings, and he names her from his latest flame. This new Sophie is the daughter of a once prosperous gentleman who now lives in contented retirement and simplicity. She is healthy, lovely, modest, tender, and useful. She helps her mother with quick and quiet competence in everything. There is nothing that she cannot do with her needle. Emile finds reason to come again, and she finds reason for his further visits. Gradually it dawns upon him that Sophie has all the qualities that his tutor pictured as ideal. What a divine coincidence! After several weeks he reaches the dizzy height of kissing the hem of her garment. More weeks and they are betrothed. Rousseau insists that this shall be a formal and solemn ceremony. Every measure must be taken, by ritual and elsewise, to exalt and fix in the memory the sanctity of the marriage bond. Then, when Emile trembles on the edge of bliss, the incredible tutor, throwing liberty and nature to the winds, makes him leave his betrothed for two years of absence and travel to test their affection and fidelity. Emile weeps and obeys. When he returns, still miraculously virginal, he finds Sophie dutifully intact. They marry, and the tutor instructs them on their duties to each other. He bids Sophie be obedient to her husband, except in bed and board. You will long rule him by love if you make your favors scarce and precious. Let Emile honor his wife's chastity without complaining of her coldness. The book concludes with a triune victory. One morning Emile enters my room and embraces me, saying, My master, congratulate your son. He hopes soon to have the honor of being a father. What a responsibility will be ours! How much we shall need you! Yet God forbid that I should let you educate the son as well as the father. God forbid that so sweet and holy a task should be fulfilled by anyone but myself. But continue to be the teacher of the young teachers. Advise and control us. We shall be easily led. As long as I live I shall need you. You have done your duty. Teach me to follow your example while you enjoy the leisure you have earned so well. After two centuries of laudation, ridicule, and experiment, the world is generally agreed that Emile is beautiful, suggestive, and impossible. Education is a dull subject, for we remember it with pain, we do not care to hear about it, and we resent any further imposition of it after we have served our time at school. Yet of this forbidding topic Rousseau made a charming romance— the simple, direct, personal style captivates us despite some flowery exaltations. We are drawn along and surrender ourselves to the omniscient tutor, though we should hesitate to surrender our sons. Having extolled maternal care and family life, Rousseau takes Emile from his parents and brings him up in antiseptic isolation from the society in which he must later live. Never having brought up children, he does not know that the average child is by nature a jealous, acquisitive, domineering little thief. If we wait till he learns discipline without commandments and industry without instruction, he will graduate into an indolent, shiftless, and anarchic misfit, unwashed, unkempt, and unbearable. And where shall we find tutors willing to give twenty years to educating one child? That kind of care and attention, said Madame de Stal in 1810, would compel every man to devote his whole life to the education of another being, and only grandfathers would at last be freed to attend to their own careers. Probably Rousseau recognized these and other difficulties after he recovered from the ecstasy of composition. At Strasbourg in 1765, an enthusiast came to him bursting with compliments. You see, sir, a man who brings up his sons on the principles which he had the happiness to learn from your Emile. So much the worse, sir, for you and your son, growled Rousseau. In the fifth of his Letters from the Mountain, he explained that he had written the book not for ordinary parents, but for sages. I made clear in the preface that my concern was rather to offer the plan of a new system of education for the consideration of sages, and not a method for fathers and mothers. 
Like his master Plato, he took the child away from the contagion of his parents in the hope that the child, graduating from a saving education, would then be fit to rear his own children. And like Plato, he laid up in heaven a pattern of a perfect state or method, so that he who desires may behold it, and beholding may govern himself accordingly. He announced his dream and trusted that somewhere, to some men and women, it would carry inspiration and make for betterment. It did. Chapter 8 Rousseau Outcast, 1762-67 1. Flight It is remarkable that a book containing, as did a meal, so open an attack upon all but the fundamentals of Christianity, should have passed the censor and been printed in France. But the censor was the tolerant and sympathetic Malzherbe. Before allowing publication, he urged Rousseau to delete some passages that would almost certainly rouse the Church to active hostility. Rousseau refused. Other heretics had escaped personal prosecution by using pseudonyms, but Rousseau bravely stated his authorship on the title pages of his books. While the philosophe denounced Emile as further treason to philosophy, the prelates of France and the magistrates of Paris and Geneva condemned it as apostasy from Christianity. The anti-Jansenist Archbishop of Paris prepared for August 1762 a powerful mandement against the book. The pro-Jansenist Parlement of Paris was engaged in expelling the Jesuits. It wished, nevertheless, to display its zeal for Catholicism. The appearance of Emile offered an opportunity to strike a blow for the Church. The Council of State, at war with the Parlement, and unwilling to lag behind it in zeal for orthodoxy, proposed to arrest Rousseau. Getting wind of this, his aristocratic friends advised him to leave France at once. On June 8th, Madame de Crequy sent him an excited message. It is only too true that an order has been issued for your arrest. In the name of God, go away. The burning of your book will do no harm, but your person cannot stand imprisonment. Consult your neighbors. The neighbors were the Maréchal and Maréchal de Luxembourg. They feared involvement if Rousseau were arrested. They and the Prince de Conti urged him to flee and gave him funds and a carriage for the long ride across France to Switzerland. He yielded reluctantly. He commended Thérèse to the Maréchal's care and left Montmorency on June 9th. On that day, a decree was issued for Rousseau's arrest, but it was executed with merciful tardiness, for many in the government were glad to let him escape. On that same day, Maître Omer Joly de Fleury, brandishing a copy of Émile, told the Parlement of Paris that this work appears to have been composed solely with the aim of reducing everything to natural religion and of developing that criminal system in the author's plan for the education of his pupil that he regards all religions as equally good and as all having their reasons in the climate, the government, and the character of the people, that in consequence he dares seek to destroy the truth of sacred scripture and the prophecies, the certitude of the miracles described in the holy books, the infallibility of revelation, and the authority of the church. He ridicules and blasphemes the Christian religion, which alone has God for its author. The author of this book, who has had the boldness to sign his name to it, should be arrested as soon as possible. It is important that justice should make an example with all severity, both of the author and of those who have shared in printing or distributing such a work. Thereupon the Parlement ordered that the said book shall be torn and burned in the court of the Palace of Justice, at the foot of the Grand Staircase, by the High Executioner. All those who have copies of the book shall deliver them to the register to be destroyed. No publisher shall print or sell or distribute this book. All sellers or distributors thereof shall be arrested and punished according to the rigor of the law. And J. J. Rousseau shall be apprehended and brought to the conciergerie prison of the palace. On June 11th, Emile was torn and burned as ordered, but by June 11th, Rousseau had reached Switzerland. The moment I was in the territory of Bern, I bade the postilion stop. I got out of my carriage, prostrated myself, kissed the ground, and exclaimed in a transport of joy, Heaven, protector of virtue, be praised. I touch a land of liberty. He was not quite sure. 
He drove on to Yverdon, near the south end of the lake of Neuchâtel, in the canton of Bern. There he stayed for a month with his old friend Rogan. Should he seek a home in Geneva? But on June 19th, the Council of Twenty-Five, ruling Geneva, condemned both Emile and the social contract as impious, scandalous, bold, full of blasphemies and calumnies against religion. Under the appearance of doubts, the author has assembled everything that could tend to sap, shake, and destroy the principal foundations of the revealed Christian religion. These books are so much the more dangerous and reprehensible as they are written in French, not in esoteric Latin, in the most seductive style, and appear over the name of Citizen of Geneva. Accordingly, the council ordered both books to be burned, prohibited their sale, and decreed a rest for Rousseau should he ever enter the territory of the Republic. The Genevan clergy made no protest against this repudiation of Geneva's most famous living son. Doubtless they feared that any sympathy shown by them to the author of the Savoyard Vicar's Profession of Faith would confirm d'Alembert's revelation of their secret Unitarian sentiments. Jacob Bern, Rousseau's friend of many years, turned against him and demanded a retraction. If, Rousseau recalled, there was any rumor amongst the populace, it was unfavorable to me, and I was publicly treated by all the gossips and pedants like a pupil threatened with a flogging for not having recited his catechism rightly. Voltaire was touched by the situation of his rival. He had read Emile. His comments can still be seen on his copy in the Bibliothèque de Genève. In a letter of June 15th, he had written of the book, It is a hodgepodge of a silly wet nurse in four volumes, with forty pages against Christianity, among the boldest ever known. He says as many hurtful things against the philosophers as against Jesus Christ, but the philosophers will be more indulgent than the priests. In any case, he admired the profession of faith. Fifty good pages, he called them, but added, It is regrettable that they should have been written by such a knave. To Madame du Deffant he wrote, I shall always love the author of the Vicaire Savoyard, whatever he has done and whatever he may do. When he heard that Jean-Jacques was homeless, he cried out, Let him come here, to Pernay. He must come. I shall receive him with open arms. He shall be master here more than I. I shall treat him like my own son. He sent this invitation to seven different addresses. It must have reached one address, for Rousseau later expressed regret that he had made no reply. In 1763, Voltaire renewed the invitation. Rousseau declined it, and accused Voltaire of having incited the Council of Twenty-Five to condemn the social contract and a meal. Voltaire denied this, apparently with truth. Early in July 1762, the Senate of Bern notified Rousseau that it could not tolerate his presence on Bernese soil. He must leave it within fifteen days or face imprisonment. Meanwhile, he received a kindly note from d'Alembert advising him to seek domicile in the Principality of Neuchâtel. This was under the jurisdiction of Frederick the Great, and was governed by Earl Maréchal George Keith, who, said d'Alembert, would receive and treat you as the patriarchs of the Old Testament received and treated persecuted virtue. Rousseau hesitated, for he had spoken critically of Frederick as a tyrant in philosophic disguise. Nevertheless, on July 10th, 1762, he accepted the invitation of Rogan's niece, Madame de la Tour, to occupy a house belonging to her in Motier Travers, fifteen miles southwest of the city of Neuchâtel, in what Boswell was to describe as a beautiful wild valley surrounded by immense mountains. About July 11th, Jean-Jacques appealed to the governor and, with characteristic humility and pride, wrote to the King of Prussia, I have said a good deal that is bad about you. I shall probably say more such things. However, chased from France, from Geneva, from the canton of Bern, I have come to seek an asylum in your states. Sir, I have not merited grace from you, and I do not ask any, but I have felt that I ought to declare to your majesty that I am in your power, and that I have willed to be so. Your majesty may dispose of me as you like. At an uncertain date, Frederick, still in the Seven Years' War, wrote to Keith, We must succor this poor unfortunate. His only offense is to have strange opinions, which he thinks are good ones. I will send a hundred crowns, from which you will be kind enough to give him as much as he needs. 
I think he will accept them in kind more readily than in cash. If we were not at war, if we were not ruined, I would build him a hermitage with a garden where he could live as I believe our first fathers did. I think poor Rousseau has missed his vocation. He was obviously born to be a famous anchorite, the Desert Father, celebrated for his austerities and flagellations. I conclude that the morals of your savage are as pure as his mind is illogical. The Marichal, whom Rousseau speaks of as a gaunt, aged, absent-minded saint, sent him provisions, coal, and wood, and proposed to build me a little house. Jean-Jacques interpreted this offer as coming from Frederick and refused it, but from that moment I became so sincerely attached to him that I interested myself as much in his glory as until then I had thought his successes unjust. On November 1st, as the war was nearing its end, he wrote to Frederick prescribing the tasks of peace. Sire, you are my protector and my benefactor, and I have a heart made for gratitude. I want to acquit myself with you if I can. You want to give me bread. Is there none of your subjects who lacks it? Take away from before my eyes that sword that flashes and wounds me. The career of kings of your metal is great, and you are still far from your time. But time is pressing. There is not a moment left you to lose. Can you resolve to die without having been the greatest of men? Could I ever be permitted to see Frederick the Just and Feared cover his states at last with a happy people whose father he would be, then Jean-Jacques Rousseau, the enemy of kings, would go to die of joy at the foot of his throne. Frederick made no known answer, but when Keith went to Berlin, the king told him he had received a scolding from Rousseau. Apparently assured of a home, Jean-Jacques sent for Thérèse to join him. He was not certain that she would come, for he had long perceived her affection to grow colder. He ascribed this to his having ceased to have sexual relations with her, since a connection with women was prejudicial to my health. Perhaps now she would prefer Paris to Switzerland. But she came. They had a tearful reunion, and looked forward at last to some years of peace. 2. Rousseau and the Archbishop Their next four years were their unhappiest. The Calvinist clergy of Neuchâtel publicly denounced Rousseau as a heretic, and the magistrates forbade the sale of Émile, perhaps to appease them, or in sincere desire to follow the precepts of his vicar. Rousseau asked the pastor at Motier might he join the congregation. Thérèse remained Catholic. He was accepted, attended worship, and received communion, with an emotion of heart and my eyes suffused with tears of tenderness. He gave a handle to ridicule by adopting Armenian costume, fur bonnet, caftan, and girdle. The long robe allowed him to conceal the effects of his urinary obstruction. He attended church in this garb and wore it in visiting Lord Keith, who made no comment upon it except to wish him salam aleikum. He continued to add to his income by copying music. Now he added needlework and learned to make lace. Like the women, I carried my cushion with me when I made visits or sat down to work at my door. This enabled me to pass my time with my female neighbors without weariness. Probably about this time, late 1762, his publishers prevailed upon him to begin writing his confessions. He had forsworn authorship, but this would not be authorship so much as a defense of his character and conduct against a world of enemies and especially against charges of the philosophes and the gossip of the salons. Furthermore, he had to answer a great variety of correspondence. Women especially offered him the consoling incense of their adoration, and not only because of their sympathy with the hunted author of a famous romance, but because they longed to revert to religion, and saw in the Savoyard vicar and his creator no real foe of faith, but its brave champion against a desolating atheism. For such women and several men he became a father confessor, a director of souls and consciences. He advised them to remain in or return to the religion of their youth, regardless of all the difficulties that science and philosophy had suggested. Those incredibilities were not of the essence and might be silently put aside. What mattered was trust in God and immortality. With that faith and hope one could rise above all the unintelligible disasters of nature, all the pains and griefs of life. A young Catholic in rebellion against his religion asked for sympathy. Rousseau, forgetting his own rebellions, told him not to make so much ado about incidentals. 
If I had been born Catholic, I would have remained Catholic, knowing well that your church puts a very salutary restraint upon the wanderings of human reason, which finds neither bottom nor bank when it would sound the abysses of things. To nearly all these suitors for wisdom, he advised a flight from the city to the country, from artifice and complexity to a natural simplicity of life, and a modest contentment with marriage and parenthood. Women who had been shocked by worldly priests and agnostic abbés fell in love, if only through correspondence, with this The Story of Civilization, Volume 10, Rousseau and Revolution, by Will and Ariel Durant. Part 1. Continued. Cassette 8, Side 2. Women who had been shocked by worldly priests and agnostic abbés fell in love, if only through correspondence, with this unworldly heretic whom all the churches denounced. Madame de Blot, titled and respected, exclaimed to a company of lords and ladies, Only the loftiest virtue could keep a woman of true sensibility from devoting her life to Rousseau, if she were certain he would love her passionately. Madame de Latour mistook some compliments in his letters for an avowal of love. She responded tenderly, warmly, effusively. She sent him her portrait, protesting that it did not do her justice. She grew despondent when he replied with the calmness of a man who had never seen her. Yet other worshippers wished to kiss the ground he walked on. Some raised altars to him in their hearts. Some called him the reborn Christ. At times he took them seriously— and thought of himself as the crucified founder of a new faith. Amid these exaltations, as if to confirm the analogy, a high priest of the temple aroused the people to condemn him as a dangerous revolutionary. On August 20th, 1762, Christophe de Beaumont, Archbishop of Paris, issued a mandate to all priests in his diocese to read to their congregations and to publish to the world his twenty-nine-page denunciation of Émile. He was a man of rigorous orthodoxy and saintly repute. He had fought against the Jansenists, the Encyclopédie, and the Philosophe. Now it seemed to him that Rousseau, after apparently breaking away from the infidels, had joined them in attacking the faith upon which, in the archbishop's view, rested the whole social order and moral life of France. He began by quoting St. Paul's second epistle to Timothy, there will come perilous days of men enamored of themselves, bold and proud blasphemers, impious calumniators, swollen with arrogance, lovers of pleasure rather than God, men corrupt in spirit and perverse in faith. Surely those times had come. Unbelief, emboldened by all the passions, presents itself under every form to adapt itself in some way to all ages, characters, and degrees. Sometimes it borrows a style light, agreeable, and frivolous. Hence so many tales, as obscene as they are impious, Voltaire's Roman, amusing the imagination as a means of seducing the mind and corrupting the heart. Sometimes, affecting profundity and sublimity in its views, it pretends to go back to the first principles of knowledge and to assume divine authority in order to throw off a yoke which, they say, dishonors mankind. Sometimes it declaims like a raging woman against religious zeal, and yet with enthusiasm preaches universal toleration. And sometimes, uniting all these diverse manners of speech, it mixes the serious with the playful, pure maxims with obscenities, great truths with great errors, the faith with blasphemy. In a word, it undertakes to reconcile light with darkness, Jesus Christ with Belial. This, said the archbishop, was especially the method of Emile, a book full of the language of philosophy without being truly philosophy, replete with bits of knowledge which have not enlightened the author and must only confuse his readers. A man given to paradoxes of opinions and conduct, a lying simplicity of manners with pomp of thought, ancient maxims with a madness of innovation, the obscurity of his retreat with the desire to be known by all the world. He denounces the sciences and cultivates them. He praises the excellence of the gospel and destroys its teachings. He has made himself the preceptor of the human race to deceive it, the monitor of the public to mislead the world, the oracle of the century to destroy it. What an enterprise! The archbishop was appalled by Rousseau's proposal to make no mention of God or religion to Emile before the age of twelve or even eighteen. So then... 
all nature would in vain have declared the glory of their Creator, and all moral instruction would forfeit the support of religious faith. But man is not by nature good, as the author supposed. He is born with the taint of original sin. He shares in the general corruption of humanity. The wise educator, best of all a priest guided by divine grace, will use every just means to nourish the good impulses in men and to weed out the evil. Therefore he will feed the child with the spiritual milk of religion, that it may grow toward salvation. Only by such education can the child develop into a sincere worshipper of the true God and a faithful subject of the sovereign. So much sin and crime survive even this assiduous instruction. Imagine what they would be without it. A torrent of wickedness would engulf us. For these reasons, concluded the archbishop, after having consulted several persons distinguished for their piety and wisdom and having invoked the holy name of God, we condemn the said book as containing an abominable doctrine subversive of natural law and the foundations of the Christian religion, as establishing principles contrary to the moral teaching of the Gospels, as tending to disturb the peace of states and lead the revolt against the authority of the sovereign, as containing a very great number of propositions false, scandalous, full of hatred against the Church and her ministers. Therefore we expressly forbid each and every person in our diocese to read or keep the said book under the penalties of the law. This mandate was printed with the privilege of the king, and soon reached Moitié Travers. Rousseau, always resolving to write no more, decided to reply. Before he put down his pen, on November 18, 1762, he had let his answer run to a hundred and twenty-eight pages. It was printed at Amsterdam in March 1763 as Jean-Jacques Rousseau, citoyen de Genève, a Christophe de Beaumont, archéchef de Paris. It was soon condemned by the Parlement of Paris and the Council of Geneva. Attacked by both the leading religions of Europe, Rousseau retaliated by assailing them both. Now the shy romantic who had disowned the philosophe repeated their arguments with reckless audacity. He opened with a question that all opponents in the unending debate still ask of each other. Why must I say anything to you, Monseigneur? What common language can we speak? How can we understand each other? He regretted that he had ever written books. He had not done this till he was thirty-eight, and he had fallen into this error by the accident of noticing that miserable question of the Dijon Academy. The critics of his discourse had led him to reply. Dispute led to dispute, and I found myself, so to speak, becoming an author at an age when one usually abandons authorship. From that time to this, repose and friends have disappeared. In all his career he claimed he had been more ardent than enlightened, but sincere in everything, simple and good, but sensitive and weak, often doing evil and always loving the good, adhering rather to my sentiments than to my interests, fearing God without fearing hell, reasoning on religion but without libertinage, loving neither impiety nor fanaticism, but hating the intolerant more than the freethinkers, confessing my faults to my friends and my opinions to all the world. He mourned less the Catholic than the Calvinist condemnation of Emile. He, who had proudly called himself Citoyen de Genève, had fled from France hoping to breathe in his native city the air of freedom, and to find there a welcome that would console him for his humiliations. But now, what am I to say? My heart closes up, my hand trembles, the pen falls from it. I must be silent. I must consume in secret the bitterest of my griefs. Behold the man who, in the century so celebrated for philosophy, reason, and humanity, dared to defend the cause of God. Behold him branded, proscribed, hunted from country to country, from refuge to refuge, without regard for his poverty, without pity for his infirmities. Finding asylum at last under an illustrious and enlightened prince, and secluding himself in a little village hidden among the mountains of Switzerland, thinking at last to find obscurity and peace, but pursued even there by the anathemas of priests. This archbishop, a virtuous man as noble in soul as in birth, should have reproved the persecutors. Instead he authorized them shamelessly, he who should have pleaded the cause of the oppressed. Rousseau perceived that the archbishop was particularly offended by the doctrine that men are born good, or at least not evil. 
Beaumont realized that if this were true, if man is not tainted at birth by inheriting the guilt of Adam and Eve, then the doctrine of atonement by Christ would fall, and this doctrine was the very heart of the Christian creed. Rousseau answered that the doctrine of original sin is nowhere clearly stated in the Bible. He realized that the archbishop was shocked by the proposal to defer religious instruction. He replied that the education of children by nuns and priests had not lessened sin or crime. Those pupils grown up had lost their fear of hell and preferred a small pleasure at hand to all paradise in promise. And those priests themselves, were they models of virtue in contemporary France? Nevertheless, I am a Christian, sincerely Christian, according to the doctrine of the gospel, not a Christian as a disciple of the priests, but as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Then, with an eye on Geneva, Rousseau added, Happy to have been born in the holiest and most reasonable religion on the earth, I remain inviolably attached to the faith of my fathers. Like them, I take scripture and reason as the sole rules of my belief. He felt the reproach of those who told him that, though all men of intelligence think as you do, it is not good that the commonalty, le vulgaire, should think so. This is what they cry out to me on every side. This perhaps is what you yourself would tell me if we two were alone in your study. Such are men. They change their language with their clothes. They speak the truth only in their dressing gowns. In their public dress they know only how to lie. And not only are they deceivers and impostors in the face of mankind, but they are not ashamed to punish against their own conscience whoever refuses to be public cheats and liars like themselves. This difference between what we believe and what we preach is at the heart of the corruption in modern civilization. There are prejudices which we should respect, but not if they turn education into a massive deception and undermine the moral basis of society. And if those prejudices become murderous, shall we still be silent about their crimes? I do not say, nor do I think, that there is no good religion, but I do say that there is none among those which have been dominant that has not inflicted cruel wounds upon humanity. All sects have tormented others. All have offered to God the sacrifice of human blood. Whatever may be the source of these contradictions, they exist. Is it a crime to wish to remove them? Toward the end of his reply, Rousseau defended his Emile lovingly and wondered why no statue had been raised to its author. Assuming that I have made some mistakes, even that I have always been wrong, is no indulgence due to a book in which one feels everywhere, even in its errors, even in the harm that may be in it, a sincere love of the good and a zeal for the truth? A book which breathes only peace, gentleness, patience, love of order, and obedience to the laws in everything, even in the matter of religion? A book in which the cause of religion is so well established, where morals are so respected, where wickedness is painted as folly and virtue as so lovable? Yes, I do not fear to say it. If there were in Europe a single government truly enlightened, it would render public honors to the author of Emile. It would raise statues to him. I know men too well to expect such recognition. I do not know them well enough to expect that which they have done. They have raised statues to him. 3. Rousseau and the Calvinists the letter to Christophe Beaumont pleased only a few free thinkers in France and a few political rebels in Switzerland. Of twenty-three refutations addressed to the author, nearly all were from Protestants. The Calvinist clergy of Geneva saw in the letter an attack upon miracles and biblical inspiration. To condone such heresies would be to invite again the danger to which they had been exposed by d'Alembert. Angry at the failure of Genevan liberals to speak out in his defense, Rousseau, on May 12, 1763, sent to the Grand Council of Geneva a renunciation of his citizenship. This action won some audible support. On June 18, the delegation submitted to the first syndic of the Republic a very humble and respectful representation of citizens and burghers of Geneva, which, among other grievances, complained that the judgment against Rousseau had been illegal, and that the confiscation of copies of Emile from Genevan bookstores had invaded property rights. The Council of Twenty-Five rejected the protest, and in September the public prosecutor, Jean-Robert Tranchin, cousin of Voltaire's doctor, issued Lettre écrite de la Campagne, 
defending the disputed actions of the council. The representant appealed to Rousseau to answer Tranchin. Never willing to let bad enough alone, Rousseau published in December 1764 Nine Lettres écrites de la Montagne, a retort from his mountain home to the oligarchy of the Genevan Plain. Furious against clergy as well as council, he attacked Calvinism as well as Catholicism and burned nearly all his bridges behind him. Formally, he addressed the letters to the leader of the représentants. He began by dealing with the harm done to himself through the hasty condemnation of his books and his person, without any opportunity for defense. He admitted the imperfections of his books. I myself have found a great number of errors in them. I doubt not that others may see many more, and that there are still others that neither I nor others have perceived. After having heard both parties, the public will judge. The book will triumph or fall, and the case is closed. But was the book pernicious? Could any one read La Nouvelle Héloïse and the Profession de Foi du Vicar Savoyard, and really believe that their author intended to destroy religion? True, these writings sought to destroy superstition as the most terrible plague of mankind, the sorrow of sages, and the tool of tyranny. But did they not affirm the necessity of religion? The author is accused of not believing in Christ. He believes in Christ, but in a different way from his accusers. We recognize the authority of Jesus Christ because our intelligence agrees with his precepts and we find them sublime. We admit revelation as emanating from the Spirit of God without our knowing how. Recognizing a divine authority in the gospel, we believe that Jesus Christ was clothed with this authority. We recognize a more than human virtue in his conduct and a more than human wisdom in his teaching. The second letter, forgetting the social contract, denied the right of a civic council to judge in matters of religion. A basic principle of the Protestant Reformation, the right of the individual to interpret Scripture for himself, had been violated in condemning Emil. If you prove to me today that in matters of faith I am obliged to submit to the decisions of someone else, tomorrow I shall become a Catholic. Rousseau admitted that the Reformers, in their turn, had become persecutors of individual interpretation, but this did not invalidate the principle without which the Protestant revolt against the papal authority would have been unjust. He accused the Calvinist clergy, except my pastor, of taking over the intolerant spirit of Catholicism. If they had been true to the spirit of the Reformation, they would have defended his right to publish his own interpretation of the Bible. He now had a good word to say for d'Alembert's view of the Genevan clergy. A philosopher casts a quick glance upon them. He penetrates them, sees that they are Arians, Sicinians. He says so and thinks to do them honor. But he does not see that he is endangering their temporal interests, the only matter that generally determines here below the faith of men. In his third letter he took up the charge that he had rejected miracles. If we define a miracle as a violation of the laws of nature, we can never know if anything is a miracle, for we do not know all the laws of nature. Even then, every day saw a new miracle achieved by science, not in contravention, but through greater knowledge of nature's laws. Anciently, the prophets made fire descend from the sky at their word. Today, children do as much with a little piece of burning glass. Joshua made the sun stop. Any almanac maker can promise the same result by calculating a solar eclipse. And as Europeans who perform such wonders among barbarians are thought by these to be gods, so the miracles of the past, even those of Jesus, may have been natural results misinterpreted by the populace as divine interruptions of natural law. Perhaps Lazarus, whom Christ raised from the dead, had not really been dead. Besides, how can the miracles of a teacher prove the truth of his doctrine when teachers of doctrines generally considered false have performed miracles reported as equally real, as when the magicians of Egypt rivaled Aaron in turning wands into serpents. Christ warned against false Christs, who shall show great signs as wonders. Rousseau had begun his letters with a view to helping the middle-class représentant. He had made no plea for the further extension of the franchise in a democratic direction. 
Indeed, in Letter 6 he again committed himself to an elected aristocracy as the best form of government, and he assured the rulers of Geneva that the ideal which he had sketched in the social contract was essentially one with the Genevan constitution. But in Letter 7 he told his friends of the protesting bourgeoisie that the constitution acknowledged the sovereignty of the enfranchised citizens only during the elections to the General Council and its annual assembly. For the remainder of the year the citizens were powerless. In all that long interval the small council of twenty-five was the supreme arbiter of the laws and thereby of the fate of all individuals. In effect, the citoyen et bourgeois, who appeared sovereign in the Conseil General, became, after its adjournment, the slaves of a despotic power delivered defenseless to the mercy of twenty-five despots. This was almost a call to revolution. However, Rousseau deprecated such a last resort. In his final letter he praised the bourgeoisie as the sanest and most peace-loving class in the state, caught between an opulent and oppressive patriciate and a brutish and stupid populace. But he advised the représentants to keep their patience and trust to justice and time to right their wrongs. The Lettre de la Montagne offended Rousseau's enemies and displeased his friends. The Genevan clergy were alarmed by his heresies, and still more by his claim that they shared them. Now he turned violently against the Calvinist ministers, called them canai, swindlers, stupid courtiers, mad wolves, and expressed preference for the simple Catholic priests of the French villages and towns. The representants made no use of the letters in their successful campaign for more political power. They considered Rousseau a dangerous and incalculable ally. He resolved to take no further part in Genevan politics. 4. Rousseau and Voltaire He had wondered, in Letter 5, why Monsieur de Voltaire, whom the Genevan councillors so often visit, had not inspired them with that spirit of tolerance which he preaches without cease, and of which he sometimes has need. And he put into Voltaire's mouth an imaginary speech favoring freedom of speech for philosophers on the ground that only a negligible few read them. The imitation of Voltaire's light and graceful manner was excellent, but the sage of Fernet was represented as avowing his authorship of a recently published Sermon des Cinquante, Sermon of the Fifty, whose paternity Voltaire had repeatedly denied, for it was heavy with heresies. We do not know whether Rousseau's revelation of the secret was deliberate and malicious. Voltaire thought so and was furious for it subjected him to the possibility of renewed expulsion from France just as he was settling into Fernay. "'The miscreant!' he exclaimed when he read the tell-tale letter. "'The monster! I must have him cudgelled! Yes, I will have him cudgelled in his mountains at the knees of his nurse!' "'Pray calm yourself,' said a bystander, "'for I know that Rousseau means to pay you a visit, and will very shortly be at Fernay.' "'Ah, only let him come,' cried Voltaire, apparently meditating mayhem. "'But how will you receive him?' "'I will give him supper, put him into my own bed, and say, "'There is a good supper. This is the best bed in the house. "'Do me the pleasure to accept one and the other, and to make yourself happy here.' "'But Rousseau did not come. "'Voltaire revenged himself by issuing, on December 31st, 1764, an anonymous pamphlet, Sentiment des Citoyens, Feelings of the Citizens, which is one of the blackest marks on his character and career. It must be quoted to be believed. We take pity on a fool, but when his dementia becomes fury, we tie him up. Tolerance, which is a virtue, then becomes a vice. We pardon this man's romances, in which decency and modesty are as damaged as good sense. When he mixed religion with his fiction, our magistrates were of necessity obliged to imitate those of Paris and Bern. Today is not patience exhausted when he publishes a new book wherein he outrages with fury the Christian religion, the Reformation that he professes, all the ministers of the Holy Gospel and all the agencies of the state? He says clearly in his own name, There are no miracles in the Gospel which we can take literally without abandoning good sense. Is he a scholar who debates with scholars? No. He is a man who still carries the tragic marks of his debauches, 
and who drags along with him from town to town and from mountain to mountain the unhappy woman whose mother he made die and whose children he exposed at the door of a hospital, abjuring all the feelings of nature as he discards those of honor and religion. Does he wish to overthrow our Constitution by disfiguring it, as he wishes to overthrow the Christianity that he professes? It suffices to warn him that the city which he troubles disavows him. If he thought that we would draw the sword, make a revolution, because of the condemnation of Emile, he can put this idea into the class of his absurdities and his follies. But he should be told that if we punish lightly an impious romance, we punish capitally a vile traitor. This was a disgraceful performance, hardly to be excused by Voltaire's anger, ailments, and age. He was now seventy. No wonder Rousseau never believed, even today we can hardly believe, that Voltaire wrote it. He ascribed it instead to the Genevan minister Verne, who protested in vain that he was not the author. Rousseau, in one of his finest moments, published a reply to the sentiment in January 1765. I wish to make with simplicity the declaration that seems required of me by this article. No malady, small or great, such as the author speaks of, has ever soiled my body. The malady that affects me has not the slightest resemblance to the one indicated. It was born with me, as those who took care of my childhood and who still live know. It is known to Messieurs Malouin, Morin, Thierry, Daron. If they find in this ailment the least sign of debauchery, I beg them to confound me and shame me. The wise and world-esteemed woman who takes care of me in my misfortunes is unhappy only because she shares my misery. Her mother is in fact full of life and in good health, despite her old age. She lived to be ninety-three. I have never exposed, never caused to be exposed, any children at the door of a hospital nor anywhere else. I will add nothing more except to say that, at the hour of death, I would prefer to have done that of which the author accuses me than to have written a piece like this. Though Rousseau's delivery of his children to a foundling asylum, not quite precisely their exposure, had been known to Paris gossip, he had admitted it to the Maréchal de Luxembourg, Voltaire's pamphlet was the first public disclosure. Jean-Jacques suspected Madame d'Epinay of having revealed it on her visit to Geneva. Now he was convinced that she and Grimm and Diderot were conspiring to blacken his reputation. Grimm at this time repeatedly attacked Rousseau in the Correspondence Littéraire, and in his letter of January 15, 1765, speaking of the Letters from the Mountain, he joined Voltaire in accusing Rousseau of treason. If there be anywhere on earth such a crime as high treason, it is found surely in attacking the fundamental constitution of a state with the arms that M. Rousseau has employed to overthrow the constitution of his country. The long quarrel between Voltaire and Rousseau is one of the sorriest blemishes on the face of the Enlightenment. Their birth and status set them far apart. Voltaire, son of a prosperous notary, received a good education, especially in the classics. Rousseau, born to an impoverished and soon-to-be-broken home, received no formal education, inherited no classical tradition. Voltaire accepted the literary norms laid down by Boileau. Love reason, let all your writings take from reason their splendor and their worth. To Rousseau, as to Faust, seducing Marguerite with Rousseau, feeling is all. Voltaire was as sensitive and excitable as Jean-Jacques, but usually he thought it bad manners to let passion discolor his art. He sensed in Rousseau's appeal to feeling and instinct an individualistic, anarchic irrationalism that would begin with revolt and end with religion. He repudiated, Rousseau echoed, Pascal. Voltaire lived like a millionaire. Rousseau copied music to earn his bread. Voltaire was the sum of all the graces in society— Rousseau was ill at ease in social gatherings and too impatient and irritable to keep a friend. Voltaire was the son of Paris, of its gaiety and luxuries. Rousseau was the child of Geneva, a somber and Puritan bourgeois resentful of class distinctions that cut him and of luxuries that he could not enjoy. 
Voltaire defended luxury as putting the money of the rich in circulation by giving work to the poor. Rousseau condemned it as feeding a hundred poor people in our towns and causing a hundred thousand to perish in our villages. Voltaire thought that the sins of civilization are outweighed by its comforts and arts. Rousseau was uncomfortable everywhere and denounced almost everything. Reformers listened to Voltaire. Revolutionists heard Rousseau. When Horace Walpole remarked that this world is a comedy to those who think, a tragedy to those who feel, he unwittingly compressed into a line the lives of the two most influential minds of the eighteenth century. 5. Boswell Meets Rousseau We get an exceptionally pleasant picture of Jean-Jacques in Boswell's report of five visits to him in December 1764. The inescapable idolater had solemnly sworn, on October 21st, neither to talk to an infidel nor to enjoy a woman before seeing Rousseau. On December 3rd he set out from Neuchâtel for Moitié Travers. At Bro, halfway, he stopped at an inn and asked the landlord's daughter what she knew about his prey. Her reply was disconcerting. Monsieur Rousseau often comes and stays here several days with his housekeeper, Mademoiselle Levasseur. He is a very amiable man. He has a fine face, but he doesn't like to have people come and stare at him as if he were a man with two heads. Heavens, the curiosity of people is incredible. Many, many people come to see him, and often he will not receive them. He is ill and doesn't wish to be disturbed. Of course, Boswell went ahead. At Motier he put up at the village inn and prepared a letter to Monsieur Rousseau in which I informed him that an ancient Scots gentleman of twenty-four was come hither with the hopes of seeing him. I assured him that I deserved his regard. Towards the end of my letter I showed him that I had a heart and soul. The letter is really a masterpiece. I shall ever preserve it as proof that my soul can be sublime. His letter, in French, was a subtle mixture of deliberate naivete and irresistible adulation. Your writings, sir, have melted my heart, have elevated my soul, have fired my imagination. Believe me, you will be glad to have seen me. O oh, dear saint Preux, enlightened mentor, eloquent and amiable Rousseau, I have a presentiment that a truly noble friendship will be born today. I have much to tell you. Though I am only a young man, I have experienced a variety of existence that will amaze you. But I beg you, be alone. I know not if I would not prefer never to see you than to see you for the first time in company. I await your reply with impatience. Rousseau sent word that he might come if he promised to make his visit short. Boswell went, dressed in a coat and waistcoat, scarlet with gold lace, buckskin breeches and boots. Above all, I wore a great coat of green camlet lined with foxskin fur. The door was opened by Thérèse, a little lively, neat French girl. She led him upstairs to Rousseau. A genteel, black, meaning dark-complexioned, man in the dress of an Armenian. I asked him how he was. Very ill, but I have given up doctors. Rousseau expressed admiration for Frederick, scorn for the French. A contemptible nation, but you will find great souls in Spain. Boswell, and in the mountains of Scotland. Rousseau spoke of theologians as gentlemen who provide a new explanation of something, leaving it as incomprehensible as before. They discussed Corsica. Rousseau said that he had been asked to draw up laws for it. Boswell began his lasting enthusiasm for Corsican independence. Presently Rousseau dismissed him, saying that he wished to go for a walk by himself. On December 4th Boswell returned to the siege. Rousseau talked with him for a while, then dismissed him. You are irksome to me. It's my nature. I cannot help it. Boswell, do not stand on ceremony with me. Rousseau, go away. Thérèse saw Boswell to the door. She told him, I have been twenty-two years with Monsieur Rousseau. I would not give my place to be Queen of France. I try to profit by the good advice he gives me. If he should die, I shall have to go into a convent. Boswell was at the door again on December 5th. Rousseau sighed, My dear sir, I am sorry not to be able to talk with you as I would wish. Boswell, 
waived such excuses, and stirred conversation by saying, I had turned Roman Catholic and intended to hide myself in a convent. Rousseau, what folly! Boswell, tell me sincerely, are you a Christian? Rousseau struck his breast and replied, Yes, I pique myself on being one. Boswell, who suffered from melancholy, Tell me, do you suffer from melancholy? Rousseau, I was born placid. I have no natural disposition to melancholy. My misfortunes have infected me with it. Boswell, What do you think of cloisters, penances, and remedies of that sort? Rousseau, Mummeries, all of them. Boswell, Will you, sir, assume spiritual direction of me? Rousseau, I cannot. Boswell, I shall come back. Rousseau, I don't promise to see you. I am in pain. I need a chamber pot every minute. That afternoon in the Maison du Village, Boswell wrote a fourteen-page sketch of my life and sent it to Rousseau. It confessed one of his adulteries and asked, Is it possible for me yet to make myself a man? He returned to Neuchâtel, but was back at Rousseau's door on December 14th. Thérèse told him her master was very ill. Boswell persisted. Rousseau received him. I found him sitting in great pain. Rousseau, I am overcome with ailments, disappointments, and sorrow. I am using a probe, a urethral dilator. Everyone thinks it my duty to attend to him. Come back in the afternoon. Boswell, for how long? Rousseau, a quarter of an hour and no longer. Boswell, twenty minutes. Rousseau, be off with you. But he could not help laughing. Boswell was back at four, dreaming of Louis the Fifteenth. Morals appear to me an uncertain thing. For instance, I should like to have thirty women. Could I not satisfy that desire? No. But consider, if I am rich, I can take a number of girls. I get them with child. Propagation is thus increased. I give them dowries, and I marry them off to good peasants who are very happy to have them. Thus they become wives at the same age as would have been the case if they had remained virgins, and I, on my side, have had the benefit of enjoying a great variety of women. Then, having made no impression with this royal hypothesis, he asked, Pray tell me, how can I expiate the evil I have done? Rousseau made a golden answer. There is no expiation for evil except good. Boswell asked Rousseau to invite him to dinner. Rousseau said, Tomorrow. Boswell returned to the inn, full of fine spirits. On December 15th he dined with Jean-Jacques and Thérèse in the kitchen, which he found neat and cheerful. Rousseau was in good humor, with no sign of the mental disturbances that were later to appear. His dog and cat got along well together, and with him. He put some victuals on a trencher and made his dog dance around it. He sang a lively air with a sweet voice and great taste. Boswell talked about religion. The Anglican Church is my choice. Rousseau, yes, but it is not the gospel. You have no liking for St. Paul? I respect him, but I think he is partly responsible for muddling your head. He would have been an Anglican clergyman. Mademoiselle Le Vasseur, shall you, sir, see Monsieur de Voltaire? Boswell, most certainly. Then to Rousseau, Monsieur de Voltaire has no liking for you. Rousseau, one does not like those whom one has greatly injured. His talk is most enjoyable. It is even better than his books. Boswell overstayed his welcome, but when he left, Rousseau kissed me several times and held me in his arms with elegant cordiality. When Boswell reached the inn, the landlady said, Sir, I think you have been crying. This, he adds, I retain as a true eulogium of my humanity. 6. A Constitution for Corsica Perhaps at Rousseau's prompting, Boswell, after visiting Voltaire at Vernay, went on to Italy, Naples, and Corsica. Corsica, under the leadership of Pasquale di Paoli, had freed itself from Genoese domination in 1755. Rousseau, in the social contract, had hailed the birth of the new state. There is still one country in Europe open to the lawgiver. It is the island of Corsica. 
the valor and firmness with which this brave people has shown itself able to regain and defend its freedom, richly deserve the aid of some wise man who will teach them how to preserve it. I have a premonition that some day this little island will astonish Europe. Voltaire would have thought Rousseau the last man in Europe to be invited as a lawgiver, but on August 31, 1764, Jean-Jacques received the following letter from Matteo Budafuoco, Corsican envoy to France. You mention Corsica, sir, in your Contra Social, in a way most flattering to our country. Such praise from a pen so sincere as yours has suggested the strong wish that you could be the wise legislator who would assist the nation to maintain the liberties obtained at the cost of so much blood. I recognize, of course, that the task I dare press you to undertake needs a special knowledge of details. If you deign to accept this charge, I would supply you with all the illumination necessary, and Monsieur Paoli will use his best endeavors to send you from Corsica all the information you may want. This distinguished chief, and indeed all my compatriots who have the advantage to know your works, share my desire and the sentiments of respect that all Europe has for you, and which are due you on so many grounds. Rousseau's reply on October 15, 1764, accepted the assignment and asked for material illustrating the character, history, and problems of the Corsican people. He confessed that the task might be beyond my power, though not beyond my zeal. But I promise you, he wrote to Budafuoco on May 26, 1765, that for the rest of my life I shall have no other interest but myself and Corsica. All other matters will be completely banished from my thoughts. He began work at once on his Projet de Constitution pour la Corse. With the social contract in mind, Rousseau proposed that every citizen should sign a solemn and irrevocable pledge of himself, body, goods, will, and all my powers, to the Corsican nation. He hailed the brave Corse who had won their independence, but he warned them that they had many vices, laziness, banditry, feuds, ferocity, mostly derived from hatred of their foreign masters. The best cure for these vices is a completely agricultural life. The laws should give every inducement to the people to remain on the land rather than gather in cities. Agriculture makes for individual character and national health. Trade, commerce, finance open the doors to all sorts of chicanery and should be discouraged by the state. All travel should be on foot or beast. Early marriage and large families are to be rewarded. Men unmarried by the age of forty should lose their citizenship. Private property should be reduced, state property increased. I should wish to see the state the sole owner, the individual taking a share of the common property only in proportion to his services. If necessary, the population should be conscripted to till the lands of the state. The government should control all education and all public morality. The form of government should model itself on the Swiss cantons. In 1768, France bought Corsica from Genoa, sent in an army, deposed Paoli, and subjected the island to French law. Rousseau abandoned his projet and denounced the French invasion as violating all justice, all humanity, all political right, all reason. 7. Fugitive For two years Rousseau lived modestly and quietly at Moutier, reading, writing, treating his ailment, suffering an attack of sciatica in October 1764, and receiving courteously the visitors who passed Thérèse's scrutiny. One of these described him gratefully. You have no idea how charming his society is, what true politeness there is in his manners, what a depth of serenity and cheerfulness in his talk. Did you not expect quite a different picture, and figure to yourself an eccentric creature, always grave and sometimes even abrupt? Ah, what a mistake! To an expression of great mildness he unites a glance of fire and eyes, the vivacity of which was never seen. When you handle any matter in which he has taken an interest, then his eyes, his lips, his hands, everything about him, speak. You would be quite wrong to picture in him an everlasting grumbler. Not at all. He laughs with those who laugh, he chats and jokes with children, he rallies his housekeeper. But the local ministers had discovered the heresies in Emile and the letters from the mountain, and it seemed to them a scandal that such a monster should further contaminate Switzerland with his presence. 
to appease them, he offered, on March 10, 1765, to bind himself by a formal document, never to publish any new work on any topic of religion, never even to deal with it incidentally in any other new work. And further, I shall continue to testify, through my feelings and my conduct, to the great store I set on the happiness of being united with the Church. The Neuchâtel Consistory summoned him to appear and answer charges of heresy. He begged to be excused. It would be impossible for me, in spite of all my good will, to suffer a long sitting, which was painfully true. His own pastor turned against him and denounced him in public sermons as Antichrist. The attacks of the clergy inflamed their parishioners. Some villagers took to stoning Rousseau when he went out for a walk. About midnight of September 6th to 7th, he and Thérèse were awakened by stones, pelting their walls and breaking the windows. One large rock came through the glass and fell at his feet. A neighbor, a village official, summoned some guards to his rescue. The crowd dispersed. But Rousseau's remaining friends in Motier advised him to leave the town. He had several men, Rousseau and Revolution, by Will and Ariel Durant. Part 1 Continued. Cassette 9, Side 1. He had several offers of asylum, but I was so attached to Switzerland that I could not resolve to quit it as long as it was possible for me to live there. He had visited, a year before, the tiny Ile de Saint-Pierre, in the middle of the Lake of Bienne. There was but one house on the island, the home of the caretaker. Here, thought Rousseau, was an ideal spot for an unpopular lover of solitude. It was in the canton of Bern, which had ejected him two years before, but he received informal assurances that he might move to the island without fear of arrest. And so, about the middle of September, 1765, after twenty-six months in Motier, he and Thérèse left the home that had become so dear to them, and went aboard with the caretaker's family in a place so isolated that neither the populace nor the churchmen can trouble it. I thought I should in that island be more separated from men and sooner forgotten by mankind. To meet his expenses he gave the printer du Peru the right to publish all his works, and made him the depositary of all my papers, under the express condition of making no use of them until after my death, having it at heart to end my days quietly, without doing anything which would again bring me back to the recollection of the public. He was offered an annuity of twelve hundred livres by Marichal Keith. He agreed to take half. He arranged another annuity for Thérèse. He settled down with her on the island, expecting nothing further of life. He was now fifty-three years old. Thirteen years later, in the final year of his life, he composed one of his finest books, Reverie d'un promeneur solitaire. It described with subdued eloquence his existence on the island of St. Peter. A delicious idleness was the first and principal enjoyment that I wished to taste in all its sweetness. We have seen elsewhere how he admired Linnaeus. Now, with one of the Swedish botanist's books in his hand, he began to list and study the plants on his little domain. Or on fair days, like Thoreau on Walden Pond, I threw myself alone into a boat which I rowed out to the middle of the lake when the water was calm. There, stretching myself out at full length in the boat, my eyes toward heaven, I let myself go and wander about slowly at the will of the water, sometimes for several hours, plunged into a thousand delightful reveries. Even on these waters he could not long rest. On October 17, 1765, the Senate of Bern ordered him to leave the island and the canton within fifteen days. He was bewildered and overwhelmed. The measures I had taken to secure the tacit consent of the government, the tranquility with which I had been left to make my establishment, the visits of several people from Bern, had led him to believe that he was now safe from molestation and pursuit. He begged the Senate for some explanation and delay, and suggested a desperate alternative to banishment. I see but one resource for me, and however frightful it may appear, I will adopt it not only without repugnance, but with eagerness, if their excellencies will be good enough to consent. It is that it should please them for me to pass the rest of my days in prison in one of their castles, or such other place in their estates as they may think fit to select. I will live there at my own expense, and I will give security never to put them to any cost. 
I submit to be without paper or pen or any communication from without. Only let me keep with a few books the liberty to walk occasionally in a garden, and I am content. Was his mind beginning to break down? He assures us to the contrary. Do not suppose that an expedient so violent in appearance is the fruit of despair. My mind is perfectly calm at this moment. I have taken time to deliberate, and it is only after profound consideration that I have brought myself to this decision. Mark, I pray you that if this seems an extraordinary resolution, my situation is still more so. The distracted life I have been made to lead for several years without intermission would be terrible for a man in full health. Judge what it must be for a miserable invalid worn down with weariness and misfortune, and who has now no wish but to die in peace. The answer from Byrne was an order to leave the island and all Bernese territory within twenty-four hours. Where should he go? He had invitations to Potsdam from Frederick, to Corsica from Paoli, to Lorraine from Saint Lambert, to Amsterdam from Ray, the publisher, and to England from David Hume. On October 22nd, Hume, then secretary to the British Embassy in Paris, wrote to Rousseau, Your singular and unheard-of misfortunes, independent of your virtue and genius, must interest the sentiments of every human creature in your favor. But I flatter myself that in England you could find an absolute security against all persecution, not only from the tolerating spirit of our laws, but from the respect which every one there bears to your character. On October 29th, Rousseau left the Ile de Saint-Pierre. He arranged for Thérèse to remain for the time being in Switzerland. He himself moved on to Strasbourg. There he stayed a full month, hesitating. Finally, he decided to accept Hume's invitation to England. The French government gave him a passport to come to Paris. There Hume met him for the first time and soon became fond of him. All Paris talked about the exile's return. It is impossible, wrote Hume, to express or imagine the enthusiasm of this nation in Rousseau's favor. No person ever so much enjoyed their attention. Voltaire and everybody else are quite eclipsed. The new friendship was flawed at its birth. It is difficult here to determine the facts with accuracy or to report them impartially. On January 1st, 1766, Grimm sent to his clientele the following report. Jean-Jacques Rousseau made his entry into Paris on the 17th of December. The following day he promenaded in the Luxembourg Gardens in his Armenian costume. As no one had been warned, no one profited by the spectacle. Monsieur le Prince de Conti has lodged him in the temple, where the said Armenian holds his court daily. He also promenades daily at an appointed hour on the boulevards near his residence. Here is a letter that went the rounds of Paris during his stay here, and which has had a great success. At this point Grimm transcribed a letter purporting to have come to Rousseau from Frederick the Great. It had been composed as a hoax on Rousseau by Horace Walpole. Let Walpole himself tell of it in his letter to H. S. Conway, January 12, 1766. My present fame is owing to a very trifling composition, but which has made incredible noise. I was one evening at Madame Geoffrin's, joking on Rousseau's affectations and contradictions, and said some things that diverted them. When I came home, I put them in a letter and showed it next day to Helvetius and the Duc de Nivernois who were so pleased with it that, after telling me some faults in the language, they encouraged me to let it be seen. As you know, I willingly laugh at mountebanks, political or literary, let their talents be ever so great. I was not averse. The copies have spread like wildfire, et me voici à la mode, and behold, I am in fashion. Here is the letter, literally translated from Walpole's French. The King of Prussia to Monsieur Rousseau, my dear Jean-Jacques, you have renounced Geneva, your fatherland. You have had yourself chased from Switzerland, a country so much praised in your writings. France has issued a warrant against you. Come then to me. I admire your talents. I am amused by your dreams, which, be it said in passing, occupy you too much and too long. You must at last be wise and happy." You have had yourself talked of enough for peculiarities hardly fitting to a truly great man. 
Show your enemies that you can sometimes have common sense. This will annoy them without doing you harm. My states offer you a peaceful retreat. I wish you well, and would like to help you if you can find it good. But if you continue to reject my aid, be assured that I shall tell no one. If you persist in racking your brains to find new misfortunes, choose such as you may desire. I am king, and can procure any to suit your wishes. And, what surely will never happen to you among your enemies, I shall cease to persecute you when you cease to find your glory in being persecuted. Your good friend, Frederick. Walpole had never met Rousseau. His sophisticated intellect and inherited fortune found no sense in Jean-Jacques' writings. He knew of Rousseau's faults and follies from the dinners at Madame Geoffrin's, where he met Diderot and Grimm. He probably did not realize that Rousseau, sensitive to the point of neurosis, had been brought near to mental collapse by a succession of controversies and tribulations. If Walpole knew this, his jeu d'esprit was disgracefully cruel. We should add, however, that when Hume asked for his advice in finding a retreat for Rousseau in England, Walpole undertook to provide the exile with every assistance. Did Hume know of this letter? Apparently he had been present at Madame Geoffrin's when it was first concocted. He has been accused of taking part in its composition. He wrote to the Marquise de Brabantin on February 16, 1766, The only pleasantry I permitted myself in connection with the pretended letter of the King of Prussia was made by me at the dinner-table of Lord Ossery. On January 3, 1766, Hume made a farewell visit to the diners at Baron Dolbach's. He told them of his hopes to free the little man from persecution and to make him happy in England. Dolbach was skeptical. I am sorry, he said, to dispel the hopes and illusions that flatter you, but I tell you it will not be long before you are grievously undeceived. You don't know your man. I tell you plainly, you're warming a viper in your bosom. The next morning, Hume and Rousseau, with Jean-Jacques de Luz and Rousseau's dog, Sultan, left Paris in two post-chaises for Calais. Rousseau paid his own expenses, having refused offers by Hume, Madame de Boufflet, and Madame de Verdelin to supply him with funds. When they reached Dover on January 10th, Rousseau embraced Hume and thanked him for bringing him to a land of freedom. 8. Rousseau in England they arrived at London on January 13, 1766. Passers-by remarked Rousseau's costume, fur cap, purple robe, and girdle. He explained to Hume that he had an infirmity which made breeches inconvenient for him. Hume persuaded his friend Conway to suggest a pension for the distinguished foreigner. George III agreed to one hundred pounds a year and expressed a desire to get an informal glimpse of him. Garrick reserved for Rousseau and Hume a box at the Drury Lane Theatre opposite the Royal Box for a night when the King and Queen were to attend. But when Hume called for Rousseau, he had great difficulty in persuading him to leave his dog, whose howls at being locked up tore the exile's heart. At last I caught Rousseau in my arms, and partly by force I engaged him to proceed. After the performance, Garrick gave a supper for Rousseau, who complimented him on his acting. Sir, you have made me shed tears at your tragedy and smile at your comedy, though I scarce understood a word of your language. Altogether Hume was thus far pleased with his guest. Soon after reaching London, he wrote to Madame de Brabantin, You have asked me my opinion of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. After having watched him in every respect, I declare that I have never known a man more amiable and virtuous. He is gentle, modest, affectionate, disinterested, of exquisite sensitivity. Seeking faults in him, I find none but extreme impatience and a disposition to nurse unjust suspicions against his best friends. As for me, I would pass my life in his company without a cloud arising between us. There is in his manners a remarkable simplicity. In ordinary affairs, he is a veritable child. This makes it easy for those who live with him to govern him. And again... He has an excellent warm heart, and in conversation kindles often to a degree of heat which looks like inspiration. I love him much and hope to have some share in his affections. The philosophers of Paris foretold to me that I could not conduct him to Calais without a quarrel, but I think I could live with him all my life in mutual friendship and esteem. 
I believe one great source of our concord is that neither he nor I are disputatious, which is not the case with any of them. They are also displeased with him because they think he overabounds in religion, and it is indeed remarkable that the philosopher of this age who has been most persecuted is by far the most devout. He has a hankering after the Bible, and is indeed little better than a Christian. But there were difficulties. As in Paris, so in London, lords, ladies, authors, commoners, flocked to the house of Mrs. Adams in Buckingham Street, where Rousseau had been lodged by Hume. Soon he wearied of these attentions and begged Hume to find him a home away from London. An offer came to take care of him in a Welsh monastery. He wished to accept it, but Hume prevailed upon him to board with a grocer at Chiswick on the Thames, six miles from London. Thither Rousseau and Sultan moved on January 28th. Now he sent for Therese and troubled his host and Hume by insisting that she should be allowed to sit at table with him. Hume complained in a letter to Madame de Boufflay, Monsieur de Luz says that she passes for wicked and quarrelsome and tattling, and is thought to be the chief cause of his quitting Neuchâtel, meaning Motier. He himself owns her to be so dull that she never knows in what year of the Lord she is, nor in what month of the year, nor in what day of the month or week, and that she can never learn the different values of the pieces of money in any country. Yet she governs him as absolutely as a nurse does a child. In her absence his dog has acquired this ascendancy. His affection for that creature is beyond all expression or conception. Meanwhile, Thérèse had come to Paris. Boswell met her there and offered to escort her to England. On February 12th, Hume wrote to Madame de Boufflay, A letter has come to me by which I learn that Mademoiselle sets out post in company with a friend of mine, a young gentleman, very good-humoured, very agreeable, and very mad. He has such a rage for literature that I dread some event fatal to our friend's honour. Boswell claimed to have justified this premonition. According to Pages, now destroyed in his diary, he shared the same bed with Thérèse at an inn in the second night out from Paris, and several nights thereafter. They reached Dover early on February 11th. The diary proceeds, Wednesday, 12th of February, Yesterday morning had gone to bed very early and had done it once, thirteen in all, was really affectionate to her. At two p.m. set out on the fly. That same evening he took Therese to Hume in London and promised her not to mention a fair till after her death or that of the philosopher. On the thirteenth he delivered her over to Rousseau. Quanta oscula! He seemed so oldish and weak, you, Boswell, had no longer your enthusiasm for him. Naturally. At Chiswick, as at Motier, Rousseau received more mail than he wished and complained of the postage he had to pay. One day, when Hume brought him a cargo from London, he refused to take it and bade him return it to the post office. Hume warned that in that case the postal officials would open the rejected mail and learn his secrets. The patient Scott offered to open such of Rousseau's correspondence as came to London and to bring him only so much as seemed important. Jean Jacques agreed but soon suspected Hume of tampering with his mail. Invitations to dinner, usually including Mademoiselle Le Vasseur, came from notables in London. Rousseau refused them on the score of ill health, but probably because he was loath to reveal Thérèse to elevated company. He repeatedly expressed a wish to retire farther into the country. Hearing of this from Garrick, Richard Davenport offered him a home at Wooten, in Derbyshire, 150 miles from London. Rousseau accepted gladly. Davenport sent a coach to transport him and Thérèse. Rousseau complained that he was being treated like a beggar, and he added to Hume, If this be really a contrivance of Davenport's, you are acquainted with it and consenting to it, and you could not possibly have done me a greater displeasure. An hour later, according to Hume, he sat suddenly on my knee, threw his hands about my neck, kissed me with the greatest warmth, and, bedewing all my face with tears, exclaimed, is it possible you can ever forgive me, dear friend? After all the testimonies of affection I have received from you, I reward you at last with this folly and ill behavior. But I have, notwithstanding, a heart worthy of your friendship. I love you, I esteem you, and not an instant of your kindness is thrown away upon me. I kissed him and embraced him twenty times with a plentiful effusion of tears. 
The next day, March 22nd, Jean-Jacques and Thérèse set off for Wooten, and Hume never saw them again. Soon afterward, Hume wrote to Hugh Blair a perceptive analysis of Rousseau's condition and character. He was desperately resolved to rush into this solitude, notwithstanding all my remonstrances, and I foresee that he will be unhappy in that situation, as he has indeed been always in all situations. He will be entirely without occupation, without company, and almost without amusements of any kind. He has read very little in the course of his life, and has now totally renounced all reading. He has seen very little, and has no manner of curiosity to see or remark. He has not, indeed, much knowledge. He has only felt, during the whole course of his life, and in this respect his sensibility rises to a pitch beyond what I have seen any example of, but it still gives him a more acute feeling of pain than of pleasure. He is like a man who were stripped not only of his clothes, but of his skin, and turned out in that situation to combat with the rude and boisterous elements such as perpetually disturb this lower world. Rousseau and Thérèse arrived at Wooten on March 29th. At first he was well pleased with his new home. He described it in a letter to a friend in Neuchâtel. A solitary house, not very large, but very suitable, built halfway up the side of a valley. Before it, the loveliest lawn in the universe, and the landscape of meadows, trees, or scattered farms, and nearby pleasant walks along a brook. In the worst weather in the world I go tranquilly botanizing. The Davenports occupied part of the house in their infrequent stops there, and their servants remained to take care of the philosopher and his housekeeper. Rousseau insisted on paying Davenport thirty pounds a year for rent and service. His happiness lasted a week. On April 3rd, a London journal, the St. James Chronicle, published in French and English the supposed letter of Frederick the Great to Rousseau, with no indication of the real author. Jean-Jacques was deeply hurt when he learned of this, and all the more when he found out that the editor, William Strawn, had long been a friend of Hume. Moreover, the tone of the British press toward Rousseau had distinctly changed since his departure from Chiswick. Articles critical of the eccentric philosopher multiplied. Some contained items which he thought only Hume knew and could have supplied. In any case, he felt, Hume should have written something in defense of his former guest. He heard that the Scot was living in London in the same house with François Tranchin, son of Jean-Jacques' enemy in Geneva. Presumably Hume was now plentifully informed of Rousseau's faults. On April 24th, Rousseau wrote to the St. James Chronicle as follows. You have offended, sir, against the respect which every private person owes to a sovereign by publicly attributing to the King of Prussia a letter full of extravagance and spite, which consequently you should have known could not have had this author. You have even ventured to transcribe his signature, as though you have seen it written by his hand. I inform you, sir, that this letter was fabricated in Paris, and what grieves and tears my heart especially is that the impostor who wrote it has accomplices in England. You owe it to the King of Prussia, to the truth, and also to me, to print this letter, signed by me, in reparation of an error which no doubt you would reproach yourself for having committed, did you know of what a wicked design you have been made the instrument. I offer you my sincere salutation. Jean-Jacques Rousseau we can understand now why Rousseau thought there was a conspiracy against him. Who but his old foes, Voltaire, Diderot, Grimm, and other lanterns of the Enlightenment, could have engineered the sudden change of tone in the British press from one of welcome and honor to one of ridicule and belittlement? About this time Voltaire published anonymously a letter to Dr. J. J. Pansoff, reproducing the unfavorable references to the English people in Jean-Jacques' writings that they were not really free, that they cared too much for money, they were not naturally good. The most damaging items in Voltaire's pamphlet were reprinted in a London periodical, Lloyd's Evening News. On May 9th, Rousseau wrote to Conway asking that the pension offered him be withheld for the time being. Hume urged him to accept it. Rousseau replied that he could not accept any benefit obtained through Hume's mediation. Hume demanded an explanation. Brooding in his isolation, Rousseau seems now to have passed into a frenzy of suspicion and resentment. On July 10th, he sent Hume a letter of eighteen folio pages, too long for total quotation, but
but so pivotal to a famous quarrel that some central passages must be borne in mind. I am ill, sir, and little disposed for writing, but as you ask for an explanation it must be given you. I live outside the world, and I remain ignorant of much that goes on in it. I only know what I feel. You ask me, confidently, who is your accuser. Your accuser, sir, is the one man in the whole world whom I would believe. It is yourself. Naming David Hume as a third person, I will make you the judge of what I ought to think of him. Rousseau acknowledged at length Hume's benefactions, but added, As for the real good done me, these services are more apparent than weighty. I was not so absolutely unknown that, had I arrived alone, I should have gone without help or counsel. If Mr. Davenport has been good enough to give me this habitation, it was not to oblige Mr. Hume, whom he did not know. All the good that has befallen me here would have befallen me in much the same way without him, meaning Hume. But the evil that has befallen me would not have happened, for why should I have any enemies in England? And how and why does it happen that these enemies are precisely Mr. Hume's friends? I heard also that the son of the mountebank Tranchin, my most mortal enemy, was not only the friend but the protégé of Mr. Hume, and that they lodged together. All these facts together made an impression upon me which rendered me anxious. At the same time the letters I wrote did not reach their destination. Those I received had been opened, and all these had passed through Mr. Hume's hands. But what became of me when I saw in the public press the pretended letter from the King of Prussia? A ray of light revealed to me the secret cause of the astonishingly sudden change toward me in the disposition of the British public, and I saw in Paris the centre of the plot which was being executed in London. When this pretended letter was published in London, Mr. Hume, who certainly knew that it was fictitious, said not one word, wrote to me nothing. There remains only one word for me to say to you. If you are guilty, do not write to me. It would be useless. Be assured you would not deceive me. But if you are innocent, deign to justify yourself. If you are not, farewell forever. Hume replied briefly on July 22nd, 1766, not meeting the charges, for he had come to the conclusion that Rousseau was verging upon insanity. If I may venture to give my advice, he wrote to Davenport, it is that you would continue the charitable work you have begun till he be shut up altogether in Bedlam. Hearing that Rousseau had denounced him in letters to Paris, for example to the Comtesse de Boufflay on April 9th, 1766, he sent to Madame de Boufflay a copy of Jean-Jacques's long letter. She replied to Hume, Rousseau's letter is atrocious. It is to the last degree extravagant and inexcusable. But do not believe him capable of any falsehood or artifice, nor imagine that he is either an impostor or a scoundrel. His anger has no just cause, but it is sincere. Of that I feel no doubt. Here is what I imagine to be the cause of it. I have heard it said, and he has perhaps been told, that one of the best phrases in Mr. Walpole's letter was by you, and that you had said in jest, speaking in the name of the King of Prussia, If you wish for persecutions, I am a king, and can procure them for you of any sort you like. And that Mr. Walpole had said you were its author. If this be true, and Rousseau knows of it, do you wonder that, sensitive, hot-headed, melancholy, and proud, he has become enraged? On July 26th, Walpole wrote to Hume, taking full blame, not expressing any repentance for the false letter, and condemning Rousseau's ungrateful and wicked heart, but he did not deny that Hume had had a hand in the letter. Hume wrote to Dolbach, You are quite right, Rousseau is a monster, and withdrew the kindly words he had formerly used of Rousseau's character. When he learned from Davenport that Jean-Jacques was writing confessions, he assumed that Rousseau would air his side of the affair. Adam Smith, Turgot, and Maréchal Keith advised Hume to bear the attack in silence, but the philosophe of Paris, led by d'Alembert, urged him to publish his own account of a cause already célèbre in two capitals. So he issued, in October 1766, an exposé succinct de la contestation qui s'est élevée entre M. Hume et M. Rousseau, which had been put into French by d'Alembert and Suard. A month later it appeared in English. Grimm gave its essence wide circulation in his subscription letter of October 15th, so that the quarrel resounded in Geneva, Amsterdam, Berlin, and St. Petersburg. 
A dozen pamphlets redoubled the brie. Walpole printed his version of the dispute. Boswell attacked Walpole. Madame de la Tour's précis sur Monsieur Rousseau called Hume a traitor. Voltaire sent him additional material on Rousseau's faults and crimes, on his frequentation of places of ill fame, and on his seditious activities in Switzerland. George III followed the battle with intense curiosity. Hume sent the pertinent documents to the British Museum. Amid all this furor, Rousseau maintained a somber silence, but he resolved now to return to France at whatever risk and cost. The damp climate of England, the reserve of the English character, depressed him. The solitude he had sought was greater than he could bear. Having made no attempt to learn English, he found it difficult to get along with the servants. He could converse only with Thérèse, who daily pleaded with him to take her to France. To further her plans, she assured him that the servants were planning to poison him. On October 30th, 1767, he wrote to his absent landlord, Davenport, "'Tomorrow, sir, I leave your house. I am not unaware of the ambushes which are laid for me, nor of my inability to protect myself. But, sir, I have lived. It remains for me only to finish bravely a career passed with honour. Farewell, sir. I shall always regret the dwelling which I leave now, but I shall regret even more having had in you so agreeable a host and yet not having been able to make of him a friend. On May 1st he and Thérèse fled in haste and fear. They left their baggage behind and money to pay for thirteen months' lodging. Unfamiliar with English geography, they took various circuitous conveyances, travelled part of the way on foot, and for ten days were lost to the world. The newspapers advertised their disappearance. On May 11th they turned up at Spalding in Lincolnshire. Thence they found their way to Dover, and there on May 22nd they embarked for Calais, after sixteen months in England. Hume wrote to Turgot and other friends, asking them to help the outcast, who, still technically under warrant of arrest, now returned desolate to France. Book Three The Catholic South, 1715-1789 Chapter 9. Italia Felix, 1715-1759. 1. The Landscape. Divided into a dozen jealous states, Italy could not unite for its own defense. The Italians were so busy relishing life that they allowed immature aliens to kill one another for the bitter fruit of politics and the tainted spoils of war. So the Golden Peninsula became the battleground of Bourbon Spain and France against Habsburg Austria. A succession of wars of succession ended in 1748 with Spain again holding the Kingdom of Naples and the Duchy of Parma. The popes kept control of the Papal States. Savoy, Venice, and San Marino remained free. Genoa and Modena were French protectorates. Austria retained the Milanese and Tuscany. Meanwhile, the sun shone, the fields, vineyards, and orchards gave food and drink, the women were beautiful and passionate, and arias filled the air. Foreigners came as tourists and students to enjoy the climate, the scenery, the theatres, the music, the art, and the society of men and women dowered with the culture of centuries. Half conquered, half despoiled, Italy, at least in the north, was the happiest country in Europe. Its population stood at some fourteen millions in 1700, about eighteen millions in 1800. Less than half the land was arable, but of that half every square foot was tilled with patient labor and skillful care. Sloping terrain was terraced to hold the earth, and vines were hung from tree to tree, garlanding the orchards. In the south the soil was poor. There the sardonically smiling sun dried up the rivers, the earth, and man, and feudalism kept its medieval hold. A bitter proverb said that Christ had never gotten south of Eboli, which was just south of Sorrento. In central Italy the soil was fertile, and was tilled by sharecroppers under ecclesiastical lords. In the north, above all in the valley of the Po, the soil was enriched with irrigation canals. These required capital outlays and a peasantry disciplined to dredge the beds and shore the banks. Here, too, the farmers tilled another man's land for a share in the crops. 
but in those teeming fields even poverty could be borne with dignity. A thousand villages took form on the plains, in the hills, by the sea, dirty and dusty in the summer, noisy in the morning with talkative labor slowing its pace to the heat, silent at noon, alive in the evening with gossip, music, and amorous pursuits. More than money, the Italians loved their midday siesta, when, said Père Labat, one saw nothing in the streets but dogs, fools, and Frenchmen. A hundred towns rich in churches, palaces, beggars, and art, half a dozen cities as beautiful as Paris, thousands of artisans still at the top of their craft. Capitalistic industry was again developing in textiles, especially in Milan, Turin, Bergamo, and Vicenza. But even in textiles, most of the work was done at domestic looms as part of family life. A small middle class, merchants, bankers, manufacturers, lawyers, physicians, functionaries, journalists, writers, artists, priests, was growing up between the aristocracy, landowners and ecclesiastical hierarchy, and the populace, shopkeepers, artisans, and peasantry, but it had as yet no political power. Class distinctions, except in Venice and Genoa, were not painfully pronounced. In most Italian cities, the nobles entered actively into commerce, industry, or finance. The fact that any Italian peasant could become a bishop or a pope infused a democratic element into social life. At the court, the possessor of an awesome pedigree rubbed elbows with a prelate of humble birth. In the academies and universities, intellectual excellence outweighed the claims of caste. In the carnival melee, men and women, at ease behind their masks, forgot their social grades as well as their moral codes. Conversation was as gay as in France, except for a tacit agreement not to disturb a religion that brought international tribute to Italy, even, especially, from her conquerors. There was nothing puritanic about that religion. It had made its peace with the nature of man and the climate of Italy. It allowed in the carnivals a moratorium on modesty, but it labored to preserve the institutions of marriage and the family against the credulity of women and the imagination of men. In the literate classes, girls were sent to a convent at an early age, as early as their fifth year, not chiefly for education, but for moral surveillance. The eager product was released only when a dowry had been raised for her, and some suitor, approved by her parents or guardians, was prepared to offer her marriage. Occasionally, if we may credit Casanova, a concupiscent nun could elude the mother superior, or the mother superior could elude her nuns, and find a way to meet a concupiscent male between dusk and dawn. But these were rare and perilous escapades. We cannot say as much for the morals of the monks. Generally, the unmarried male, if he could not seduce a wife, patronized prostitutes. Le Comte de Quelou estimated 8,000 of them at Naples in 1714 and a population of 150,000. President de Bros in Milan found that one cannot take a step in the public squares without encountering pimps, courtiers de galanterie, who offer you women of whatever color or nationality you may desire. But you may believe that the effect is not always as magnificent as the promise. In Rome, the prostitutes were excluded from the churches and public assemblies and were forbidden to sell their charms during Advent or Lent, or on Sundays and Holy Days. Their greatest cross was the accessibility of married women to illicit devotion. These revenged themselves on their guarded adolescents and unchosen mates by indulging in liaisons and by adopting a cavaliere servente. This custom of Chichis Beatura, imported from Spain, allowed a married woman with her husband's consent and in his absence to be attended by a serving gentleman who accompanied her to dinner, to the theater, to society, but rarely to bed. Some husbands chose cavalieri serventi for their wives to keep these from unlawful loves. The wide circulation of Casanova's memoirs and the hasty reports of French travelers accustomed to French laxity led to an exaggerated foreign conception of Italian immorality. Crimes of violence or passion abounded, but by and large the Italians were devoted children, jealous husbands, hard-working wives, and fond parents— living a united family life, and facing the tribulations of marriage and parentage with dignity, volubility, and resilient good cheer. The education of women was not encouraged, for many men considered literacy dangerous to chastity. 
A minority of girls received in convents some instruction in reading, writing, embroidery, the arts of dressing, and pleasing. Yet we hear of well-educated women conducting salons in which they conversed at ease with writers, artists, and men of affairs. In Palermo, Anna Gentile translated Voltaire into good Italian verse and published Le Terre Philosophiche, in which she boldly defended the non-religious ethics of Helvetius. At Milan, President de Bros heard Maria Gaetana Agnesi, aged twenty, lecture in Latin on hydraulics. She learned Greek, Hebrew, French, and English, and wrote treatises on conic sections and analytical geometry. At the University of Bologna, Signora Mazzolini taught anatomy, and Signora Tambroni taught Greek. At that same university, Laura Bassi received the doctorate in philosophy at the age of twenty-one in 1732. She soon acquired such erudition that she was appointed to a professorship. She lectured on Newton's optics and wrote treatises on physics. Meanwhile, she gave her husband twelve children and educated them herself. The great majority in both sexes remained illiterate without social contumely. If a village lad showed an alert and eager mind, the priest would usually find some way of getting him an education. Various religious congregations organized schools in the towns. The Jesuits had a great number of colleges in Italy. Six in Venice, seven in the Milanese, six in Genoa, ten in Piedmont, twenty-nine in Sicily, and many in the Kingdom of Naples and the Papal States. There were universities at Turin, Genoa, Milan, Pavia, Pisa, Florence, Bologna, Padua, Rome, Naples, and Palermo. All these were under control of Catholic ecclesiastics, but there were many laymen on the faculties. Teachers and students alike were sworn not to teach, read, say, or do anything contrary to the doctrine of the Roman Church. At Padua, says Casanova, the Venetian government paid well-known professors very highly and left the students absolute liberty to follow their lessons and lectures or not as they liked. In addition, the Italian mind was stimulated by many academies devoted to literature, science, or art, and usually free from priestly control. Chief of these in fame was the Arcadian Academy, which was now in genteel decay. There were public libraries like the beautiful Bibliotheca Ambrosiana at Milan, or the Bibliotheca Malibecchiana, now Nazionale, at Florence and many private libraries, like that of the Pisani at Venice, were open to the public on stated days of the week. De Bros reported that the libraries of Italy were more frequently and zealously used than those of France. Finally, there were periodicals of every sort, scholarly, literary, or humorous. The Giornale dei Letterati d'Italia, established in 1710 by Apostolo Zeno and Francesco Scipione di Maffei, was one of the most learned and respected journals in Europe. All in all, Italy was enjoying a lively intellectual life. Poets abounded, living from dedication to dedication. The air was powdered with lyrics still echoing Petrarch. Improvisatori competed in spawning verses on the spur of the invitation. But there was no great poet till Alfieri closed the century. There were theatres at Venice, Vicenza, Genoa, Turin, Milan, Florence, Padua, Naples, Rome. To these elegant structures the elite and the commonalty came to converse and ogle, as well as to hear the opera or the play. There were great scholars like Maffei, industrious historians like Muratori. Soon there would be great scientists. It was a slightly artificial culture, cautious under censorship, and too courteous to be brave. Even so, some fitful breezes of heresy came over the Alps or the sea. Foreigners, chiefly Jacobite Englishmen, established in Genoa, Florence, Rome, and Naples, from 1730 onward, Freemason lodges with a tendency to deism. Popes Clement XII and Benedict XIV condemned them, but they attracted numerous adherents, especially from the nobility, occasionally from the clergy. Some books of Montesquieu, Voltaire, Reynal, Mably, Condillac, Helvetius, Dolbach, and La Maitrie were imported into Italy. Editions of the Encyclopédie in French were published at Lucca, Leghorn, and Padua. In a modest degree, in a form available to persons who could read French, the Enlightenment reached Italy. 
but the Italian deliberately and for the most part contentedly refrained from philosophy. His bent and skill lay in the creation or appreciation of art and poetry or music. A tangible or visible or audible beauty seemed preferable to an elusive truth that was never guaranteed to please. He let the world argue while he sang. 2. Music Europe acknowledged the supremacy of Italian music, accepted its instruments and forms, welcomed its virtues, crowned its castrati, and surrendered to its melodious opera before, despite of, and after Gluck. Gluck, Hasse, Mozart, and a thousand others went to Italy to study its music, to learn the secrets of bel canto from Porpora, or to receive Padre Martini's accolade. In Venice, said Bernie, If two persons are walking together arm in arm, it seems as though they converse only in song. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now. The Story of Civilization, Volume 10, Rousseau and Revolution, by Will and Ariel Durant, Part 1, Continued. Cassette 9, Side 2 In Venice, said Bernie, if two persons are walking together arm in arm, it seems as though they converse only in song. All the songs there are duets. In the Piazza di San Marco, reported another Englishman, a man from the people, a shoemaker, a blacksmith, strikes up an air. Other persons of his sort, joining him, sing this air in several parts, with an accuracy and taste which one seldom encounters in the best society of our northern countries. Lovers under a window plucked at a guitar or mandolin and a maiden's heart. Street singers carried their strains into coffee houses and taverns. In the gondolas, music caressed the evening air. Salons, academies, and theaters gave concerts. Churches trembled with organs and choirs. At the opera, men melted and women swooned over some divas or castrato's aria. At a symphony concert given in Rome under the stars in 1758, Morlay heard such exclamations as, O oh Benedetto! O oh che gusto! Piacere di morir! O oh blessed one! O oh what delight! One could die of pleasure! It was not unusual at the opera to hear sobbing in the audience. Musical instruments were loved with more than sexual fidelity. Money was lavished to make them objects of art, precisely fashioned in precious wood, inlaid with ivory, enamel, or jewelry. Diamonds might be seen on harps or guitars. Stradivari had left in Cremona pupils like Giuseppe Antonio Guarneri and Domenico Montagnana, who carried on the secret of making violins, violas, and violoncellos with souls. The harpsichord which the Italians called clavicembalo, remained to the end of the 18th century the favorite keyboard instrument in Italy, though Bartolomeo Cristofori had invented the pianoforte at Florence in 1709. Virtuosi of the harpsichord like Domenico Scarlatti, or of the violin like Tartini and Geminiani, had in this age an international reputation. Francesco Geminiani was the list of the violin, or as his rival Tartini called him, Il Furibondo, the madman of the bow. Coming to England in 1714, he became so popular in the British Isles that he stayed there through most of his final eighteen years. The rise of such virtuosi encouraged the production of instrumental music. This was the golden age of Italian compositions for the violin. Now, chiefly in Italy, overture, suite, sonata, concerto, and symphony took form. All of them stressed melody and harmony rather than the polyphonic counterpoint which was culminating and dying with Johann Sebastian Bach. As the suite grew out of the dance, so the sonata grew out of the suite. It was something sounded as the cantata was something sung. In the eighteenth century it became a sequence of three movements, fast, allegro or presto, slow, andante or adagio, and fast, presto or allegro, with sometimes the interpolation of a scherzo, or joke, recalling the merry gigue, or a graceful minuet recalling the dance. By 1750, the sonata, at least in its first movement, had developed sonata form. 
the exposition of contrasting themes, their elaboration through variation, and their recapitulation toward the close. Through the experiments of G. B. Sammartini and Rinaldo di Capua in Italy, and of Johann Stamitz in Germany, the symphony evolved by applying sonata form to what had formerly been an operatic overture or recitative accompaniment. In these ways, the composer provided pleasure for the mind as well as for the senses. He gave to instrumental music the added artistic quality of a definite structure, limiting and binding the composition into logical order and unity. The disappearance of structure, of the organic relation of parts to a whole or of beginning to middle and end, is the degeneration of an art. The concerto, Latin concertare, to contend, applied to music that principle of conflict which is the soul of drama. It opposed to the orchestra a solo performer and engaged them in harmonious debate. In Italy, its favorite form was the concerto grosso, where the opposition was between a small orchestra of strings and a concertino of two or three virtuosi. Now Vivaldi in Italy, Handel in England, and Bach in Germany brought the concerto grosso to ever finer form, and instrumental music challenged the preeminence of song. Nevertheless, and above all in Italy, the voice continued to be the favorite and incomparable instrument. There it had the advantage of a euphonious language in which the vowel had conquered the consonant, of a long tradition of church music, and of a highly developed art of vocal training. Here were the alluring prima donnas who yearly mounted the scales in weight and wealth, and the plump castrati who went forth to subdue kings and queens. These male sopranos or contraltos combined the lungs and the larynx of a man with the voice of a woman or a boy. Emasculated at the age of seven or eight and subjected to a long and subtle discipline of breathing and vocalization, they learned to perform the trills and flourishes, the quavers and runs and breathtaking cadenzas that sent Italian audiences into a delirium of approval, sometimes expressed by the exclamation, Eviva il coltello! Long live the little knife! The ecclesiastical opposition, especially at Rome, to the employment of women on the stage and the inferior training of female singers in the seventeenth century, had created a demand which the little knife supplied by cutting the seminal ducts. So great were the rewards of successful castrati that some parents, with the victim's induced consent, submitted a son to the operation at the first sign of a golden voice. Expectations were often disappointed— in every city of Italy, said Bernie, numbers of these failures could be found without any voice at all. After 1750, the vogue of the castrati declined, for the prima donnas had learned to surpass them in purity of tone and rival them in vocal power. The most famous name in 18th century music was not Bach, nor Handel, nor Mozart, but Farinelli, which was not his name. Carlo Broschi, apparently assumed the name of his uncle, who was already well known in musical circles. Born in Naples in 1705 of pedigreed parentage, Carlo would not normally have entered the ranks of the unmanned. We are told that an accident that befell him while riding compelled the operation that resulted in the finest voice in history. He studied singing with Porpora, accompanied him to Rome, and appeared there in Porpora's opera Eumene. In one aria he competed with a flutist in holding and swelling a note, and so outpuffed him that invitations came to him from a dozen capitals. In 1727, at Bologna, he met his first defeat. He divided a duo with Antonio Bernacchi, acknowledged as the king of singers, and begged him to be his teacher. Bernacchi consented and was soon eclipsed by his pupil. Farinelli now went from triumph to triumph in city after city, Venice, Vienna, Rome, Naples, Ferrara, Lucca, Turin, London, Paris. His vocal technique was a wonder of the age. The art of breathing was one secret of his skill. More than any other singer, he knew how to breathe deeply, quickly, imperceptibly, and could hold a note while all musical instruments gave out. In the aria Son Qual Nave, he began the first note with almost inaudible delicacy, expanded it gradually to full volume, and then reduced it by degrees to its first faintness. Sometimes an audience, even in staid England, would applaud this curiosa felicitas for five minutes. He won his hearers also by his pathos, grace, and tenderness. 
and these qualities were in his nature as well as in his voice. In 1737 he made what he thought would be a brief visit to Spain. He remained in or near Madrid for a quarter of a century. We shall look for him there. With castrati like Farinelli and Senesino, with divas like Faustina Bordoni and Francesca Cuzzoni, opera became the voice of Italy, and as such was heard with delight everywhere in Europe except in France, where it stirred a war. Originally, opera was the plural of opus, meaning works. In Italian, the plural became singular, still meaning a work. What we now call opera was termed opera per musica, a musical work. Only in the 18th century did the word take on its present meaning. Influenced by traditions of the Greek drama, it had been designed originally as a play accompanied by music. Soon in Italy the music dominated the play, and arias dominated the music. Operas were planned to give display solos to each prima donna and each primo uomo in the cast. Between these exciting peaks the auditors conversed. Between the acts they played cards or chess, gambled, ate sweets, fruit or hot suppers, and visited and flirted from box to box. In such feasts the libretto was regularly drowned in an intermittent cascade of arias, duets, choruses, and ballets. The historian Lodovico Muratori denounced this submergence of poetry in 1701. The librettist Apostolo Zeno agreed with him. The composer Benedetto Marcello satirized this tendency in Teatro alla Moda in 1721. Metastasio for a time stemmed the torrent, but rather in Austria than in Italy. Jomelli and Traita struggled against it, but were repudiated by their countrymen. The Italians frankly preferred music to poetry and took the drama as mere scaffolding for song. Probably no other art form in history ever enjoyed such popularity as opera in Italy. No enthusiasm could compare with an Italian audience welcoming an aria or a cadenza by a singer of renown. To cough during such a ceremony was a social felony. Applause began before the familiar song was finished and was reinforced by canes beating upon floors or the backs of chairs. Some devotees tossed their shoes into the air. Every Italian town of any pride, and which of them was without pride, had its opera house. There were forty in the Papal States alone. Whereas in Germany opera was usually a court function, closed to the public, and in England it limited its audience by high prices of admission, in Italy it was open to all decently dressed persons at a modest charge, sometimes at no charge at all. And as the Italians were devoted to the enjoyment of life, they insisted that their operas, however tragic, should have a happy ending. Moreover, they liked humor as well as sentiment. The custom grew to interpolate comic intermezzi between the acts of an opera. These interludes developed into a genus of their own until they rivaled opera seria in popularity and sometimes in length. It was an opera buffa, Pergolesi's La Serva Padrona, that charmed Paris in 1752 and was acclaimed by Rousseau as attesting the superiority of Italian music over French. Buffa or Seria, Italian opera was a force in history. As Rome had once conquered Western Europe with her armies, as the Roman Church had conquered it again with her creed, so Italy conquered it once more with opera. Her operas displaced native productions in Germany, Denmark, England, Portugal, Spain, even in Russia. Her singers were the idols of almost every European capital. Native singers, to win acceptance at home, took Italian names. That enchanting conquest will go on as long as vowels can outsing consonants. 3. Religion after the prima donnas and the great castrati, the dominant class in Italy was the clergy. In their distinctive cassocks and under their broad-rimmed hats they walked or rode in proud freedom across the Italian scene, knowing that they dispensed the most precious boon known to humanity, hope. Whereas in France there was in this century approximately one ecclesiastic for each two hundred souls, in Rome there was one for fifteen, in Bologna one for seventeen, in Naples and Turin, one for twenty-eight. A contemporary Neapolitan, professedly orthodox, complained, 
So greatly have the clergy increased in number that the princes must either take measures to restrict them, or allow them to engulf the whole of the state. Why is it necessary that the smallest Italian village should be controlled by fifty or sixty priests? The great number of campaniles and convents shuts out the sun. There are cities with as many as twenty-five convents of friars or sisters of St. Dominic, seven colleges of Jesuits, as many of Theatines, about twenty or thirty monasteries of Franciscan friars, and a good fifty others of different religious orders of both the sexes, not to speak of four or five hundred churches and chapels. Perhaps these figures were exaggerated for argument. We hear of four hundred churches in Naples, two hundred sixty in Milan, one hundred and ten in Turin. These, however, included small chapels. The monks were relatively poor, but the secular clergy as a whole possessed more wealth than the nobility. In the kingdom of Naples, the clergy received a third of the revenues. In the duchy of Parma, one half, in Tuscany almost three quarters of the soil, belonged to the clergy. In Venice, in the eleven years from 1755 to 1765, new legacies added 3,300,000 ducats worth of property to the church. Some cardinals and bishops were among the richest men in Italy, but cardinals and bishops were primarily administrators and statesmen, only occasionally saints. Several of them, in the second half of the century, renounced their wealth and luxury and led lives of voluntary poverty. The Italian people, barring a few publicists or satirists, made no significant protest against the wealth of the clergy. They took pride in the splendor of their churches, monasteries, and prelates. Their contributions seemed a small price to pay for the order that religion brought to the family and the state. Every home had a crucifix and an image of the Virgin. Before these, the family, parents, children, and servants knelt in prayer each evening. What could replace the moral influence of those unifying prayers? The abstinence from meat on Fridays and on Wednesdays and Fridays in Lent was a wholesome discipline of desire, and was a boon to health and fishermen. The priests, who themselves knew the charms of women, were not too hard on sins of the flesh, and winked an eye at the laxities of carnival. Even the prostitutes on Saturdays lit a candle before the Virgin and deposited money for a mass. De Brosse, Attending a play in Verona was astonished to see the performance stop when the church bells rang the Angelus. All the actors knelt and prayed. An actress who had fallen in a dramatic faint rose to join in the prayer and then fainted again. Seldom has a religion been so loved as Catholicism in Italy. There was another side to the picture, censorship and inquisition. The church demanded that every Italian at least once a year perform his or her Easter duty go to confession on Holy Saturday, and receive communion on Easter morn. Failure to do this brought, in all but the largest cities, priestly reproof. Failure of private reproof and exhortation brought public listing of the recusant's name on the doors of the parish church. Continued refusal brought excommunication and, in some towns, imprisonment. The Inquisition, however, had lost much of its power and bite. In the larger centers ecclesiastical surveillance could be evaded, Censorship was reduced, and there was a silent spread of doubt and heresy in the intelligentsia, even in the clergy themselves, for some of these, despite papal bulls, were secret Jansenists. While many priests and monks led easy lives and were no strangers to sin, there were also many who were faithful to their vows and kept the faith alive by devotion to their tasks. New religious foundations testified to the survival of the monastic impulse. St. Alfonso de Liguori, a lawyer of noble lineage, founded in 1732 the Redemptorists, that is, the Congregation of the Most Holy Redeemer, and St. Paul of the Cross, Paolo de Ney, who practiced the most severe asceticism, founded in 1737 the Passionist Order, that is, the Clerks of the Holy Cross and Passion of Our Lord. The Society of Jesus the Jesuits, had in 1750 some 23,000 members, 3,622 of them in Italy, half of them priests. Their power was quite out of proportion to their number. As confessors to kings, queens, and prominent families, they often influenced domestic and international politics, and they were sometimes the most urgent force, next to the populace itself, in the persecution of heresy. Yet they were the most liberal of the Catholic theologians. 
We have seen elsewhere how patiently they sought a compromise with the French Enlightenment. A similar flexibility marked their foreign missions. In China they converted several hundred thousands to Catholicism, but their intelligent concessions to ancestor worship, to Confucianism, and to Taoism shocked the missionaries of other orders, and these persuaded Pope Benedict XIV to check and reprove the Jesuits in the bull Ex Quo Singulari in 1743. They remained nevertheless the most able and learned defenders of the Catholic faith against Protestantism and unbelief, and the most loyal supporters of the popes against the kings. In the conflicts of jurisdiction and power between the national states and the supranational church, the kings saw in the society of Jesus their subtlest and most persistent enemy. They resolved to destroy it. But the first act of this drama belongs to Portugal. 4. From Turin to Florence Entering Italy from France by Montsenis, we descend the Alps into foot of the mountain Piedmont, and pass through vineyards, fields of grain, and orchards of olive or chestnut trees to two thousand year old Turin, ancient citadel of the House of Savoy. This is one of the oldest royal families in existence, founded in 1003 by Umberto Biancamano, Umbert of the White Hand. Its head in this period was among the ablest rulers of the time. Victor Amadeus II inherited the ducal throne of Savoy at the age of nine in 1675, took charge at eighteen, fought now for, now against the French in the wars of Louis XIV, shared with Eugene of Savoy in driving the French from Turin and Italy, and emerged from the Treaty of Utrecht in 1713 with Sicily added to his crown. In 1718 he exchanged Sicily for Sardinia. He took the title King of Sardinia, in 1720, but kept Turin as his capital. He governed with brusque competence, improved public education, raised the general prosperity, and after fifty-five years of rule, abdicated in favor of his son Charles Emmanuel I, who reigned from 1730 to 1773. During these two reigns, covering almost a century, Turin was a leading center of Italian civilization. Montesquieu, seeing it in 1728, called it the most beautiful city in the world, though he loved Paris. Chesterfield, in 1749, praised the court of Savoy as the best in Europe for forming well-bred and agreeable people. Part of Turin's splendor was due to Filippo Juvara, an architect who still breathed the afflatus of the Renaissance. On the proud hill of Superga, towering 2,300 feet above the city, he built, between 1717 and 1731, for Victor Amadeus II, to commemorate the liberation of Turin from the French, a handsome basilica in classic style of portico and dome, which for a century served as a tomb for Savoyard royalty. To the old Palazzo Madama, he added in 1718, a lordly staircase and massive facade. And in 1729 he designed, Benedetto Alfieri completed, the immense Castello Stupinigi, whose main hall displayed all the ornate splendor of Baroque. Turin remained the capital of the Savoy Dukes until in their final triumph, from 1860 onward, they moved to Rome to become kings of united Italy. Milan, long stifled by Spanish domination, revived under the milder Austrian rule. In 1703, Franz Tiefen, in 1746 and 1755, Felice and Ro Clerici, aided by the government, established textile factories that extended the replacement of handicrafts and guilds with large-scale production under capitalistic financing and management. In the cultural history of Milan, the great name was now Giovanni Battista Sammartini, whom we can still hear occasionally over the affluent air. In his symphonies and sonatas, the contrapuntal solemnity of the German masters was replaced by a dynamic interplay of contrasted themes and moods. The young Gluck, coming to Milan in 1737 as chamber musician to Prince Francesco Melzi, became the pupil and friend of Sammartini, and adopted his method of constructing an opera. In 1770, the Bohemian composer Josef Mislivicek, listening with the youthful Mozart to some of Sammartini's symphonies in Milan, exclaimed, I have found the father of Haydn's style, and therefore one of the fathers of the modern symphony. Genoa had a bad eighteenth century. 
Its commerce had declined through the competition of the oceans with the Mediterranean, but its strategic location on a defensive hill overlooking a well-equipped port attracted the dangerous attention of neighboring powers. Placed between enemies without and an uneducated but passionate populace within, the government fell into the hands of old commercial families ruling through a closed council and an obedient doge. This self-perpetuating oligarchy taxed the people into a sullen and impatient poverty, and was in turn dominated and fleeced by the Banco di San Giorgio. When the Allied forces of Savoy and Austria besieged Genoa in 1746, the government did not dare arm the people to resist for fear they would kill the rulers. It preferred to open the gates to the besiegers who exacted indemnities and ransoms that broke the bank. The commonalty, preferring indigenous exploiters, rose against the Austrian garrison, bombarded it with tiles and stones torn from roofs and streets, and drove it ignominiously out. The old tyranny was resumed. The Genoese patriciate built new mansions like the Palazzo de Ferrari, and shared with Milan in supporting a painter who has come to a second fame in our time. Almost every extant picture by Alessandro Magnasco strikes us with the dark originality of its style. Pancinello playing the guitar, an elongated figure in careless patches of black and brown, the graceful girl and musician before the fire, the barber, apparently eager to cut his client's throat, the massive refectory of the monks, attesting the culinary prosperity of the church. All these are masterpieces, recalling El Greco in their gaunt forms and tricks of light, anticipating Goya in macabre exposure of life's cruelties, and almost modernistic in rough disdain of prim detail. Florence in this age saw the end of one of history's most famous families. The prolonged reign of Cosimo III, from 1670 to 1723 as Grand Duke of Tuscany, was a misfortune for a people still proud with memories of Florentine grandeur under the earlier Medici. Obsessed with theology, Cosimo allowed the clergy to govern him and draw from his ailing revenues rich endowments for the church. Despotic rule, incompetent administration, and exorbitant taxation forfeited the popular support that the dynasty had enjoyed for 250 years. Cosimo's eldest son, Ferdinand, preferred courtesans to courtiers, ruined his health with excesses, and died childless in 1713. Another son, John Gastone, took to books, studied history and botany, and lived a quiet life. In 1697 his father forced him to marry Anne of Saxe-Lauenburg, a widow of unfurnished mind. John went to live with her in a remote Bohemian village, bore boredom for a year, then consoled himself with adulteries in Prague. When Ferdinand's health failed, Cosimo called John back to Florence. When Ferdinand died, John was named heir to the Grand Ducal Crown. John's wife refused to live in Italy. Cosimo, fearing extinction of the Medici line, persuaded the Florentine Senate to decree that on the death of the childless John Gastone, John's sister Anna Maria Ludovica should succeed to the throne. The European powers fluttered eagerly around the dying dynasty. In 1718, Austria, France, England, and Holland refused to recognize Cosimo's arrangement and declared that on John's death Tuscany and Parma should be given to Don Carlos, eldest son of Elizabeth Farnese, Queen of Spain. Cosimo protested and belatedly reorganized the military defenses of Leghorn and Florence. His death left to his son an impoverished state and a precarious throne. John Gastone was now, in 1732, fifty-two years old. He labored to remedy abuses in the administration and the economy, dismissed the spies and sycophants who had fattened under his father, reduced taxes, recalled exiles, released political prisoners, assisted the revival of industry and commerce, and restored the social life of Florence to security and gaiety. The enrichment of the Uffizi Gallery by Cosimo II and John Gastone, the flourishing of music under the lead of Francesco Veracini's violin, the masked balls, the parades of decorated carriages, the popular battles of confetti and flowers, made Florence rival Venice and Rome in attracting foreign visitors. Here, for example, about 1740, Lady Mary Wortley Montague, Horace Walpole, and Thomas Gray gathered around Lady Henrietta Pumfret in the Palazzo Ridolfo. 
there is something wistfully attractive in a society in decay. Exhausted by his efforts, John Gastoni in 1731 turned the government over to his ministers and slipped into sensual degradation. Spain sent an army of 30,000 men to ensure Don Carlos's succession. Charles VI of Austria sent 50,000 troops to escort his daughter Maria Theresa to the Grand Ducal Throne. War was averted by an agreement in 1736 among Austria, France, England, and Holland that Carlos should have Naples and that Tuscany should go to Maria Theresa and her husband, Francis of Lorraine. On July 9, 1737, the last of the Medici rulers died. Tuscany became a dependence of Austria, and Florence flowered again. 5. Queen of the Adriatic Between Milan and Venice, some minor cities lolled in the sun. Bergamo had to be content in this half-century with painters like Ghislandi, composers like Locatelli. Verona presented operas in her Roman theater and had an outstanding man in Marchese Francesco Scipione di Maffei. His poetic drama, Merope, of 1713, was imitated by Voltaire, who honorably dedicated his own Merope to him as the first who had courage and genius enough to hazard a tragedy without gallantry, a tragedy worthy of Athens in its glory, wherein maternal affection constitutes the whole intrigue and the most tender interest arises from the purest virtue. Even more distinguished was Maffei's scholarly Verona Illustrata of 1731-32, which set a pace for archaeology. His city was so proud of him that it raised a statue to him in his lifetime. Vicenza, with its buildings by Palladio, was a goal of pilgrimage for architects reviving the classic style. Padua had a university then especially noted for its faculties of law and medicine, and it had Giuseppe Tartini, acknowledged by all, except Geminiani, to be at the head of Europe's violinists. Who has not heard Tartini's Devil's Trill? All these cities were part of the Venetian Republic. So in the north were Treviso, Friuli, Feltre, Bassano, Udine, Belluno, Trento, Bolzano, so in the east was Istria. In the south, the state of Venezia extended through Chioggia and Rovigo to the Po. Across the Adriatic it held Cataro, Previca, and other parts of today's Yugoslavia and Albania. And in the Adriatic it held the islands of Corfu, Cephalonia, and Zante. Within this complex realm dwelt some three million souls, each the center of the world. 1. Venetian Life Venice herself, as the capital, contained 137,000 inhabitants. She was now in political and economic decline, having lost her Aegean Empire to the Turks and much of her foreign commerce to Atlantic states. The failure of the Crusades, the unwillingness of the European governments after the victory at Lepanto in 1571 to help Venice defend the outposts of Christendom in the east, the eagerness of those governments to accept from Turkey commercial privileges denied to her bravest enemy. These developments had left Venice too weak to maintain her Renaissance splendor. She decided to cultivate her own garden, to give to her Italian and Adriatic possessions, a government severe in law, political censorship, and personal supervision, but competent in administration, tolerant in religion and morals, liberal in internal trade. Like the other republics of 18th century Europe, Venice was ruled by an oligarchy. In the flotsam of diverse stocks, Antonios, Shylocks, Othellos, with a populace poorly educated, slow to think and quick to act, and preferring pleasure to power, democracy would have been chaos enthroned. Eligibility to the Gran Consiglio was generally restricted to some 600 families listed in the Libro d'Oro. But to that native aristocracy, some judicious additions were made from the ranks of merchants and financiers, even though of alien blood. The great council chose the Senate, which chose the powerful Council of Ten. A swarm of spies circulated silently among the citizens, reporting to the Inquisitori any suspicious action or speech of any Venetian, of the Doge himself. The Doges were now usually figureheads, 
serving to polarize patriotism and adorn diplomacy. The economy was fighting a losing battle against foreign competition, import dues, and guild restraints. Venetian industry did not expand into free enterprise, free trade, and capitalistic management. It was content with the fame of its crafts. The wool industry, which had 1,500 employees in 1,700, had only 600 at the end of the century. The silk industry declined in the same period from 12,000 to 1,000. The glass workers of Murano resisted any change in the methods that had once brought them European renown. Their secrets escaped to Florence, France, Bohemia, England. Their rivals responded to advances in chemistry, to experiments in manufacture. The Murano ascendancy passed. The lace industry similarly succumbed to competitors beyond the Alps. By 1750, the Venetians themselves were wearing French lace. Two industries flourished. Fisheries, which employed 30,000 men, and the importation and sale of slaves. Religion was not allowed to interfere with the profits of trade or the pleasures of life. The state regulated all matters concerning ecclesiastical property and clerical crime. The Jesuits, expelled in 1606, had been recalled in 1657, but under conditions that checked their influence in education and politics. Despite a governmental ban on the importation of works by the French philosophers, the doctrines of Voltaire, Rousseau, Helvetius, and Diderot found their way, if only by visitors, into Venetian salons, and in Venice, as in France, the aristocracy toyed with the ideas that sapped its power. The people accepted religion as an almost unconscious habit of ritual and belief, but they played more often than they prayed. A Venetian proverb described Venetian morals with all the inadequacy of an epigram. In the morning a little mass, after dinner a little gamble, in the evening a little woman. Young men went to church not to worship the virgin, but to examine the women, and these, despite ecclesiastical and governmental fulminations, dressed décolleté. The perennial war between religion and sex was giving sex the victory. The government permitted a regulated prostitution as a measure of public safety. The courtesans of Venice were famous for their beauty, good manners, rich raiment, and sumptuous apartments on the Grand Canal. The supply of cortigiane was considerable, but still fell short of the demand. Thrifty Venetians and aliens like Rousseau clubbed together two or three to maintain one concubine. Despite these facilities, and not content with cavalieri serventi, married women indulged in liaisons dangereuses. Some of them frequented the casinos, in which every convenience was provided for assignations. Several noble ladies were publicly reproved by the government for loose conduct. Some were ordered confined to their homes. Some were exiled. The middle classes showed more sobriety. A succession of offspring kept the wife busy and filled her need for receiving and giving love. Nowhere did mothers lavish more ardent endearments upon their children. Il mio leon di San Marco, la mia allegrezza, il mio fior di primavera, my lion of St. Mark, my joy, my flower of spring. Crime was less frequent in Venice than elsewhere in Italy. The arm ready to strike was held back by the abundance and watchfulness of constables and gendarmes. But gambling was accepted as a natural occupation of mankind. The government organized a lottery in 1715. The first ridotto, or gambling casino, was opened in 1638. Soon there were many, public or private, and all classes hastened to them. Clever sharpers like Casanova could live on their gambling gains. Others could lose the savings of a year in a night. The players, some masked, bent over the table in a silent devotion more intense than love. The government looked on amiably till 1774, for it taxed the ridotti and received some 300,000 lire from them in annual revenue. Moneyed idlers came from a dozen states to spend their savings or their declining years in the relaxed morals and plein air gaiety of the piazzas and the canals. The abandonment of empire lowered the fever of politics. No one here talked of revolution, for every class, besides its pleasures, had its stabilizing customs, its absorption in accepted tasks. 
Servants were pliant and faithful, but they brooked no insult or contumely. The gondoliers were poor, but they were the lords of the lagoons, standing on their gilded barks in the confident pride of their ancient skill, or rounding a turn with lusty esoteric cries, or murmuring a song to the sway of their bodies and the rhythm of their oars. Many different nationalities mingled in the piazzas, each keeping its distinctive garb, language, and profanity. The upper classes still dressed as in the heyday of the Renaissance, with shirts of finest linen, velvet breeches, silk stockings, buckled shoes. But it was the Venetians who in this century introduced to Western Europe the Turkish custom of long trousers, pantaloons. Wigs had come in from France about 1665. Young fops took such care of their dress, hair, and smell that their sex was imperceptible. Women of fashion raised upon their heads fantastic towers of false or natural hair. Men as well as women felt undressed without jewelry. Fans were works of art, elegantly painted, often encrusted with gems or enclosing a monocle. Every class had its clubs, every street its café. In Italy, said Goldoni, we take ten cups of coffee every day. All kinds of amusement flourished, from prize fights, pungi, to masked balls. One game, pallone, tossing an inflated ball about with the palm of the hand, gave us our word balloon. Water sports were perennial. Ever since 1315, a regatta had been held on January 25th on the Grand Canal. A race between galleys rowed by fifty oars and decorated like our floats. And the festival was climaxed by a water polo game in which hundreds of Venetians divided into shouting and competing groups. On Ascension Day, the Doge sailed in glory from San Marco to the Lido in the richly decorated ship of state, the Bucintoro, amid a thousand other craft, to remarry Venice to the sea. Saints and historical anniversaries lent their names and memories to frequent holidays, for the Senate found that bread and circuses were an acceptable substitute for elections. On such occasions, picturesque processions passed from church to church, from square to square. Colorful carpets, garlands, and silks were hung from windows or balconies on the route. There was intelligible music, pious or amorous song, and graceful dancing in the streets. Patricians chosen for high office celebrated their victories with parades, arches, trophies, festivities, and philanthropies costing sometimes thirty thousand ducats. Every wedding was a festival, and the funeral of a dignitary was the grandest event in his career. And there was Carnival, the Christian legacy from the Saturnalia of pagan Rome. Church and state hoped that by allowing a moral holiday they could reduce, for the remainder of the year, the tension between the flesh and the sixth commandment. Usually in Italy, Carnevale extended only through the last week before Lent. In 18th century Venice, from December 26th or January 7th, to Marte di Grasso, Fat Tuesday, Mardi Gras. Perhaps from that final day of permissible meat-eating, the festival took its name, Carnevale, Farewell to Flesh Food. Almost every night in those winter weeks the Venetians, and visitors converging from all Europe, poured into the piazzas, dressed in gay colors, and hiding age, rank, and identity behind a mask. In that disguise many men and women laughed at laws, and harlots thrived. Confetti flew about, and artificial eggs were cast around to spread their scented waters when they broke. Pantalone, Arlecchino, Colombine, and other beloved characters from the comic theater pranced and prattled to amuse the crowd. Puppets danced, rope walkers stopped a thousand breaths. Strange beasts were brought in for the occasion, like the rhinoceros, which was first seen in Venice in the festivities of 1751. Then, at midnight before Ash Wednesday, Mercoledì della Ceneri, the great bells of San Marco told the end of Carnival. The exhausted reveler returned to his legal bed and prepared to hear his priest tell him on the morrow, Memento homo, quia pulvises et in pulverem radieris. Remember, man, that thou art dust, and unto dust thou shalt return. 2. Vivaldi Venice and Naples were the rival foci of music in Italy. 
In its theaters, Venice heard 1,200 different operas in the 18th century. There, the most renowned divas of the age, Francesca Cuzzoni and Faustina Bordoni, fought their melodious battles for supremacy. And each from one foot of board moved the world. Cuzzoni sang opposite Farinelli in one theater, Bordoni sang opposite Bernacchi in another, and all Venice was divided between their worshippers. If all four had sung together, the Queen of the Adriatic would have melted into her lagoons. At antipodes to these citadels of opera and joy were the four ospedali, or asylums, in which Venice cared for some of her orphan or illegitimate girls. This book is continued on Cassette 10, Side 1. The Story of Civilization, Volume 10, Rousseau and Revolution, by Will and Ariel Durant. Part 1, Continued, Cassette 10, Side 1. At an antipodes to these citadels of opera and joy were the four ospedali, or asylums, in which Venice cared for some of her orphan or illegitimate girls. To give function and meaning to the lives of these homeless children, they were trained in vocal and instrumental music, to sing in choirs, and to give public concerts from behind their semi-monastic grills. Rousseau said he had never heard anything so touching as these girlish voices singing in disciplined harmony. Goethe thought he had never heard so exquisite a soprano, or music of such ineffable beauty. Some of the greatest of Italy's composers taught in these institutions— wrote music for them, and conducted their concerts. Monteverdi, Cavalli, Lotti, Galuppi, Porpora, Vivaldi. To supply her theatres with operas, to furnish her ospedali, orchestras, and virtuosi with vocal and instrumental music, Venice called upon the cities of Italy, sometimes of Austria and Germany. She herself was the mother or nurse of Antonio Lotti, organist and then maestro di cappella at St. Mark's, author of indifferent operas but of a mass that brought tears to Protestant Bernie's eyes, of Baldassare Galuppi, famous for his opera buffi, and for the splendor and tenderness of his operatic airs, of Alessandro Marcello, whose concertos rank high in the compositions of his time, of his younger brother Benedetto, whose musical setting of fifty psalms constitute one of the finest productions of musical literature, and of Antonio Vivaldi. To some of us, the first hearing of a Vivaldi concerto was a humiliating revelation. Why had we been ignorant of him so long? Here was a stately flow of harmony, laughing ripples of melody, a unity of structure and a cohesion of parts— which should have won this man an early entry into our ken and a higher place in our musical histories. He was born about 1675, son of a violinist in the orchestra of the Doge's Chapel in St. Mark's. His father taught him the violin and obtained a place for him in the orchestra. At fifteen he took minor orders. At twenty-five he became a priest. He was called El Prete Rosso because his hair was red. His passion for music may have conflicted with his sacerdotal ministrations. Enemies said that one day when Vivaldi was saying Mass, a subject for a fugue came to his mind. He at once left the altar and repaired to the sacristy to write out the theme. Then he came back to finish Mass. A papal nuncio charged him with keeping several women, and finally, it was said, the Inquisition forbade him to say Mass. Antonio in later years gave quite a different account. It was twenty-five years ago that I said Mass for the last time, not due to interdiction, but by my own decision, because of an ailment that has burdened me since birth. After being ordained a priest, I said Mass for a year or a little more. Then I ceased to say it, having on three occasions been compelled by this ailment to leave the altar without completing it. For this same reason I nearly always live at home, and I only go out in a gondola or coach, because I can no longer walk on account of this chest condition— or rather this tightness in the chest, stretezza di petto, probably asthma. 
No nobleman invites me to his house, not even our prince, because all are informed of my ailment. My travels have always been very costly, because I have always had to make them with four or five women to help me. These women, he added, were of spotless repute. Their modesty was admitted everywhere. Every day of the week they made their devotions. He could not have been much of a rake for the Seminario Musicale del Ospedale della Pietà, kept him through thirty-seven years as violinist, teacher, composer, or maestro di coro, rector of the choir. For his girl students he composed most of his non-operatic works. The demands were great, hence he wrote in haste and corrected at what leisure he could find. He told de Brosse that he could compose a concerto faster than a copyist could copy it. His operas were equally hurried. One of them bore on the title page the boast, or excuse, Fato in Cinque Giorni, done in five days. Like Handel, he saved time by borrowing from himself, adapting past performances to meet present needs. In the interstices of his work at the Ospedale, he composed forty operas. Many contemporaries agreed with Tartini that they were mediocre. Benedetto Marcello made fun of them in his Teatro alla Moda. But audiences in Venice, Vicenza, Vienna, Mantua, Florence, Milan, and Vienna welcomed him, and Vivaldi often deserted his girls to travel with his women through northern Italy, even to Vienna and Amsterdam, to perform as a violinist, or to conduct one of his operas, or to supervise its staging and decor. His operas are now dead, but so are nearly all those composed before Gluck. Styles, manners, heroes, voices, sexes have changed. History knows of 554 compositions by Vivaldi. Of these, 454 are concertos. A clever satirist said that Vivaldi had not written 600 concertos, but had written the same concerto 600 times. And sometimes it seems so. There is in these pieces much sawing of springs, much hurdy-gurdy continuo, an almost metronomic beating of time. Even in the famous series called The Seasons, from 1725, there are some deserts of monotony. But there are also peaks of passionate vitality and wintry blasts, oases of dramatic conflict between soloists and orchestra, and grateful streams of melody. In such pieces Vivaldi brought the Concerto Grosso to an unprecedented excellence, which only Bach and Handel would surpass. Like most artists, Vivaldi suffered from the sensitivity that fed his genius. The power of his music reflected his fiery temper, the tenderness of his strains reflected his piety. As he aged, he became absorbed in religious devotions, so that one fanciful record described him as leaving his rosary only to compose. In 1740 he lost or resigned his post at the Ospedale della Pietà. For reasons now unknown, he left Venice and went to Vienna. We know nothing further of him except that there, a year later, he died and received a pauper's funeral. His death passed unnoticed in the Italian press, for Venice had ceased to care for his music, and no one ranked him near the top of his art in his land and time. His compositions found a welcome in Germany. Quantz, flutist and composer for Frederick the Great, imported Vivaldi's concertos and frankly accepted them as models. Boxo admired them as to transpose at least nine for the harpsichord, four for the organ, and one for four harpsichords and a string ensemble. Apparently it was from Vivaldi and Corelli that Bach derived the tripartite structure of his concertos. Throughout the nineteenth century, Vivaldi was almost forgotten, except by scholars tracing the development of Bach. Then in 1905, Arnold Schering's Geschichte des Instrumental Concerts restored him to prominence, and in the 1920s Arturo Toscanini gave his passion and prestige to Vivaldi's cause. Today the Red Priest takes for a time the highest place among the Italian composers of the 18th century. 3. Remembrances from the Indian summer of Venetian art, a dozen painters rise up and ask for remembrance. We merely salute Giambattista Pitoni, whom Venice placed only after Tiepolo and Piazzetta, and Jacopo Amigoni, 
whose voluptuous style passed down to Boucher, and Giovanni Antonio Pellegrini, who carried his colors to England, France, and Germany. It was he who decorated Kimbleton Castle, Castle Howard, and the Banque de France. Marco Ricci makes a more striking figure since he killed a critic and himself. In 1699, aged 23, he stabbed to death a gondolier who had slighted his paintings. He fled to Dalmatia, fell in love with its landscapes, and caught them so skillfully with his colors that Venice forgave him and hailed him as Tintoretto reborn. His uncle, Sebastiano Ricci, took him to London, where they collaborated on the tomb of the Duke of Devonshire. Like so many artists of the 17th and 18th centuries, he loved to paint real or imaginary ruins— not forgetting himself. In 1729, after several attempts, he succeeded in committing suicide. In 1733, one of his paintings was sold for $500. In 1963, it was resold for $90,000, illustrating both the appreciation of art and the depreciation of money. Rosalba Carriera is more pleasant to contemplate. She began her career by designing patterns for Point de Venise lace. Then, like the young Renoir, she painted snuff boxes, then miniatures. Finally, she found her fort in pastel. By 1709, she had won such fame that when Frederick IV of Denmark came, he chose her to paint for him pastel portraits of the most beautiful or celebrated ladies of Venice. In 1720, Pierre Crozat, millionaire art collector, invited her to Paris. There she was welcomed and fated as no other foreign artist since Bernini. Poets wrote sonnets about her. Regent Philippe d'Orléans visited her. Watteau painted her and she him. Louis XV sat for her. She was elected to the Académie de Peinture and offered as her diploma piece the muse that hangs in the Louvre. It was as if, in her, the soul of Rococo had been made flesh. In 1730 she went to Vienna, where she made pastel portraits of Charles VI, his empress, and the Archduchess Maria Theresa. Back in Venice she so absorbed herself in her art that she forgot to marry. The Academia has there a room full of her portraits. The Gemelde Galerie of Dresden has 157, almost all characterized by pink faces, blue backgrounds, rosy innocence, dimpled delicacy. Even when she pictured Horace Walpole, she made him look like a girl. She flattered every sitter but herself. The self-portrait in Windsor Castle shows her in her later years, white-haired, a bit somber, as if foreseeing that she would soon be blind. For the last twelve of her eighty-two years, she had to live without the light and color that had been to her almost the essence of life. She left her mark on the art of her time. Latour may have taken fire from her. Greuze remembered her idealization of young women. Her rosy tints, la vie en rose, passed down to Boucher and Renoir. Giovanni Battista Piazzetta was a greater artist, superior to sentiment, disdaining decoration, seeking not so much to please the public as to conquer the difficulties and honor the highest traditions of his métier. His fellow craftsmen recognized this, and though Tiepolo had led in establishing in 1750 the Venetian Accademia di Pittura e Scultura, it was Piazzetta whom they chose as its first president. His Rebecca at the Well is worthy of Titian, and makes even less concession to conventional conceptions of beauty. Enough of Rebecca is revealed to stir the savage breast, but her Dutch face and snub nose were not fashioned for Italian ecstasies. It is the man who moves us here, a figure worthy of the Renaissance, a powerful face, an insinuating beard, a feathered hat, a gleam of sly inducement in his eyes, and all the picture a masterpiece of color, texture, and design. It was characteristic of Piazzetta that he was the most respected of Venetian painters in his day, and died the poorest. Antonio Canale, called Canaletto, is more famous, for half the world knows Venice through his vedute, or views, and England knew him in the flesh. He followed for a while his father's profession of scene painting for theaters. In Rome he studied architecture. Returning to Venice, he applied compass and T-square to his drawing and made architecture a feature of his pictures. 
From these we know the Queen of the Adriatic as she looked in the first half of the 18th century. We note from his Bacino di San Marco how crowded with vessels was the main lagoon. We watch a regatta on the Grand Canal and see that life was as full and eager then as it had ever been. And we are pleased to find the Ponte di Rialto, the Piazza San Marco, the Piazzetta, the Palazzo dei Doggi, and Santa Maria della Salute, almost as we find them today, except for the rebuilt Campanile. Such pictures were precisely what tourists needed in the cloudy north to remember gratefully the sun and magic of Venezia la Serenissima. They bought and paid and took their mementos home, and soon England demanded Canaletto himself. He came in 1746 and painted extensive views of Whitehall and the Thames from Richmond House. This last, astonishing in its combination of space, perspective, and detail, is Canaletto's masterpiece. Not till 1755 did he return to Venice. There, in 1766, aged 69, he was still hard at work and proudly wrote on the interior of St. Mark's, done without spectacles. He handed down his technique of precise measurement to his nephew, Bernardo Bellotto Canaletto, and his flair for vedute to his good scholar, Francesco Guardi, whom we shall meet again. As Canaletto showed the outer view of the splendid city, so Pietro Longhi revealed the life within the walls by applying genre painting to the middle class. The lady at breakfast on negligé, the abbé tutoring her son, her little girl fondling a toy dog, the tailor coming to display a frock, the dancing master putting the lady through the steps of a minuet, the children wide-eyed at a menagerie, the young women frolicking at blindman's buff, the tradesmen in their shops, the maskers at carnival, the theatres, the coffee-houses, the literary coteries, the poets reciting their verses, the quack doctors, the fortune-tellers, the vendors of sausages and plums, the promenade in the piazza, the hunting party, the fishing party, the family on its villagiatura holiday. All the mentionable activities of the bourgeoisie are there, even more fully than in the comedies of Goldoni, Longhi's friend. It is not great art, but it is delightful, and shows a society more orderly and refined than we should have imagined from the aristocrats of the gambling casinos or the cursing stevedores of the wharves. 4. Tiepolo The Venetian who made Europe believe for a moment that the Renaissance had returned was Giambattista Tiepolo. Any summer's day we'll see a procession of students and tourists entering the residence of the Bishop of Würzburg, to see the staircase and ceiling frescoed by Tiepolo in 1750-53. These are the peak of Italian painting in the 18th century. Or look at the Trinity appearing to St. Clement in the National Gallery at London. Observe its skillful composition, its precise drawing, its subtle handling of light, its depth and glow of color. Surely this is Titian. Perhaps if Tiepolo had not wandered so, he might have joined the giants. Or possibly he was handicapped by good fortune. He was the last child of a prosperous Venetian merchant who, dying, left a substantial patrimony. Handsome, bright, frolicsome, John soon acquired an aristocratic scorn of anything plebeian. In 1719, aged 23, he married Cecilia, sister of Francesco Guardi. She gave him four daughters and five sons, of whom two became painters. They lived in a fine house in the parish of Santa Trinita. His talent had already bloomed. In 1716 he exhibited his sacrifice of Isaac, crude but powerful. He was visibly at this time under Piazzetta's influence. He studied Veronese, too, and assumed a maniera paulesca of sumptuous raiment, warm colors, and sensuous lines. In 1726, the Archbishop of Udine invited him to adorn his cathedral and palace. Tiepolo chose themes from the story of Abraham, but his treatment was not quite biblical. Sarah's face, emerging from a Renaissance ruff, is a corrugation of wrinkles revealing two vestigial teeth. The angel, however, is an Italian athlete with an engaging leg. Tiepolo seems to have felt that in a century that was beginning to laugh at angels and miracles, he could let his humor play with reverend traditions. 
and the amiable archbishop indulged him. But the artist had to be careful, for the church was still one of the chief sources of pictorial commissions in the Catholic world. The other source was the layman with a palace to be adorned. In the Palazzo Casali Dugnani at Milan in 1731, John told in frescoes the story of Scipio. These were not typical Tiepolo, for he had not yet formed his characteristic style of figures moving easily and loosely in undefined space, but they showed a skill that made a stir in northern Italy. By 1740 he found his fort and achieved what some have thought his chef dœuvre the ceiling and banquet hall of the Palazzo Clerici in Milan. Here he chose, as vehicles for his fancy, the four parts of the world, the course of the sun, and Apollo with the pagan gods. He was happy to leave the somber world of Christian legend and disport himself on Olympian heights where he could use the Greco-Roman divinities as figures in a realm free from the laws of motion, the chains of gravity, and even the academic rules of design. Like most artists whose moral code melts in the heat of their feelings, he was at heart a pagan. Moreover, a fine body might be the product of a resolute and formative soul, and be therefore itself a spiritual fact. For thirty years now, Tiepolo would send gods and goddesses, garbed in gauze and nonchalantly nude, frolicking through space, chasing one another among the planets, or making love on a cushion of clouds. Back in Venice, he returned to Christianity, and his religious pictures absolved his mythologies. For the Scuola di San Rocco, he painted a canvas, Hager and Ishmael, notable for the fine figure of a sleeping boy. In the Church of the Gesuati, renamed by the Dominicans Santa Maria del Rosario, he pictured the institution of the Rosary. For the Scuola dei Carmini, or School of the Carmelite Monks, he depicted the Madonna of Mount Carmel, this almost rivaled Titian's Annunciation. For the Church of St. Alvise, he made three pictures. One of these, Christ carrying the cross, is crowded with powerful figures vividly portrayed. Tiepolo had paid his debt to his native faith. His fancy moved more freely on palace walls. In the Palazzo Barbaro, he showed the apotheosis of Francesco Barbaro, now in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. For the palace of the doges, he portrayed Neptune offering to Venus the riches of the sea. To the Palazzo Papadopoli, he contributed two delightful snatches of Venice in carnival, the minuet and the charlatan. And, topping all his palace pictures in Venice, he embellished the Palazzo Labia with frescoes telling the story of Antony and Cleopatra in magnificent scenes brilliantly realized. A fellow artist, Girolimo Mengozzi Colonna, painted the architectural backgrounds in a burst of Palladian splendor. On one wall, the meeting of the two rulers. On the opposite wall, their banquet. On the ceiling, a wild array of flying figures representing Pegasus, time, beauty, and the winds, these blown about by jolly puffing imps. In the meeting, Cleopatra descends from her barge in dazzling raiment, revealing twin mounds calculated to lure a tired triumvir to fragrant rest. In the still more effulgent banquet, she drops a pearl without price into her wine. Antony is impressed by this careless wealth, and on a balcony musicians strum their lyres to double the jeopardy and triple the intoxication. The masterpiece, recalling and rivaling Veronese, was one of the pictures that Reynolds copied in 1752. Such work in the grand style raised Tiepolo to a height visible across the Alps. Count Francesco Algarotti, friend of Frederick and Voltaire, spread his name through Europe. As early as 1736, the Swedish minister in Venice informed his government that Tiepolo was just the man to decorate the royal palace in Stockholm. He is full of wit and zest, easy to deal with, bubbling over with ideas. He has a gift for brilliant color and works at a prodigious speed. He paints a picture in less time than it takes another artist to mix his colors. Stockholm was already beautiful, but it seemed so far away. In 1750, a closer invitation came. Karl Philipp von Greifenklau, Prince Bishop of Würzburg, asked him to paint the imperial hall of his newly built residence or administrative palace. The proffered fee moved the aging master. 
Arriving in December with his sons Domenico, 24, and Lorenzo, 14, he found an unexpected challenge in the splendor of the Kaisersaal, which Balthasar Neumann had designed. How could any picture catch the eye amid that radiance? Diepolo's success here was the crown of his career. On the walls he depicted the story of the Emperor Frederick Barbarossa, who had kept tryst with Beatrice of Burgundy at Wurzburg in 1156, and on the ceiling he showed Apollo bringing the bride. Here he reveled in an ecstasy of white horses, gay gods, and the play of light upon prancing cherubs and filmy clouds. On a slope of the ceiling he represented the wedding. Handsome faces, stately figures, flowered drapery, garments recalling Veronese's Venice rather than medieval styles. The bishop was so pleased that he enlarged the contract to include the ceiling of the grand staircase and two altarpieces for his cathedral. Over the majestic stairway Tiepolo pictured the continents and Olympus, the happy hunting ground of his fancy, and the lordly figure of Apollo the sun god circling the sky. Rich and weary, Gian Battista returned to Venice in 1753, leaving Domenico to finish the assignment at Würzburg. Soon he was elected president of the academy. He was of so amiable a disposition that even his rivals were fond of him, and called him Il Buon Tiepolo. He could not resist all the demands made upon his waning time. We find him painting in Venice, Treviso, Verona, Parma, and doing a large canvas commissioned by the court of Muscovy. We should hardly have expected another major work from him, but in 1757, aged 61, he undertook to decorate the Villa Valmarana, near Vicenza. Mengozzi Colonna drew the architectural setting, Domenico signed some pictures in the guest house, Gian Battista deployed his brush in the villa itself. He chose subjects from the Iliad, the Aeneid, the Orlando Furioso, and the Gerusalemme Liberata. He gave his airy illusionism full reign, losing color in light and space in infinity, letting his gods and goddesses float at their ease in an empyrean raised above all care and time. Goethe, marveling before these frescoes, exclaimed, Gar frühlich und brav, very joyful and bold. It was Tiepolo's last riot in Italy. In 1761, Charles III of Spain asked him to come and paint in the new royal palace at Madrid. The tired titan pleaded age, but the king appealed to the Venetian Senate to use its influence. Reluctantly, aged 66, he set out once more with his faithful sons and his model Christina, again leaving his wife behind, for she loved the casinos of Venice. We shall find him on a scaffold in Spain. 5. Goldoni and Gozzi Four figures, paired, stand out in the Venetian literature of this age. Apostolo Zeno and Pietro Metastasio both of whom wrote librettos that were poetry. Carlo Goldoni and Carlo Gozzi, who fought over Venetian comedy, a comedy that became Goldoni's tragedy. Of the first pair, Goldoni wrote, These two illustrious authors effected the reform of Italian opera. Before them, nothing but gods, devils, machines, and wonders were to be found in these harmonious entertainments. Zeno was the first who conceived the possibility of representing tragedy in lyrical verse without degradation and singing it without producing exhaustion. He executed the project in a manner most satisfactory to the public, reflecting the greatest glory on himself and his nation. Zeno carried his reforms to Vienna in 1718, retired amiably in favor of Metastasio in 1730, and returned to Venice in twenty years of peace. Metastasio, as Goldononi noted, played Racine to Zeno's Corneille, adding refinement to power and bringing operatic poetry to an unprecedented height. Voltaire ranked him with the greatest French poets, and Rousseau thought him the only contemporary poet who reached the heart. His real name was Pietro Trapassi, Peter Cross. A dramatic critic, John Vincenzo Gravina, heard him singing in the streets, adopted him, rechristened him Metastasio, Greek for Trapassi, financed his education, and dying left him a fortune. 
Pietro ran through the fortune with poetic license, then articled himself to a lawyer who exacted the condition that he should not read or write a line of verse. So he wrote under a pseudonym. At Naples he was asked by the Austrian envoy to provide lyrics for a cantata. Porpora composed the music. Mariana Bulgarelli, then famous under the name of La Romanina, sang the lead. All went well. The diva invited the poet to her salon. There he met Leo, Vinci, Pergolesi, Farinelli, Hasse, Alessandro, and Domenico Scarlatti. Metastasio developed rapidly in that exciting company. La Romanina, thirty-five, fell in love with him, twenty-three. She rescued him from the toil of the law, took him into a ménage à trois with her complacent husband, and inspired him to write his most famous libretto, Didone Abandonata, which twelve successive composers set to music between 1724 and 1823. In 1726 he wrote Siroe for his Inamorata. Vinci, Hasse, and Handel independently made operas of it. Metastasio was now the most sought-after librettist in Europe. In 1730 he accepted a call to Vienna, leaving La Romanina behind. She tried to follow him. Fearing that her presence would compromise him, he secured an order forbidding her to enter imperial territory. She stabbed her breast in an attempt at suicide. This effort to play Dido failed, but she lived only four years more. When she died, she left to her unfaithful Aeneas all her fortune. Stricken with remorse, Metastasio renounced the legacy in favor of her husband. I have no longer any hope that I shall succeed in consoling myself, he wrote, and I believe that the rest of my life will be savorless and sorrowful. He sadly enjoyed triumph after triumph till the War of the Austrian Succession interrupted operatic performances in Vienna. After 1750, he repeated himself aimlessly. He had exhausted life thirty years before his death in 1782. Opera, as Voltaire had predicted, drove the tragic drama from the Italian stage and left it to comedy. But Italian comedy was dominated by the Commedia dell'arte, the play of improvised speech and characterizing masks. Most of the characters had long since become stereotyped. Pantalone, the good-humored, trousered bourgeois, Tartaglia, the stammering Neapolitan knave, Brighella, the simpleton schemer caught in his own intrigues, Trufaldino, the genial carnal bon vivant, Arlecchino, our harlequin, Pulcinello, our punch. Diverse towns and times added several more. Most of the dialogue and many incidents in the plot were left to extempore invention. In those improvised comedies, according to Casanova, if the actor stops short for a word, the pit and the gallery hiss him mercilessly. There were usually seven theaters operating in Venice, all named after saints and housing scandalously behaved audiences. The nobles in the boxes were not particular about what they dropped upon the commoners below. Hostile factions countered applause with whistling, yawns, sneezes, coughs, cockcrows, or the meowing of cats. In Paris, the theater audience was mostly composed of the upper classes, professional men and literati. In Venice, it was chiefly middle class, sprinkled with gaudy courtesans, ribald gondoliers, priests and monks in disguise, haughty senators in robe and wig. It was hard for a play to please all elements in such a ola podrida of humanity. So Italian comedy tended to be a mixture of satire, slapstick, buffoonery, and puns. The training of the actors to portray stock characters made them incapable of variety and subtlety. This was the audience, this the stage, that Goldoni strove to raise to legitimate and civilized comedy. Pleasant is the simple beginning of his memoirs. I was born at Venice in 1707. My mother brought me into the world with little pain, and this increased her love for me. My first appearance was not, as is usual, announced by cries, and this gentleness seemed then an indication of the pacific character which from that day forward I have ever preserved. It was a boast, but true. 
Boldoni is one of the most lovable men in literary history, and despite this exordium, his virtues included modesty, a quality uncongenial to scribes. We may believe him when he says, I was the idol of the house. The father went off to Rome to study medicine and then to Perugia to practice it. The mother was left at Venice to bring up three children. Carlo was precocious. At four, he could read and write. At eight, he composed a comedy. The father persuaded the mother to let Carlo come and live with him in Perugia. There, the boy studied with the Jesuits, did well, and was invited to join the order. He declined. The mother and another son joined the father, but the cold mountain air of Perugia disagreed with her, and the family moved to Rimini, then to Chioggia. Carlo went to a Dominican college in Rimini, where he received daily doses of St. Thomas Aquinas's Summa Theologiae. Finding no drama in that masterpiece of rationalization, he read Aristophanes, Menander, Plautus, and Terence. And when a company of actors came to Rimini, he joined it long enough to surprise his parents in Chioggia. They scolded him, embraced him, and sent him to study law at Pavia. In 1731 he received his degree and began to practice. He married and was now the happiest man in the world, except that he came down with smallpox on his wedding night. Gravitating back to Venice, he succeeded in law and became consul there for Genoa. But the theater continued to fascinate him. He itched to write and to be produced. His Belisarius was staged on November 24, 1734, with inspiring success. It ran every day till December 14th, and his old mother's pride in him doubled his joy. Venice, however, had no taste for tragedy. His further offerings in that genre failed, and he sadly took to comedy. Nevertheless, he refused to write farces for the Commedia dell'arte. He wanted to compose comedies of manners and ideas in the tradition of Moliere, to put upon the stage no stock characters frozen into masks, but personalities and situations drawn from contemporary life. He chose some actors from a Commedia troupe in Venice, trained them, and produced in 1740 his Momolo Courtesan. Momolo the Courtier. The piece was wonderfully successful, and I was satisfied. Not quite, for he had compromised by leaving all the dialogue unwritten except for the leading part, and by providing roles for four of the traditional masked characters. He advanced his reforms step by step. In La Donna di Garbo, The Woman of Honor, he for the first time wrote out action and dialogue completely. Hostile companies rose to compete with his or to mock his plays. The classes that he had satirized, like the Chichis Bay, plotted against him. He fought them all with success after success. But no other author could be found to furnish his troupe with suitable comedies. His own, too often repeated, forfeited favor. He was compelled by the competition to write sixteen plays in one year. He was at his peak in 1752, hailed by Voltaire as the Moliere of Italy. La Locandera, the mistress of the inn, had in that year a success so brilliant that it was preferred to everything else that had yet been done in that kind of comedy. He prided himself on having observed the Aristotelian unities of action, place, and time. Otherwise, he judged his plays realistically. Good, he said, but not yet Moliere. He had written them too rapidly to make them works of art. They were cleverly constructed, pleasantly gay, and generally true to life, but they lacked Moliere's reach of ideas, force of speech, power of presentation. They remained on the surface of character and events. The nature of the audience forbade him to try the heights of sentiment, philosophy, or style, and he was by nature too cheerful to plumb the depths that had tortured Moliere. Once, at least, he was shocked out of his genial humor and touched to the quick. When Carlo Gozzi challenged him for theatrical supremacy in Venice, and won. There were two Gozzi involved in the literary turmoil at this time. Gasparo Gozzi wrote plays that were chiefly adaptations from the French. He edited two prominent periodicals and began the revival of Dante. Not so genial was his brother Carlo tall, handsome, vain, and ever ready for a fight. He was the wittiest member of the Accademia Granileschi, 
which campaigned for the use of pure Tuscan Italian in literature rather than the Venetian idiom which Goldoni used in most of his plays. As the lover or cavaliere servente of Teodora Ricci, he may have felt the sting when Goldoni satirized the Chichis Bay. He too wrote memoirs, the white paper of his wars. He judged Goldoni as one author sees another. I recognized in Goldoni an abundance of comic motives, truth, and naturalness, yet I detected a poverty and meanness of intrigue. Virtues and vices ill-adjusted, vice too often triumphant, plebeian phrases of low double meaning, scraps and tags of erudition stolen heaven knows where, and brought to impose upon a crowd of ignoramuses. Finally, as a writer of Italian, except in the Venetian dialect of which he showed himself a master, he seemed not unworthy to be placed among the dullest, basest, and least correct authors who have used our language. At the same time, I must add that he never produced a play without some excellent comic trait. In my eyes, he had always the appearance of a man who was born with a natural sense of how sterling comedies should be composed— but who, by defect of education, by want of discernment, by the necessity of satisfying the public and supplying new wares to the poor comedians through whom he gained his livelihood, and by the hurry in which he produced so many pieces every year to keep himself afloat, was never able to fabricate a single play which does not swarm with faults. In 1757 Gozzi produced a volume of verses expressing kindred criticisms in the style of good old Tuscan masters. Goldoni replied in Terza Rima, Dante's medium, to the effect that Gozzi was like a dog baying at the moon, come il cane che abbaha la luna. Gozzi retorted by defending the Commedia dell'arte from Goldoni's strictures. He charged that Goldoni's plays were a hundred times more lascivious, indecent, and harmful to morals than the comedy of masks and he compiled a vocabulary of obscure expressions, dirty double entendre, and other nastinesses from Goldoni's works. The controversy, Molmenti tells us, threw the city into a kind of frenzy. The case was discussed in playhouses, homes, shops, coffee houses, and streets. Abate Chiari, another dramatist stung by Gozzi's Tuscan Asp, challenged him to write a better play than those he had condemned. Gozzi answered that he could do this easily, on even the most trivial themes, and by using only the traditional comedy of masks. In January 1761, a company at the Teatro San Samuele produced his Fiaba dell'amore delle tre melerancie, Fable of the Love of the Three Oranges, merely a scenario that showed Pantalone, Tartaglia, and other masks seeking three oranges believed to have magic powers. The dialogue was left to be improvised. The success of this fable was decisive. The Venetian public, living on laughter, relished the imagination of the tale and the implied satire of Chiari's and Goldoni's plots. Gozzi followed with nine other fiabe in five years, but in these he supplied a poetic dialogue, thereby in part admitting Goldoni's criticism of the Commedia dell'arte. In any case, Gozzi's victory seemed complete. The attendance at the San Samuele remained high, that at Goldone's Teatro Sant'Angelo fell toward bankruptcy. Chiari moved to Brescia, and Goldoni accepted an invitation to Paris. As his farewell to Venice, Goldoni produced in 1762 Una delle ultime sere di Carnevale, one of the last evenings of Carnival. It told of a textile designer... Sior Anzoletto, who with a heavy heart was leaving in Venice the weavers whose looms he had so long provided with patterns. The audience soon saw in this an allegory for the dramatist regretfully leaving the actors whose stage he had so long supplied with plays. When Anzoletto appeared in the final scene, the theater, Goldoni tells us, rang with thunderous applause amid which could be heard, A happy journey! Come back to us! Don't fail to come back to us! He left Venice on April 15, 1762, and never saw it again. In Paris he was engaged for two years in writing comedies for the Théâtre des Italiens. In 1763 he was sued for seduction, but a year later he was engaged to teach Italian to the daughters of Louis XV. 
For the wedding of Marie Antoinette and the future Louis XVI, he composed in French one of his best plays, Le Bourou Bienfaisant, The Benevolent Boor. He was rewarded with a pension of 1,200 francs, which was annulled by the Revolution when he was 81 years old. He solaced his poverty by dictating to his wife his memoirs in 1792, inaccurate, imaginative, illuminating, entertaining. Gibbon thought them more truly dramatic than his Italian comedies. He died on February 6, 1793. On February 7th, the National Convention, on a motion by the poet Marie-Joseph de Chénier, restored his pension. Finding him in no condition to receive it, the Convention gave it reduced to his widow. Gozzi's victory in Venice was brief. Long before his death in 1806, his fiabe had passed from the stage, and Goldoni's comedies had been revived in the theatres of Italy. They are still played there, almost as frequently as Molière's in France. His statue stands on the Campo San Bartolomeo in Venice and on the Largo Goldoni in Florence. For, as his memoirs said, humanity is everywhere the same, jealousy displays itself everywhere, and everywhere a man of a cool and tranquil disposition in the end acquires the love of the public and wears out his enemies. 6. Rome South of the Po, along the Adriatic and spanning the Apennines, were the states of the Church, Ferrara, Bologna, Forli, Ravenna, Perugia, Benevento, Rome, forming the central and largest part of the magic boot. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now. The Story of Civilization, Volume 10, Rousseau and Revolution, by Will and Ariel Durant. Part 1, Continued, Cassette 10, Side 2. South of the Po, along the Adriatic and spanning the Apennines, were the states of the Church, Ferrara, Bologna, Forli, Ravenna, Perugia, Benevento, Rome, forming the central and largest part of the magic boot. When Ferrara was incorporated into the Papal States in 1598, its Estense Dukes made Modena their home and gathered there their archives, books, and art. In 1700, Lodovico Moratori, priest, scholar, and doctor of laws, became curator of these treasures. From them, in fifteen years of labor and twenty-eight volumes, he compiled Rerum Italicarum Scriptores, Writers of Italian Affairs, published between 1723 and 1738. Later he added ten volumes of Italian antiquities and inscriptions. He was rather an antiquarian than an historian, and his twelve-volume Annali d'Italia was soon superseded. But his researches in documents and inscriptions made him the father and source of modern historical writing in Italy. Aside from Rome, the most flourishing of these states was Bologna. Its renowned school of painting continued under Giuseppe Crespi, Lo Spagnuolo. Its university was still one of the best in Europe. The Palazzo Bevilacqua, in 1749, was among the most elegant structures of the century. A remarkable family, centering in Bologna, brought theatrical architecture and scene painting to their highest excellence in modern times. Ferdinando Galli da Bibiena built the Teatro Reale at Mantua in 1731, wrote famous texts on his art, and begot three sons who carried on his skill in deceptive and sumptuous ornament. His brother, Francesco, designed theaters in Vienna, Nancy, and Rome, and Verona's Teatro Filarmonico, often rated the finest in Italy. Ferdinando's son, Alessandro, became chief architect for the elector of the Palatinate. Another son, Giuseppe, designed the interior of the opera house at Bayreuth in 1748, the most beautiful of its kind in existence. A third son, Antonio, drew the plans for the Teatro Comunale at Bologna. That theater, 
and the massive old church of San Petronio, heard the best instrumental music in Italy, for Bologna was the chief Italian center of musical education and theory. There, Padre Giovanni Battista Martini held his modest but austere court as the most respected music teacher in Europe. He had a music library of 17,000 volumes. He composed classic texts on counterpoint and musical history. He corresponded with a hundred celebrities in a dozen lands. The accolade of the Academia Philharmonica, of which he was for many years the head, was coveted by all musicians. Here the boy Mozart would come in 1770 to face the prescribed tests. Here Rossini and Donizetti were to teach. The annual festival of new compositions performed by the hundred-piece orchestra of the Academia was for Italy the supreme event of the musical year. Gibbon estimated the population of Rome in 1740 at some 156,000 souls. Recalling the brilliance of the imperial past and forgetting its paupers and slaves, he found the charm of the Catholic capital uncongenial to his taste. Within the spacious enclosures of the Aurelian walls, the largest portion of the seven hills is overspread with vineyards and ruins. The beauty and splendor of the modern city may be ascribed to the abuses of the government and to the influence of superstition. Each reign, the exceptions are rare, has been marked by the rapid elevation of a new family, enriched by the childless pontiff at the expense of the church and country. The palaces of these fortunate nephews are the most costly monuments of elegance and servitude. The perfect arts of architecture, painting, and sculpture have been prostituted in their service, and their galleries and gardens are decorated with the most precious works of antiquity which taste or vanity has prompted them to collect. The popes of this period were distinguished by their high morality. Their morals rose as their power fell. They were all Italians, for none of the Catholic monarchs would allow any of the others to capture the papacy. Clement XI, who reigned from 1700 to 1721, justified his name by reforming the prisons of Rome. Innocent XIII, 1721 to 24, in the judgment of the Protestant Ranca, possessed admirable qualifications for the spiritual as well as the temporal government, but his health was extremely delicate. The Roman families connected with him, and which had hoped to be promoted by him, found themselves completely deceived. Even his nephew could not obtain without difficulty the enjoyment of those twelve thousand ducats annually which had now become the usual income of a nephew. Benedict XIII, 1724-30, was a man of great personal piety, but, says a Catholic historian, he allowed far too much power to unworthy favorites. Clement XII, 1730-1740, flooded Rome with his Florentine friends, and when old and blind allowed himself to be ruled by his nephews, whose intolerance further embittered the conflict between Jesuits and Jansenists in France. Macaulay thought Benedict XIV, 1740 to 58, the best and wisest of the 250 successors of St. Peter. A sweeping judgment, but Protestants, Catholics, and unbelievers join in acclaiming Benedict as a man of wide learning, lovable character, and moral integrity. As Archbishop of Bologna, he had seen no contradiction between attendance at the opera three times a week and strict attention to his episcopal tasks. And as a pope, he reconciled the purity of his personal life with gaiety of humor, freedom of speech, and an almost pagan appreciation of literature and art. He added a nude Venus to his collection and told Cardinal de Tonsin how the prince and princess of Württemberg scratched their names on a gracefully rounded portion of the anatomy not often mentioned in papal correspondence. His wit was almost as keen as Voltaire's, but it did not prevent him from being a careful administrator and a far-seeing diplomat. He found papal finances in chaos. Half the revenue was lost in transit— and a third of Rome's population consisted of ecclesiastics far more numerous than the business of the church required, and more expensive than the church could properly afford. Benedict reduced his own staff, dismissed most of the papal troops, ended papal nepotism, lowered taxes, introduced agricultural improvements, and encouraged industrial enterprise. Soon his probity, economies, and efficiency brought a surplus to the papal treasury. 
His foreign policy made genial concessions to turbulent kings. He signed with Sardinia, Portugal, Naples, and Spain, concordats allowing their Catholic rulers to nominate to Episcopal sees. He strove to quiet the doctrinal furor in France by a lax enforcement of the anti-Jansenist bull Unigenitus. Since infidelity progresses daily, he wrote, we must rather ask whether men believe in God than whether they accept the bull. He made brave efforts to find a modus vivendi with the Enlightenment. We have noted his cordial acceptance of the dedication of Voltaire's Maumet, though this play was under ecclesiastical fire in Paris in 1746. He appointed a commission to revise the breviary and to eliminate some of the more incredible legends. However, the recommendations of this commission were not carried out. He secured by personal activity the election of d'Alembert to the Bologna Institute. He discouraged the hasty prohibition of books. When some aides advised him to denounce La Maitre's L'Homme Machine, he replied, Should you not refrain from reporting to me the audacities of fools? And he added, Know that the Pope has a free hand only to give blessings. The revised Index Expurgatorius, which he issued in 1758, abandoned all attempts to keep track of non-Catholic literature. With a few exceptions, it confined itself to prohibiting some books by Catholic authors. No condemnation should be made until the author, if available, had been given a chance to defend himself. No book on a learned subject should be condemned except after consultation with experts. Men of science or scholarship should be readily given permission to read prohibited books. These rules were followed in subsequent editions of the Index and were confirmed by Leo XIII in 1900. The popes found it almost as difficult to govern Rome as to rule the Catholic world. The populace of the city was probably the roughest and most violent in Italy, perhaps in Europe. Any cause could lead to a duel in the nobility or to a bloody conflict between the sectionally patriotic gangs that divided the holy city. At the theater, the judgment of the audience could be merciless, especially when wrong. We shall see an instance with Pergolesi. The church strove to appease the people with festivals, processions, indulgences, and carnival. During the eight days preceding Lent, they were allowed to don gay and fanciful disguises and frolic on the Corso. Nobles sought popular favor by parades of horses or chariots bearing skilled riders or beautiful women, all richly adorned. Prostitutes offered their wares at temporarily raised rates and masked flirtations relieved for some hours the strain of monogamy. Carnival over, Rome resumed its uneven tenor of piety and crime. Art did not prosper amid the diminishing returns of a declining faith. Architecture made some minor contributions. Alessandro Galilei gave the old church of San Giovanni in Laterano a proud facade. Ferdinando Fuga put a new face upon Santa Maria Maggiore, and Francesco de Sanctis raised the stately, spacious Scala di Spagna from the Piazza di Spagna to the shrine of Santissima Trinità dei Monti. Sculpture added a famous monument, the Fontana di Trevi, where the pleased tourist throws a coin over his shoulder into the water to ensure a further visit to Rome. This fountain of the three outlets had a long history. Bernini may have left a sketch for it. Clement XII opened a competition for it. Edme Bouchardon of Paris and Lambert Sigisbert Adam of Nancy submitted plans. Giovanni Maini was chosen to design it. Pietro Bracci carved the central group of Neptune and his team in 1732. Filippo della Valle molded the figures of fertility and healing. Niccolo Salvi provided the architectural background. Giuseppe Panini completed the work in 1762. This collaboration of many minds and hands through thirty years may suggest some faltering of will or failure of funds, but it bars any thought that art in Rome was dead. Bracci added to his honors the tomb, now in St. Peter's, of Maria Clementina Sobieska, the unhappy wife of the Stuart pretender James III, and de la Valle left in the church of St. Ignatius a delicately carved relief of the Annunciation, worthy of the High Renaissance. Painting produced no marvels at Rome in this age, but Giovanni Battista Piranesi made engraving a major art. Born to a stonemason near Venice, he read Palladio and dreamed of palaces and shrines. 
Venice had more artists than money. Rome had more money than artists. So Giovanni moved to Rome and set up as architect. But buildings were not in demand. He designed them anyway. Or rather, he drew imaginary structures that he knew no one would build, including fantastic jails that looked as if the Spanish steps had fallen upon the baths of Diocletian. He published these drawings in 1750 as Opere Varii di Architettura and Carceri, or prisons, and people bought them as they bought puzzles or mysteries. In loftier mood, Piranesi turned his skill to engraving his sketches of ancient monuments. He fell in love with them, as Poussin and Robert did. He mourned to see these classic ruins disintegrating further day by day, through spoliation or neglect. For twenty-five years, almost daily, he went out to draw them, sometimes missing meals. Even when he was dying of cancer, he continued to draw, engrave, and etch. His Roman antiquities and views of Rome went out as prints over Europe and shared in the architectural revival of classic styles. That revival was powerfully stimulated by excavations at Herculaneum and Pompeii, towns that had been overwhelmed by the eruption of Vesuvius in A.D. 79. In 1719, some peasants reported that they had found statues embedded in the earth at Herculaneum. Nineteen years passed before funds could be secured for systematic exploration of the site. In 1748, similar excavations began to reveal the wonders of pagan Pompeii, and in 1752 the massive and majestic Greek temples of Pestum were cleared from the jungle. Archaeologists came from dozens of countries to study and describe the findings, their drawings stirred the interest of artists as well as historians. Soon Rome and Naples were invaded by enthusiasts for classic art, especially from Germany. Mengs came in 1740, Winkelmann in 1755. Lessing longed to go to Rome, but remained there at least for a year and, if possible, forever. And Goethe, but let that story wait. Anton Raphael Mengs is hard to place, for he was born in Bohemia in 1728, worked chiefly in Italy and Spain, and chose Rome for his home. His father, a painter of miniatures at Dresden, named him after Correggio and Raphael, and pledged him to art. The boy showed talent, and the father took him, aged twelve, to Rome. There, we are told, he shut him up in the Vatican day after day, with bread and wine for lunch, and told him for the rest to feed on the relics of Raphael, Michelangelo, and the classic world. After a brief stay in Dresden, Anton returned to Rome and won attention by a painting of the Holy Family. For this he took as his model Margarita Guazzi, a poor, virtuous, and beautiful maiden. He married her in 1749, and in the same embrace he accepted the Roman Catholic faith. Again in Dresden, he was appointed court painter to Augustus III at a thousand dollars a year. He agreed to paint two pictures for a Dresden church, but he persuaded the elector king to let him do these in Rome, and in 1752, aged twenty-four, he settled there. At twenty-six, he was made director of the Vatican School of Painting. In 1755, he met Winkelmann and agreed with him that Baroque was a mistake, and that art must chasten itself with neoclassic forms. Probably about this time he executed in pastel the self-portrait now in the Dresden Gemälde Gallery. The face and hair of a girl, but eyes flashing with the pride of a man sure that he could shake the world. When Frederick the Great chased Augustus from Saxony in 1756, Mengs's royal salary stopped and he had to live on the modest fees offered him in Italy. He tried Naples, but the local artists, following an old Neapolitan custom, threatened his life as an alien invader, and Mengs hurried back to Rome. He adorned the Villa Albani with once famous frescoes, still visible there is his Parnassus of 1761, technically excellent, coldly classical, emotionally dead. Nevertheless, the Spanish minister at Rome felt that this was the man to decorate the royal palace in Madrid. Charles III sent for Manx, promised him 2,000 doubloons per year, plus a house and a coach, and free passage on a Spanish man-of-war, soon to sail from Naples. In September 1761, Manx arrived in Madrid. 7. Naples 1. The King and the People 
The kingdom of Naples, comprising all Italy south of the Papal States, was buffeted about in the struggle for power among Austria, Spain, England, and France. But that is the dreary logic-chopping of history, the bloody seesaw of victory and defeat. Let us merely note that Austria took Naples in 1707, that Don Carlos, Bourbon Duke of Parma and son of Philip V of Spain, drove out the Austrians in 1734, and as Charles IV, King of Naples and Sicily, ruled till 1759. His capital, with 300,000 population, was the largest city in Italy. Charles matured slowly into the royal art. At first he took kingship as a license for luxury. He neglected government, spent half his days in hunting, and ate himself into obesity. Then, toward 1755, inspired by his Minister of Justice and Foreign Affairs, Marchese Bernardo di Tanucci, he undertook to mitigate the harsh feudalism that underlay the toil and ecstasy of Neapolitan life. Three interlocking groups had long ruled the kingdom. Nobles owned almost two-thirds of the land, held four-fifths of its five million souls in bondage, dominated the Parliament, controlled taxation, and frustrated all reform. The clergy owned a third of the land, and held the people in spiritual subjection with the theology of terror, a literature of legends, a ritual of stupefaction, and such miracles as the semi-annual manipulated liquefaction of the congealed blood of St. Januarius, Naples's patron saint. Administration was in the hands of lawyers, beholden to nobles or prelates, and therefore pledged to the medieval status quo. A small middle class, mostly of merchants, was politically impotent. Peasants and proletaires lived in a poverty that drove some into brigandage and many into beggary. There were thirty thousand beggars in Naples alone. De Bros called the masses of the capital the most abominable riffraff, the most disgusting vermin— a judgment that condemned the result without stigmatizing the cause. We must admit, however, that those ragged, superstitious, and priest-ridden Neapolitans seemed to have more of the salt and joy of life in them than any other populace in Europe. Charles checked the power of the nobles by attracting them to the court to be under the royal eye, and by creating new nobles pledged to his support. He discouraged the flow of youth into monasteries, reduced the ecclesiastical multitude from 100,000 to 81,000, laid a tax of 2% upon church property, and limited the legal immunities of the clergy. Tanucci restricted the jurisdiction of the nobles, fought judicial corruption, reformed legal procedure, and moderated the severity of the penal code. Freedom of worship was allowed to the Jews, but the monks assured Charles that his lack of a male heir was God's punishment for this sinful toleration, and the indulgence was withdrawn. The king's passion for building gave Naples two famous structures. The vast Teatro San Carlo was raised in 1737. It is still one of the largest and most beautiful opera houses in existence. In 1752, Luigi Van Vitelli began at Caserta, twenty-one miles northeast of the capital, the enormous royal palace that was designed to rival Versailles, and to serve the similar functions of housing the royal family, the attendant nobility, and the main administrative staff. Slaves, black or white, toiled on the task for twenty-two years. Curved buildings flanked a spacious approach to the central edifice, which spread its front for eight hundred and thirty feet. Within were a chapel, a theater, countless rooms, and a broad double stairway of which every step was a single marble slab. Behind the palace, for half a mile, lay formal gardens, a population of statues and majestic fountains supplied by an aqueduct twenty-seven miles long. Other than this caserta, for the palace, like the Escorial and Versailles, took the name of its town, there was no outstanding art in the Naples of this age, nor anything memorable in drama or poetry. One man wrote a bold Historia Civile del Regno di Napoli in 1723, a running attack upon the greed of the clergy, the abuses of the ecclesiastical courts, the temporal power of the church, and the claim of the papacy to hold Naples as a papal fief. Its author, Pietro Giannone, was excommunicated by the Archbishop of Naples, fled to Vienna, was thrown into prison by the King of Sardinia, and died in Turin in 1748 after twelve years of confinement. Antonio Genovesi, 
a priest, lost his faith while reading Locke, and in Elementa Metaphysicae of 1743, tried to introduce the Lockean psychology into Italy. In 1754, a Florentine businessman established in the University of Naples the first European chair of political economy on two conditions, that it should never be held by an ecclesiastic, and that its first occupant should be Antonio Genovese. Genovese repaid him in 1756 with the first systematic economic treatise in Italian, Lezioni di Commercio, which voiced the cry of merchants and manufacturers for liberation from feudal, ecclesiastical, and other restraints on free enterprise. In that same year, Quenet raised the same demand for the French middle class in his articles for Diderot's Encyclopédie. Perhaps some liaison had been established between Genovese and Quenet by Ferdinando Galliani of Naples and Paris. Galliani published in 1750 a Trattato della Moneta, in which, with the innocence of a twenty-two-year-old economist, he determined the price of a product by the cost of its production. More brilliant was his Dialoghi sul Commercio dei Grani, which we have noted as a criticism of Quenet. When he had to come home after his exciting years in Paris, he mourned that Naples had no salons, no Madame Geoffrin to feed him and stir his wit. It had, however, a philosopher who left a mark on history. 2. Giambattista Vico At the age of seven, says his autobiography, he fell from a ladder, struck the ground head first, and remained unconscious for five hours. He suffered a cranial fracture over which a massive tumor formed. This was reduced by successive lancings. However, the boy lost so much blood in the process that the surgeons expected his early death. By God's grace, he survived, but as a result of this mischance I grew up with a melancholy and irritable temperament. He also developed tuberculosis. If genius depends upon some physical handicap, Vico was richly endowed. At seventeen, in 1685, he earned his bread by tutoring at Vatola, near Salerno, the nephews of the Bishop of Ischia. There he remained nine years, meanwhile feverishly studying jurisprudence, philology, history, and philosophy. He read with special fascination Plato, Epicurus, Lucretius, Machiavelli, Francis Bacon, Descartes, and Grotius, with some injury to his catechism. In 1697, he obtained a professorship in rhetoric at the University of Naples. It paid him only a hundred ducats yearly, to which he added by tutoring. On this he raised a large family. One daughter died in youth. One son showed such vicious tendencies that he had to be sent to a house of correction. The wife was illiterate and incompetent. Vico had to be father, mother, and teacher. Amid these distractions, he wrote his philosophy of history. Principi di una scienza nuova d'intorno alla comune natura della nazione, of 1725, offered the principles of a new science concerning the common nature of the nations, and proposed to find in the jungle of history regularities of sequence that might illuminate past, present, and future. Vico thought that he could discern three main periods in the history of every people. One, the age of the gods, in which the Gentiles believed that they lived under divine governments, and that everything was commanded them by gods through auspices and oracles. 2. The age of heroes, when these reigned in aristocratic commonwealths on account of a certain superiority of nature which they held themselves to have over the plebs. 3. The age of men, in which all recognized themselves as equal in human nature and therefore established the first popular commonwealths, and then monarchies. Pico applied the first period only to Gentiles and profane, or non-biblical, history. He could not, without offending sacred tradition, speak of the Old Testament Jews as merely believing that they lived under divine governments. Since the Inquisition, severer in Naples than in northern Italy, had prosecuted Neapolitan scholars for talking of men before Adam, Vico laboriously reconciled his formula with Genesis by supposing that all the descendants of Adam, except the Jews, had relapsed after the flood into an almost bestial condition 
living in caves and copulating indiscriminately in a communism of women. It was from this secondary state of nature that civilization had developed through the family, agriculture, property, morality, and religion. At times, Vico spoke of religion as a primitive, animistic way of explaining objects and events. At times, he exalted it as a peak of evolution. To the three stages of social development correspond three natures, or ways of interpreting the world, the theological, the legendary, the rational. The first nature, by an illusion of imagination, which is strongest in those who are weakest in reasoning power, was a poetic or creative nature, which we may be allowed to call divine, since it conceived physical things as animated by gods. Through the same error of their imagination, men had a terrible fear of the gods whom they themselves had created. The second nature was the heroic. The heroes believed themselves to be of divine origin. The third was the human nature, or way, intelligent and therefore modest, benign and rational, recognizing conscience, reason, and duty as laws. Vico strove to fit the history of language, literature, law, and government into this triadic scheme. In the first stage, men communicated through signs and gestures. In the second, through emblems, similitudes, images. In the third, through words agreed upon by the people, whereby they might fix the meaning of the laws. Law itself passed through a corresponding development. At first it was divine, God-given, as in the Mosaic Code, then heroic as in Lycurgus, then human, dictated by fully developed human reason. Government, too, has gone through three stages, the theocratic, in which the rulers claimed to be the voice of God, the aristocratic, in which all civil rights were confined to the ruling order of heroes, and the human, wherein all are accounted equal before the laws. This is the case in the free popular cities and also in those monarchies that make all their subjects equal under their laws. Vico evidently recalled Plato's summary of political evolution from monarchy through aristocracy to democracy to dictatorship, or tyrannis. But he varied the formula to read theocracy, aristocracy, democracy, monarchy. He agreed with Plato that democracy tends toward chaos, and he looked upon one-man rule as a necessary remedy for democratic disorder. Monarchies are the final governments in which nations come to rest. Social disorder may come through moral deterioration, luxury, effeminacy, loss of martial qualities, corruption in office, a disruptive concentration of wealth, or an aggressive envy among the poor. Usually such disorder leads to dictatorship, as when the rule of Augustus cured the democratic chaos of the Roman Republic. If even dictatorship fails to stem decay, some more vigorous nation enters as conqueror. Since people so far corrupted have already become slaves of their unrestrained passions, providence decrees that they become slaves by the natural law of nations. They become subject to better nations, which, having conquered them, keep them as subject provinces. Herein two great lights of natural order shine forth. First, that he who cannot govern himself must let himself be governed by another who can. Second, that the world is always governed by those who are naturally fittest. In such cases, the conquered people falls back into the stage of development reached by its conquerors. So the population of the Roman Empire, after the barbarian invasions, relapsed into barbarism, and had to begin with theocracy, rule by priests and theology. Such were the Dark Ages. With the Crusades came another heroic age. The feudal chieftains correspond to the heroes of Homer, and Dante is Homer again. We hear in Vico echoes of the theory that history is a circular repetition, and of Machiavelli's law of corsi e ricorsi, development and return. The idea of progress suffers in this analysis, Progress is merely one half of a cyclical movement in which the other half is decay. History, like life, is evolution and dissolution in an ineluctable sequence and fatality. On his way, Vico offered some striking suggestions. He reduced many heroes of classic legend to eponyms, afternames, post-factum personifications of long impersonal or multipersonal processes. 
So Orpheus was the imaginary consolidation of many primitive musicians. Lycurgus was the embodiment of the series of laws and customs that congealed Sparta. Romulus was a thousand men who had made Rome a state. Likewise, Vico reduced Homer to a myth by arguing, half a century before Friedrich Wolff's Prolegomena to Homer of 1795, that the Homeric epics are the accumulated and gradually amalgamated product of groups and generations of rhapsodes who sang in the cities of Greece the sagas of Troy and Odysseus. And almost a century before Bartold Niebuhr's History of Rome, 1811 to 1832, Vico rejected as legendary the first chapters of Livy. All the histories of the Gentile nations have had fabulous beginnings. Again, Vico carefully avoids impugning the historicity of Genesis. This epical book reveals a powerful but harassed mind struggling to formulate basic ideas without getting himself into an Inquisition jail. Vico went out of his way time after time to profess his loyalty to the Church, and he felt that he merited ecclesiastical commendation for explaining the principles of jurisprudence in a manner compatible with the Catholic theology. We hear a sincerer tone in his view of religion as the indispensable support of social order and personal morality. Religions alone have the power to cause the people to do virtuous works. And yet, despite his frequent use of providence, he seems to eliminate God from history and to reduce events to the unimpeded play of natural causes and effects. A Dominican scholar attacked Vico's philosophy as not Christian, but Lucretian. Perhaps the emerging secularism of Vico's analysis had something to do with its failure to win a hearing in Italy, and doubtless the disorderly discursiveness of his work and the confusion of his thought doomed his new science to a still but painful birth. No one agreed with his belief that he had written a profound or illuminating book. He appealed in vain to Jean Leclerc to at least mention it in the periodical Nouvelle de la République des Lettres. Ten years after the Scienza Nuova appeared, Charles IV came to Vico's aid by appointing him historiographer royal with the yearly stipend of a hundred ducats. In 1741, Giambattista had the satisfaction of seeing his son Gennaro succeed to his professorship in the University of Naples. In his final years, 1743-44, to 44, his mind gave way and he lapsed into a mysticism bordering on insanity. A copy of his book was in Montesquieu's library. In private notes, the French philosopher acknowledged his debt to Vico's theory of cyclical development and decay. And that debt, unnamed, appears in Montesquieu's Greatness and Decadence of the Romans of 1734. For the rest, Vico remained almost unknown in France until Jules Michelet published in 1827 an abridged translation of the Scienza Nuova. Michelet described Italy as the second mother and nurse who in my youth suckled me on Virgil and in my maturity nourished me with Vico. In 1826, Auguste Comte began the lectures that became his Cours de Philosophie Positive, 1830-1842, wherein the influence of Vico is felt at every stage. It was left for a Neapolitan, Benedetto Croce, to give Vico his full due, and to suggest again that history must take its place beside science as the ground and vestibule of philosophy. 3. Neapolitan Music Naples reversed Pythagoras and judged music to be the highest philosophy, said Lalande, the French astronomer, after a tour of Italy in 1765-66. to Music is the special triumph of the Neapolitans. It seems as if in that country the membranes of the eardrum are more taut, more harmonious, more sonorous than elsewhere in Europe. The whole nation sings. Gestures, tone, voice, rhythm of syllables, the very conversation, all breathe music. So Naples is the principal source of Italian music, of great composers and excellent operas. It is there that Corelli, Vinci, Rinaldo, Iomelli, Durante... Leo, Pergolesi, and so many other famous composers have brought forth their masterpieces. Naples, however, was supreme only in opera and vocal melody. In instrumental music, Venice led the way. And music fanciers complained that the Neapolitans loved the tricks of the voice more than the subtleties of harmony and counterpoint. 
Here reigned Niccolo Porpora, perhaps the greatest singing teacher who ever lived. Every Italian warbler aspired to be his pupil, and once accepted, bore humbly with his imperious eccentricities. So, said a story, he kept Gaetano Caffarelli for five years at one page of exercises, and then dismissed him with the assurance that he was now the greatest singer in Europe. Second only to Porpora as a teacher was Francesco Durante, who taught Vinci, Iomelli, Pergolesi, Paisiello, and Piccini. Leonardo Vinci seemed handicapped by his na name, but he won early acclaim by his setting of Metastasio's Didone Abandonata. Algarotti felt that Virgil himself would have been pleased to hear a composition so animated and so harrowing, in which the heart and soul were at once assailed by all the powers of music. Still more famous was Leonardo Leo, in Opera Seria and Buffa, Oratorio, Masses, and Motets. Naples oscillated for some time between laughing at his comic opera La Finta Fracastana and weeping over the Miserere that he composed for the Lenten services of 1744. When, about 1735, Leo heard a cantata by Niccolò Iomelli, he exclaimed, A short time and this young man will be the wonder and admiration of Europe. Iomelli almost verified the prophecy. At twenty-three he won the plaudits of Naples with his first opera. At twenty-six he earned a similar triumph in Rome. Passing to Bologna, he presented himself as a pupil to Padre Martini, but when that reverend teacher heard him extemporize a fugue in all its classic development, he cried out, Who are you, then? Are you making fun of me? It is I who should learn from you. At Venice his operas aroused such enthusiasm that the Council of Ten appointed him music director of the Scuola degli Incurabili. There he wrote some of the best religious music of that generation. Moving on to Vienna in 1748, he composed in close friendship with Metastasio. After further victories in Venice and Rome, he settled down in Stuttgart and Ludwigsburg between 1753 and 68 as Kapellmeister to the Duke of Württemberg. Here he modified his operatic style in a German direction, giving more complexity to his harmony, more substance and weight to the instrumental music. He discarded the da capo repetition of arias and provided orchestral accompaniment for recitatives. Probably under the influence of Jean-Georges Nevers, the French ballet master at Stuttgart, he gave ballet a prominent part in his operas. In some measure, these developments in Jomelli's music prepared the way for the reforms of Gluck. When the aging composer returned to Naples in 1768, the audience resented his Teutonic tendencies and decisively rejected his operas. Mozart, hearing one of them there in 1770, remarked, It is beautiful, but the style is too elevated as well as too antique for the theater. Jomelli fared better with his church music. His Miserere and his Mass for the Dead were sung throughout the Catholic world. William Beckford, after hearing the Mass in Lisbon in 1787, wrote, Such august, such affecting music I never heard and perhaps may never hear again. Having saved his earnings with Teutonic care, Jomelli retired to his native Aversa and spent his final years in opulent corpulence. In 1774, all the prominent musicians of Naples attended his funeral. Naples laughed even more than it sang. It was with a comic opera that Pergolesi conquered Paris after that proud city, alone among the European capitals, had refused to submit to Italy's opera seria. Giovanni Battista Pergolesi did not fight that battle in person, for he died in 1736 at the age of 26. Born near Ancona, he came to Naples at 16. By the age of 22, he had written several operas, 30 sonatas, and two masses much admired. In 1733, he presented an opera, Il Prigioniero, and as an interlude to this, he offered La Serva Padrona, the maid become mistress of the house. The libretto is a jolly story of how Serpina, the servant, maneuvers her master into marrying her. The music is an hour of gaiety and agile arias. We have seen how this artful frolic captured the mood and heart of Paris in the Guerre des Buffons of 1752, when it ran for a hundred performances at the Opéra, and then in 1753 for ninety-six more at the Théâtre Français. 
Meanwhile, Pergolesi conducted his opera L'Olympiade in Rome in 1735. It was hailed with a storm of hoots and with an orange accurately aimed at the composer's head. A year later he went to Pozzuoli to be treated for tuberculosis, which had been made worse by his profligate life. His early death atoned for his sins, and he was buried in the local cathedral by the Capuchin friars among whom he had spent his last days. Rome, repentant, revived L'Olympiade, and applauded it rapturously. Italy honors him not so much for his joyous intermezzi as for the tender sentiment of his Stabat Mater, which he did not live to complete. Pergolesi himself was made the subject of two operas. Domenico Scarlatti, like Pergolesi, has been slightly inflated by the winds of taste, but who can resist the sparkle of his prestidigitation? Born in the Anus Mirabilis of Handel and Bach, 1685, he was the sixth child of Alessandro Scarlatti, then the Verdi of Italian opera. He breathed music from his birth. His brother, Pietro, his cousin, Giuseppe, his uncles, Francesco and Tommaso, were musicians. Giuseppe's operas were produced in Naples, Rome, Turin, Venice, Vienna. Fearing lest Domenico's genius be stifled by this plethora of talent, the father sent him, aged twenty, to Venice. This son of mine, he said, is an eagle whose wings are grown. He must not remain in the nest, and I must not hinder his flight. In Venice, the youth continued his studies and met Handel. Perhaps together they passed to Rome, where at the urging of Cardinal Ottoboni, they engaged in an amiable competition on the harpsichord and then on the organ. Domenico was already the best harpsichordist in Italy, but Handel, we are told, equaled him while on the organ Scarlatti frankly owned Il Caro Sassone's superiority. The two men became fast friends. This is extremely difficult for leading practitioners of the same art, but the contemporary tells us Domenico had the sweetest temper and the gentilest behavior, and Handel's heart was as big as his frame. The shy modesty of the Italian deterred him from giving public displays of his harpsichord mastery. We know it only from reports of private musicales. One auditor in Rome in 1714 thought ten thousand devils had been at the instrument. Never before had he heard such passages of execution and effect. Scarlatti was the first to develop the keyboard potentialities of the left hand, including its crossing over the right. This book is continued on Cassette 11, Side 1. accepted appointment as Maestro di Capella to the former Queen of Poland, Maria Casimiera. On the death of her husband, Jan Sobieski, she had been banished as a troublesome intriguer. Coming to Rome in 1699, she resolved to set up a salon as brilliant with genius as that of Queen Christina of Sweden, who had died ten years before. In a palace on the Piazza della Trinità dei Monti, she gathered many of Christina's former circle, including several members of the Arcadian Academy. There, between 1709 and 1714, Scarlatti produced several of his operas. Encouraged by their success, he presented Amleto, Hamlet, in the Teatro Capranico. It was not well received, and Domenico never again offered an opera to an Italian public. His father had set a standard too high for him to reach. For four years, from 1715 to 19, he directed the Capella Giulia at the Vatican and officiated at the organ in St. Peter's. Now he composed a Stabat Mater, which has been pronounced a genuine masterpiece. In 1719, he conducted his opera Narciso in London. Two years later, we find him in Lisbon as chapel master to John V and as teacher to the king's daughter Maria Barbara, who became a skilled harpsichordist under his tutelage. Most of his extant sonatas were composed for her use. Returning to Naples in 1725, he married, age 42, Maria Gentile, age 16, and in 1729 he took her to Madrid. In that year, Maria Barbara married Ferdinand, Crown Prince of Spain. When she moved with him to Seville, Scarlatti accompanied her, and he remained in her service till her death. Scarlatti's wife died in 1739, leaving him five children. 
He married again, and soon the five were nine. When Maria Barbara became Queen of Spain in 1746, she brought the Scarlatti family with her to Madrid. Farinelli was the favorite musician of the royal pair, but the singer and the virtuoso became good friends. Scarlatti's position was that of a privileged servitor, providing music for the Spanish court. He obtained leave to go to Dublin in 1740 and to London in 1741. But mostly he lived in quiet content in or near Madrid, almost secluded from the world, and probably with no suspicion that he would become a favorite with pianists in the twentieth century. Of the 555 sonatas that now precariously support his fame on their tonal filigree, Scarlatti in his lifetime published only thirty. Their modest title, Esercizi per Gravi Giambalo, indicated their limited aim, to explore the possibilities of expression through harpsichord technique. They are sonatas only in the older sense of the term, as instrumental pieces to be sounded, not sung. Some have contrasted themes, and some are paired in major and minor keys, but they are all in single movements, with no attempt at thematic elaboration and recapitulation. They represent the emancipation of harpsichord music from the influence of the organ, and the reception by keyboard compositions of influences from opera. The vivacity, delicacy, trills, and tricks of sopranos and castrati are here surpassed by agile fingers obeying a playful and prodigal imagination. Scarlatti literally played the harpsichord. Do not expect, he said, any profound learning, but rather an ingenious jesting with art. Something of the Spanish dance, its prancing feet and swirling skirts and tinkling castanets, is in these ripples and cascades, and everywhere in the sonatas is the abandon of a performer to pleasure in mastery over his instrument. That joy in the instrument must have been one source of solace to Scarlatti in those serving years in Spain. It was rivaled by his delight in gambling, which consumed much of his pension. The queen had repeatedly to pay his debts. After 1751 his health failed and his piety increased. In 1754 he returned to Naples, and there, three years later, he died. The good Farinelli provided for his friend's impoverished family. We have left to a later chapter the strange career of Farinelli in Spain. He and Domenico Scarlatti, Giambattista and Domenico Tiepolo, were among the gifted Italians who, with the almost Italianate Menx, brought Italian music and art into the Spanish quickening. In 1759 the King of Naples followed or preceded them. In that year Ferdinand VI died without issue, and his brother Charles IV of Naples inherited the Spanish throne as Charles III. Naples was sorry to see him go. His departure, in a fleet of sixteen ships, was a sad holiday for the Neapolitans. They gathered in great throngs along the shore to see him sail away, and many, we are told, wept in bidding farewell to a sovereign who had proved himself the father of his people. He was to crown his career by rejuvenating Spain. Chapter 10 Portugal and Pombal, 1706-1782 1. John V, 1706-1750 Why had Portugal declined since the great days of Magellan, Vasco da Gama, and Camões? Once her flesh and spirit had sufficed to explore half the globe, leaving bold colonies in Madeira, the Azores, South America, Africa, Madagascar, India, Malacca, Sumatra. Now, in the eighteenth century, she was a tiny promontory of Europe, tied in trade and war to England, and nourished by Brazilian gold and diamonds reaching her by permission of the British fleet. Had her loins been exhausted by furnishing brave men to hold so many outposts precariously poised on the edges of the world? Had that influx of gold washed the iron out of her veins and relaxed her ruling classes from adventure into ease? Yes, and it had enervated Portuguese industry as well. What was the use of trying to compete in handicrafts or manufactures with artisans or entrepreneurs of England, Holland, or France, when imported gold could be paid out for imported clothing, food, and luxuries? The rich, handling the gold, grew richer and more gorgeously accoutred and adorned. The poor, kept at a distance from that gold, remained poor and had only hunger as a prod to toil. 
Negro slave labor was introduced on many farms, and beggars made the cities noisy with their cries. William Beckford, hearing them in 1787, reported, No beggars equal those of Portugal for strength of lungs, luxuriance of sores, profusion of vermin, variety and arrangement of tatters, and dauntless perseverance, innumerable, blind, dumb, and scabby. Lisbon was not then the lovely city that it is today. The churches and the monasteries were magnificent. The palaces of the nobility were immense, but fully a tenth of the population was homeless, and the tortuous alleys reeked with rubbish and filth. Yet here, as elsewhere in southern lands, the poor had the consolations of sunny days, starry evenings, music, religion, and pious women with tantalizing eyes. Undeterred by fleas on their flesh and mosquitoes in the air, the people poured into the streets after the heat had subsided, and there they danced, sang, strummed guitars, and fought over a damsel's smile. Treaties in 1654, 1661, and 1703 had bound Portugal to England in a strange symbiosis that allied them in economy and foreign policy, while keeping them enthusiastically diverse in manners and hostile in creed. England promised to protect Portugal's independence and to admit Portuguese wine, port from Oporto, with a greatly reduced tariff. Portugal pledged herself to admit English textiles duty-free and to side with England in any war. The Portuguese thought of the English as damned heretics with a good navy. The English looked upon the Portuguese as benighted bigots with strategic ports. British capital dominated Portuguese industry and trade. Bombal complained, with some exaggeration. In 1754, Portugal scarcely produced anything toward her own support. Two-thirds of her physical necessities were supplied by England. England had become mistress of our entire commerce, and all our foreign trade was managed by English agents. The entire cargo of vessels sent from Lisbon to Brazil, and consequently the riches that were returned in exchange, belonged to them. Nothing was Portuguese except in name. Nevertheless, enough of colonial gold, silver, and gems reached the Portuguese government to finance its expenses and make the king independent of the Cortes and its taxing power. So John V, in his reign of forty-four years, lived in sultanic ease, gracing polygamy with culture and piety. He gave or lent enormous sums to the papacy, and received in return the title of his most faithful majesty, and even the right to say mass— though not to change bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. His pleasures, said Frederick the Great, were in priestly functions. His buildings were convents, his armies were monks, his mistresses were nuns. The church prospered under a king who owed her so many absolutions. She owned half the land, and her devotees filled nine hundred religious houses. Of the nation's two million population, some two hundred thousand were ecclesiastics of some degree or attached to a religious establishment. The Jesuits were especially prominent at home and in the colonies. They had shared in winning Brazil for Portugal and were pleasing even Voltaire by their administration of Paraguay. Several of them were welcomed at court and some of them acquired ascendancy over the king. In the great procession of Corpus Christi, the king bore one of the poles of the canopy under which the Patriarch of Lisbon carried the Blessed Sacrament. When Englishmen marveled to see the root of the procession lined with troops and worshippers, all bareheaded and kneeling, it was explained to them that such ceremonies and the display of precious vessels and miraculous relics in the churches were a main factor in keeping social order among the poor. Meanwhile, the Inquisition watched over the purity of a nation's faith and blood. John V checked the power of the institution by securing from Pope Benedict XIII a bull allowing its prisoners to be defended by counsel, and requiring that all its sentences be subject to review by the king. Even so, the authority of the tribunal sufficed to burn sixty-six persons in Lisbon in eleven years, between 1732 and 1742. Among them was the leading Portuguese dramatist of the age, Antonio José da Silva, who was charged with secret Judaism. On the day of his execution, October 19, 1739, one of his plays was performed in a Lisbon theater. John V loved music, literature, and art. He brought French actors and Italian musicians to his capital. 
He founded the Royal Academy of History. He financed the great aqueduct that supplies Lisbon with water. He built at the cost of fifty million francs the convent of Mafra between 1717 and 32, vaster than the Escorial, and still among the most imposing structures in the Iberian Peninsula. To adorn the interior, he summoned back from Spain the greatest Portuguese painter of the century. The eighty-four years of Francisco Vieira mingled love and art in a romance that stirred all Portugal. Born at Lisbon in 1699, he fell in love with Ignace Helena de Lima when both were children. Enamored also of painting, he went to Rome at the age of nine, studied there for seven years, and, aged fifteen, won the first prize in a competition offered by the Academy of St. Luke. Returning in 1715, he was chosen by John V to paint a mystery of the Eucharist. This, we are told, he finished in six days. Then he set out to find Ignace. Her titled father turned him away and demurred the girl in a convent. Francisco appealed to the king, who refused to intervene. He went to Rome and secured a bull annulling Ignace's conventual vows and authorizing the marriage. The bull was ignored by Portuguese authorities. Francisco, back in Lisbon, disguised himself as a bricklayer, entered the convent, carried off his beloved, and married her. Her brother shot him, he recovered, and forgave his assailant. John V made him court painter and gave him commissions to decorate not only the Mafra convent but the royal palaces. After Ignace died in 1775, Francisco spent his remaining years in religious retreat and in works of charity. How many such romances of soul and blood are lost behind the facades of history? 2. Pombal and the Jesuits John V died in 1750 after eight years of paralysis and imbecility, and his son, Joseph I, José Manuel, began an eventful reign. He appointed to his cabinet, as Minister for War and Foreign Affairs, Sebastião José de Carvalho e Melu, whom history knows as the Marquês de Pombal, the greatest and most terrible minister who ever governed Portugal. He was already fifty-one years old when Joseph reached the throne. Educated by the Jesuits at the University of Coimbra, he won his first fame as an athletic and pugnacious leader of the Mohawks gang that infested the streets of Lisbon. In 1733, he persuaded the high-born Dona Teresa de Noronha to elope with him. Her family denounced him, then recognized his talent and promoted his political career. His wife brought him a small fortune. He inherited another from an uncle. He made his way by influence, persistence, and obvious ability. In 1739, he was appointed minister plenipotentiary to London. His wife retired to a convent and died there in 1745. In his six years in England, Pombal studied the English economy and government, noted the obedience of the Anglican Church to the state, and perhaps shed some of his Catholic faith. He returned to Lisbon in 1744, was sent as envoy to Vienna in 1745, and there married a niece of Marshal Daun who was to earn immortality by defeating Frederick once. Pombal's new bride remained devoted to him through all his triumphs and defeats. John V had distrusted him as having a hairy heart, as coming from a cruel and vindictive family, and as capable of defying a king. Nevertheless, Pombal was called home in 1749 and was raised to ministerial office with Jesuit support. Joseph I confirmed the appointment. Intelligence combined with industry soon gave Pombal dominance in the new cabinet. Carvalho, reported a French chargé d'affaires, may be looked upon as the chief minister. He is indefatigable, active, and expeditious. He has won the confidence of the king, his master, and in all political matters none has it more than he. His superiority became evident in the great earthquake of November 1st, 1755. At 9.40 a.m. on All Saints' Day, when most of the population were worshipping in the churches, four convulsions of the earth laid half of Lisbon in ruins, killing over 15,000 people, destroying most of the churches, sparing most of the brothels, and Pombal's home. Many inhabitants ran in terror to the shores of the Tagus, but a tidal wave fifteen feet high drowned thousands more, and wrecked the vessels that lay in the river. The fires that broke out in every quarter of the city claimed additional lives. 
In the resultant chaos, the scum of the populace began to rob and kill with impunity. The king, who himself had narrowly escaped death, asked his ministers what should be done. Pombal is reported to have answered, Bury the dead and relieve the living. Joseph gave him full authority, and Pombal used it with characteristic energy and dispatch. He stationed troops to maintain order, set up tents and camps for the homeless, and decreed immediate hanging for anyone found robbing the dead. He fixed the prices of provisions at those that had prevailed before the earthquake, and compelled all incoming ships to unload their cargoes of food and sell them at those prices. Helped by an undiminished influx of Brazilian gold, he supervised the rapid rebuilding of Lisbon with wide boulevards and well-paved and well-lit streets. The central part of the city as it is today was the work of the architects and engineers who worked under Pombal. His success in this demoralizing catastrophe confirmed his power in the ministry. Now he undertook two far-reaching tasks, to free the government from domination by the church and to free the economy from domination by Britain. These enterprises required a man of steel, of patriotism, ruthlessness, and pride. If his anti-clericalism struck especially at the Jesuits, it was primarily because he suspected them of fomenting the resistance to Portuguese appropriation of that Paraguayan territory where the Jesuits had since 1605 been organizing over a hundred thousand Indians into thirty-one reducciones, or settlements, on a semi-communistic basis in formal submission to Spain. Spanish and Portuguese explorers had heard of quite legendary gold in Paraguayan soil, and merchants complained that the Jesuit fathers were monopolizing the export trade of Paraguay and were adding the profits to the funds of their order. In 1750, Pombal negotiated a treaty by which Portugal surrendered to Spain the rich colony of San Sacramento, at the mouth of the Rio de la Plata, in exchange for seven of the Jesuit reductions adjacent to the Brazilian frontier. The treaty stipulated that the 30,000 Indians in these communities should emigrate to other regions and relinquish the land to the incoming Portuguese. Ferdinand VI of Spain ordered the Paraguayan Jesuits to leave the settlements and to instruct their subjects to depart in peace. The Jesuits claimed to have obeyed these orders, but the Indians resisted with a passionate and violent tenacity, which it took a Portuguese army three years to overcome. Pombal accused the Society of Jesus of secretly encouraging this resistance. He resolved to end all Jesuit participation in Portuguese industry, commerce, and government. Perceiving his intention, the Jesuits of Portugal joined in efforts to overthrow him. Their leader in this movement was Gabriel Malagrida. Born in Menaggio on Lake Como in 1689, he distinguished himself at school by biting his hands till the blood flowed. So, he said, he prepared himself to bear the pains of martyrdom. He joined the Society of Jesus and sailed as a missionary to Brazil. From 1724 to 1735, he preached the gospel to Indians in the jungle. Several times he escaped death, from cannibals, crocodiles, shipwreck, disease. His beard turned white in early middle age. He was credited with miraculous powers, and expectant crowds followed him whenever he appeared in the cities of Brazil. He built churches and convents and founded seminaries. In 1747 he came to Lisbon to solicit funds from King John. He received them, sailed back to Brazil, and established more religious houses, often sharing in the manual labor of construction. In 1753 he was in Lisbon again, for he had promised to prepare the Queen Mother for death. He attributed the earthquake of 1755 to the sins of the people, called for a reform of morals, and with others of his order, predicted further earthquakes if morals did not improve. His house of religious retreat became a focus of plots against Pombal. Some noble families were involved in these plots. They protested that the son of an insignificant country squire had made himself master of Portugal, holding their lives and fortunes in his hands. One of these aristocratic factions was led by Dom José de Mascareñas, Duke of Averu. Another was headed by the Duke's brother-in-law, Dom Francisco de Assis, Marquis of Tavora. Tavora's wife, the Marchioness Dona Leonor, a leader of Portuguese society, was a fervent disciple and frequent visitor of Father Malagrida. Her oldest son, Dom Luis Bernardo, the younger Marquis of Tavora, was married to his own aunt. 
When Luis went off to India as a soldier, this lovely and beautiful younger marchioness became the mistress of Joseph I. This, too, the Averus and the Tavoras never forgave. They heartily agreed with the Jesuits that should Pombal be removed, the situation would be eased. Pombal struck back by persuading Joseph that the Society of Jesus was secretly encouraging further revolt in Paraguay and was conspiring not only against the ministry but against the king as well. On September 19, 1757, a decree banished from the court the Jesuit confessors of the royal family. Pombal instructed his cousin, Francisco de Almade Mendonça, Portuguese envoy to the Vatican, to leave no ducat unturned in promoting and financing the anti-Jesuit party in Rome. In October, Almada presented to Benedict XIV a list of charges against the Jesuits, that they had sacrificed all Christian religious, natural, and political obligations in a blind wish to make themselves masters of the government, and that the society was actuated by an insatiable desire to acquire and accumulate foreign riches and even to usurp the dominion of sovereigns. On April 1, 1758, the Pope ordered Cardinal de Saldana, Patriarch of Lisbon, to investigate these charges. On May 15, Saldana published a decree declaring that the Portuguese Jesuits carried on commerce contrary to all laws, divine and human, and he bade them desist. On June 7, probably at Pombal's urging, he ordered them to abstain from hearing confessions or preaching. In July, the superior of the Lisbon Jesuits was banished sixty leagues from the court. Meanwhile, on May 3, 1758, Benedict XIV died. His successor, Clement XIII, appointed another commission of inquiry, and this body reported that the Jesuits were innocent of the charges brought against them by Pombal. There was some doubt whether Joseph I would support his minister in attacking the Jesuits, but a dramatic turn of events drove the king completely to Pombal's side. On the night of September 3, 1758, Joseph was returning to his palace near Belém from a secret rendezvous, probably with the young Marchioness of Tavora. Shortly before midnight, three masked men emerged from the arch of an aqueduct and fired into the coach without effect. The coachman put his horse to the gallop, but a moment later two shots came from another ambush. One shot wounded the coachman, the other wounded the king in his right shoulder and arm. According to a later court of inquiry, a third ambush by members of the Tavora family awaited the coach farther on the highway to Belém. But Joseph ordered the coachman to leave the main road and drive to the house of the royal surgeon, who dressed the wounds. The resultant events which made a noise throughout Europe might have been very different if the third ambush had succeeded in the attempted assassination. Pombal acted with subtle deliberation. Rumors of the attack were officially denied. The king's temporary confinement was ascribed to a fall. For three months, the secret agents of the minister gathered evidence. A man was found who testified that Antonio Ferreira had borrowed a musket from him on August 3rd and had returned it on September 8th. Another man was reported as saying that Ferreira had borrowed a pistol from him on September 3rd and had returned it a few days later. Ferreira, said both these witnesses, was in the service of the Duke of Averu. Salvador Durao, a servant in Belém, testified that on the night of the attack, while he was keeping an assignation outside the Averu home, he had overheard some members of the Averu family returning from a nocturnal enterprise. Pombal prepared his case with caution and audacity. He set aside the procedure required by law, which would have tried the suspected nobles by a court of their peers. Such a court would never condemn them. Instead, as the first public revelation of the crime, the king issued on December 9th two decrees. One nominated Dr. Pedro Gonçalves Pereira as judge to preside over a special tribunal of high treason. The other ordered him to discover, arrest, and execute those responsible for the attempt to kill the king. Gonçalves Pereira was empowered to disregard all customary forms of legal process, and the tribunal was told to execute its decrees on the day of their announcement. To these decrees, Pombal added a manifesto, posted throughout the city, relating the events of September 3rd, and offering rewards to any person who would give evidence leading to the arrest of the assassins. On December 13th, government officers arrested the Duke of Averu, his 16-year-old son, the Marquis of Gouveia, his servitor, Antonio Ferreira, 
the old and the younger Marquis of Tavora, the old Marchioness of Tavora, all servants of these two families and five other nobles. All Jesuit colleges were on that day surrounded by soldiers. Malagrida and twelve other leading Jesuits were jailed. To accelerate matters, a royal decree of December 20th permitted, against Portuguese custom, the use of torture to elicit confessions. Under torture or threat of it, fifty prisoners were examined. Several confessions implicated the Duke of Averu. He himself, under torture, admitted his guilt. Antonio Ferreira acknowledged that he had fired at the coach, but swore that he had not known that the prospective victim was the king. Under torture, several servants of the Tavoras compromised that entire family. The younger Marquis confessed complicity. The older Marquis, tortured to the point of death, denied his guilt. Pombal himself assisted at the examination of witnesses and prisoners. He had had the males examined. He claimed to have found in them twenty-four letters by the Duke of Averu, by several Tavoras, by Malagrida and other Jesuits, notifying their friends or relatives in Brazil of the abortive attempt, and promising renewed efforts to overturn the government. On January 4, 1759, the king nominated Dr. Eusebio Tavares de Sequera to defend the accused. Sequera argued that the confessions elicited under torture were worthless as evidence, and that all the accused nobles could prove alibis for the night of the crime. The defense was judged unconvincing. The intercepted letters were held to be genuine and to corroborate the confessions, and on January 12th the court declared all indicted persons guilty. Nine of them were executed on January 13th in the public square of Belém. The first to die was the old Marchioness of Tavora. On the scaffold the executioner bent to tie her feet, she repelled him, saying, Do not touch me except to kill me. After being compelled to see the instruments, wheel, hammer, and faggots by which her husband and her sons were to die, she was beheaded. Her two sons were broken on the wheel and strangled. Their corpses lay on the scaffold when the Duke of Averu and the old Marquis of Tavora mounted it. They suffered the same shattering blows, and the Duke was allowed to linger in agony until the last of the executions the burning alive of Antonio Ferreira was complete. All the corpses were burned, and the ashes were thrown into the Tagus. Portugal still debates whether the nobles, though admittedly hostile to Pombal, had meant to kill the king. Were the Jesuits involved in the attempt? There was no doubt that Malagrida, in his passionate fulminations, had predicted the fall of Pombal and the early death of the king and no doubt that he and other Jesuits had held conferences with the minister's titled foes. He had implied his awareness of a plot by writing to a lady of the court a letter begging her to put Joseph on his guard against an imminent danger. Asked in jail how he had learned of such a peril, he replied, in the confessional. Aside from this, according to an anti-Jesuit historian, there is no positive evidence to connect the Jesuits with the outrage. Pombal accused them, by their preaching and teaching, of having excited their allies to the point of murder. He persuaded the king that the situation offered the monarchy an opportunity to strengthen itself as against the church. On January 19th, Joseph issued edicts attaching all Jesuit property in the kingdom— and confining all Jesuits to their houses or colleges pending settlement by the Pope of the charges against them. Meanwhile, Pombal used the government press to print, and his agents to distribute widely at home and abroad, pamphlets stating the case against the nobles and the Jesuits. This was apparently the first time that a government had made use of the printing press to explain its actions to other nations. These publications may have had some influence in leading to the expulsion of the Jesuits from France and Spain. In the summer of 1759, Pombal sought from Clement XIII permission to submit the arrested Jesuits to trial before the Tribunal of High Treason. Moreover, he proposed that henceforth all ecclesiastics accused of crimes against the state should be tried in secular, not ecclesiastical, courts. A personal letter from Joseph to the Pope announced the king's resolve to expel the Jesuits from Portugal, and expressed the hope that the Pope would approve the measure as warranted by their actions and as necessary for the protection of the monarchy. 
Clement was shocked by these messages, but he feared that if he directly opposed them, Pombal would induce the king to sever all relations between the Portuguese church and the papacy. He recalled the action of Henry VIII in England, and knew that France, too, was developing hostility against the Society of Jesus. On August 11th, he sent his permission to try the Jesuits before the secular tribunal, but explicitly confined his consent to the present case. To the king he made a personal appeal for mercy to the accused priests. He reminded Joseph of the past achievements of the order and trusted that all Portuguese Jesuits would not be punished for the mistakes of a few. The papal appeal failed. On September 3, 1759, the anniversary of the attempted assassination, the king issued an edict giving a long list of alleged offenses by the Jesuits and decreeing that, these religious, being corrupt and deplorably fallen away from their holy institute, or rule, and rendered manifestly incapable by such abominable and inveterate vices of returning to its observance, must be properly and effectually banished, proscribed, and expelled from all His Majesty's dominions, as notorious rebels, traitors, adversaries, and aggressors of His royal person and realm. And it is ordered under the irremissible pain of death that no person of whatever state or condition is to admit them into any of his possessions or hold any communication with them by word or writing. Those Jesuits who had not yet made their solemn profession and who should petition to be released from their preliminary vows were exempted from the decree. All Jesuit property was confiscated by the state. The exiles were forbidden to take anything with them but their personal clothing. From all sections of Portugal they were led in coaches or on foot to ships that took them to Italy. Similar deportations were carried out from Brazil and other Portuguese possessions. The first shipload of expatriates reached Civita Vecchia on October 24th, and even Pombal's representative there was moved to pity by their condition. Some were weak with age, some were near starvation, some had died on the way. Lorenzo Ricci, general of the society, arranged for the reception of the survivors into Jesuit houses in Italy, and the Dominican friars shared in extending hospitality. On June 17, 1760, the Portuguese government suspended diplomatic relations with the Vatican. The victory of Pombal seemed complete, but he knew that it was unpopular with the nation. Feeling insecure, he expanded his power to full dictatorship and began a reign of absolutism and terror that continued till 1777. His spies reported to him every detected expression of opposition to his policies or his methods. Soon the jails of Lisbon were crowded with political prisoners. Many nobles and priests were arrested on charges of new plots against the king or of implication in the old plot. The Junquera Fort, midway between Lisbon and Belém, became the special jail of aristocrats, many of whom were kept there till their death. Other prisons held, some for nineteen years, Jesuits brought from the colonies and charged with resisting the government. Malagrida languished in prison for thirty-two months before being brought to trial. The old man solaced his confinement by writing The Heroic Life of St. Anne, the Mother of Mary, dictated to the Reverend Father Malagrida by St. Anne herself. Pombal had the manuscript seized and found in it several absurdities that could be labeled heresies. St. Anne said Malagrida had been conceived, like Mary, without the stain of original sin, and she had spoken and wept in her mother's womb. Having made his own brother, Paul de Carvalho, head of the Inquisition in Portugal, Pombal had Malagrida summoned before its tribunal and drew up with his own hand an indictment charging the Jesuit with cupidity, hypocrisy, imposture, and sacrilege, and with having menaced the king with repeated predictions of death. Made half insane by his sufferings, Malagrida, now seventy-two years old, told the inquisitors that he had spoken with St. Ignatius Loyola and St. Teresa. One judge, moved to pity, wished to stop the trial. Pombal had him removed. On January 12, 1761, the Holy Office pronounced Malagrida guilty of heresy, blasphemy, and impiety, and of having deceived the people by pretended divine revelations. He was allowed to live eight months more. 
On September 20th, he was led to a scaffold in the Praça Rocio, was strangled and was burned at the stake. Louis XV, hearing of the execution, remarked, It is as if I burned the old lunatic in the Petite Maison Asylum, who says that he is God the Father. Voltaire, recording the event, pronounced it folly and absurdity joined to the most horrible wickedness. The French philosophe, who in 1758 had looked upon Pombal as an enlightened despot, were not pleased with his development. They welcomed the overthrow of the Jesuits, but they deprecated the arbitrary methods of the dictator, the violent tone of his pamphlets, and the barbarity of his punishments. They were shocked by the treatment of the Jesuits during their deportation, by the wholesale execution of ancient families, and by the inhumane treatment of Malagrida. We have, however, no record of their protesting the eight-year imprisonment of the Bishop of Coimbra for condemning Pombal's censorship board, which had allowed the circulation of such radical works as Voltaire's Philosophical Dictionary and Rousseau's Social Contract. Pombal himself preached no heresies and went to Mass regularly. He aimed not at the destruction of the Church, but at its subjection to the King. And when in 1770 Clement XIV agreed to let the government nominate to bishoprics, he made his peace with the Vatican. Joseph I, as he neared death, rejoiced in the thought that after all he might die with full benefit of clergy. The Pope sent a cardinal's hat to Pombal's brother Paul, and to Pombal himself a ring bearing the papal portrait, and a miniature framed in diamonds, and the entire cadavers of four saints. 3. Pombal the Reformer Meanwhile, the dictator had left his mark upon the economy, administration, and cultural life of Portugal. With the help of English and German officers, he reorganized the army, which turned back a Spanish invasion in the Seven Years' War. Like Richelieu in 17th century France, he reduced the disruptive power of the aristocracy and centralized the government in a monarchy that could give the nation political unity educational development, and some protection from ecclesiastical domination. After the execution of the Tavoras, the nobles ceased to plot against the king. After the expulsion of the Jesuits, the clergy submitted to the state. During the alienation from the Vatican, Pombal appointed the bishops, and his bishops ordained priests without reference to Rome. A royal decree curtailed the acquisition of land by the church and restrained Portuguese subjects from burdening their estates with bequests for masses. Many convents were closed, and the rest were forbidden to receive novices under twenty-five years of age. The Inquisition was brought under government control. Its tribunal was made a public court, subject to the same rules as the courts of the state. It was shorn of censorship powers. Its distinction between old Christians and new Christians— Christianized Jews or Moors and their descendants, was abolished, for Pombal took it for granted that most Spaniards and Portuguese had now some Semitic strain in their blood. A decree of May 25, 1773, made all Portuguese subjects eligible to civil, military, and ecclesiastical office. There was no burning of persons by the Portuguese Inquisition after that of Malagrida in 1761. In that year, Pombal abolished three quarters of the petty offices that had hampered the administration of justice. The law courts were made more accessible, litigation was made less expensive. In 1761, he reorganized the treasury, required it to balance its books every week, ordered yearly audits of municipal revenues and expenditures, and made some progress in the most difficult reforms of all, the reduction of personnel and extravagance at the royal court. The eighty cooks that had fed John V and his entourage were weeded out. Joseph I had to content himself with twenty. An edict of May 25, 1773, in effect abolished slavery in Portugal, but allowed it to continue in the colonies. The reformer's hand moved everywhere. He gave governmental support to agriculture and fisheries, and introduced the silkworm into the northern provinces. He established potteries, glassworks, cotton mills, woolen factories, and paper plants to end the dependence of Portugal upon the importation of such products from abroad. He abolished internal tolls in the movement of goods and established free trade between Portugal and her American colonies. He founded a college of commerce to train men for business management. 
He organized and subsidized companies to take over Portuguese trade from foreign merchants and carriers. Here he, or the Portuguese, failed, for in 1780 the commerce of Portugal was still mostly in foreign, chiefly in British hands. The expulsion of the Jesuits necessitated a thorough reconstruction of education. New elementary and secondary schools, to the number of 837, were scattered over the land. The Jesuit college at Lisbon was transformed into a college of nobles under secular administration. The curriculum at Coimbra was enlarged with additional courses in science. Pombal persuaded the king to build an opera house and to invite Italian singers to lead the castes. In 1757 he founded the Arcadia de Lisboa for the stimulation of literature. For an exciting half-century, from 1755 to 1805, Portuguese literature enjoyed a relative freedom of ideas and forms. Liberating itself from Italian models, it acknowledged the spell of France and felt some zephyrs of the Enlightenment. Antonio Dinista Cruz e Silva won national fame by a satire, Uesupe, in 1772, describing in eight cantos the quarrel of a bishop with his dean. João Anastasio de Cunha translated Pope and Voltaire, for which he was condemned by the Inquisition in 1778, soon after Pombal's fall. Francisco Manuel do Nascimento, son of a longshoreman, took passionately to books and became the center of a group that rebelled against the Arcadian Academy as a drag on the development of national poetry. In 1778, again taking advantage of Pombal's fall, the Inquisition ordered his arrest as being addicted to modern philosophers who follow natural reason. He escaped to France, where he spent nearly all his remaining forty-one years. There he wrote most of his poems, ardent for freedom and democracy, including an ode to the liberty and independence of the United States. His followers ranked him as second only to Camões in Portuguese poetry. The most elegant and melodious verse of the age was in a volume of love poems, Amarilia, bequeathed by Tomás Antonio Gonzaga, who suffered imprisonment from 1785 to 88 for political conspiracy and died in exile. José Agustinho de Macedo, an Augustinian friar unfrocked because of his dissipated life, boldly took for the subject of his epic, U Oriente, the same subject as Camoix, voyage of Vasco da Gama to India. He judged his poem superior to the Lusiads and the Iliad, but we are assured that it is a dreary performance. More interesting was a satire in six cantos, Us Buros, in which Macedo pilloried by name men and women of all ranks, living or dead. His favorite enemy was Manuel Maria Barbosa de Bucage, who was imprisoned by the Inquisition in 1797 on a charge of spreading Voltairean ideas in his verse and plays. The execution of Marie Antoinette turned him back to conservatism in religion and politics. He recaptured his youthful piety and saw in the mosquito a proof of the existence of God. The great event in the art history of Pombal's regime was the statue raised to Joseph I, which still stands in Lisbon's Black Horse Square. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now. By Will and Ariel Durant Part 1. Continued. Cassette 11, Side 2. The great event in the art history of Pombal's regime was the statue raised to Joseph I, which still stands in Lisbon's Black Horse Square. Designed by Joaquim Machado de Castro, cast in bronze by Bartolomeu da Costa, it represented the king riding a steed victoriously over serpents, symbolizing the evil forces overcome during his reign. Pombal made the inauguration of the monument on June 6, 1775, a celebration of his triumphant ministry. Troops of soldiery lined the square. The diplomatic corps, the judiciary, the senate, and other dignitaries were assembled in full costume. Then came the court, then the king and the queen. Finally, Pombal came forward and unveiled the figures and the massive pedestal, on which a medallion pictured the minister wearing the cross of Christ. Everyone but the king understood that the real subject of the celebration was Pombal. 
A few days after the unveiling, he sent to Joseph I a rosy-colored inscription of the progress made by Portugal since 1750. The spread of education and literacy, the growth of manufactures and trade, the development of literature and art, the general rise in the standard of living. Truth must take many deductions from his account. Industry and trade were growing, but very slowly, and were in financial difficulties— the arts were stagnant, and half of Lisbon still lay in 1774 in the ruins caused by the earthquake of 1755. The natural piety of the people was restoring ecclesiastical power. Pombal's lordly manners and dictatorial methods were making new enemies every day. He had enriched himself and his relatives. He had built for himself an extravagantly costly palace— there was hardly a noble family in the kingdom that did not have a beloved member wasting away in jail. Everywhere in Portugal there were secret hopes and prayers for Pombal's fall. 4. The Triumph of the Past The king was sixty years old in 1775. Illnesses and mistresses had aged him beyond his years, and he spent hours in meditation on sin and death. He wondered had he been right in following the policies of his minister. Had he been just to the Jesuits? Those nobles and priests in prison, he would gladly have pardoned them now that he sought pardon for himself, but how could he mention such an idea to the unrelenting Pombal? And what could he do without Pombal? On November 12, 1776, he suffered an apoplectic stroke, and the court almost visibly rejoiced in expectation of a new reign and a new ministry. The heir to the throne was his daughter, Maria Francisca, who had married his brother Pedro. She was a good woman, a good wife and mother, a kind and charitable soul, but she was also a fervent Catholic who had so resented Pombal's anti-clericalism that she had left the court to live quietly with Pedro at Queluz, a few miles from the capital. The foreign diplomats notified their governments to expect an early reversal of Portuguese policies. On November 18th, the king received the sacraments. On November 29th, Maria became regent. One of her first acts was to end the bishop of Coimbra's long imprisonment. The 74-year-old prelate was restored to his see amid almost universal rejoicing. Pombal saw his authority waning, and noted with somber premonitions that courtiers lately subservient to him now looked upon him as politically moribund. In a final act of despotism, he took a wild revenge upon the village of Trafaria, whose fisher folk had opposed the forcible impressment of their sons into the army. He ordered a platoon of soldiers to burn the village down. They did it by flinging lighted torches through the windows of the wooden cottages in the dark of night on January 23, 1777. On February 24, Joseph I died. The regent became Queen Maria I, who reigned from 1777 to 1816, and her husband became King Pedro III, who reigned from 1777 to 1786. Pedro was a man of weak mind. Maria absorbed herself in piety and charity. Religion, which was half the life of the Portuguese people, rapidly recovered its power. The Inquisition resumed its activity in censorship and the suppression of heresy. Queen Maria sent forty thousand pounds to the papacy to partially reimburse it for expenses incurred in caring for the banished Jesuits. On the day after Joseph's burial, Queen Maria ordered the release of eight hundred prisoners, most of them incarcerated by Pombal for political opposition. Many of them had been in the dungeons for twenty years. When they emerged, their eyes could not bear the sun. Nearly all were in rags. Many looked twice their age. Hundreds of prisoners had died in jail. Of the 124 Jesuits who had been imprisoned 18 years before, only 45 still lived. Five nobles condemned for alleged complicity in the plot to kill Joseph refused to leave prison until their innocence had been officially declared. The sight of the released victims of Pombal's hostility and the news of the burning of Trafaria brought his unpopularity to the point where he no longer ventured to show himself in public. On March 1st he sent to Queen Maria a letter resigning all his offices and asking permission to retire to his estate in the town of Pombal. The nobles who surrounded the Queen demanded his imprisonment and punishment. 
but when she discovered that all the measures which they resented had been signed by the late king, she decided that she could not punish Pombal without laying a public stain upon her father's memory. She accepted the minister's resignation and allowed him to retire to Pombal, but she ordered him to remain there. On March 5th, he left Lisbon in a hired chase, hoping to escape notice. Some people recognized him and stoned his carriage, but he escaped. At the town of Weiras, his wife joined him. He was seventy-seven years old. Now that he was only a private citizen, he was assailed from every side by suits for debts he had neglected to pay, for injuries he had inflicted, for properties he had taken without adequate compensation. Bailiffs besieged his doors at Pombal with a succession of writs. There is not a hornet or a gnat in Portugal, he wrote, that does not fly to this remote spot and buzz in my ears. The Queen helped him by granting continuance for life of the salary he had received as minister, and added to it a modest pension. Nevertheless, countless enemies urged the Queen to summon him to trial on charges of malfeasance and treason. She compromised by allowing judges to visit him and subject him to examination on the charges. They questioned him for hours at a time through three and a half months, until the old dictator, exhausted, begged for mercy. The Queen delayed action on the report of the examination, hoping that Pombal's death might relieve her embarrassment. Meanwhile, she sought to appease his foes by ordering retrial of those who had been convicted of complicity in the attempt upon her father. The new court confirmed the guilt of the Duke of Averu and three of his servants, but exonerated all the rest of the accused. All Tavoras were declared innocent, and all their honors and property were remitted to their survivors on April 3, 1781. On August 16th, the Queen issued a decree condemning Pombal as an infamous criminal, but adding that since he had begged for pardon, he was to be left at peace in his exile and in the possession of his property. Pombal was entering upon his final illness. His body was almost covered with pus oozing sores, apparently from leprosy. Pain kept him from sleeping more than two hours in a day. Dysentery weakened him, and his doctors, as if to add to his torments, persuaded him to drink a broth made from the flesh of snakes. He prayed for death, received the sacraments, and ended his sufferings on May 8, 1782. Forty-five years later, a party of Jesuits, passing through the town, stopped at his grave and recited a requiem, in triumph and pity, for the repose of his soul. Chapter 11 Spain and the Enlightenment, 1700-1788 1. Milieu At his death in 1700, Charles II, last of the Spanish Habsburgs, bequeathed Spain and all its global empire to the age-long enemy of the Habsburgs, Bourbon France. The grandson of Louis XIV, as Philip V of Spain, fought bravely during the War of the Spanish Succession, from 1702 to 1713, to maintain that empire unimpaired. Nearly all Europe rose in arms to prevent so dangerous an aggrandizement of Bourbon power. In the end, Spain had to yield Gibraltar and Menorca to England, Sicily to Savoy, and Naples, Sardinia, and Belgium to Austria. Moreover, the loss of sea power left Spain only a precarious hold on the colonies that nourished her commerce and her wealth. Wheat in Spanish America gave from five to twenty times the yield per acre that came from the soil of Spain. From those sunny lands came mercury, copper, zinc, arsenic, dyes, meat, hides, rubber, cochineal, sugar, cocoa, coffee, tobacco, tea, quinine, and a dozen other medicaments. In 1788, Spain exported to her American colonies goods valued at 158 million reales. She imported from them goods valued at 804 million reales. This unfavorable balance of trade was wiped out by a stream of American silver and gold. The Philippines sent cargoes of pepper, cotton, indigo, and sugar cane. At the end of the 18th century, Alexander von Humboldt estimated the population of the Philippines at 1,900,000, of Spanish America at 16,902,000. Spain herself, in 1797, had 10,541,000. It is one credit to Bourbon rule that this last figure almost doubled the population of 5,700,000 in 1700. 
Geography favored Spain only from maritime commerce. In the north, the land was fertile, fed with rains and the melting snows of the Pyrenees. Irrigation canals, mostly bequeathed to their conquerors by the Moors, had reclaimed Valencia, Murcia, and Andalusia from aridity. The rest of Spain was discouragingly mountainous or dry. The gifts of nature were not developed by economic enterprise. The most venturesome Spaniards went to the colonies. Spain preferred to buy industrial products from abroad with her colonial gold and the yield of her own mines of silver, copper, iron, or lead. Her industries, still in the guild or domestic stage, lagged far behind those of the industrious North, and many of her rich mines were operated by foreign management for the profit of German or English investors. The production of wool was monopolized by the Mesta, an association of flock owners privileged by the government, entrenched in tradition, and dominated by a small minority of nobles and monasteries. Competition was stifled, improvements lagged. A meager proletariat festered in the towns, serving as domestics to the great or as journeymen in the guilds. Some Negro or Moorish slaves adorned affluent homes. A small middle class lived in dependence upon the government, the nobility, or the church. Of the agricultural land, 51.5% was owned in vast tracts by noble families, 16.5% by the church, 32% by communes, towns, or peasants. The growth of peasant proprietorship was retarded by an old law of entail, which required that an estate should be bequeathed intact to the eldest son, and that no part of it should be mortgaged or sold. Through most of the century, except in the Basque provinces, three-quarters of the soil was tilled by tenants paying tribute in rent, fees, service, or kind, to aristocratic or ecclesiastical landlords, whom they rarely saw. As rents were raised according to the productivity of the farm, the tenants had no incentive to inventiveness or industry. The owners defended the practice by alleging that the progressive depreciation of the currency forced them to raise rents to keep pace with rising prices and costs. Meanwhile, a sales tax on such necessaries as meat, wine, olive oil, candles, and soap fell heavily upon the poor, who spent most of their income on necessaries, more lightly upon the rich. The result of these procedures, of hereditary privilege and of the natural inequality of human ability, was a concentration of wealth at the top and at the bottom a somber poverty that continued from generation to generation, alleviated and abetted by supernatural consolations. The nobility was jealously divided into grades of dignity— at the top, in 1787, were 119 grandees, grandes de España. We may guess at their wealth from the probably exaggerated report of the contemporary British traveller Joseph Townsend that three great lords, the Dukes of Osuna, Alba, and Medina Seli, cover, or own, almost the whole province of Andalusia. Medina Seli received one million reales yearly from his fisheries alone. Osuna had an annual income of 8,400,000 reales. The Count of Aranda had nearly 1,600,000 reales a year. Below the grandees were 535 titulos, men who had been given hereditary titles by the king on condition of remitting half their income to the crown. Below these were the caballeros, chevaliers or knights named by the king to lucrative membership in one of the four military orders of Spain. Santiago, Alcantara, Calatrava, and Montesa. The lowliest of the nobles were the 400,000 Hidalgos, who owned modest tracts of land, were exempt from military service and from imprisonment for debt, and had the right to display a coat of arms and be addressed as Don. Some of them were poor, some joined the beggars in the streets. Most of the nobles lived in the cities and named the municipal officials. As the divine guardian of the status quo, the Spanish church claimed a comfortable share of the gross national product. A Spanish authority reckoned its annual income after taxes at 1,101,753,000 reales, and that of the state at 1,371,000,000. A third of its revenues came from land. 
large sums from tithes and first fruits, petty cash from christenings, marriages, funerals, masses for the dead, and monastic costumes sold to pious people who thought that if they died in such robes they might slip unquestioned into paradise. Monastic mendicants brought in an additional fifty-three million reales. The average priest, of course, was poor, partly because of his number. Spain had ninety-one thousand two hundred fifty-eight men in orders, of whom sixteen thousand four hundred eighty-one were priests and two thousand nine hundred forty-three were Jesuits. In seventeen ninety-seven, sixty thousand monks and thirty thousand nuns lived in three thousand monasteries or convents. The Archbishop of Seville and his staff of two hundred thirty-five aides enjoyed an annual revenue of six million reales. The Archbishop of Toledo, with six hundred aides, received nine million. Here, as in Italy and Austria, ecclesiastical wealth aroused no protest from the people. The cathedral was their creation, and they loved to see it gorgeously adorned. Their piety set a standard for Christendom. Nowhere else in the eighteenth century was the Catholic theology so thoroughly believed or the Catholic ritual so fervently observed. Religious practices rivaled the pursuit of bread and probably exceeded the pursuit of sex as part of the substance of life. The people, including the prostitutes, crossed themselves a dozen times a day. The worship of the Virgin far surpassed the adoration of Christ. Images of her were everywhere. Women lovingly sewed robes for her statues and crowned her head with fresh flowers. In Spain, above all, rose the popular demand that her immaculate conception, her freedom from the stain of original sin, be made a part of the defined and required faith. The men almost equaled the women in piety. Many men as well as women heard Mass daily. In some religious processions, until it was forbidden in 1777, Men of the lower classes flogged themselves with knotted cords ending in balls of wax containing broken glass. They professed to be doing this to prove their devotion to God or Mary or a woman. Some thought such bloodletting was good for the health and kept arrows down. Religious processions were frequent, dramatic, and colorful. One humorist complained that he could not take a step in Madrid without coming upon such a solemnity, and not to kneel when it passed was to risk arrest or injury. When the people of Saragossa rose in revolt in 1766, sacking and looting, and a religious procession appeared with the bishop holding the sacrament before him, the rioters bared their heads and knelt in the streets. When the retinue had filed by, they resumed the sack of the town. In the great Corpus Christi procession, all the departments of the government took part, sometimes led by the king. Throughout Holy Week, the cities of Spain were draped in black, theaters and cafes were closed, churches were crowded, and supplementary altars were set up in public squares to accommodate the overflow of piety. In Spain, Christ was king, Mary was queen, and the sense of divine presence was, in every waking hour, part of the essence of life. Two religious orders especially prospered in Spain. The Jesuits, through their learning and address, dominated education and became confessors to royalty. The Dominicans controlled the Inquisition— and though this institution had long since passed its heyday, it was still strong enough to terrify the people and challenge the state. When some remnants of Judaism appeared under Bourbon laxity, the Inquisition snuffed them out without us to fay. In seven years, from 1720 to 27, the Inquisitors condemned 868 persons, of whom 820 were accused of secret Judaism. Seventy-five were burned, others were sent to the galleys or merely scourged. In 1722, Philip V testified his adoption of Spanish ways by presiding over a sumptuous auto de fe in which nine heretics were burned in celebration of the coming of a French princess to Madrid. His successor, Ferdinand VI, showed a milder spirit. During his reign from 1746 to 59, only ten persons, all relapsed Jews, were burned alive. The Inquisition exercised a strangling censorship over all publication. A Dominican monk reckoned that there was less printing in Spain in the 18th century than in the 16th. Most books were religious, and the people liked them so. The lower classes were illiterate and felt no need for reading or writing. Schools were in the hands of the clergy, but thousands of parishes had no schools at all. The once great Spanish universities had fallen far behind those of Italy, France, England, or Germany in everything but orthodox theology. 
Medical schools were poor, ill-staffed, ill-equipped. Therapy relied upon bloodletting, purging, relics, and prayer. Spanish physicians were a peril to human life. Science was medieval, history was legend, superstition flourished, portents and miracles abounded. The belief in witchcraft survived to the end of the century and appeared among the horrors that Goya drew. Such was the Spain that the Bourbons came from France to rule. 2. Philip V, 1700-1746 Felipe Quinto was a good man within his lights, which had been limited by his education. As a younger son to the Dauphin, he had been trained to modesty, piety, and obedience, and he never overcame these virtues sufficiently to meet half a century of challenges in government and war. His piety led him to accept in Spain a religious obscurantism that was dying in France. His docility made him malleable by his ministers and his wives. Maria Luisa Gabriela, daughter of Victor Amadeus II of Savoy, was only thirteen when she married Philip in 1701, but she was already adept in feminine wiles. Her beauty and vivacity, her tantrums and tears reduced the king to an exhausted subjection, while she and her chief lady-in-waiting manipulated the politics of their adopted land. Marie-Anne de la Tremouille, Francesse des Ursins, French widow of a Spanish grandee, had helped the girl queen to marriage and power. Ambitious but tactful, she became for a decade a power behind the throne. She could not rely upon beauty, for she was fifty-nine in 1701, but she provided the knowledge and subtlety lacking in the queen and after 1705 she determined policy. In 1714 Maria Luisa, aged twenty-six, died, and Philip, who had learned to love her devotedly, sank into a morbid melancholy. Madame des Ursins thought to salvage her power by arranging his marriage with Isabella, Elizabeth Farnese, daughter of Duke Eduardo II of Parma and Piacenza. She went to meet the new queen at the Spanish border, but Isabella curtly ordered her to leave Spain. She withdrew to Rome and died eight years later in wealth and oblivion. Isabella did not admit that the Renaissance was over. She had all the force of will, keenness of intellect, fire of temper, and scorn of scruples that had marked the women as well as the men who had dominated sixteenth-century Italy. She found in Philip a man who could not make up his mind, and who could not sleep alone. Their bed became her throne, from which she ruled a nation, directed armies, and won Italian principalities. She had known almost nothing of Spain, nor did she ever take to the Spanish character, but she studied that character. She made herself familiar with the needs of the country, and the king was surprised to find her as informed and resourceful as his ministers. In his first years of rule, Philip had used jean Henri and other French aides to reorganize the government on lines set by Louis XIV. Centralized and audited administration and finance, with a trained bureaucracy and provincial intendants, all under the legislative, judicial, and executive authority of the royal council, here called the Consejo de Castilla. Corruption diminished, extravagance was checked, except in the building operations of the king. To these French ministers there succeeded in 1714 an able and ambitious Italian, the Abate Giulio Alberoni, whose energy made the Spanish shudder. Son of a Piacenza gardener, he had reached Spain as secretary to the Duke de Vendôme. He had been the first to suggest Isabella Farnese as Philip's second wife. Grateful, she eased his way to power. Together they kept the king away from affairs and from any council but their own. Together they planned to build up Spain's armed forces and use them to drive the Austrians out of Italy, restore Spanish ascendancy in Naples and Milan, and set up ducal thrones to be graced some day by the far-seeing Isabella's sons. Alberoni asked five years for preparation. He replaced titled sluggards with middle-class ability in the leading posts. He taxed the clergy and imprisoned rebellious priests. He scrapped worn-out vessels and built better ones. He set up forts and arsenals along coasts and frontiers. He subsidized industry, opened up roads, accelerated communication, abolished sales taxes and traffic tolls. The British ambassador in Madrid warned his government that with a few more years of such advances, Spain would be a danger to other European powers. To 
To soothe such fears, Alberoni pretended that he was raising forces to help Venice and the papacy against the Turks. Indeed, he sent six galleys to Clement XI, who rewarded him with a red hat in 1717. The Spanish monarchy, wrote Voltaire, has resumed new life under Cardinal Alberoni. Everything was granted him but time. He hoped to win French and English consent to Spanish aims in Italy, and offered substantial concessions in return, but the careless king spoiled these maneuvers by revealing his desire to replace Philippe d'Orléans as ruler of France. Philippe turned against Felipe, and joined England and the United Provinces in a pact to maintain the territorial arrangements fixed by the Treaty of Utrecht. Austria violated that treaty by compelling Savoy to give her Sicily in exchange for Sardinia. Alberoni protested that this place to thwart the Mediterranean, a power whose head still claimed the crown of Spain. Cursing the undue acceleration of events, he resigned himself to premature war. His newborn fleet captured Palermo in 1718, and his troops soon brought all Sicily under Spanish control. Austria thereupon joined England, France, and Holland in a quadruple alliance against Spain. On August 11, 1718, a British squadron under Admiral Byng destroyed the Spanish fleet off the coast of Sicily. Spain's best troops were bottled up in that island while French armies invaded Spain. Philip and Isabella sued for peace. It was granted on condition of Alberoni's banishment. He fled to Genoa in 1719, made his way in disguise through Austrian-held Lombardy to Rome, took part in the conclave that elected Innocent the Thirteenth, and died in 1752, aged 88. On February 17, 1720, a Spanish envoy signed in London a treaty by which Philip resigned all claim to the throne of France, Spain surrendered Sicily to Austria, England promised to restore Gibraltar to Spain, and the Allies pledged to Isabella's offspring the right of succession to Parma and Tuscany. In the kaleidoscope of international politics, allies soon become enemies, and foes may formally become friends. To cement peace with France, Philip had betrothed his two-year-old daughter, Maria Anna Victoria, to Louis XV in 1721, and had sent her, all wandering, to France in 1722. But in 1725, France sent her back so that Louis might marry a woman who could at once undertake the task of giving him an heir. Insulted, Spain allied herself with Austria. The Emperor Charles VI promised to help recapture Gibraltar. When a Spanish army tried to take that bastion, Austrian help did not come. The attempt failed, and Spain not only made peace with England, but restored to her the asiento monopoly of selling slaves to Spanish colonies. In return, Britain pledged to put Isabella's son, Don Carlos, on the ducal throne of Parma. In 1731, Carlos and 6,000 Spanish troops were escorted to Italy by an English fleet. Austria, to secure British and Spanish support for the accession of Maria Theresa to the imperial throne, yielded Parma and Piacenza to Carlos. In 1734, Carlos promoted himself to Naples. Isabella's triumph was complete. Philip, however, sank into a melancholy mood that, after 1736, lapsed now and then into insanity. He shrank into a corner of his room, thinking that all who entered planned to kill him. He was loath to eat for fear of being poisoned. For a long time he refused to leave his bed or be shaved. Isabella tried a hundred ways to heal or soothe him. All failed but one. In 1737 she coaxed Farinelli to come to Spain. One night, in an apartment adjoining the king's, she arranged a concert in which the great castrato sang two arias by Hasse. Philip rose from his bed to look through a doorway and see what agency could make such captivating sounds. Isabella brought Farinelli to him. The monarch praised and caressed him and bade him name his reward. Nothing would be refused. Previously instructed by the queen, the singer asked only that Philip should let himself be shaved and dressed, and should appear at the royal council. The king consented. His fears subsided. He seemed miraculously healed. But when the next evening came, he called for Farinelli and begged him to sing those same two songs again. Only so could he be calmed to sleep. So it continued, night after night, for ten years. 
Farinelli was paid two hundred thousand reales a year, but was not allowed to sing except at the court. He accepted the condition gracefully, and though his power over the king was greater than that of any minister, he never abused it, always used it for good. He remained untouched by venality and won the admiration of all. In 1746, Philip ordered one hundred thousand masses to be said for his salvation. If so many should not be needed to get him into heaven, the surplus should be applied to poor souls for whom no such provision had been made. In that year he died. 3. Ferdinand VI, 1746-1759 to 1759. His second son by his first wife succeeded him and gave Spain thirteen years of healing rule. Isabella survived till 1766. She was treated with kindness and courtesy by her stepson, but she lost her power to influence events. Ferdinand's wife, Maria Barbara, Scarlatti's pupil, was now the woman behind the throne. Though she loved food and money beyond reason, she was a gentler spirit than Isabella, and gave most of her energies to encouraging music and art. Farinelli continued to sing for the new rulers, and Scarlatti's harpsichord could not rival him. King and queen worked to end the war of the Austrian succession. They accepted the Treaty of Aix-la-Chapelle in 1748, though it gave Tuscany to Austria, and a year later they terminated the 136-year-old Asiento by paying $100,000 to the South Sea Company for the loss of its privileges in the slave trade. Ferdinand was a man of good will, kindly and honest, but he had inherited a delicate constitution and was subject to fits of passion, of which he was painfully ashamed. Conscious of his limitations, he left administration to two able ministers, Don José de Carvajal and Zenon de Somo de Villa, Marques de la Ensenada. Ensenada improved agricultural methods, subsidized mining and industry, built roads and canals, abolished internal tolls, rebuilt the navy, replaced the hated sales tax by a tax on income and property, reorganized the finances, and broke down the intellectual isolation of Spain by sending students abroad. Partly through Ensenada's diplomacy, a concordat was signed with the papacy in 1753, reserving to the king the right to tax ecclesiastical property and to appoint bishops to Spanish sees. The power of the church was reduced, the Inquisition was subdued, public autos de fe were abolished. The two ministers diverged in foreign policy. Carvajal felt the charm of the devoted British ambassador, Sir Benjamin Keane, and took a peaceful pro-British line. And Senada favored France and moved toward war with England. Ferdinand, appreciating his energy and ability, was long patient with him, but finally dismissed him. While nearly all Europe fell into seven years of war, Ferdinand gave his people a longer period of tranquility and prosperity than Spain had enjoyed since Philip II. In 1758, Maria Barbara died. The king, who had loved her as if politics had had nothing to do with their marriage, fell into a state of melancholy and unshaved dishevelment, strangely recalling that of his father. In his final year he too was insane. Toward the end he refused to go to bed, fearing that he would never get up again. He died in his chair, August 10, 1759. Everyone mourned the royal lovers, for their rule had been a rare blessing to Spain. 4. The Enlightenment Enters Spain the story of the Enlightenment in Spain is a case of a resistible force encountering an immovable body. The Spanish character and its blood-written pledge to its medieval faith turned back sooner or later all winds of heresy or doubt, all alien forms of dress or manners or economy. Only one economic force favored foreign thought. Spanish merchants who daily dealt with strangers and who knew to what power and wealth their like had risen in England and France— they were willing to import ideas if these could weaken the hold that nobles and clergy had inherited on the land, life, and mind of Spain. They knew that religion had lost its power in England. Some had heard of Newton and Locke. Even Gibbon was to find a few readers in Spain. Of course, the strongest Enlightenment breezes came from France. The French aristocrats who followed Philip V to Madrid were already touched by the irreligion that hid its head under Louis XIV but ran rampant during the Regency. In 1714, some scholars founded the Real Academia Española 
in emulation of the French Academy. Soon it began to work on a dictionary. In 1737, the Diario de los Literatos de España undertook to rival the Journal des Savants. The Duke of Alba, who directed the Real Academia for twenty years, from 1756 to 1776, was a warm admirer of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. In 1773 he subscribed eight louis d'or for Pigalle's statue of Voltaire. Condemned to cultivate my reason in secret, he wrote to d'Alembert, I take this opportunity to give public testimony to my gratitude and admiration for the great man who first showed me the way. Gratuitous advertisement was given to Rousseau's Emile by its ceremonious burning in a Madrid church in 1765. Young Spaniards acquainted with Paris, like the Marques de Mora, who loved Julie de Lespinas, came back to Spain with some rubbing of the skepticism that they had encountered in the salons. Copies of works by Voltaire, Diderot, or Reynal were smuggled into Spain and aroused some innovating minds. A Spanish journalist wrote in 1763, Through the effect of many pernicious books that have become the fashion, such as those of Voltaire, Rousseau, and Delvecius, much cooling of faith has been felt in this country. Pablo Olavide openly expressed Voltairean ideas in his Madrid salon, circa 1766. On the shelves of the Sociedades Economicas de los Amigos del País in Madrid were works by Voltaire, Rousseau, Bale, D'Alembert, Montesquieu, Hobbes, Locke, and Hume. Abbé Clément, touring Spain in 1768, reported a wide spread of religious indifference, even unbelief, covered with external observance of Catholic ritual. In 1778, the Inquisition was informed that the highest officials of the court read the French philosophe. It was of considerable importance to Spanish history that Pedro Abarca, Conde de Aranda, traveling in France, became a friend of Voltaire. We may judge of his connections by his later activity as Spanish ambassador to Versailles. He mixed freely with the encyclopedists in Paris, forming an admiring intimacy with d'Alembert, and crossed France to visit Voltaire at Pernay. In Spain he professed fidelity to the Church, but it was he who persuaded Charles III to expel the Jesuits. Under his guidance, Charles joined the ranks of those enlightened despots, to whom the philosophes were looking as their likeliest aids in the spread of education, liberty, and reason. 5. Charles III, 1759-1788 to 1788. 1. The New Government When he arrived from Naples, he was forty-three years old. He was welcomed by all but the Jesuits, who resented the sale of their Paraguayan settlements by Spain to Portugal in 1750. Otherwise, he won all hearts by remitting arrears of taxes and restoring some of the privileges that the provinces had lost under the centralizing policy of Philip V. His first year as King of Spain was saddened by the death of his wife, Maria Amalia. He never married again. It is to the credit of the Spanish Bourbons of the eighteenth century that they gave the monarchs of Europe an example of marital devotion and stability. A British diplomat drew a British picture of Charles, who had had some encounters with the English in Naples. The king has a very odd appearance in person and dress. He is of diminutive stature, with a complexion the color of mahogany. He has not been measured for a coat these thirty years, so that it sits on him like a sack. His waistcoat and breeches are generally leather, with a pair of cloth spatterdashes on his legs. He goes out a sporting every day of the year, rain or blow. But the Earl of Bristol added in 1761, the Catholic king has good talents, a happy memory, and uncommon command of himself on all occasions. His having been often deceived renders him suspicious. He ever prefers carrying a point by gentle means, and has the patience to repeat exhortations rather than exert his authority. Yet with the greatest air of gentleness he keeps his ministers and attendants in the utmost awe. His personal piety gave no warning that he would attack the Jesuits or undertake religious reforms. He heard Mass daily. 
his honest and obstinate adherence to all his treaties, principles, and engagements, astonished an English enemy. He devoted a large part of each weekday to governmental affairs. He rose at six, visited his children, breakfasted, worked from eight to eleven, sat in council, received dignitaries, dined in public, gave several hours to hunting, supped at nine-thirty, fed his dogs, said his prayers, and went to bed. His hunting was probably a health measure aimed to dispel the melancholy that ran in the family. He began with some serious mistakes. Unfamiliar with Spain, which he had not seen since his sixteenth year, he took as his first aides two Italians who had served him well in Naples, the Marchese de Grimaldi in foreign policy, the Marchese de Squilacci in domestic affairs. The Earl of Bristol described Squilacci as not bright. He is fond of business and never complains of having too much, notwithstanding the variety of departments that center in him. I believe he is incapable of taking any bribes, but I would not be equally responsible for his wife. Squilacci did not like the crime, odor, and gloom of Madrid. He organized a zealous police and a street-cleaning squad and lighted the capital with five thousand lamps. He legalized monopolies for supplying the city with oil, bread, and other necessities. A drought raised prices, and the populace called for Squilacci's head. He offended the clergy by regulations that checked their privileges and power. He lost a thousand supporters by banning concealed weapons. Finally, he stirred up a revolution by attempting to change the dress of the people. He persuaded the king that the long cape, which hid the figure, and the broad hat with turned-down rim, which hid much of the face, made it easier to conceal weapons and harder for the police to recognize criminals. A succession of royal decrees forbade the cape and the hat, and officers were equipped with shears to cut the offending garments down to legal size. This was more government than the proud Madrilenos could stand. On Palm Sunday, March 23, 1766, they rose in revolt, captured ammunition stores, emptied the prisons, overwhelmed soldiers and police, attacked Squilacci's home, stoned Grimaldi, killed the Walloon guards of the royal palace, and paraded with the heads of these hated foreigners held aloft on spikes and crowned with broad-rimmed hats. For two days the mob slaughtered and pillaged. Charles yielded, repealed the decrees, and sent Squilacci, safely escorted, back to Italy. Meanwhile he had discovered the talents of the Conde de Aranda and appointed him president of the Council of Castile. Aranda made the long cape and wide sombrero the official costume of the hangman. The new connotation made the old garb unfashionable. Most madrilenos adopted French dress. Aranda came of an old and wealthy family in Aragon. We have seen him imbibing enlightenment in France. He went also to Prussia, where he studied military organization. He returned to Spain, eager to bring his country abreast of these northern states. His encyclopedist friends rejoiced too publicly over his accession to power. He mourned that they had thereby made his course more difficult, and he wished they had studied diplomacy. He defined political diplomacy as the art of recognizing the strength, resources, interests, rights, fears, and hopes of the different powers so that, as the occasion warrants it, we may appease these powers, divide them, defeat them, or ally ourselves with them, depending on how they serve our advantage and increase our security. The king was in a mood for ecclesiastical reforms because he suspected the clergy of secretly encouraging the revolt against Squilacci. This book is continued on Cassette 12, Side 1. Rousseau and Revolution by Will and Ariel Durant. Part 1. Continued. Cassette 12, Side 1. The king was in a mood for ecclesiastical reforms because he suspected the clergy of secretly encouraging the revolt against Squilacci. He had permitted the government press to print in 1765 an anonymous Tratado de la Regalia de la Mortisacion, which questioned the right of the church to amass real property and argued that in all temporal matters the church should be subject to the state. The author was Conde Pedro Rodriguez de Campomanes, a member of the Consejo de Castilla. In 1761, Charles had issued an order requiring royal consent for the publication of papal bulls or briefs in Spain. Later he rescinded this order. 
1768 he renewed it. Now he supported Aranda and Campomanes in a succession of religious reforms that for one exciting generation remade the intellectual face of Spain. 2. The Spanish Reformation The Spanish reformers, perhaps excepting Aranda, had no intent to destroy Catholicism in Spain. The long wars to drive out the Moors, like the long struggle for the liberation of Ireland, had made Catholicism a part of patriotism, and had intensified it into a faith too sanctified by the sacrifices of the nation to admit of successful challenge or basic change. The hope of the reformers was to bring the church under control of the state, and to free the mind of Spain from terror of the Inquisition. They began by attacking the Jesuits. The Society of Jesus had been born in Spain in the mind and experiences of Ignatius Loyola, and some of its greatest leaders had come from Spain. Here, as in Portugal, France, Italy, and Austria, it controlled secondary education, gave confessors to kings and queens, and shared in forming royal policies. Its expanding power aroused the jealousy, sometimes the enmity, of the secular Catholic clergy. Some of these believed in the superior authority of the ecumenical councils over the popes. The Jesuits defended the supreme authority of the popes over councils and kings. Spanish businessmen complained that Jesuits engaged in colonial commerce were underselling regular merchants because of ecclesiastical exemption from taxation, and this, it was pointed out, lessened royal revenues. Charles believed that the Jesuits were still encouraging the resistance of the Paraguayan Indians to the orders of the Spanish government, and he was alarmed when Aranda, Campomanes, and others showed him letters which they alleged had been found in the correspondence of the Jesuits. One of these letters, supposedly from Father Ricci, general of the order, declared that Charles was a bastard and should be superseded by his brother Luis. The authenticity of these letters has been rejected by Catholics and unbelievers alike, but Charles thought them genuine and concluded that the Jesuits were plotting to depose him, perhaps to have him killed. He noted that an attempt had been made, allegedly with Jesuit complicity, to assassinate Joseph I of Portugal in 1758. He determined to follow Joseph's example and expel the order from his realm. Campomanes warned him that such a move could succeed only through secret preparations, followed by a sudden and concerted blow. Otherwise the Jesuits, who were revered by the people, could arouse a troublesome furor throughout the nation and its possessions. On Aranda's suggestion, sealed messages, signed by the king, were sent out early in 1767 to officials everywhere in the empire, with orders on pain of death to open them only on March 31st in Spain, on April 2nd in the colonies. On March 31st the Spanish Jesuits awoke to find their houses and colleges surrounded by troops and themselves placed under arrest. They were ordered to depart peaceably, taking only such possessions as they could carry with them. All other Jesuit property was confiscated by the state. Each of the exiles was granted a small pension, which was to be discontinued if any Jesuit protested the expulsion. They were taken in carriages under military escort to the nearest port and shipped to Italy. Charles sent word to Clement XIII that he was transporting them to the ecclesiastical territories in order that they may remain under the wise and immediate direction of His Holiness. I request Your Holiness not to regard this resolution otherwise than as an indispensable civil precaution which I have adopted only after mature examination and profound reflection. When the first vessel, bearing six hundred Jesuits, sought to deposit them at Civita Vecchia, Cardinal Torrigiani, papal secretary, refused to let them land, arguing that Italy could not so suddenly take care of so many refugees. For weeks the ship roamed the Mediterranean, seeking some hospitable port. While its desperate passengers suffered from weather, hunger, and disease. Finally, they were allowed to debark in Corsica, and later, in manageable groups, they were absorbed into the Papal States. Meanwhile, the Jesuits experienced similar banishment from Naples, Parma, Spanish America, and the Philippines. Clement XIII appealed to Charles III to revoke edicts whose suddenness and cruelty must shock all Christendom. Charles replied, 
to spare the world a great scandal, I shall ever preserve as a secret in my heart the abominable plot that necessitated this rigor. Your Holiness ought to believe my word. The safety of my life exacts of me a profound silence. The king never fully revealed the evidence upon which he had based his decrees. The details are so controverted and obscure that judgment is baffled. D'Alembert, no friend of the Jesuits, questioned the method of their banishment. On May 4, 1767, he wrote to Voltaire, What do you think of the edict of Charles III so abruptly expelling the Jesuits? Persuaded as I am that he had good and sufficient reasons, do you not think that he ought to have made them known and not shut them up in his royal heart? Do you not think he ought to have allowed the Jesuits to justify themselves, especially since everyone is sure they could not? Do you not think, too, that it would be very unjust to make them all die of starvation if a single lay brother, who perhaps is cutting cabbage in the kitchen, should say a word one way or the other in their favor? Does it not seem to you that he could act with more common sense in carrying out what, after all, is a reasonable matter? Was the expulsion popular? A year after its completion, on the festival of St. Charles, the king showed himself to the people from the balcony of his palace. When, following custom, he asked what gift they desired of him, they cried out with one voice that the Jesuits should be allowed to return and to wear the habit of the secular clergy. Charles refused and banished the Archbishop of Toledo on charge of having instigated the suspiciously concordant petition. When in 1769 the Pope asked the bishops of Spain for their judgment on the expulsion of the Jesuits, forty-two bishops approved, six opposed, eight gave no opinion. Probably the secular clergy were content to be relieved of Jesuit competition. The Augustinian friars of Spain approved the expulsion and later supported the demand of Charles III that the Society of Jesus be completely dissolved. No such summary action could be taken with the Inquisition. Far more deeply than the Society of Jesus, it was mortised in the awe and tradition of the people, who ascribed to it the preservation of morals and the purity of their faith even of their blood. When Charles III came to the throne, the Inquisition held the mind of Spain by a severe and watchful censorship. Any book suspected of religious heresy or moral deviation was submitted to calificadores, qualifiers or examiners. If they thought it dangerous, they sent their recommendations to the Consejo de la Inquisición. This could decree the suppression of the book and the punishment of the author. Periodically, the Inquisition published an index of prohibited books. To own or read one of these without ecclesiastical permission was a crime that only the Inquisition could forgive and for which the offender could be excommunicated. Priests were required, especially in Lent, to ask all penitents whether they had or knew anyone who had a prohibited book. Any person failing to report a violation of the index was considered as guilty as the violator, and no ties of family or friendship could excuse him. Charles's ministers here accomplished only minor reforms. In 1768, the inquisitorial censorship was checked by requiring that all edicts prohibiting books should secure royal approval before being put into effect. In 1770, the king ordered the Inquisition's tribunal to concern itself only with heresy and apostasy, and to imprison no one whose guilt had not been conclusively established. In 1784 he ruled that proceedings of the Inquisition regarding grandees, cabinet ministers, and royal servants must be submitted to him for review. He appointed inquisitor generals who showed a more liberal attitude toward diversities of thought. These modest measures had some effect in 1782 the Inquisitor-General sadly reported that fear of ecclesiastical censure for reading forbidden books was nearly extinct. In general, the agents of the Inquisition after 1770 were milder, its penalties more humane than before. Toleration was granted to Protestants under Charles III and in 1779 to Moslems, though not to Jews. There were four autos de fe under the reign of Charles IV, the last in 1780 at Seville, of an old woman accused of witchcraft, and this execution aroused such criticism throughout Europe that the way was prepared for the suppression of the Spanish Inquisition 
in 1813. Nevertheless, even under Charles III, freedom of thought, if expressed, was still legally punishable with death. In 1768, Pablo Olavide was denounced to the Inquisition as having pornographic paintings in his Madrid home. Perhaps some copies of Boucher's nudes, for Olavide had traveled in France, even to Ferney. A more serious charge was laid against him in 1774, that in the modeled villages established by him in Sierra Morena he had allowed no monasteries, and had forbidden the clergy to say mass on weekdays or beg for alms. The Inquisition notified the king that these and other offenses had been proved by the testimony of eighty witnesses. In 1778, Olavide was summoned to trial. He was accused of upholding the Copernican astronomy and of corresponding with Voltaire and Rousseau. He abjured his errors, was reconciled with the church, suffered confiscation of all his property, and was sentenced to confinement in a monastery for eight years. In 1780 his health collapsed, and he was allowed to take the waters at a spa in Catalonia. He escaped to France and received a hero's welcome from his philosophic friends in Paris. But after some years of exile he grew unbearably lonesome for his Spanish haunts. He composed a pious work, The Gospel Triumphant or The Philosopher Converted, and the Inquisition permitted his return. We note that the trial of Olavide occurred after the fall of Aranda from his place at the head of the Consejo de Castilla. In his final years of power, Aranda founded new schools, taught by secular clergy, to supply the void left by the Jesuits, and he reformed the currency by replacing debased coins with money of good quality and superior design in 1770. However, his sense of his superior enlightenment made him in time irritable, overbearing, and presumptuous. After making the power of the king absolute, he sought to limit it by increasing the authority of the ministers. He lost perspective and measure and dreamed of bringing Spain in one generation out of its contented Catholicity into the stream of French philosophy. He expressed too boldly his heretical ideas, even to his confessor. Though many of the secular clergy supported some of his ecclesiastical reforms as beneficial to the church, he frightened many more by disclosing his hope of completely disbanding the Inquisition. He became so unpopular that he did not dare go out of his palace without a bodyguard. He complained so often of the burdens of office that at last Charles took him at his word and sent him as ambassador to France from 1773 to 87. There he predicted that the English colonies in America, which were beginning their revolt, would in time become one of the great powers of the world. 3. THE NEW ECONOMY Three able men dominated the ministry after Aranda's departure. José Monino, Conde de Florida Blanca, succeeded Grimaldi as Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs in 1776 and dominated the cabinet till 1792. Like Aranda, but in less degree, he felt the influence of the philosophe. He guided the king in measures for improving agriculture, commerce, education, science, and art. But the French Revolution frightened him into conservatism, and he led Spain into the first coalition against revolutionary France in 1792. Pedro de Campomanes presided over the Council of Castile for five years and was the prime mover in economic reform. Gaspar Melchor de Jovellanos, the most eminent Spaniard of his age, came into public view as a humane and incorruptible judge in Seville in 1767 and Madrid in 1778. Most of his activity in the central government followed 1789, but he contributed powerfully to economic policy under Charles III with his Informe sobre un proyecto de ley agraria from 1787. This proposal for a revision of agricultural law, written with almost Ciceronian elegance, gave him a European reputation. These three men, with Aranda, were the fathers of the Spanish Enlightenment and the new economy. On the whole, in the judgment of an English scholar, their result for good rivals that achieved in an equally short time in any other country, and in the history of Spain there is certainly no period which can compare with the reign of Charles III. The obstacles to reform in Spain were as great in economy as in religion. 
The concentration of inalienable ownership in titled families or ecclesiastical corporations and the monopoly of wool production by the Mesta seemed to be insurmountable barriers to economic change. Millions of Spaniards took pride in indolence and showed no shame in begging. Change was distrusted as a threat to idleness. Money was hoarded in palace coffers and church treasuries instead of being invested in commerce or industry. The expulsion of Moors, Jews, and Moriscos had removed many sources of agricultural betterment and commercial development. Difficulties of internal communication and transport left the interior a century behind Barcelona, Seville, and Madrid. Despite these deterrents, in Madrid and other centers, men of goodwill, nobles, priests, and commoners without distinction of sex, formed Sociedades Económicas de los Amigos del País to study and promote education, science, industry, commerce, and art. They founded schools and libraries, translated foreign treatises, offered prizes for essays and ideas, and raised money for progressive economic undertakings and experiments. Acknowledging the influence of French physiocrats and Adam Smith, they condemned the national accumulation of gold as a monument to stagnation, and one of them asserted, the nation that has the most gold is the poorest, as Spain has shown. Ovellanos hailed the science of civil economy as the true science of the state. Economic treatises multiplied. Campomanes' Discurso sobre el Fomento de la Industria Popular inspired thousands, including the king. Charles began by importing grain and seed for regions where agriculture had decayed. He urged towns to lease their uncultivated common lands to peasants at the lowest practical rent. Florida Blanca, using crown revenues from vacant ecclesiastical benefices, established in Valencia and Malaga Montes Pios, or pious funds, for lending money to farmers at low interest. To check deforestation and erosion, Charles ordered all communes to plant each year a fixed number of trees. Hence came that annual celebration of Arbor Day, which was still, in both hemispheres, a wholesome custom in our youth. He encouraged the disregard of old entails, discouraged new ones, and thereby facilitated the breakup of large estates into peasant properties. The privileges of the Mesta sheep monopoly were sharply reduced. Large tracts of land formerly reserved by it for pasturage were opened to cultivation. Foreign colonists were brought in to people sparsely inhabited areas. So, in the Sierra Morena region of southwestern Spain, hitherto abandoned to robbers and wild beasts, Olavide created, from 1767 on, 44 villages and 11 towns of French or German immigrants. These settlements became famous for their prosperity. Extensive canals were dug to connect rivers and irrigate large tracts of formerly arid land. A network of new roads, which for a time were the best in Europe, bound the villages and the towns in a quickened facility of communication, transport, and trade. Governmental aid went to industry. To remove the stigma traditionally attached to manual labor, a royal decree declared that craft occupations were compatible with noble rank and that craftsmen were henceforth eligible to governmental posts. Model factories were established for textiles at Guadalajara and Segovia, for hats at San Fernando, for silks at Talavera, for porcelain at Buen Retiro, for glass at San Ildefonso, for glass cabinetry and tapestry at Madrid. Royal edicts favored the development of large-scale capitalistic production, especially in the textile industry. Guadalajara in 1780 had 800 looms employing 4,000 weavers. One company at Barcelona managed 60 factories with 2,162 cotton weaving looms. Valencia had 4,000 looms weaving silk and, favored by its facilities for export, was cutting into the silk trade of Lyon. By 1792, Barcelona had 80,000 weavers and ranked second only to the English Midlands in the production of cotton cloth. Seville and Cadiz had long enjoyed a state-protected monopoly of commerce with Spain's possessions of the New World. Charles III ended this privilege and allowed various ports to trade with the colonies, and he negotiated a treaty with Turkey in 1782 that opened Moslem harbors to Spanish goods. The results were beneficial to all parties. Spanish America grew rapidly in wealth, 
Spain's income from America rose 800% under Charles III. Her export trade was tripled. The expanding activities of the government required enlarged revenues. These were raised in some measure by state monopolies in the sale of brandy, tobacco, playing cards, gunpowder, lead, mercury, sulfur, and salt. At the outset of the reign, there were sales taxes of 15% in Catalonia, 14% in Castile. Ovellanos aptly described sales taxes. They surprise their prey at its birth, pursue and nip it as it circulates, and never lose sight of it or let it escape until the moment of its consumption. Under Charles, the sales tax in Catalonia was abolished, and in Castile it was reduced to 2, 3, or 4 percent. A moderate graduated tax was laid upon incomes. To secure additional funds by putting the savings of the people to work, Francisco de Cabarrus persuaded the Treasury to issue interest-bearing government bonds. When these fell to 78 percent of their par value, he founded in 1782 the first national bank of Spain, the Banco de San Carlos, which redeemed the bonds at par and restored the financial credit of the state. The result of statesmanship and enterprise was a substantial rise in the prosperity of the nation as a whole. The middle classes profited most, for it was their organizations that remade the Spanish economy. At Madrid, 375 businessmen composed five great merchant guilds, the Cinco Gremios Mayores, which controlled most of the trade of the capital. We may judge their wealth from the fact that in 1776 they lent 30 million reales to the government. Generally, the government favored this rise of the business class as indispensable to freeing Spain from economic and political dependence upon states with a more advanced economy. Here, as there, the growing proletariat had little share in the new affluence. Wages rose, especially in Catalonia, where the well-to-do complained that servants were hard to find and hard to keep. But by and large, prices rose faster than wages, and the working classes were as poor at the end of the reign as at the beginning. An Englishman traveling in Valencia in 1787 remarked the contrast between the opulence of merchants, manufacturers, ecclesiastics, the military or gentlemen of landed property, and the poverty wretchedness and rags visible in every street. So the middle classes welcomed the Luces, the Enlightenment coming in from France and England, while their employees, crowding the churches and kissing the shrines, comforted themselves with divine grace and hopes of paradise. The cities expanded under the new economy. The great maritime centers, Barcelona, Valencia, Seville, Cadiz, had populations ranging from 80,000 to 100,000 in 1800. Madrid in 1797 had 167,607 plus 30,000 foreigners. When Charles III came to the throne, the city had the reputation of being the dirtiest capital in Europe. In the poorer quarters, people still emptied their garbage into the streets, relying upon wind or rain to distribute it. When Charles forbade this, they denounced him as a tyrant. The Spaniards, he said, are children who cry when they are washed. Nevertheless, his agents established a system of garbage collection and sewage, and scavengers were organized to get offal for fertilizer. An effort to suppress mendicancy failed. The people refused to let the police arrest beggars, especially the blind ones who had formed themselves into a powerful guild. Year by year, Charles improved his capital. Water was led from the mountains into several hundred fountains, from which 720 water carriers laboriously delivered it to the houses of the city. The streets were lighted by oil lamps from nightfall to midnight during six months of autumn and winter. Most streets were narrow and tortuous, following old and devious paths and hiding from the summer sun but some fine avenues were laid out, and the people enjoyed spacious parks and shady promenades. Especially popular was the Paseo del Prado, or Meadow Walk, cooled with fountains and trees, and favored for amorous reconnaissance and rendezvous. There, in 1785, Juan de Villanueva began to build the Museo del Prado, and there, almost any day, four hundred carriages drove by, and any evening thirty thousand madrilenos gathered. 
They were forbidden to sing ribald songs or bathe nude in the fountains or play music after midnight, but they enjoyed the melodious cries of women selling naranjas, limas, and avellanas, oranges, limes, and hazelnuts. At the end of the eighteenth century, said travelers, the spectacle visible daily on the Prado equaled that which in other cities of that period could be seen only on Sundays and holidays. Madrid became then, as it has again become in our time, one of the most beautiful cities in Europe. Charles III was not as successful in foreign policy as in domestic affairs. The revolt of the English colonies in America seemed to offer a chance to avenge the losses suffered by Spain in the Seven Years' War. Aranda urged Charles to help the revolutionists. The king secretly sent the rebels a million livres in June 1776. Attacks by English corsairs upon Spanish shipping finally led Spain to declare war on June 23, 1779. A Spanish force recaptured Menorca, but an attempt to take Gibraltar failed. An invasion of England was prepared, but was frustrated by Protestant storms. In the Peace of Versailles, Spain, in 1783, withdrew its demand for Gibraltar, but regained Florida. The failure to restore Spain's territorial integrity saddened the king's final years. The wars had consumed much of the wealth which the new economy had produced. His brilliant ministers had never overcome two powerful forces of conservatism— the grandees with their vast estates, and the clergy with their vested interest in the simplicity of the people. Charles himself had seldom wavered in his basic fidelity to the church. His people never admired him so much as when, meeting a religious procession, he gave his coach to the prelate who was carrying the host, and then joined the retinue on foot. His religious devotion won the affection which had been withheld from him as a stranger from Italy in the first decade of his reign. When he died on December 14, 1788, after fifty-four years of rule in Naples and Spain, there were many who reckoned him, if not the greatest, certainly the most beneficent king that Spain had ever had. His kindly nature shone out when, on his deathbed, he was asked by the attending bishop had he yet pardoned all his enemies. How should I wait for this pass before forgiving them, he said. They were all forgiven the moment after the offense. 6. THE SPANISH CHARACTER What sort of people were they, the Spaniards of the eighteenth century? By all reports their morals were good, compared with their peers in England or France. Their intense religion, their courage and sense of honor, their family coherence and discipline provided strong correctives to their sexual sensitivity and their pugnacious pride, even while sanctioning a passionate chauvinism of race and faith. Sexual selection promoted courage, for Spanish women, desiring protection, gave their most intoxicating smiles to those men who dared the bulls in the arena or the streets, or who quickly resented and avenged an insult, or who returned with glory from the wars. Sexual morality had softened with the influx of French ideas and ways. Girls were closely guarded, and parental consent, after 1766, was a legal requisite for marriage but after marriage the women in the larger cities indulged in flirtations. The cortejo, or sisisbeo, courtier, or attendant cavalier, became a necessary appendage to a woman of fashion, and adultery increased. One small group, the majos and majas, constituted a unique aspect of Spanish life. The majos were men of the lower class who dressed like dandies, wore long capes, long hair, and broad-rimmed hats, smoked big cigars, were always ready for a fight, and lived a bohemian life financed as often as possible by their mahas, their mistresses. Their sexual unions paid no attention to law. Often the maha had a husband who supported her while she supported her maho. Half the world knows the maha, garbed or not, from Goya's brush. Social morality was relatively high. Political and commercial corruption existed, but not on the scale known in France or England. A French traveler reported that Spanish probity is proverbial, and it shines conspicuously in commercial relations. The word of a Spanish gentleman was moral tender from Lisbon to St. Petersburg. Friendship in Spain was often more lasting than love. Charity was plentiful. In Madrid alone, religious institutions daily distributed 30,000 bowls of nourishing soup to the poor. 
Many new hospitals and almshouses were established. Many old ones were enlarged or improved. Almost all Spaniards were generous and humane, except to heretics and bulls. Bullfights rivaled religion, sex, honor, and the family as objects of Spanish devotion. Like the gladiatorial games of ancient Rome, they were defended on two grounds. Courage had to be developed in men, and bulls had to die before being eaten. Charles III forbade these contests, but they were resumed soon after his death. Skillful and riskful toreadors were the idols of all classes. Each had his following. The Duchess of Alba favored Costillares, the Duchess of Osuna favored Romero, and these factions divided Madrid as Gluck and Piccini divided Paris. Men and women wagered their earnings on the fate of the bulls and on almost everything else. Gambling was illegal but universal. Even private homes held gambling soirees, and the hostesses pocketed the fees. Genteel male dress gradually abandoned the somber black garb and stiff color of an earlier generation, for the French habit of colored coat, long vest of satin or silk, knee breeches, silk stockings, buckled shoes, all crowned with a wig and a three-cornered hat. Usually the Spanish woman made a sacred mystery of her charms by swathing them in lace bodices and long, sometimes hoop, skirts, and using mantilla veils to hide eyes in whose dark depths some Spaniard would gladly sink his soul. But whereas in the seventeenth century a lady rarely allowed her feet to be seen by a man, now her skirts were shortened to a few inches above the floor, and the formerly heelless slippers were displaced by sharp-pointed high-heeled shoes. Preachers warned that such indecent exposure of female feet added dangerous fuel to the already combustible male. The women smiled, adorned their shoes, flashed their skirts, and waved their fans, even on winter days. Isabella Farnese had an armory of 1,626 fans, some of them painted by artists of national renown. Social life was restrained in everything but the dance. The evening assemblies avoided serious discussion, preferring games, the dance, and gallantry. Dancing was a major passion in Spain and sprouted varieties that became famous in Europe. The fandango was danced to a triple measure with castanets. The seguidilla was performed by two or four couples with castanets and usually with songs. Its derivative, the bolero, took form toward 1780 and soon acquired a mad popularity. In the Contradanza, a line of men faced a line of women in alternating approach and retreat, as if symbolizing the tactics of the eternal war between woman and man. Or four couples formed and enclosed a square in the stately Contradanza Quadrada, the quadrille, Masquerade balls sometimes drew 3,500 eager dancers, and in carnival time they danced till dawn. These dances made motion a living poetry and a sexual stimulus. It was said that a Spanish woman dancing the seguidilla was so seductive that even a pope and the whole college of cardinals would be swept off their dignity. Casanova himself found something to learn in Spain. About midnight the wildest and maddest of dances began. It was the fandango, which I fondly supposed I had often seen, but which here was far beyond my wildest imaginings. In Italy and France the dancers are careful not to make the gestures which render this the most voluptuous of dances. Each couple, man and woman, make only three steps, then, keeping time to the music with their castanets, they throw themselves into a variety of lascivious attitudes— the whole of love from its birth to its end, from its first side to its last ecstasy, is set forth. In my excitement I cried aloud. He marveled that the Inquisition allowed so provocative a dance. He was told that it was absolutely forbidden, and no one would dare to dance it if the Conde de Aranda had not given permission. Some of the most popular forms of Spanish music were associated with the dance. So the cante flamenco, or gypsy Flemish singing, used a plaintive and sentimental tone with which all gypsy singers accompanied the seguidilla gitana. Perhaps these mournful melodies echoed old Moorish airs, or reflected the somber quality of Spanish religion and art, or the irritating inaccessibility of the female form, or the disillusionment following realization. 
A more joyous strain came in with Italian opera in 1703 and Farinelli's arias. The old castrato, after trilling through two reigns, lost favor under Charles III, who dethroned him with a line. Capons are good only to eat. The Italian influence continued with Scarlatti and triumphed again with Boccherini, who arrived in 1768, dominated the music of the court under Charles III and Charles IV, and remained in Spain till his death in 1805. By a reverse movement, Vicente Martini Solar, after making a name in Spain, successfully produced Italian opera in Florence, Vienna, and St. Petersburg. Antonio Soler's harpsichord sonatas rivaled Scarlatti's, and Don Luis Misson developed the tonada, or vocal solo, into the tonadillo, as an intermezzo of song between the acts of a play. In 1799, a royal order ended the reign of Italian music in Spain by forbidding the performance of any piece not written in Castilian language and presented by Spanish artists. We cannot sum up the Spanish character in one homogeneous mold. The Spanish soul varies with the scenery from state to state, and the Afrancesados, or Frenchified Spaniards, who gathered in Madrid, were quite another type than those natives who had been mortised and tenoned in Spanish ways. But if we set aside exotic minorities, we may recognize in the Spanish people a character indigenous and unique. The Spaniard was proud, but with a silent force that took little from chauvinism or nationality. It was a pride of individuality, a resolute sense of solitary struggle against earthly injury, personal insult, or eternal damnation. To such a spirit the external world could seem of secondary moment, not worth bothering about or toiling for. Nothing mattered but the fate of the soul in the conflict with man and in the search for God. How trivial, then, were the problems of politics, the race for money, the exaltation of fame or place. Even the triumphs of war had no glory unless they were victories over the enemies of the faith. Rooted in that faith, the Spaniard could face life with a stoic tranquility, a fatalism that waited quietly for eventual paradise. 7. The Spanish Mind when Louis the Fourteenth accepted the offer of the last Habsburg king of Spain to bequeath his crown to a grandson of the Grand Monarque, a Spanish ambassador at Versailles exclaimed joyfully, Now there are no more Pyrenees. But those gloomy masses stood their ground as an obstinate barrier to French Lumière, as a symbol of the resistance that would meet the attempt of a dedicated few to Europeanize the Spanish mind. Campomanes startled the old with a discurso sobre la educación popular de los artesanos y su fomento, 1774-76, which made a wider extension of popular education an indispensable base for national vitality and growth. Some high ecclesiastics and great landowners saw no sense in disturbing the people with unnecessary knowledge that might lead to religious heresy and social revolt. Undeterred, Jovellanos labored to spread faith in education. Numerous are the streams that lead to social prosperity, he wrote, but all spring from the same source, and that source is public education. He hoped that education would teach men to reason, that reason would free them from superstition and intolerance, and that science, developed by such men, would use the resources of nature for the conquest of disease and poverty. Some noble ladies took up the challenge and formed a junta de damas to finance primary schools. Charles III spent considerable sums in establishing free elementary schools. Private individuals joined in founding academies for the study of language, literature, history, art, law, science, or medicine. The expulsion of the Jesuits compelled and facilitated the remolding of secondary schools. Charles ordered an expansion of science courses in these colleges, a modernization of their textbooks, and the admission of laymen to their faculties. He endowed colleges and gave pensions to outstanding teachers. The universities were advised to admit Newton to their courses in physics and Descartes and Leibniz into their courses in philosophy. The University of Salamanca rejected the advice on the ground that the principles of Newton and Cartesio do not resemble the revealed truth as much as do those of Aristotle. 
but most Spanish universities accepted the royal directive. The University of Valencia, with 2,400 students, was now, in 1784, the largest and most progressive educational center in Spain. Several religious orders adopted Philosophia Moderna in their colleges. The general of the discalced Carmelites urged Carmelite teachers to read Plato, Aristotle, Cicero, Francis Bacon, Descartes, Newton, Leibniz, Locke, Wolf, Condillac. Here was no regimen for saints. One chapter of the Augustinian friars studied Hobbes, another studied Helvetius. Such studies were always followed by refutations, but many an ardent soul has lost his faith in refuting its enemies. One remarkable monk had modernized while Charles III was still a youth. Though spending the last forty-seven years, 1717 to 1764, of his life in a Benedictine monastery at Oviedo, Benito Jerónimo Fejuo y Montenegro managed to study Bacon, Descartes, Galileo, Pascal, Gassendi, Newton, and Leibniz. And he saw with wonder and shame how Spain, since Cervantes, had been isolated from the main currents of European thought. From his cell he sent forth, between 1726 and 1739, a series of eight volumes which he called Teatro Critico, not dramatic criticism, but a critical examination of ideas. He attacked the logic and philosophy then taught in Spain, lauded Bacon's plea for inductive science, summarized the findings of scientists in many fields, ridiculed magic, divination, bogus miracles, medical ignorance, and popular superstitions, laid down rules of historical credibility that ruthlessly punctured fond national legends, demanded an extension of education to all classes, and advocated a freer and more public life for women in education and society. A swarm of enemies gathered around his books, impugning his patriotism and denouncing his audacities. The Inquisition summoned him before its tribunal, but it could find no explicit heresy in him or his work. In 1742 he resumed his campaign with the first of five volumes entitled Cartas Eruditas y Curiosas, Learned and Inquiring Letters. He wrote a good style, recognizing every author's moral obligation to be clear, and the public so relished his instruction and his courage that fifteen editions of the Teatro and the Cartas were required by 1786. He could not banish superstition from Spain. Witches, ghosts, and demons still peopled the air and frightened the mind. But a beginning had been made, and it is to the credit of his order that this had been done by a monk who remained unmolested in his modest cell until his death at eighty-eight in 1764. It was another cleric who wrote the most famous prose work of eighteenth-century Spain. Just as the Benedictines saw that no harm should come to Fejuo, so the Jesuits protected one of their priests whose chief production was a satire of sermons. José Francisco de Isla was himself an eloquent preacher, but he was first amused, then disturbed, by the oratorical tricks, the literary conceits, the histrionics and buffoonery with which some preachers caught the attention and pennies of the people in churches and public squares. In 1758 he made high fun of these evangelists in a novel called Historia del Famoso Predicador Fray Herundio. Brother Gerund, said Father Isla, always began his sermons with some proverb, some pothouse witticism, or some strange fragment which, taken from its context, would seem at first blush to be an inconsequence, a blasphemy, or an impiety, until at last, having kept his audience waiting a moment in wonder, he finished the clause and came out with an explanation that reduced the whole to a sort of miserable trifling. Thus, preaching one day on the mystery of the Trinity, he began his sermon by saying, I deny that God exists a unity in essence and a trinity in person, and then stopped short for an instant. The hearers, of course, looked around, wondering what would be the end of this heretical blasphemy. At length, when the preacher thought he had fairly caught them, he went on, Thus say the Ebionite, the Marcionite, the Arian, the Manichaean, the Socinian, but I prove it against them all from the Scriptures, the Councils, and the Fathers." Within a day of its publication, 800 copies of Fray Herundio were sold. 
This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now. The Story of Civilization, Volume 10, Rousseau and Revolution, by Will and Ariel Durant. Part 1, Continued. Cassette 12, Side 2. Within a day of its publication, 800 copies of Fray Herundio were sold. The preaching friars assailed it as encouraging disrespect of the clergy. Isla was summoned before the Inquisition, and his book was condemned in 1760, but he himself was not punished. Meanwhile, he joined his fellow Jesuits in exile, and on the road suffered an attack of paralysis. He spent his declining years at Bologna, living on the pittance allowed him by the Spanish government. Almost every Spaniard who could write wrote poetry. At a poetic joust in 1727, there were 150 competitors. Ovellanos added poetry and drama to his activities as jurist, educator, and statesman. His home in Madrid became a meeting place for men of letters. He composed satires in the manner of juvenile, rebuking the corruption he had found in government and law. And, like any city-dweller, he sang the joys of rural peace. Nicolás Fernández de Moratín composed an epic canto on the exploits of Cortés, we are told that this is the noblest poem of its class produced in Spain during the 18th century. The gay and gracious verses of Diego González, an Augustinian friar, were more popular than the didactic Four Ages of Man, which he dedicated to Jovellanos. Don Tomás de Iriarte y Oropesa also indulged a didactic bent in his poem on music. Better were his fables from 1782, which chastised the foibles of pundits and earned him a reputation that still survives. He translated tragedies by Voltaire and comedies by Moliere. He made fun of the monks who held sway over the heavens and two-thirds of Spain. He was prosecuted by the Inquisition, recanted, and died of syphilis at forty-one in 1791. In 1780 the Spanish Academy offered an award for an eclogue, celebrating pastoral life. Iriarte won second prize and never forgave the victor, for Juan Melendez Valdez went on to become the leading Spanish poet of the age. Juan Wood Jovellanos, and through him obtained the chair of humanities at Salamanca in 1781. There he won first the students, then the faculty, to a more adventurous curriculum, even to reading Locke and Montesquieu. Between classes he wrote a volume of lyrics and pastoral poetry, vivid evocations of natural scenery and verses of such delicacy and finish as Spain had not read for more than a century. The continuing favor of Jovellanos raised Melendez to the judiciary at Zaragoza and to the chancery court at Valladolid, and his poetry suffered from his politics. When Jovellanos was exiled in 1798, Melendez was banished too, he turned his pen to denouncing the French invaders of Spain, and Joseph Bonaparte especially. But in 1808 he returned to Madrid, accepted office under Joseph Bonaparte, and shocked Spain with poetic flatteries of his foreign masters. In the War of Liberation that deposed Joseph, the poet's house was sacked by French soldiers, he himself was attacked by an angry mob, and he fled for his life from Spain. Before crossing the Bidasoa into France, he kissed the last spot of Spanish earth, in 1813. Four years later he died in obscurity and poverty in Montpellier. Spain should have had good dramatists in this age, for the Bourbon kings were well disposed toward the theater. Three factors made for its decline. The strong preference of Isabella Farnese for opera, and of Philip V for Farinelli. The consequent dependence of the theatre upon the general public, whose applause went most to farces, miracles, legends, and verbal conceits, and the effort of the more serious dramatists to imprison their plays within the Aristotelian unities of action, place, and time. The most popular playwright of the century was Ramon Francisco de la Cruz, who wrote some four hundred little farces, satirizing the manners, ideas, and speech of the middle and lower classes but portraying the sins and follies of the populace with a forgiving sympathy. Ovellanos, the Uomo Universale of Spain, put his hand to comedy, and won both the audience and the critics with his Delinquente Honrado of 1773, 
the honored criminal. A Spanish gentleman, after repeatedly refusing to fight a duel, finally takes up a persistent challenge, kills his opponent in a fair fight, and is condemned to death by a judge who turns out to be his father. Always a reformer, Jovellanos aimed with his play to obtain a mitigation of the law that made dueling a capital crime. The campaign for the Aristotelian unities was led by the poet Nicolas Fernandez de Moratin and was carried on to success by his son Leandro. The early poems of this youth pleased Jovellanos, who secured a berth for him with the Spanish embassy in Paris. There he made friends with Goldoni, who turned him to writing plays. Fortune lavished gifts upon Moratin the Younger, and he was sent at public expense to study the theatres in Germany, Italy, and England. And on his return to Spain he was given a sinecure that allowed him time for literary work. His first comedy was offered to a Madrid theatre in 1786, but its presentation was delayed for four years while managers and actors debated whether a play obeying the rules of Aristotle and French drama could win a Spanish audience. Its success was moderate. Moratin took the offensive. In his Comedia Nueva of 1792, he made such fun of the popular comedies that the audience thereafter accepted dramas that studied character and illuminated life. Moratin was acclaimed as the Spanish Moliere and dominated the stage of Madrid until the French invasion of 1808. His French sympathies and liberal politics led him, like Melendez and Goya, to cooperate with the government of Joseph Bonaparte. When Joseph fell, Moratin narrowly escaped imprisonment. He sought refuge in France and died in Paris in 1828, the same year in which the self-exiled Goya died in Bordeaux. 8. Spanish Art What could be expected of it after the ravaging of Spain and the long war of the Spanish succession? Invading armies pillaged the churches, rifled the tombs, burned the pictures, and stabled their horses in venerated shrines. And after the war, a new invasion came. Through half a century, Spanish art submitted to French or Italian domination. And when, in 1752, the Academy of San Fernando was formed to guide and help young artists, it labored to impress upon them the principles of a neoclassicism completely uncongenial to the Spanish soul. Baroque struggled violently to preserve itself, and in architecture and sculpture it had its way. It triumphed in the towers that Fernando de Casse Sinova added in 1738 to the Cathedral of Santiago de Compostela, and in the north front of Ventura Rodriguez, from 1764, for that same monument to Spain's patron St. James. One of the legends dear to the people told how a statue of the Virgin on a pillar in Saragossa had come to life and had spoken to St. James. On that site, Spanish piety built the church of the Virgen del Pilar, and for that church, Rodriguez designed the Templete, a chapel of marble and silver to house the Virgin's image. Two famous palaces were raised in the reign of Philip V. Near Segovia, he bought the grounds and grange of a monastery. He engaged Filippo Uvara of Turin to erect there the palace of San Ildefonso, from 1719 onward. He surrounded the buildings with gardens and twenty-six fountains rivaling those of Versailles. The ensemble took the name of La Granja, and cost the people forty-five million crowns. It had hardly been finished when, on Christmas Eve of 1734, fire destroyed the Alcazar, which had been the royal residence in Madrid since the Emperor Charles V. Philip moved to Buen Retiro, where Philip IV had built a palace in 1631. This remained the chief royal seat for thirty years. To replace the Alcazar, Yovara planned a Palacio Real, Apartments, offices, council rooms, chapel, library, theater, and gardens, which would have surpassed in grandeur any royal residence then known. The model alone contained enough wood to build a house. Before he could begin construction, Yuvara died in 1736. Isabella Farnese rejected his design as impossibly expensive, and his successor, Giovanni Battista Sacchetti of Turin, raised, between 1737 and 64, the royal palace that stands in Madrid today, 470 feet long, 470 feet wide, 100 feet high. 
Here the style of the late Renaissance replaced Baroque. The façade was of Doric and Ionic columns, and was crowned by a balustrade pointed with colossal statues of Spain's early kings. When Napoleon escorted his brother Joseph to reign in this palace, he said, as they mounted the superb stairway, "'You will be better lodged than I.' Charles III moved into this immensity in 1764. Under French and Italian influences, Spanish sculpture lost something of its wooden severity and dowered its seraphim with laughter and a saint or two with grace. Subjects were nearly always religious, for the church paid best. So the Archbishop of Toledo spent 200,000 ducats for the Transparente, which Narciso Tomé raised in 1721 behind the cathedral choir. A complex of marble angels floating on marble clouds, an opening in the ambulatory, making the marble luminous, gave the altar screen its name. The old realism survived in the Christ Scourged of Luis Carmona, a figure in wood, horrible with welts and bloody wounds. Lovelier are the statues of faith, hope, and charity which Francisco Vergara the Younger carved for the cathedrals of Puenza in 1759. Seán Bermúdez, the Vasari of Spain, ranked these among the finest products of Spanish art. The great name in the Hispanic sculpture of the 18th century was Francisco Zarcio y Alcares. His father and teacher, a sculptor in Capua, died when Francisco was twenty, leaving him the main support of a mother, a sister, and six brothers. Too poor to pay for models, Francisco invited passers-by, even beggars, to share his meal and pose for him. So perhaps he found the figures for his masterpiece, The Last Supper, now in the Ermita de Jesus in Mercia. With the aid of his sister Inés, who drew and modeled, his brother José, who carved details, and his priest brother Patricio, who colored the figures and the drapes, Francisco in his seventy-four years produced one thousand seven hundred ninety-two statues or statuettes, some with such tasteless devices as an embroidered velvet robe on a figure of Christ, some so moving in their simple piety that Madrid offered him rich commissions to decorate the royal palace. He preferred to remain in his native Mercia, which in 1781 gave him a sumptuous funeral. Spanish painting in the 18th century labored under a double foreign incubus, from which it did not recover until Goya broke all shackles with his impetuous and unprecedented art. First came a French wave with Jean Ranc, René and Michel-Ange Ouas, and Louis-Michel Van Loo. The last became court painter to Philip V and painted an immense canvas of the entire royal family, wigs, hoops, and all. Then a flock of lively Italians, Van Vitelli, Amigoni, Corrado. Giambattista Tiepolo and his sons reached Madrid in June 1762. On the ceiling of the throne room in the new royal palace they painted a vast fresco, the Apotheosis of Spain, celebrating the history, power, virtues, piety, and provinces of the Spanish monarchy. Symbolical mythological figures poised in air. Nereids, tritons, zephyrs, winged genii, chubby putti, virtues and vices flying through the luminous void, and Spain herself enthroned amid her possessions and glorified with all the attributes of good government. On the ceiling of the guardroom, Tiepolo represented Aeneas conducted to the Temple of Immortality by Venus. And on the ceiling of the Queen's antechamber, he portrayed again the triumph of the Spanish monarchy. In 1766, Charles commissioned Tiepolo to paint seven altarpieces for the Church of San Pasquale at Aranjuez. One of these, still brilliant in the Prado, used the face of a Spanish beauty to represent the Immaculate Conception of the Virgin. The king's confessor, Padre Joaquín de Electa, condemned the paganism and crudities of Tiepolo's work as alien to the spirit of Spain. Tiepolo repented and painted a powerful deposition from the cross, a meditation on death brightened by angels promising resurrection. These efforts exhausted the old titan. He died in Madrid in 1770, aged 74. Shortly afterward, the Aranjuez altarpieces were removed, and Anton Rafael Menx was commissioned to replace them. Menx had come to Madrid in 1761. 
He was then thirty-three, strong, confident, masterful. Charles the Third, who had never felt at ease on Tiepolo's fluorescent clouds, saw in the enterprising German just the man to organize the artwork for the palace. In 1764, Mengs was made director of the San Fernando Academy, and he ruled Spanish painting during his stays in Spain. He misinterpreted the classic style into a bloodless, lifeless immobility, enraging both old Tiepolo and young Goya. But he fought beneficently to end the extravagance of Baroque decoration and the fantasies of Rococo imagination. Art, said Manx, should seek first a natural style by imitating nature faithfully. Only then should it aim at the sublime style of the Greeks. How was sublimity to be achieved? By eliminating the imperfect and irrelevant, by combining partial perfections, variously found, into ideal forms conceived by a disciplined imagination, shunning all excess. Manx began his work by depicting the deities of Olympus on the ceiling of the king's bedchamber. Similar pictures decorated the bedroom of the queen. Perhaps perceiving that their majesties did not quite follow him to Olympus, Manx produced for the royal oratory an altarpiece, the nativity of our Lord and a descent from the cross. He worked hard, ate little, grew irritable, lost his health, thought Rome would restore it. Charles gave him a leave of absence, which Mengs extended to four years. In his second Spanish sojourn, from 1773 to 77, he added more frescoes to the royal palaces in Madrid and Aranjuez. His health again gave way, and he begged permission to retire to Rome. The good king granted it, and a continuing pension of 3,000 crowns per year. But were there no native artists then painting in Spain? There were many, but our interest, waning with distance and time, has left them in the murky limbo of fading fame. There was Luis Melendez, who almost equaled Chardin in still lifes, Bordejones, Fruteras. The Prado has forty of them, the Boston Museum has an appetizing example, but the Louvre outdoes them all with a wonderful self-portrait. And Luis Paretti Alcazar, who rivaled Canaletto in picturing city scenes, as in his Puerta del Sol, the main square of Madrid, and Antonio Villadamat, whom Manx pronounced the finest Spanish painter of the age, and the kindly, surly, devoted Francisco Vallejo y Subias, who won first prize at the Academy in 1758, designed tapestries for Manx, and became the friend, enemy, and brother-in-law of Goya. 9. Francisco de Goya y Lucientes 1. Growth Like all Iberian boys, Francisco took the name of a patron saint, then the name of his father, José Goya, and of his mother, El Gracia Lucientes, Lady of Grace and Light. She was an Hidalga, hence the de that Francisco inserted into his name. He was born on March 30, 1746, in Fuente Todos, an Aragon village of a hundred and fifty souls and no trees. A stony soil, a hot summer, a cold winter, killing many, making the survivors grim and tough. Francisco dabbled with brushes, and in his boyhood painted for the local church a picture of Nuestra Señora del Pilar, patroness of Aragon. In 1760, the family moved to Saragossa. There the father worked as a gilder and earned enough to send his boy to study art under José Luzán. With him and Juan Ramírez, Goya copied old masters, imitated Tiepolo's subtle coloring, and learned enough anatomy to draw forbidden nudes. Story tells of his joining, soon leading, a band of wild youths who defended their parish against another, how in one of the brawls some bravos were killed, and how Francisco, fearing arrest, fled to Madrid. In December 1763, he took an examination for admission to the academy and failed. Legend describes his riotous life in the capital. We only know that Goya was not in love with laws. He competed again in 1766 and failed. Perhaps these failures were his fortune. He escaped the academic tutelage of Manx, he studied the work that Tiepolo was doing in Madrid, and he laid the foundations of a unique style pervaded with personality. 
The legend tells next how he joined a troop of bullfighters and traveled with them to Rome at a date unknown. He was always a devotee of Toreadors, and once he signed himself Francisco de los Toros. I used to be a bullfighter in my youth, he wrote in old age to Moratin. With sword in hand I feared nothing. Perhaps he meant that he had been one of those venturesome lads who fought bulls in the streets. In any case, he reached Italy, for in 1770 he won second prize in a competition at the Academy of Fine Arts in Parma. Legend describes him climbing the dome of St. Peter's and breaking into a convent to carry off a nun. More likely he was studying the pictures of Maniasco, whose dark coloring, tortured figures, and inquisition scenes may have moved him more deeply than the calm and classic poses that Menx had recommended in Spain. In the fall of 1771 he was back in Saragossa, decorating a chapel in the cathedral, Iglesia Metropolitana de la Nuestra Señora del Pilar. This he did well, earning 15,000 reales for six months' work, and now he could support a wife. Since propinquity dominates in determining our choice of mates, he married, in 1773, Josefa Bayeu, who had youth and golden hair and was near at hand. She served as his model, and he painted her portrait many times. That which hangs in the Prado shows her tired with many pregnancies, or saddened by Francisco's digressions from monogamy. He returned to Madrid in 1775. Probably on Bayeu's recommendation, Manx commissioned him in 1776 to paint large canvases as cartoons for the royal tapestry factory that Philip V had founded in emulation of the Gobelins. Now, risking a serious repulse, Goya made a decision that shaped his career. Ignoring Manx's predilection for classical mythology and heroic history, he portrayed in massive line and vivid color the people of his own kind and time, their labor and loves, their fairs and festivals, their bullfights and kite-flying, their markets, picnics, and games. And to this realism he added, venturesomely, things he had imagined but never seen. Manx rose to the occasion. He did not condemn this transcending of academic tradition. He felt the pulse of life in the new style and gave the rebel more commissions. In fifteen years Goya produced forty-five cartoons as the staple of his work, while moving with growing confidence into other fields. Now he could eat and drink in comfort. I have twelve to thirteen thousand reales a year, he wrote to his friend Zapater. A spirochete intruded upon this prosperity. We do not know the origin of Goya's syphilis. We know that he was seriously ill in April 1777. He recovered gradually, but we may suspect that the ailment had some influence on the pessimism in his art, perhaps on his loss of hearing in 1793. He was well enough in 1778 to take part in a project of Charles III to spread abroad, through prints, the treasures of Spanish art. For this purpose, Goya made copies of eighteen paintings by Velázquez. From these copies he made etchings was a new skill for him, and his buren was for a while unsure and crude. But from that beginning he grew to be one of the greatest etchers since Rembrandt. He was allowed to present his copies in person to the king, and in 1780 he was enrolled as one of the court painters. Now at last he was received into the academy. About 1785 he made his famous portrait of Charles III, showing him in hunting costume dressed to kill, but aged, weary, toothless, bow-legged, bent. Here, as usual, Goya sacrificed favor to truth. His father having died, Goya brought his mother and brother Camilo to live with him, Josefa, and the children. To support this enlarged household, he accepted a variety of commissions, to paint a fresco in the church of San Francisco el Grande, devotional pictures for the Calatrava College at Salamanca, and Jean Racines for the country house of the Duke of Osuna, and to execute portraits as the most lucrative branch of his profession. He made several of Osuna, one of the Duke and his family, the children as stiff as dollars, and a three-quarter length of the Duchess of Osuna, a miracle of oils transfigured into silk and lace. Perhaps Goya was happy in 1784. In that year Javier was born, the only one of his children who would survive him. 
The frescoes in San Francisco el Grande were ceremoniously unveiled and were hailed as the finest painting of that age. The king and all the court were present and joined in the praise. About 1787, Goya painted the portrait of the Marquesa de Pontejos, which is now one of the prized possessions of the National Gallery at Washington. A year later, he returned to nature in La Pradera de San Isidro, a field crowded with picnickers celebrating the feast of Madrid's great patron saint by riding, strolling, sitting, eating, drinking, singing, dancing on the grassy shores of the Manzanares. It is only a sketch, but it is a chef d'oeuvre. When Charles died in 1788, Goya was in his forty-third year and thought himself old. In the previous December he had written to Sapater, I have become old, with so many wrinkles in my face that you could no longer recognize me if it were not for my flat nose and sunken eyes. He could hardly foresee that he had forty years more of life in him, and that his wildest adventures and most distinguished work lay in his future. He had developed slowly. Now romance and revolution would compel him to quicken his pace or be submerged. He rose with events and became the greatest artist of his time. 2. Romance he was kept busy in 1789 making portraits of the new king and queen for their formal entry into Madrid on September 21st. Felipe, eldest son of Charles III, had been barred from the succession as an imbecile. The crown passed to the second son, whom an unsympathetic historian described as only semi-imbecile. Charles IV was simple and unsuspecting, and so good as almost to invite wickedness. Presuming himself as second son excluded from the succession, he had taken to a life of hunting, eating, and parentage. Now, plump and malleable, he submitted amiably to his wife, Maria Luisa of Parma. He ignored, or was ignorant of, her adulteries, and promoted her new lover, Manuel de Godoy, to head the ministry from 1792 to 1797. The new queen had played with liberal ideas before her accession— and Charles IV, in his first year, encouraged Florida Blanca, Ovellanos, and Campomanes, all of whom Goya portrayed, to continue their program of reforms. But the fall of the Bastille frightened Charles IV and Florida Blanca into a political reaction that turned the government back to full cooperation with the Church as the strongest bulwark of monarchy. Many of the progressive measures enacted under Charles III were allowed to lapse. The Inquisition recaptured some of its powers. The importation of French literature was stopped. All newspapers except the official Diario de Madrid were suppressed. Ovellanos, Compomanes, and Aranda were banished from the court. The people rejoiced in the triumph of their cherished faith. In 1793, Spain joined in the war of the monarchical powers against revolutionary France. Amid this turmoil, Goya prospered. In April 1789, he was named Pintor de Camara, painter to the chamber. When Josefa fell ill and the doctor prescribed sea air, Goya took her to Valencia in 1790, where he was fated as Spain's new Velázquez. Apparently he was in demand from one end of Spain to another, for in 1792 we find him in Cádiz as the guest of Sebastián Martínez. On his way back at Seville, he was stricken with dizziness and partial paralysis. He returned to his friend in Cadiz and fretted through a lengthy convalescence. What was this illness? Bayeu spoke of it vaguely as of the most terrible nature, and doubted that Goya would ever recover. Goya's loyal friend Sapater wrote in March 1793, Goya has been brought to this pass by his lack of reflection but he is to be commiserated with all the pity that his affliction demands. Many students have interpreted the disease as an aftermath of syphilis, but the latest medical analysis rejects this view and diagnoses it as inflammation of the nerves in the labyrinth of the year. Whatever the cause, Goya, returning to Madrid in July 1793, was stone deaf and remained so till his death. In February 1794... Ovellanos noted in his diary, I wrote to Goya, who answered that as a result of his apoplexy he was not even capable of writing. 
but the paralysis gradually disappeared, and by 1795 Goya was strong enough to fall in love. Teresa Cayetana Maria del Pilar was the thirteenth duchess of the famous Alba line. As her father had imbibed French philosophy, she was brought up on libertarian lines with an education that gave her an alert intellect and an undisciplined will. At thirteen, she married the nineteen-year-old Don José de Toledo Osorio, Duke of Alba. Frail and sickly, the Duke, for the most part, kept to his home and absorbed himself in music. Goya portrayed him at the harpsichord, confronting a Haydn score. The Duchess was haughty, beautiful, and sensual. A French traveler remarked that she has not a hair on her head that does not provoke desire, and she satisfied her own desires without restriction of morals, expense, or class. She took into her household a half-wit, a one-eyed monk, and a little negress who became her especial pet. Generosity hid in her audacities. She may have taken to Goya because he was deaf and unhappy, as well as because he could immortalize her with his brush. He must have seen her many times before she stood for her portrait by him, for she fluttered in and out of the court, keeping gossip busy with her flirtations and her bold hostility to the queen. His first dated picture of her shows her in full length, her sharp, thin features shrouded in a mass of black hair, her right hand pointing to something on the ground. Looking, clearly, we read the inscription, A la Duquesa de Alba, Francisco de Goya, 1795. There is here a suggestion of friendship already established. This is not one of Goya's masterpieces. Much better is the portrait that he painted in this year of Francisco Bayeu, who had just passed away. In November, Goya succeeded him as director of the School of Painting in the Academy. The Duke of Alba died in June 1796. The Duchess retired for a brief period of mourning to her country estate at San Lucar between Seville and Cadiz. It is not certain that Goya accompanied her. We only know that he was absent from Madrid from October 1796 till April 1797, and that he recorded in two notebooks some of the things he had seen in San Lucar. Most of the drawings show the Duchess receiving guests, petting her negro girl, tearing her own hair in a rage, taking her siesta, while the maid removes the chamber vessel, fainting in a promenade, or flirting with one or another of Goya's rivals for her caressing hands. The sketches show his rising jealousy, and picture also another woman, emerging naked from the bath, lying half-dressed on the bed, or adjusting the garter on a shapely leg. Perhaps Goya, like the Duchess, indulged in tangents to the curve of love. Yet it was probably in San Lucar that he painted his proudest picture of her, dressed as a saucy maha in a black and yellow costume with a sash of scarlet and gold about her tiny waist and a black mantilla over her head. Her right hand, itself a masterpiece of painting, carries two rings, one bearing the name Alba, the other Goya. Her index finger points to his name and the date 1797 traced in the sandy soil at her feet. He always refused to sell this portrait. The bloom of the romance had blown away by the time Goya returned to Madrid. Some of his capriccio drawings, possibly from 1797, accuse her of wanton surrender to an indecent variety of males. Godoy accused her of seducing the minister of war and wrote to the queen that the Alba and all her supporters ought to be buried in a huge pit. When the Duchess died on July 23, 1803, age 40, Madrid gossiped that she had been poisoned. Sympathy went out to her because she had left much of her huge fortune to her servants. Also she bequeathed an annuity of 3,600 reales to Goya's son, Javier. The king ordered an inquiry into her death and put Godoy at its head. The physician and some attendants of the duchess were imprisoned. Her will was annulled. Her servants were deprived of their legacies. The queen was soon wearing Alba's most beautiful jewels. 3. Zenith Goya had resigned in 1797 as director of painting at the Academy. He was now too busy to teach. In 1798 he was chosen to decorate the dome and tympanums of the Church of San Antonio de la Florida. 
and though he troubled the clergy by giving his angels voluptuous limbs, nearly all agreed that he had transferred to those saintly spaces, in a fury of inspiration, the life and blood of Madrid's streets. On October 31, 1799, he was appointed first painter to the court with a salary of 50,000 reales per year. He made in 1800 the most famous of all his paintings, Charles IV and his family, a merciless revelation of royal imbecility. We shudder to think how this collection of swollen bodies and stunted souls would have looked without their glamorous raiment, a virtuosity of radiance rarely surpassed in the history of art. We are told that the victims expressed complete satisfaction with the work. In a corner of that picture Goya painted himself. We must forgive the egotism of his many self-portraits. Some of them, doubtless, were experimental studies made with a mirror, like an actor practicing facial expression before a glass, and two of them are magnificent. The best of them shows him at fifty, dead but proud, with a pugnacious chin, sensual lips, enormous nose, sly and surly eyes, black hair growing over his ears and almost to his chin, and to top it all a lordly silk hat rising over his massive head like a challenge to all the fortuitous nobles of the world. Nineteen years later, after surviving a revolution, he discarded the hat, opened his shirt at the neck, and showed himself in a more amiable mood, still proud but too confident of himself to stoop to challenges. Portraiture was his fort. Though his contemporaries knew that he would not flatter them, they eagerly submitted to the verdict of an art that they hoped would carry them down, or fame or shame, through centuries. We know of three hundred nobles and eighty-eight members of the royal family who sat for him. Two hundred of these portraits survive. One of the best is of Ferdinand Guilmardet, the French ambassador. It was brought to Paris by the sitter, and was acquired by the Louvre in 1865, and played a part in stirring up Goya's fame in France. Among Goya's pictures of children, the finest is that of Don Manuel Osorio de Suniga, now in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. Here Goya touched Velázquez. He rivaled Velázquez again in his gallery of women, running the range from such scarecrows as the Infanta Maria Josefa, to the ravishing Senora Garcia, and the aging actress La Tirana, beauty waning but replaced with character. The most fully revealed of Goya's women is the saucy Maha, who, about 1798, posed unadorned for the Maha desnuda, and provocatively dressed for La Maha Vestida. These companion pictures attract almost as many gazers in the Prado as the Mona Lisa in the Louvre. The desnuda and Velázquez's Roque Venus are among the few nudes in Spanish painting. To depict the nude in Spanish art was punishable by a year in prison, confiscation of goods, and exile. Velázquez ventured it under the protection of Philip IV, Goya under the protection of Godoy, who agreed with Goya in preferring substantial bosoms, slim waists, and swelling hips. Despite legend, Goya's Maha did not represent the Duchess of Alba, nor was the Vestida painted overnight to replace the Desnuda when the angry duke, in the legend, came with a jewel in his eye. But the two pictures were bought by or given to the Duchess, and passed at her death into the collection of Godoy. While Goya was financing his family with portraits, he amused himself, possibly between 1796 and 97, with etchings and watercolors which he published in 1799, as Los Caprichos. Eighty-three caprices of graver brush and angry mind, describing with somber satire and sarcastic captions the manners, morals, and institutions of his time. The most significant of the series is number 43. A man has fallen asleep at his desk while demons swarm about his head. On the desk is an inscription, The Dream of Reason Produces Monsters. Goya interpreted this to mean, Fantasy abandoned by reason produces monsters. United with reason, she is the mother of the arts and the source of their marvels. This was a thrust at the superstitions that darkened the mind of Spain, but it was also a description of half of Goya's art. He was haunted by horrible dreams. The caprichos especially are ghastly with them. 
There the human form is degraded into a hundred bloated, haggard, crippled, bestial shapes. Owls and cats leer at us, wolves and vultures prowl, witches fly through the air, the ground is strewn with skulls and shin-bones, and corpses of newborn children newly dead. It is as if the diseased imagination of Hieronymus Bosch had leaped across France and the centuries to enter and disorder Goya's mind. Was Goya a rationalist? We can only say that he favored reason against superstition. In one of his drawings he showed a young woman, crowned with laurel and holding a scale, chasing blackbirds with a whip. Underneath this Goya wrote, Divine reason, do not spare any one. Another shows monks unfrocking themselves, and upon a monk in prayer he put the face of a lunatic. He pictured the tribunal of the Inquisition as a dismal scene of pitiful victims judged by cold authority. He represented a Jew chained in an Inquisition cell and wrote the caption, Zapata, your glory will be everlasting. This was an echo of Voltaire's questions of Zapata. He made twenty-nine plates of Inquisition victims, suffering diverse punishments, and at their end he drew a rejoicing figure over the caption, Divine Liberty. And yet, to the end of his life, he crossed himself piously, invoked Christ and the saints, and headed his letters with a cross. Perhaps all these were vestiges of habits formed in you. 4. Revolution Was Goya a revolutionist? No, he was not even a republican. There is no sign in his art or his words that he desired the overthrow of the Spanish monarchy. He attached himself and his fortunes to Charles III, to Charles IV, to Godoy, to Joseph Bonaparte, and associated gladly with the nobility and the court. But he had known poverty, he still saw it around him, he was repelled by the destitution of the masses, their consequent ignorance and superstition, and the Church's acceptance of mass poverty as a natural consequence of the nature and inequality of men. Half of his art commemorated the rich, the other half was a cry for justice to the poor, a protest against the barbarism of law, the Inquisition, and war. He was a loyalist in his portraits, a Catholic in his paintings, a rebel in his drawings. There, with an almost savage power, he expressed his hatred of obscurantism, injustice, folly, and cruelty. One drawing represents a man stretched on a rack with an inscription because he discovered the movement of the earth. Another pictures a woman in the stocks because she showed sympathy for the liberal cause. Who were these Spaniards who called themselves liberales? They were apparently the first political faction to use that name. They meant by it to signalize their desire for liberty, of the mind from censorship, of the body from degradation, of the soul from tyranny. They had received gratefully the luces coming in from the French Enlightenment. They welcomed the entry of a French force into Spain in 1807. Indeed, half of the population welcomed it as an army of liberation. No protest was heard when Charles IV resigned and his son, Ferdinand VII, was enthroned under the protection of Murat's soldiery. Goya painted a portrait of the new ruler. But the mood of the people and of Goya changed when Napoleon summoned Charles IV and Ferdinand VII to Bayonne, deposed both of them, exiled one to Italy, the other to France, and made his brother Joseph king of Spain. An angry crowd gathered before the royal palace. Murat ordered his soldiers to clear the square. The crowd fled but reassembled, twenty thousand strong, in the Plaza Mayor. When French and Mameluke troops marched toward the plaza, they were fired on from windows and arcades. Infuriated, they entered houses, killing indiscriminately. Troops and crowd entered into an all-day battle, the famous Dos de Mayo, May 2, 1808. Hundreds of men and women fell. From some nearby vantage, Goya saw part of the massacre. On May 3rd, thirty of the prisoners taken by the soldiers were executed by a firing squad, and every Spaniard found with a gun in his hands was put to death. Nearly all Spain was now in revolt against the French. A war of liberation spread from province to province, disgracing both sides with bestial ferocities. Goya saw some of these and was haunted by their memory till his death. In 1811, fearing the worst, he made his will. In 1812, Joseva died. In 1813, Wellington took Madrid. Ferdinand VII was again king. 
Goya celebrated the triumph of Spain by painting two of his most famous pictures in 1814. One, Dos de Mayo, was his reconstruction of what he had seen, heard, or imagined of the battle between the populace of Madrid and the French and Mameluke troops. He placed the Mamelukes in the center, for it was their participation that stirred the hottest resentment in Spanish memory. We need not ask if the picture is accurate history. It is brilliant and powerful art, from the gradations of gleaming colors on the horse of the falling Mameluke to the faces of men terrified and brutalized by the choice between killing and being killed. Even more vivid is a companion picture, the shooting of the 3rd of May, a squad of French riflemen executing Spanish prisoners. Nothing in Goya is more impressive than the contrast of terror and defiance in the central figure of that massacre. Still a pensioned pintor de camera, but no longer a favorite at the court, Goya, widowed, silenced, and deaf, retired into the world of his art. This book is continued on Cassette 13, Side 1. The Story of Civilization, Volume 10, Rousseau and Revolution, by Will and Ariel Durant. Part 1. Continued. Cassette 13, Side 1. Still a pensioned pintor de camera, but no longer a favorite at the court, Goya, widowed, silenced, and deaf, retired into the world of his art. Perhaps in 1812 he made the most powerful of his engravings, the Colossus, a Hercules with the face of Caliban, seated on the edge of the earth, a Mars resting after triumphant war. Ever since 1810 he had been drawing little sketches which he later engraved and printed, and to which he gave the title The Fatal Consequences of Spain's Bloody War with Bonaparte and Other Caprichos. He did not dare publish these eighty-five drawings. He bequeathed them to his son, whose son sold them to the Academy of San Fernando, which published them in 1863 as Los Desastres de la Guerra. These sketches are not usual battle scenes, which disguise killing as heroism and glory. They are moments of terror and cruelty in which the frail restraints of civilization are forgotten in the ecstasy of conflict and the intoxication of blood. Here are houses on fire collapsing upon their inmates, women rushing to the battle with stones or pikes or guns, women raped, men tied to posts before firing squads, men shorn of a leg, an arm, or a head, a soldier cutting off a man's genitals. Corpses impaled upon the sharp stumps or limbs of trees. Dead women still clutching their infants at their breast. Children gazing in horror at the slaughter of their parents. Dead men cast in heaps into pits. Vultures feasting upon the human dead. Under these pictures Goya added sardonic captions. This is what you were born for. This I saw. It happened like this. To bury the dead and be silent. At the end, Goya expressed his despair and his hope. Number 79 is a woman dying amid gravediggers and priests, and is captioned, Truth Dies. But number 80 shows her radiating light and asks, Will she rise again? 5. De Crescendo In February 1819, he bought a country house on the other side of the Manzanares. It was shaded by trees, and though he could not hear the music of the brook that bordered it, he could feel the lesson of its placid continuance. The neighbors called his home La Quinta del Sordo, the house of the deaf. As Javier had married and made a separate household, Goya took with him Doña Leocadia Weiss, who served him as mistress and housekeeper. She was a lusty shrew, but Goya was immune to her eloquence. She brought with her two children, a boy, Guillermo, and a lively little girl, Maria del Rosario, who became the solace of the artist's declining life. He badly needed so wholesome a stimulus, for his mind was on the edge of lunacy. Only so can we understand the pinturas negras, with which he covered many walls of the house that was his asylum. As if reflecting the darkness of his mind, he painted chiefly in black and white and as if faithful to the vagueness of his visions, he gave no certain contours to the forms, but used rough daubs to quickly fix upon the walls the fleeting images of a dream. On one of the long side walls he represented the pilgrimage of San Isidro, the same festival that he had painted joyfully in 1788, thirty-one years before. But now it was a gloomy panorama of bestial and drunken fanatics. 
On the opposite wall he gathered even more horrible figures in a Sabbath of witches, awesomely worshipping a huge black goat as their Satan and commanding God. At the farther end of the room rose the most hideous form in the history of art, Saturn devouring his offspring, a giant crunching a naked child, having eaten a head and one arm, and now gorging himself on the other, splashing blood. Perhaps it is an insane symbol of insane nations consuming their children in war. These are the visions of a man who is obsessed with macabre imaginings, and madly paints them to drive them out of himself and immobilize them on the wall. In 1823, Leocadia, whose Freemason activities had made her fear a rest, fled to Bordeaux with her children. Goya, left alone with the madness that he had painted on his walls, decided to follow them. But if he went without royal permission, he would forfeit the official salary that he was receiving as Pintor de Camara. He asked for several months' leave to take the waters at Plomier. It was granted. He deeded the Quinta del Sordo to his grandson Mariano, and in June 1824 he made his way to Bordeaux, Leocadia, and Maria of the Rosary. As he neared death, his love for his grandson Mariano became his dominant passion. He settled an annuity on the boy and offered to pay expenses if Javier would bring Mariano to Bordeaux. Javier could not come, but he sent his wife and son. When they arrived, Goya embraced them with such emotion that he broke down and had to take to his bed. He wrote to his son, My dear Javier, I only want to tell you that all this joy has been too much for me. Chapter 12 Valle Italia, 1760-1789 1. Farewell Tour If we indulge ourselves in one more look at Italy, we shall find her, even in this seeming siesta, warm with life. Turin nursing Alfieri, Luca publishing Diderot's Encyclopédie, Florence flowering again under Grand Duke Leopold, Milan reforming law with Beccaria, Pavia and Bologna thrilling with the experiments of Volta and Galvani, Venice suffering Casanova, Naples challenging the papacy, Rome caught in the tragedy of the Jesuits, and a hundred breeding grounds of music exporting opera and virtuosity to tame the savage transalpine breast. We shall meet in Italy a hundred thousand foreigners coming to study her treasures and bask in her sun. There, in this age, Goethe, choked with Weimar dignitaries, came to renew his youth and discipline his muse. Goethe's first impression, as he came down from the Alps into Venezia Tridentina in September 1786, was of the mild and luminous air, which gave exquisite enjoyment to mere existence, even to poverty. The figure of that massacre. Still a pensioned Pintor de Camera, but no longer light-heartedness, think of nothing but to live. He thought that the fruitful soil must readily provide for the modest wants of these simple people, yet the poverty and the lack of sanitation in the smaller towns dismayed him. When I asked the waiter for a certain place, he pointed down into the courtyard, qui abasso puo servire. Dove? I asked. Da per tutto, dove vuol, was the friendly reply. Four courts and colonnades are all soiled with filth, for things are done in the most natural manner. Sensory adaptation gradually reconciled him. Venice was enjoying her amiable decay. About 1778, Carlo Gozzi described with righteous exaggeration what seemed to him a general dissolution of morality. The spectacle of women turned into men, men turned into women, and both men and women turned into monkeys, all of them immersed in the whirligig of fashion, corrupting and seducing one another with the eagerness of hounds on the scent, vying in their lusts and ruinous extravagance, burning incense to Priapus. In 1797 he blamed the collapse on philosophy. Religion, that salutary curb on human passion, has become a laughing stock. I am bound to believe that the gallows benefit society, being an instrument for punishing crime and deterring would-be criminals. But our newfangled philosophers have denounced the gallows as a tyrannical prejudice, and by so doing they have multiplied murders on the highway, robberies and acts of violence a hundredfold. 
It was pronounced a musty and barbarous prejudice to keep women at home for the supervision of their sons and daughters, their domestic service and economy. At once the women poured forth, storming like bacchanals, screaming, Liberty! Liberty! The streets swarmed with them. Meanwhile they abandoned their vapory brains to fashions, frivolous inventions, amusements, amours, coquetries, all sorts of nonsense. The husbands had not the courage to oppose this ruin of their honor, their substance, their families. They were afraid of being pilloried with that dreadful word prejudice. Good morals, modesty, and chastity received the name of prejudice. When all the so-called prejudices had been put to flight, many great and remarkable blessings appeared. Irreligion, respect and reverence annulled, justice overturned, criminals encouraged and bewept, heated imaginations, sharpened senses, animalism, indulgence in all lusts and passions, imperious luxury, bankruptcies, adulteries. But of course the basic causes of decay were economic and military. Venice no longer had the wealth to defend her former power. By contrast, her rival Austria had grown so strong in manpower that she commanded all land approaches to the lagoons and fought some of her campaigns on the soil of the neutral but helpless republic. On March 9, 1789, Lodovico Manin was elected to head the government, the last of the 120 doges who had presided over Venice in an impressive continuity since 697. He was a man of great riches and little character, but poverty and courage would not have prevented his tragedy. Four months later the Bastille fell, the religion of liberty captured the imagination of France, and when the religion came with the legions of Napoleon it swept nearly all Italy under its banner and ecstasy. On the ground that Austrian forces had used Venetian territory, and on the charge that Venice had secretly aided his enemies, the victorious Corsican, backed by 80,000 troops, imposed upon the Queen of the Adriatic a provisional government dictated by himself, on May 12, 1797. On that day, Doja Manin, resigning, gave his cap of state to an attendant, and bade him take it away, we shall not want it again. A few days later he died. On May 16th, French troops occupied the city. On October 17th, Bonaparte signed at Campo Formio, a treaty that transferred Venice and nearly all her territorial possessions to Austria in exchange for Austrian concessions to France in Belgium and on the left bank of the Rhine. It was exactly eleven hundred years since the first doge had been elected to rule and defend the lagoons. Parma was a Spanish protectorate, but its duke, Don Felipe, son of Philip V and Isabella Farnese, married Louise Elizabeth, daughter of Louis XV, he adopted her expensive habits and made his court a miniature Versailles. Parma became a center of culture, gaily mingling cosmopolitan ways. It seemed to me, said Casanova, that I was no longer in Italy, for everything had the air of belonging to the other side of the Alps. I heard only French and Spanish spoken by the passers-by. An enlightened minister, Guillaume du Tillot, gave the duchy stimulating reforms. Here were made some of the finest textiles, crystals, and faience. Milan now experienced an industrial expansion, modestly prefiguring its economic preeminence in the Italy of today. Austrian rule gave loose rein to local ability and enterprise. Count Karl Joseph von Fermian, governor of Lombardy, cooperated with native leaders in improving administration and reduced the oppressive power of feudal barons and municipal oligarchs. A group of economic liberals led by Pietro Veri, Cesare Bonesana di Beccaria, and Giovanni Carli adopted the principles of the physiocrats, abolished taxes on internal trade, ended the farming of taxes, and spread the burden by taxing ecclesiastical property. The textile industry grew till in 1785 it comprised 29 firms, operating 1,384 looms. The land was surveyed, the state financed irrigation projects, the peasants worked with a will. In the 21 years between 1749 and 1770, the population of the duchy rose from 90,000 to 130,000. It was in this period of Milanese exhilaration that the community built the Teatro alla Scala, 1776-78, to 78, seating 3,600 spectators amid palatial decorations 
and offering facilities for music, conversation, eating, playing cards, and sleeping, and surmounting all a reservoir of water designed to extinguish any fire. Here Cimarosa and Cherubini now enjoyed resounding victories. This was the heroic age of Corsica. That mountainous isle was already surfeited with history. The Phocians from Asia Minor had established a colony there toward 560 B.C. They were conquered by the Etruscans, who were conquered by the Carthaginians, who were conquered by the Romans, who were conquered by the Byzantine Greeks, who were conquered by the Franks, who were conquered by the Moslems, who were conquered by the Tuscan Italians, who were conquered by the Pisans, who were conquered by the Genoese in 1347. Two-thirds of the population in that century died from the Black Plague. Under Genoese rule, the Corsicans, harassed by pestilence and piratical raids, barred from major offices and taxed beyond bearing, sank into a semi-savagery in which violent vendettas were the only honored law. Periodical revolts failed because of internecine feuds and lack of foreign aid. Genoa, fighting for its own life against Austrian armies, appealed to France for help in maintaining order in Corsica. France responded, lest the island be taken by the British as a citadel for control of the Mediterranean. French troops occupied Ajaccio and other Corsican strongholds between 1739 and 48. When peace seemed secure, the French withdrew, Genoese domination was resumed, and the historic revolt of Paoli began. Pasquale di Paoli anticipated by a century the exploits of Garibaldi. Lord Chatham called him one of those men who are no longer to be found but in the pages of Plutarch. Born in 1725, the son of a Corsican rebel, he followed his father into exile, studied in Naples under the liberal economist Genovese, served in the Neapolitan army, returned to Corsica in 1755, and was chosen to lead a rebellion against Genoa. In two years of fighting, he succeeded in driving the Genoese from all but some coastal towns. As elected head of the new republic, from 1757 to 68, he proved himself as brilliant in legislation and administration as he showed himself in the strategy and tactics of war. He established a democratic constitution, suppressed the vendetta, abolished the oppressive rights of feudal lords, spread education, and founded a university at Corte, his capital. Unable to overcome him, Genoa sold the island to France on May 15, 1768, for two million francs. Paoli now found himself fighting against repeatedly reinforced French troops. His secretary and aide at this time was Carlo Buonaparte, to whom a son, Napoleone, was born at Ajaccio on August 15, 1769. Overwhelmed by the French at Ponte Nuovo in May 1769, Paoli abandoned the hopeless struggle and took refuge in England. There he received a government pension, was celebrated by Boswell, and numbered Johnson among his friends. The National Assembly of Revolutionary France recalled him from exile, acclaimed him as the hero and martyr of liberty, and made him governor of Corsica in 1791. But the French convention judged him insufficiently Jacobin. It sent a commission to depose him. British troops came to his aid, but the British general took control of the island and sent Paoli back to England in 1795. Napoleon dispatched a French force to expel the British in 1796. The islanders welcomed the French as coming from um, the Corsican. The British withdrew, and Corsica submitted to France. Tuscany flourished under the Habsburg Grand Dukes who succeeded the Medici in 1738. Since its nominal ruler, Francis of Lorraine, resided in Austria as the husband of Maria Theresa, the government was deputed to a regency under native leaders who rivaled the Milanese liberals in economic reforms. Seven years before Turgot's similar attempt in France, they established free internal trade in grains, this in 1767. When Francis died in 1765, he was followed as Grand Duke by his younger son Leopold, who developed into one of the most enterprising and courageous of the enlightened despots. He checked corruption in office, improved the judiciary, the administration, and the finances, equalized taxation, abolished torture, confiscation, and capital punishment, helped the peasantry, drained marshes, ended monopolies, extended free trade and free enterprise, allowed self-government in the communes, 
and looked forward to setting up a semi-democratic constitution for the duchy. Goethe was impressed by the comparative cleanliness of the Tuscan cities, the good condition of roads and bridges, the beauty and grandeur of the public works. Leopold's brother Joseph, on becoming sole emperor, supported Leopold in abolishing most feudal privileges in Tuscany, in closing many monasteries and in reducing the power of the clergy. In ecclesiastical reforms, Leopold received powerful cooperation from Scipione de Ricci, bishop of Pistoia and Prato. A harsh custom in Tuscany required all dowerless women to take the veil. Ricci joined the Grand Duke in raising the minimum age for taking the vows and turning many convents into schools for girls. Provision was made for secular education by substituting lay for Jesuit schools. Ricci celebrated Mass in Italian and discouraged superstitions, much to the displeasure of the populace. When it was rumored that he intended to remove Espurius, the famous girdle of the Virgin, at Prato, the people rioted and sacked the Episcopal Palace. Ricci nevertheless called a diocesan synod, which met at Pistoia in 1786 and proclaimed principles recalling the Gallican Articles of 1682, that the temporal power is independent of the spiritual, that is, the state is independent of the church, and that the Pope is fallible even in matters of faith. Leopold lived simply and was liked for his unassuming manners, but as his reign progressed and the hostility of the Orthodox pressed upon him, he grew suspicious and aloof and employed a multitude of spies to watch not only his enemies but his aides. Joseph advised him from Vienna, Let them deceive you sometimes, rather than thus torment yourself constantly and in vain. When Leopold left Florence to succeed Joseph as emperor in 1790, the forces of reaction triumphed in Tuscany. Ricci was condemned by Pope Pius VI in 1794 and was imprisoned from 1799 to 1805 until he retracted his heresies. The advent of Napoleonic government in 1800 restored the liberals to power. Goethe hurried through Tuscany to Rome. Hear him, writing on November 1st, 1786. At last I have arrived at this great capital of the world. I have as good as flown over the mountains of the Tyrol. My anxiety to reach Rome was so great that to think of stopping anywhere was out of the question. Even in Florence I stayed only three hours. Now, as it would seem, I shall be put at peace for my whole life. For we may almost say that a new life begins when a man once sees with his own eyes all that previously he has but partially heard or read of. All the dreams of my youth I now behold realized before me. What a dizzy mixture it was, that eighteenth-century Rome, swarming with beggars and nobles, cardinals and castrati, bishops and prostitutes, monks and tradesmen, Jesuits and Jews, artists and criminals, bravi and saints, and tourists seeking antiquities by day and cortigiane by night. Here, within twelve miles of city walls, were pagan amphitheaters and triumphal arches, Renaissance palaces and fountains, three hundred churches and ten thousand priests, a hundred and seventy thousand people, and around the Vatican citadel of Catholic Christianity, the most turbulent, lawless, and anti-clerical rabble in Christendom. Scurrilous pamphlets against the church were hawked about the streets. Buffoons parodied in public squares the most sacred ceremonies of the Mass. Perhaps Winkelmann, a timid and tender soul, exaggerated a bit. In the daytime it is pretty quiet in Rome, but at night it is the devil let loose. From the great freedom which prevails here, and from the absence of any sort of police, the brawling, shooting, fireworks and bonfires in all the streets last during the whole night. The populace is untamed, and the governor is weary of banishing and hanging. Even more than Paris, Rome was a cosmopolitan city where artists, students, poets, tourists mingled with prelates and princesses in the salons, the galleries, and the theaters. Here Winkelmann and Manx were proclaiming the revival of the classic style, and here the harassed, beleaguered popes were struggling to mollify the impoverished populace with bread and benedictions, to hold back ambassadors pressing for the abolition of the Jesuits, 
and to keep the whole complex edifice of Christianity from crumbling under the advance of science and the assaults of philosophy. But let us go on with Goethe to Naples. He thought he had never seen such joie de vivre. If in Rome one can readily set oneself to study, here one can do nothing but live. You forget yourself and the world, and to me it is a strange feeling to go about with people who think of nothing but enjoying themselves. Here men know nothing of one another. They scarcely observe that others are also going on their way, side by side with them. They run all day backward and forward in a paradise without looking about them. And if the neighboring jaws of hell begin to open into rage, they have recourse to St. Januarius. Don Carlos, leaving Naples for Spain in 1759, had bequeathed the kingdom of Naples and Sicily to his eight-year-old son, Ferdinand IV, with the Marchese di Tanucci as regent. Tanucci continued that war against the church which he had begun with Carlos. He suppressed many convents and monasteries and willingly followed the directive of Charles III of Spain to expel the Jesuits. Shortly after midnight of November 3rd to 4th, 1767, Soldiers arrested all members of the order in the realm and escorted them, with no possessions but the clothes they wore, to the nearest port or frontier, whence they were deported to the Papal States. Ferdinand IV, reaching the age of sixteen in 1767, ended Tanucci's regency. A year later he married Maria Carolina, pious daughter of Maria Teresa. She soon dominated her husband and led a reaction against Tanucci's anti-clerical policies. The Marchese's reforms had strengthened the Neapolitan monarchy against the feudal barons in the church, but they had done little to mitigate the poverty that left to the populace no hope but in another life. Sicily followed a similar curve. The erection of the Cathedral of Palermo from 1782 to 1802 was a far more moment to the people than the attempt of Domenico di Caraccioli to tame the feudal lords who controlled the land. He had served many years as Neapolitan ambassador in London and Paris, and had listened to Protestants and philosophers. Appointed viceroy of Sicily in 1781, he laid heavy taxes upon the great landowners, reduced their feudal rights over their serfs, and ended their privileges of choosing the local magistrates. But when he dared to imprison a prince who protected bandits and decreed a reduction of two days in the holidays honoring Palermo's patron St. Rosalia, all classes rose against him, and he returned to Naples in defeat in 1785. The philosophers had not yet proved that they understood better than the Church the needs and nature of man. 2. Popes, Kings, and Jesuits The power of the Catholic Church rested on the natural supernaturalism of mankind, the recognition and sublimation of sensual impulses and pagan survivals, the encouragement of Catholic fertility, and the inculcation of a theology rich in poetry and hope and useful to moral discipline and social order. In Italy, the Church was also the main source of national income and a valued check upon a people especially superstitious, pagan, and passionate. Superstitions abounded. As late as 1787, witches were burned at Palermo, and refreshments were served to fashionable ladies witnessing the scene. Pagan beliefs, customs, and ceremonies survived with the genial sanction of the Church. I have arrived at a vivid conviction, wrote Goethe, that all traces of original Christianity are extinct here in Rome. There were, however, many real Christians left in Christendom, even in Italy. Conte Caisotti di Chiusano, Bishop of Asti, gave up his rich inheritance, lived in voluntary poverty, and traveled only on foot. Bishop Testa of Monreale slept on straw, ate only enough to subsist, kept only three hundred lire of his revenues for his personal needs, and devoted the remainder to public works and the poor. The Church responded in some measure to the Enlightenment. The works of Voltaire, Rousseau, Diderot, Helvetius, Dolbach, La Métrie, and other freethinkers were of course placed on the Index Expurgatorius, but permission to read them might be obtained from the Pope. Monsignor Ventimiglio, bishop, from 1757 to 73, of Catania, had in his library full editions of Voltaire, Helvetius, and Rousseau. The Inquisition was abolished in Tuscany and Parma in 1769, in Sicily in 1782, 
in Rome in 1809. In 1783, a Catholic priest, Tamburini, under the name of his friend Trautmannsdorf, published an essay on ecclesiastical and civil toleration, in which he condemned the Inquisition, declared all coercion of conscience to be unchristian, and advocated toleration of all theologies except atheism. It was the misfortune of the popes in this second half of the 18th century that they had to face the demand of Catholic monarchs for the total dissolution of the Society of Jesus. The movement against the Jesuits was part of a contest of power between the triumphant nationalism of the modern state and the internationalism of a papacy weakened by the Reformation, the Enlightenment, and the rise of the business class. The Catholic enemies of the Society did not openly press their chief objection— that it had persistently upheld the authority of the popes as superior to that of kings, but they were keenly resentful that an organization acknowledging no superior except its general and the pope should in effect constitute within each state an agent of a foreign power. They acknowledged the learning and piety of the Jesuits, their contributions to science, literature, philosophy, and art, their sedulous and efficient education of Catholic youth, their heroism on foreign missions— their recapture of so much territory once lost to Protestantism. But they charged that the society had repeatedly interfered in secular affairs, that it had engaged in commerce to reap material gains, that it had inculcated casuistic principles excusing immorality and crime, condoning even the murder of kings, that it had allowed heathen customs and beliefs to survive among its supposed converts in Asia and that it had offended other religious orders and many of the secular clergy by its sharpness in controversy and its contemptuous tone. The ambassadors of the kings of Portugal, Spain, Naples, and France insisted that the papal charter of the society be revoked and that the organization be officially and universally dissolved. The expulsion of the Jesuits from Portugal in 1759, from France in 1764-67, from Spain and Naples in 1767, had left the society still operative in central and northern Italy, in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, in Catholic Germany, Silesia, and Poland. On February 7, 1768, they were expelled from the Bourbon Duchy of Parma and were added to the congestion of Jesuit refugees in the states of the Church. Pope Clement XIII protested that Parma was a papal fief, He threatened Duke Ferdinand VI and his ministers with excommunication if the edict of expulsion should be enforced. When they persisted, he launched a bull declaring the rank and title of the Duke forfeited and annulled. The Catholic governments of Spain, Naples, and France opened war upon the papacy. Tanucci seized the papal cities of Benevento and Ponte Corvo, and France occupied Avignon. On December 10, 1768, the French ambassador at Rome, in the name of France, Naples, and Spain, presented to the Pope a demand for the retraction of the bull against Parma and for the abolition of the Society of Jesus. The 76-year-old pontiff collapsed under the strain of this ultimatum. He summoned for February 3, 1769, a consistory of prelates and envoys to consider the matter. On February 2, he fell dead through the bursting of a blood vessel in his brain. The cardinals who were called to choose his successor were divided into two factions, Zelanti, who proposed to defy the kings, and Regalisti, who favored some pacific accommodations. As the Italian cardinals were almost all Zelanti, and soon gathered in Rome, they tried to open the conclave before the Regalist cardinals from France, Spain, and Portugal could arrive. The French ambassador protested, and the conclave was deferred. Meanwhile, Lorenzo Ricci, general of the Jesuits, compromised their case by issuing a pamphlet questioning the authority of any pope to abolish the society. In March, Cardinal de Berny arrived from France and began to canvass the cardinals with a view to ensuring the election of a pope willing to satisfy their Catholic majesties. Later rumors that he or others bribed or otherwise induced Cardinal Giovanni Ganganelli to promise such action, if chosen, have been rejected by Catholic and anti-Catholic historians alike. Ganganelli, by common consent, was a man of great learning, devotion, and integrity. However, he belonged to the Franciscan order, which had often been at odds with the Jesuits, both in missions and in theology. 
On May 19, 1769, he was elected by the unanimous vote of the forty cardinals and took the name of Clement XIV. He was sixty-three years old. He found himself at the mercy of the Catholic powers. France and Naples held on to the papal territory they had seized. Spain and Parma were defiant. Portugal threatened to establish a patriarchate independent of Rome. Even Maria Theresa, hitherto fervently loyal to the papacy and the Jesuits, but now losing authority to her freethinker son Joseph II, answered the Pope's appeal for aid by saying that she could not resist the united will of so many potentates. Choiseul, dominating the government of France, instructed Berny to tell the Pope that if he does not come to terms he can consider all relations with France at an end. Charles III of Spain had sent a similar ultimatum on April 22nd. Clement, playing for time, promised Charles soon to submit to the wisdom and intelligence of your majesty a plan for the total extinction of the society. He ordered his aides to consult the archives and summarize the history, achievements, and alleged offenses of the Society of Jesus. He refused to surrender to Choiseul's demand that he decide the issue within two months. He took three years, but finally yielded. On July 21st, 1773... He signed the historic brief Dominus Ac Redemptor Noster. It began with a long list of religious congregations that had, in the course of time, been suppressed by the Holy See. It noted the many complaints made against the Jesuits and the many efforts of divers popes to remedy the abuses so alleged. We have observed with the bitterest grief that these remedies and others applied afterward had neither efficacy nor strength to put an end to the troubles, the charges, and the complaints. The brief concluded, Having recognized that the Society of Jesus could no longer produce the abundant fruit and the great good for which it was instituted and approved by so many popes, our predecessors, who adorned it with so many most admirable privileges, and seeing that it was almost and indeed absolutely impossible for the Church to enjoy a true and solid peace while this order existed, we do hereby, after a mature examination, and of our certain knowledge and by the plenitude of our apostolic power, suppress and abolish the Society of Jesus. We nullify and abrogate all and each of its offices, functions, administrations, houses, schools, colleges, retreats, refuges, and other establishments, which belong to it in any manner whatever, and in every province, kingdom, or state in which it may be found. The brief went on to offer pensions to those Jesuits who had not yet taken holy orders, and who wished to return to lay life. It permitted Jesuit priests to join the secular clergy or some religious congregation approved by the Holy See. It allowed professed Jesuits, who had taken final and absolute vows, to remain in their former houses, provided they dressed like secular priests and submitted to the authority of the local bishop. For the most part, and excepting a few missionaries in China, the Jesuits took the papal sentence of death for their society with apparent docility and order. Anonymous pamphlets, however, were printed and circulated in their defense, and Ricci and several assistants were arrested on charges, never proved, that they were in correspondence with opponents of the decree. Ricci died in prison November 24th, 1775, aged 72. Clement XIV survived the edict by little more than a year. Rumors multiplied that in his last months his mind broke down. Physical ills, including scurvy and hemorrhoids, made every day and night a misery to him. A cold contracted in April 1774 never left him. By the end of August, the cardinals were already discussing the succession, and on September 22nd, Clement died. After many delays and intrigues, the conclave raised to the papacy on February 15th, 1775, Giovanni Braschi, who took the name of Pius VI. He was a man of culture rather than a statesman. He collected art, charmed everyone by his kindliness, improved the administration of the curia, and effected a partial reclamation of the Pontine Marshes. He arranged a peaceful modus vivendi for the Jesuits with Frederick the Great. In 1793 he joined the coalition against revolutionary France. In 1796 Napoleon invaded the Papal States. In 1798 the French army entered Rome, 
proclaimed a republic, and demanded of the Pope a renunciation of all temporal power. He refused, was arrested, and remained in various places and conditions of imprisonment until his death on August 29, 1799. His successor, Pius VII, made the restoration of the Society of Jesus in 1814 a part of the victory of the coalition against Napoleon. 3. THE LAW AND Beccaria. The morals and manners of Italy remained a mixture of violence and indolence, vendetta and love. The fourteen-year-old Mozart wrote from Bologna in 1770, Italy is a sleepy country. He had not learned the philosophy of siesta. His father, in 1775, was of the opinion that Italians are rascals all the world over. Both Mozart and Goethe commented on Italian crime. In Naples, wrote Mozart, the Lazzaroni, beggars, have their own captain or head who draws twenty-five silver ducats from the king each month for nothing more than to keep them in order. What strikes the stranger most, wrote Goethe, is the common occurrence of assassination. Today the victim has been an excellent artist, Schwendemann. The assassin with whom he was struggling gave him twenty stabs, and as the watch came up the villain stabbed himself. This is not generally the fashion here. The murderer usually makes for the nearest church. Once there he is quite safe. Every church gave the criminal sanctuary, immunity from arrest so long as he remained under its roof. The law attempted to deter crime rather by severity of punishment than by efficiency of police. Under the laws of the gentle Benedict the Fourteenth, blasphemy was punished by flogging, and for a third offense, five years in the galleys. Unlawful entry of a convent at night was a capital crime. The solicitation or public embrace of an honorable woman brought condemnation to the galleys for life. Defamation of character, even if it spoke nothing but the truth, was punishable with death and confiscation of goods. Pasquinades abounded nonetheless. A like penalty was decreed for carrying concealed pistols. These edicts were in many areas evaded by flight to a neighboring state, or by the mercy of a judge, or by sanctuary of a church, but in several instances they were strictly carried out. One man was hanged for pretending that he was a priest, another for stealing an ecclesiastical vestment which he sold for one and a quarter francs. Another was beheaded for writing a letter that accused Pope Clement XI of a liaison with Maria Clementina Sobieska. As late as 1762, prisoners were broken on the wheel, bone after bone, or were dragged over the ground at the tail of a prodded horse. We should add, as a brighter side to the picture, that some confraternities raised money to pay the fines and secure the liberation of prisoners. Reform of the law in both its procedure and its penalties became a natural part of that humanitarian spirit born from the double parentage of a humanist enlightenment and a Christian ethic freed from a cruel theology. It is to the credit of Italy that the most effective appeal for law reform came in this century from a Milanese nobleman. Cesare Bonesana, Marchese di Beccaria, was a product of the Jesuits and the Philosoph. Though rich enough to be idle, he gave himself with restless devotion to a career of philosophical writing and practical reform. He refrained from attacking the religion of the people, but confronted directly the actual conditions of crime and punishment. He was shocked to see the disease-breeding filth of Milanese jails, and to hear from prisoners how and why they had taken to crime, and how they had been tried. He was dismayed to find flagrant irregularities in procedure— inhuman tortures of suspects and witnesses, arbitrary severities and mercies in judgment, and barbarous cruelties in punishment. About 1761 he joined with Pietro Veri in a society which they called De Pugni, the fists, bowed to action as well as thought. In 1764 they started a review, Il Café, an imitation of Addison's Spectator, and in that year Beccaria published his historic Treatise on Crimes and Penalties. He modestly announced at the outset that he was following the lead of the spirit of laws of the immortal president of the Bordeaux Parlement. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now.
The Story of Civilization, Volume 10, Rousseau and Revolution, by Will and Ariel Durant, Part 1, Continued, Cassette 13, Side 2. He modestly announced at the outset that he was following the lead of the spirit of laws of the immortal president of the Bordeaux Parlement. Laws should be based upon reason. Their basic reason is not to avenge crime, but to preserve social order. They should always aim at the greatest happiness divided among the greatest number. Here, twenty-five years before Bentham, was the famous principle of utilitarian ethics. Beccaria, with his customary candor, acknowledged the influence of Helvetius, who had offered the same formula in De L'Esprit of 1758. It had already appeared in Francis Hutcheson's Ideas of Beauty and Virtue from 1725. For the good of society, said Beccaria, it would be wiser to widen and deepen education in the hope of diminishing crime than to resort to punishments that, by association, may transform an incidental miscreant into a confirmed criminal. Every accused person should have a fair and public trial before competent magistrates pledged to impartiality. Trial should come soon after accusation. Punishment should be proportioned not to the intention of the agent, but to the harm done to society. Ferocity of punishment breeds ferocity of character, even in the non-criminal public. Torture should never be used. A guilty man accustomed to pain may bear it well and be supposed innocent, while an innocent man with keener nerves may be driven by it to confess anything and be judged guilty. Ecclesiastical sanctuary for criminals should no longer be allowed. Capital punishment should be abolished. The little book went through six editions in eighteen months and was translated into twenty-two European languages. Beccaria praised the French version by Morellet as superior to the original. Voltaire contributed an anonymous preface to that translation and repeatedly acknowledged the influence of Beccaria on his own efforts at law reform. Most Italian states soon reformed their penal codes, and nearly all Europe discarded torture by 1789. Catherine was moved by Beccaria as well as Voltaire in abolishing torture in her dominions. Frederick the Great had already ended it in Prussia in 1740, except for treason. In 1768, Beccaria was appointed to a chair of law and economy founded expressly for him in the Palatine College at Milan. In 1790, he was named to a commission for the reform of jurisprudence in Lombardy. His lectures anticipated several basic ideas of Adam Smith and Malthus on the division of labor, the relation between labor and capital, and between population and the food supply. In him, the humanism of the Renaissance was reborn as the Enlightenment in Italy. 4. Adventurers Giuseppe Balsamo was born to a shopkeeper in Palermo in 1743. He matured early and was soon an accomplished thief. At thirteen, he was entered as a novice in the monastery of the Benfratelli. There he was assigned to aid the house apothecary, from whose bottles, tubes, and books he learned enough chemistry and alchemy to equip himself for quackery. Required to read the lives of the saints to the friars as they ate, he substituted for the names of the saints those of Palermo's most distinguished prostitutes. Flogged, he decamped, joined the underworld, and studied the art of eating without working. He served as a pimp, a forger, a counterfeiter, a fortune-teller, a magician, and a robber, usually with such concealment of his traces that the police could convict him only of insolence. Seeing himself uncomfortably suspect, he moved to Messina, crossed to Reggio Calabria, and sampled the opportunities of Naples and Rome. For a while he lived by touching up prints and selling them as his own. He married Lorenza Feliciani, and prospered by selling her body. Taking the name of Marchese de Pellegrini, he brought his lucrative lady to Venice, Marseille, Paris, London. He arranged to have his wife discovered in the arms of a rich Quaker. The resultant blackmail supported them for months. He changed his name to Count di Cagliostro, put on whiskers and the uniform of a Prussian colonel, and rechristened his wife Countess Serafina. He returned to Palermo, was arrested as a forger, but was released on the ominous insistence of his friends, who terrified the law. 
As Serafina's charms were worn with circulation, he put his chemistry to use, concocting and selling drugs guaranteed to flatten wrinkles and set love aflame. Back in England, he was accused of stealing a diamond necklace and spent a spell in jail. He joined the Freemasons, moved to Paris, and set himself up as the Grand Copter of Egyptian Masonry. He assured a hundred gullibles that he had found the ancient secrets of rejuvenation, which could be obtained through a forty days course of purges, sweats, root diet, phlebotomy, and theosophy. As soon as he was exposed in one city, he went on to another, winning access to moneyed families by his Masonic grip and ring. In St. Petersburg, he practiced as a doctor, treated the poor gratis, and was received by Potemkin. But Catherine the Great's physician, a canny Scot, analyzed some of the doctor's elixirs and found them worthless. Cagliostro was given a day to pack and depart. In Warsaw, he was exposed by another physician in a booklet, Cagliostro de Masque, in 1780. But before it could catch up with him, he was off to Vienna, Frankfurt, Strasbourg. There he charmed Cardinal Prince Louis-René Edouard de Rohan, who placed in his palace a bust of the Grand Copte inscribed the Divine Cagliostro. The Cardinal brought him to Paris, and the great impostor was unwittingly involved in the affair of the diamond necklace. When this hoax was exposed, Cagliostro was sent to the Bastille. He was soon liberated as innocent, but was ordered to leave France in 1786. He found a new clientele in London. Meanwhile, Goethe visited Cagliostro's mother in Sicily and assured her that her famous son had been acquitted and was safe. From London, where doubters had multiplied, the Count and Countess moved to Basel, Turin, Rovereto, Trent, everywhere suspected and expelled. Serafina begged to be taken to Rome to pray at her mother's grave. The Count agreed. In Rome they tried to set up a lodge of his Egyptian Freemasonry, the Inquisition arrested them on December 29, 1789. They confessed their charlatanry. Cagliostro was sentenced to life imprisonment and ended his days in the castle of San Leo, near Pizarro, in 1795, aged 52. He, too, was part of the picture of the illuminated century. 2. Casanova Giovanni Jacopo Casanova added the lordly de saint Gall to his name by a random plucking of the alphabet, as a useful honorific in overwhelming nuns and braving the governments of Europe. Born to two actors in Venice in 1725, he gave early promise of mental alacrity. He was apprenticed to the law and claimed to have received the doctorate at the University of Padua when he was sixteen. At every step in his engaging memoirs we must beware of his imagination— but he tells his story with such self-damning candor that we may believe him, though we know he lies. While at Padua he made his first conquest, Bettina, a pretty girl of thirteen, sister of his tutor, the good priest Gozzi. When she fell ill of smallpox, Casanova nursed her and caught the disease. By his own account, his acts of kindness equaled his amours. In his old age, going to Padua for the last time, I found her old, ill, and poor, and she died in my arms. Nearly all his sweethearts are represented as loving him until his death. Despite his law degree, he suffered from a humiliating poverty. His father was dead, his mother was acting in cities as far away as St. Petersburg, and usually forgot him. He earned some bread by fiddling in taverns and streets. But he was strong as well as handsome and brave. When, in 1746, the Venetian senator Juan Bragadino suffered a stroke while descending a stairway, Jacopo caught him in his arms and saved him from a precipitate fall. Thereafter, the senator protected him in a dozen scrapes and gave him funds to visit France, Germany, and Austria. At Lyon, he joined the Freemasons. At Paris, I became a companion, then a master of the order." We note with some shock that in my time no one in France knew how to overcharge. In 1753 he returned to Venice and soon caught the attention of the government by peddling occult wisdom. A year later an official inquisitor reported on him to the Senate. He has insinuated himself into the good graces of the noble Juan Bragadino and has fleeced him grievously. Benedetto Pisano tells me that Casanova is by way of being a cabalistic philosopher 
and, by false reasoning cleverly adapted to the minds he works on, contrives to get his livelihood. He has made Bragadino believe that he can evoke the angel of light for his benefit. Furthermore, the report continues, Casanova had sent to his friends compositions that revealed him as an impious freethinker. Casanova tells us, A certain Madame Memno took it into her head that I was teaching her son the precepts of atheism. The things I was accused of concerned the Holy Office, and the Holy Office is a ferocious beast with whom it is dangerous to meddle. There were certain circumstances which made it difficult for them to shut me up in the ecclesiastical prisons of the Inquisition, and because of this it was finally decided that the State Inquisition should deal with me. Bragadino advised him to leave Venice. Casanova refused. The next morning he was arrested, his papers were confiscated, and he was confined without trial in Ipiombi, the Leds, a name given to the Venetian state prison from the plates on its roof. When night came it was impossible for me to close my eyes for three reasons. First, the rats. Second, the terrible din made by the clock of St. Mark's, which sounded as if it were in my room. And third, the thousands of fleas which invaded my body, bit and stung me, poisoning my blood to such an extent that I suffered from spasmodic constrictions amounting to convulsions. He was sentenced to five years, but after fifteen months of incarceration he escaped in 1757 by a complication of devices, risks, and terrors, whose narrative became part of his stock in trade in a dozen lands. Arrived a second time in Paris, he fought a duel with the young Comte Nicolas de la Tour d'Auvergne, wounded him, healed him with a magic ointment, won his friendship, and was introduced by him to a rich aunt, Madame Durfey, who devoutly believed in occult powers and hoped through them to change her sex. Casanova played upon her credulity and found in it a secret means of opulence. I cannot, now that I am old, look back upon this chapter of my life without blushing. But it lasted through a dozen chapters of his book. He added to his income by cheating at cards, by organizing a lottery for the French government, and by obtaining a loan for France from the United Provinces. En route from Paris to Brussels, I read Helvetius's De l'Esprit all the way. He was to offer to conservatives a persuasive example of the libertin, free thinker, becoming a libertine, though the sequence was probably the reverse. At every stop he picked a mistress. At many stops he found a former mistress. Now and then he stumbled upon his own unpremeditated progeny. He visited Rousseau at Montmorency and Voltaire at Ferney in 1760. We have already enjoyed part of that tete-a-tete. If we may believe Casanova, he took the occasion to reprove Voltaire for exposing the absurdities of the popular mythology. Casanova. Suppose you do succeed in destroying superstition. With what will you replace it? Voltaire. I like that. When I have delivered humanity from a ferocious monster that devours it, you ask what shall I put in its place? Casanova. Superstition does not devour humanity. It is, on the contrary, necessary to its existence. Voltaire. Necessary to its existence? That is a horrible blasphemy. I love mankind. I would like to see it as I am free and happy. Superstition and liberty cannot go hand in hand. Do you think that slavery makes for happiness? Casanova. What you want, then, is the supremacy of the people? Voltaire. God forbid, the masses must have a king to govern them. Casanova. In that case, superstition is necessary, for the people would never give a mere man the right to rule them. Voltaire. I want a sovereign ruling a free people, and bound to them by reciprocal conditions which should prevent any inclination to despotism on his part. Casanova. Addison says that such a sovereign is impossible. I agree with Hobbes. Between two evils one must choose the lesser. A nation freed from superstition would be a nation of philosophers, and philosophers do not know how to obey. There is no happiness for a people that is not crushed, kept down, and held in leash. Voltaire. Horrible! And you are of the people! Casanova. Your master passion is love of humanity. This love blinds you. Love humanity, but love it as it is. Humanity is not susceptible to the benefits you wish to shower upon it. These would only make it more wretched and perverse. 
Voltaire. I am sorry you have such a bad opinion of your fellow creatures. Wherever he went, Casanova made his way into some aristocratic homes, for many of the European nobility were Freemasons or Rosicrucians or addicts of occult lore. He not only claimed esoteric knowledge in these fields, but in addition had a good figure, a distinguished, though not handsome, face, a command of languages, a seductive self-assurance, a fund of stories and wit, and a mysterious ability to win at cards or in casino games. Everywhere he was sooner or later escorted to jail or the frontier. Now and then he had to fight a duel, but like a nation in its histories, he never lost. At last he succumbed to longing for his native land. He was free to travel anywhere in Italy except Venice. He repeatedly applied for permission to come back. It was finally granted, and in 1775 he was in Venice again. He was employed by the government as a spy. His reports were discarded as containing too much philosophy and too little information. He was dismissed. Relapsing into his youthful ways, he wrote a satire on the patrician Grimaldi. He was told to leave Venice or face another stay in the Leads. He fled to Vienna in 1782, to Spa, and to Paris. There he met a Count von Falstein, who took a fancy to him and invited him to serve as his librarian in the castle of Dukes in Bohemia. Casanova's arts of love and magic and sleight of hand had reached the point of diminishing returns. He accepted the post at a thousand florins per year. Arrived and installed, he was grieved to find that he was considered a servant and dined in the servants' hall. At Dukes he spent his final fourteen years. There he wrote his Histoire de ma vie, principally to palliate the deadly dullness which is killing me in this dull Bohemia. By writing ten or twelve hours a day I have prevented black sorrow from eating up my poor heart and destroying my reason. He professed absolute veracity in his narrative, and in many cases it jibes well enough with history. Often, however, we find no verification of his account. Perhaps his memory declined while his imagination grew. We can only say that his book is one of the most fascinating relics of the eighteenth century. Casanova lived long enough to mourn the death of the old regime. Oh, my dear, my beautiful France, where in those days things went so well, despite lettre de cachet, despite the corvée and the misery of the people. Dear France, what have you become today? The people is your sovereign, the people, most brutal and tyrannical of all rulers. And so on his last day, June 4th, 1798, he ended his career in timely piety. I have lived a philosopher, and I die a Christian. He had mistaken sensualism for philosophy, and Pascal's wager for Christianity. 5. Binkelmann By contrast, let us look at an idealist. The most influential figure in the art history of this age was not an artist, but a scholar whose mature life was dedicated to the history of art and whose strange death moved the soul of literate Europe. He was born on December 9, 1717, at Stendhal in Brandenburg. His cobbler father hoped he would be a cobbler, but Johann wished to study Latin. He paid for his early education by singing. Eager and industrious, he advanced rapidly. He tutored less able pupils and bought books and food. When his teacher went blind, Johann read to him and devoured his master's library. He learned Latin and Greek thoroughly, but he had no interest in modern foreign languages. Hearing that the library of the late Johann Albert Fabricius, a famous classical scholar, was to be sold at auction, he walked 178 miles from Berlin to Hamburg, bought Greek and Latin classics, and carried them on his shoulders back to Berlin. In 1738 he entered the University of Halle as a theological student. He did not care for theology, but he seized the opportunity to study Hebrew. After graduating, he lived by tutoring. He read twice completely Bale's Dictionnaire Historique et Critique, presumably with some effect upon his religious faith. In one year he read the Iliad and the Odyssey thrice through in Greek. In 1743 he accepted an invitation to be associate director of a school at Seehausen in Altmark, at a salary of 250 dollars per year. During the day he taught 
children with scabby heads their ABC, whilst I was ardently longing to attain to a knowledge of the beautiful, and was repeating similes from Homer. In the evening he tutored for his lodging and meals, then he studied the classics till midnight, slept till four, studied the classics again, then went wearily to teach. He gladly accepted a call from Count von Bunau to be assistant librarian in the chateau at Nürtinitz, near Dresden, for lodging and fifty to eighty dollars a year, this in 1748. There he reveled in one of the most extensive book collections of the time. Among those who used this library was Cardinal Arquinto, papal nuncio at the court of the Elector of Saxony. He was impressed by Winkelmann's learning and enthusiasm, his emaciation and pallor. "'You should go to Italy,' he told him. Johann replied that such a trip was the deepest desire of his heart, but beyond his means. Invited to visit the nuncio in Dresden, Winkelmann went several times. He was delighted by the erudition and the courtesy of the Jesuits he met in the nuncio's home. Cardinal Passionei, who had three hundred thousand volumes in Rome, offered him the post of librarian there for board and seventy ducats. However, the post could be filled only by a Catholic. Winkelmann agreed to conversion. As he had already expressed his belief that after death you have nothing to dread, nothing to hope, he found no theological, only social difficulties in making the change. To a friend who reproached him, he wrote, It is the love of knowledge and that alone which can induce me to listen to the proposal that has been made to me. On July 11, 1754, in the chapel of the nuncio at Dresden, he professed his new faith and arrangements were made for his journey to Rome. For various reasons, he remained for another year in Dresden, living and studying with the painter-sculptor etcher Adam Ursen. In May 1755, he published in a limited edition of fifty copies his first book, Thoughts on the Imitation of Greek Works in Painting and Sculpture. Besides describing the antiques that had been gathered in Dresden, he contended that the Greek understanding of nature was superior to the modern, and that this was the secret of Hellenic preeminence in art. He concluded that the only way for us to become great, indeed to become inimitably great, is through imitation of the ancients. And he thought that of all modern artists, Raphael had done this best. This little volume marked the beginning of the neoclassic movement in modern art. It was well received. Klopstock and Gottsched joined in praising both its erudition and its style. Father Rauch, confessor to Frederick Augustus, secured for Winkelmann from the Elector King, a pension of two hundred dollars for each of the next two years, and provided him with eighty ducats for the trip to Rome. At last, on September 20th, 1755, Winkelmann set out for Italy in the company of a young Jesuit. He was already thirty-seven years old. Arrived in Rome, he had trouble at the customs house, which confiscated several volumes of Voltaire from his baggage. These were returned to him later. He found lodging with five painters in a house on the Pynchon Hill, sanctified by the shades of Nicolas Poussin and Claude Lorrain. He met Menx, who helped him in a hundred ways. Cardinal Passionet gave him the freedom of his library, but Winkelmann, wishing to explore the art of Rome, refused as yet any regular employment. He obtained permission for repeated visits to the Belvedere of the Vatican. He spent hours before the Apollo, the Torso, and the Laocoon, in contemplation of these sculptures, his ideas took clearer form. He visited Tivoli, Frascati, and other suburbs containing ancient remains. His knowledge of classical art won him the friendship of Cardinal Alessandro Albani. Cardinal Arquinto gave him an apartment in the Palazzo della Cancelleria, the papal chancellery. In return, Winkelmann reorganized the palace library. Now he was almost ecstatically happy. God owed me this, he said. In my youth I suffered too much. And to a friend in Germany he wrote as a hundred distinguished visitors were writing, All is not compared with Rome. Formerly I thought that I had thoroughly studied everything, and behold, when I came hither I perceived that I knew nothing. Here I have become smaller than when I came out of school to the Bunau Library. If you wish to learn to know men, here is the place. Here are heads of infinite talent, men of high endowments, beauties of the lofty character which the Greeks have given to their figures. 
as the freedom enjoyed in other states is only a shadow compared to that of Rome, which probably strikes you as a paradox, so there is also in this place a different mode of thinking. Rome is, I believe, the high school of the world, and I too have been tried and refined. In October 1757, armed with letters of introduction, he left Rome for Naples. There he lived in a monastery, but he dined with men like Tanucci and Galliani. He visited cities redolent with classic history, Pozzuoli, Baia, Mycenaeum, Cumi, and stood in wonder before the stately temples of Pestum. In May 1758 he returned to Rome laden with antiquarian lore. In that month he was called to Florence to catalogue and describe the enormous collection of gems, casts, engravings, maps, and manuscripts left by Baron Philipp von Stosch. The task occupied him for nearly a year, and almost ruined his health. Meanwhile, Arquinto died, and Frederick the Great ravaged Saxony. Winkelmann lost his apartment in the Cancelleria, and his pension from the unfortunate Elector King. Albani came to his rescue by offering him four rooms and ten scudi per month to take care of his library. The cardinal himself was a fervent antiquarian. Every Sunday he drove out with Winkelmann to hunt antiquities. Winkelmann added to his reputation by issuing scholarly monographs on grace in works of art, remarks upon the architecture of the ancients, description of the torso in the Belvedere, the study of works of art. In 1760 he tried to arrange a trip to Greece with Lady Orford, sister-in-law of Horace Walpole. The plan fell through. Nothing in the world have I so ardently desired as this, he wrote. Willingly would I allow one of my fingers to be cut off. Indeed, I would make myself a priest of Sibylle, could I but see this land under such an opportunity. The priests of Sibylle had to be eunuchs, but this did not prevent Winkelmann from denouncing an old ordinance of the Roman government requiring the private parts of the Apollo, the Laocoon, and other statues in the Belvedere to be covered by metal aprons. There has hardly ever been in Rome, he declared, so asinine a regulation. The sense of beauty was so dominant in him that it almost annulled any consciousness of sex. If he felt an aesthetic preference, it favored the beauty of the virile male figure rather than the frail and transitory loveliness of woman. The muscular torso of Hercules seems to have moved him more than the soft and rounded contours of the Venus de Medici. He had a good word to say for hermaphrodites, at least for the one in the Villa Borghese. He protested, I have never been an enemy of the other sex, but my mode of life has removed me from all intercourse with it. I might have married, and probably should have done so, if I had revisited my native land, but now I scarcely think of it. In Seehausen, his friendship with his pupil Lamprecht had taken the place of feminine attachments. In Rome, he lived with ecclesiastics and seldom met young women. For a long time, we are told, there dined with him on Saturdays a young Roman, slender, fair, and tall, with whom he talked of love. He caused a portrait to be painted of a beautiful castrato. He dedicated to the youthful Baron Friedrich Reinhold von Berg a treatise on the capability of the feeling for beauty. Readers found in it and in the letters to Berg the language not of friendship but of love, and such it actually is. In 1762 and 1764 he visited Naples again. His letter on the antiquities of Herculaneum, from 1762, and his account of the latest Herculanean discoveries, from 1764, gave European scholars the first orderly and scientific information about the treasures excavated there and at Pompeii. He was now recognized as the supreme authority on ancient classical art. In 1763 he received an office in the Vatican as antiquarian to the Apostolic Chamber. Finally, in 1764, he published the massive volumes that he had been writing and illustrating for seven years, History of Ancient Art. Despite its long and painstaking preparation, it contained many errors, two of which were cruel hoaxes. His friend Manx had foisted upon him, as faithful reproductions of antique paintings, two drawings born of Manx's imagination. 
Finkelmann listed these paintings, used the engravings, and dedicated the entire work to Mengs. The translations that soon appeared in French and Italian carried nearly all the errors to Winkelmann's mortification. "'We are wiser today than we were yesterday,' he wrote to some friends. "'Would to God I could show you my history of art entirely remodeled and considerably enlarged. "'I had not yet learned to write when I took it in hand. "'The thoughts were not yet sufficiently linked together. "'There is wanting in many cases the transition from what precedes to what follows, "'in which the greatest art consists.' And yet the book had accomplished a very difficult task, to write well about art. His intense devotion to his subject lifted him to style. He addressed himself literally to the history of art rather than the much easier history of artists. After a hurried survey of Egyptian, Phoenician, Jewish, Persian, and Etruscan art, Winkelmann let all his enthusiasm loose in 450 pages on the classical art of the Greeks. In some final chapters he discussed Greek art under the Romans. Always his emphasis was on the Greeks, for he was convinced that they had found the highest forms of beauty. In the refinement of line rather than in brilliance of color, in the representation of types rather than individuals, in the normality and nobility of the figure, in the restraint of emotional expression, in the serenity of aspect, in the repose of features even in action, and above all in the harmonious proportion and relation of differentiated parts in a logically unified whole. Greek art to Winkelmann was the age of reason in form. He connected the superiority of Greek art with the high regard that the Greeks paid to excellence of form in either sex. Beauty was an excellence that led to fame, for we find that the Greek histories make mention of those who were distinguished for it as histories now record great statesmen, poets, and philosophers. There were beauty contests as well as athletic contests among the Greeks. Winkelmann thought that political freedom and Greek leadership of the Mediterranean world before the Peloponnesian War led to a synthesis of grandeur with beauty and produced the grand style in Phidias, Polycletus, and Myron. In the next stage, the grand gave way to the beautiful style, or style of grace. Phidias gave way to Praxiteles, and decline began. Freedom in art was part of Greek freedom. Artists were liberated from rigid rules and dared to create ideal forms not found in nature. They imitated nature only in details. The whole was a composite of perfections found only in part in any natural object. Winkelmann was a romantic, preaching classic form. His book was accepted throughout Europe as an event in the history of literature and art. Frederick the Great sent him an invitation in 1765 to come to Berlin as superintendent of the Royal Library and Cabinet of Antiquities. Winkelmann agreed to come for $2,000 per year. Frederick offered $1,000. Winkelmann stood his ground and recalled the story of the castrato who demanded a fat sum for his songs. Frederick complained that he asked more than his best general cost him. E bene, said the castrato, faccia cantare il suo generale. Very well, then, let him make his general sing. In 1765, Winkelmann revisited Naples, this time in company with John Wilkes, who had made Europe resound with his defiance of Parliament and George III. After gathering more data, he returned to Rome and completed his second major work, Monumenti Antichi Inediti, in 1767. His prelate friends had complained of his writing the history in German, which was not yet a major medium of scholarship. Now he pleased them by using Italian, and the happy author, seated between two cardinals, had the ecstasy of reading a part of his book at Castel Gandolfo to Clement XIII and a numerous assembly of notables. However, he was accused of having heretical books and making heretical remarks, and he never obtained from the papacy the post which he felt he deserved. Perhaps in hope that he might there secure the means of seeing Greece, he decided to visit Germany in 1768. But he had so immersed himself in classic art and Italian ways that he took no pleasure in his native land. He ignored its scenery and resented its Baroque architecture and ornament. Let us return to Rome, he repeated a hundred times to his traveling companion. 
He was received with honors in music, where he was presented a beautiful antique gem. At Vienna, Maria Theresa gave him costly medallions, and both the Empress and Prince von Kaunitz invited him to settle there. But on May 28th, after hardly a month's absence, he turned back to Italy. At Trieste, he was delayed while waiting for a ship that would take him to Ancona. During these days, he developed acquaintance with another traveler, Francesco Arcangeli. They took walks together and occupied adjoining rooms in the hotel. Soon, Winkelmann showed him the medallions he had received in Vienna. He did not, so far as we know, show his gold-filled purse. On the morning of June 8, 1768, Arcangeli entered Winkelmann's room, found him seated at a table, and threw a noose around his neck. Winkelmann rose and fought. Arcangeli stabbed him five times and fled. A physician bandaged the wounds but pronounced them fatal. Winkelmann received the last sacrament, made his will, expressed a desire to see and forgive his assailant, and died at four o'clock in the afternoon. Trieste commemorates him with a handsome monument. Arcangeli was captured on June 14th. He confessed, and on June 18th he was sentenced. For the crime of murder done by you on the body of Johann Winkelmann, the Imperial Criminal Court has decreed that you shall be broken alive on the wheel, from the head to the feet, until your soul depart from your body. On July 20th it was so done. The limitations of Winkelmann were bound up with geography. Because he never realized his hope of visiting Greece under conditions that would have allowed extensive study of classic remains, he thought of Greek art in terms of Greco-Roman art as found in the museums, collections, and palaces of Germany and Italy, and in the relics of Herculaneum and Pompeii. His predilection for sculpture over painting, for the representation of types rather than individuals, for tranquility as against the expression of emotion, for proportion and symmetry, for imitation of the ancients as against originality and experiment, all this placed upon the creative impulses in art severe restraints that resulted in the romantic reaction against the cold rigidity of classical forms. His concentration on Greece and Rome blinded him to the rights and possibilities of other styles. Like Louis XIV, he thought that the genre paintings of the Netherlands were grotesqueries. Even so, his achievement was remarkable. He stirred the whole European realm of art, literature, and history with his exaltation of Greece. He went beyond the semi-classicism of Renaissance Italy and Louis XIV's France to classic art itself. He aroused the modern mind to the clean and placid perfection of Greek sculpture. He turned the chaos of a thousand marbles, bronzes, paintings, gems, and coins into a scientific archaeology. His influence on the best spirits of the next generation was immense. He inspired Lessing, if only to opposition. He shared in maturing Herder and Goethe. And perhaps without the afflatus that rose from Winkelmann, Byron would not have crowned his poetry with death in Greece. The ardent Hellenist helped to form the neoclassic principles of Manx and Torvaldsen, and the neoclassic painting of Jacques-Louis David. Winkelmann, said Hegel, is to be regarded as one of those who, in the sphere of art, have known how to initiate a new organ for the human spirit. 6. The artists. Italy hardly needed Winkelmann's exhortations, for she honored her gods, and her accumulated art served in each generation as a school of discipline for a thousand artists from a dozen lands. Carlo Marchioni designed the palatial Villa Albani in 1758, into which Cardinal Albani, guided by Winkelmann, gathered a world-famous collection of antique sculptures, still rich after many rapes. Napoleon stole 294 of the pieces for France, hence perhaps an Italian saying of those days, not all Frenchmen are thieves, but a good part of them are. Venice produced nearly all the leading Italian painters of these years, and three of them inherited already famous names. Alessandro Longhi, son of Pietro, illustrated the genius of his people with some delicate portraits, including two of Goldoni. We have seen Domenico Tiepolo accompanying his father to Augsburg and Madrid and modestly offering his specialty to the common stock. In the guest house of the Villa Valmarani, he struck out for himself with genre scenes from rural life. 
peasants reposing as an idol of dropped tools and restful ease. After his father's death in Spain, Domenico returned to Venice and gave his own style of humorous realism, free reign. Francesco Guardi, brother-in-law to Giambattista Tiepolo, learned painting from his father, his brother, and Canaletto. He missed a claim in his generation, but his vedute caught critical eyes by seizing and conveying subtleties of light and moods of atmosphere, which may have given some hints to French Impressionists. He did not wait for Constable's caution, remember that light and shade never stand still. Perhaps his favorite hour was twilight, when lines were blurred, colors merged, and shadows were dim, as in Gondola on the Lagoon. Venetian skies and waters seemed designed to offer such misty, melting views. Sometimes, we are told, Guardi carried his studio into a gondola and moved on the minor canals to catch unhackneyed scenes. He painted the human figures carelessly, as if he felt that they were evanescent minutiae beside the solid architecture and the changing yet persistent sea and sky. But he could picture men, too, crowding the piazzetta in some gala festival, or moving in stately dress in the great Sala dei Filarmonici. In their lifetime, his brother Giovanni was rated the better painter, and Canaletto greater than either. Today, Francesco Guardi promises to outlive them both. Anton Raphael Menx returned from Spain in 1768 and was soon lord of the studios in Rome. Hardly anyone questioned his supremacy among contemporary artists. Crowned heads angled for his brush, sometimes in vain. Winkelmann called him the Raphael of his age, praised his deadly Parnassus as a masterpiece before which even Raphael would have bowed his head, and injected into the history of ancient art a superlative estimate of his friend. The best of Menx's paintings in this period is his self-portrait, from about 1773. It shows him still vigorous, handsome, black-haired, proud at forty-five. After a second stay in Spain, Manx returned in 1777 to spend his declining years in Italy. He continued to prosper, but the death of his wife in 1778 broke his once buoyant spirit. A variety of ailments weakened him, and his resort to quack doctors and miraculous cures completed his physical ruin. He died in 1779 at 